So team here, from here we are going to start. All right. So earlier days, if I'll talk about any IT organization, how they used to deploy their application. All right. So we are going to start from the very beginning. All right. So earlier days, we used to have some physical servers. Physical servers means physical computer, you can say. All right. We used to have some physical computer, physical servers. All right. And there, if we want to deploy our application, we put some operating system, whether Windows or Linux or any other else. All right. Then we install Java over that. <clears throat> then we install Tomcat, your application. And then your application, Jar or War file. Okay. This is how we used to deploy your application on the physical servers in the earlier days. And your physical servers were quite heavy. All right. For example, they were 36 uh, core of CPU, 500 gigs of RAM, 2 terabytes of disk space. These types of configuration were there on the physical server. All right. So team, if you have worked on the uh, Tomcat application, can anybody tell me how much RAM utilization is it normally takes for a Tomcat application to run? Any brief idea? Not the exact figure. Anyone? Okay, Shiju, four gigs. All right, got it. Uh, Ganapati Sundaram. Okay, long name. Nice. Uh, minimum 16 to 32 GB. Okay, that is on a higher side. One of five gigs. All right. Okay, got it. So that is the case, right? Okay, Shiju T2 medium instance. Okay, you went to the instances. All right, great. Okay, so yes, team. A Tomcat is a very light application, not very light, but still it doesn't need your 36 gigs of CPU, 500 gigs of RAM, 2 terabyte of disk space. All right, so that is not required by a Tomcat application. So the thing is, with physical servers, there was a lot of wastage of resources. Because if I'm running a Tomcat application on this server, I cannot run any other Tomcat application on the same server. On the physical server all right so there was a lot of wastage of the resources and we used to have heavy so uh, heavy servers because you don't know when your application is going to get heavy all right so that is why for the safer side we have very heavy servers but initially there is a lot of wastage of resources to move over this challenges we move to virtualization okay in virtualization, we have hardware level virtualization. What is that? For say, I hope most of you have already worked on that. Consider I have a laptop. My this laptop have 36 core of CPU, 500 gigs of RAM, 2 terabyte of this space, same configuration. All right. And I want to run multiple similar kind of application on my this laptop. Right. That is my requirement because I don't want to waste any resources that we used to waste in physical servers. To overcome that challenge, some organization came up with a solution. And those organizations were called VMware and Oracle. Oracle product is VirtualBox. Okay. So they started providing virtualization. And what is that virtualization actually is? If you have a physical server or you have a physical laptop where you want, you want to run multiple application of similar environment, they used to provide you virtualization. And if I'm talking about VMware and your virtual box, these are the software that provide you virtualization. All right. And they are actually called hypervisor. So if you want to have some hypervisor, you're going to have some product like VMware or VirtualBox that is going to provide you virtualization. But what exactly the virtualization is on my this single laptop, I can have multiple machines, multiple virtual machines. They won't be actual physical servers. They won't be actual laptop, but I can create virtual machines. OK, so that is your hardware level virtualization or hardware level division of your resources among multiple computers on your single laptop. So earlier I was having a single physical server. Now I can have multiple virtual servers. For example, I'm going to run a Tomcat application. Okay, in dot 
in that tomcat application i don't need all this resources how much i resource how much resourcing i need i need two core of cpu that's all i can need hardly 5 gb of ram that's all okay that is what i'm using so what i have done i have taken this much resources from this pool and assigned it to one virtual machine that virtual machine can be of any flavor it can be your windows or linux or alpine or centos any flavor whatever you want you just need some image for that okay so then you are good to go so you are not wasting the complete pool you are just taking that much you need and other resources are available to create multiple virtual machines all right so you can run one application of tomcat and one application of nginx on the same computer with virtual machines which don't have any interference with each other because they are running on separate virtual machines now and that's how you can create multiple virtual machine for your multiple application on the same machine using the same resource pool all right and these virtual machines are complete operating system means if you are running a physical server and if you are running any virtual machine over your physical server it is going to be heavy as well because it will have complete operating system of your centos over your physical server all right so we were able to remove the challenges that we face in physical servers but still some challenges were there in your virtualization and what were those challenges so here they are mentioned for example first challenge was your reboot time so team if you are going to reboot any virtual machine it is going to take some time all right depending on your flavor that you have chosen it might take 2 to 5 minutes or 10 minutes as well for a single machine reboot all right and we in we are in the era where we want negligible downtime of our application if i am running an application i don't want any downtime i want my application to be running 24 cross 7 all right so if we talk about business even the downtime of 2 to 5 minutes or 10 minutes is having a large impact all right so reboot time was a challenge and we don't want that much of downtime of our application all right second is your full operating system full operating system means as i told you if you are running a centos virtual machine we are going to have a down, we have to download a image all right and that image is going to contain the full operating system so those are actually heavy in nature if i'll talk about any basic image of any basic uh, operating system it can range from 1 gb to 2 gb or 5 gb as well so those images are actually heavy cannot increase it in the real time dynamic allocation all right for example your application is running on this virtual machine your current allocation is 5 gb of ram but your load increased on your tomcat server on your tomcat application your load has increased and your 5 gigs are completely exhausted so in that case you cannot increase the ram util uh, ram assignment to this virtual machine on the go okay you have to bring down this application and then you have to restart your server and then you are going to assign more ram you can make it 5 gb to 10 gb or 20 gb as per the availability of your pool all right but you cannot go on the fly for this you have to take a reboot and as i told you reboot take 2 to 5 minutes or 10 minutes so consider that your application is heavy your application is in much demand you have a good traffic on your application and your ram is exhausted so you have to increase the ram allocation and you have to reboot your machine and take a downtime for 5 to 10 minutes or uh, and when your application is in heavy demand there is a large traffic so how it is going to work we don't want that when our application is heavy in demand we don't want to take a unplanned maintenance time at that point of time so that is also a challenge with your virtualization next is your scalability scalability means consider that you want to create exact replica of your this virtual machine <clears throat> with another virtual machine you just want to do the load balancing for say all right 
So what you want to do, you want to do the load balancing. You have one virtual server and you want to create another virtual server. So it is going to take time. Or consider that you have all these resources and your pool is exhausted now. All right. In that scenario, you have to bring down all the machines all together and you have to increase the allocation of your server. Then you have to allot allocation to the virtual servers. And again, it is going to take some downtime for all the machines. <clears throat> okay. So team, these were the challenges with your virtual machines, which we wanted to overcome. All right. And to overcome all these challenges, your containers came into picture. All right. So your containers are in the picture now, which has eliminated all the challenges in your virtual machine. All right. We are going to discuss about them so that it is clear to you. <coughs> Again, considering that we have the same physical server, 36 core of CPU, 5 gigs, uh, 500 gigs of RAM, 2 terabytes of this space. All right. We have the same server. Earlier, we used to install your hypervisor, your VM pair or your virtual box. But now we are going to install some container runtime engine. Okay, it is called CRD. We are going to install some container runtime engine. So what is it? It is exactly similar to your hypervisor if you compare, but these are the different software. At hypervisor, we have softwares like VMware, your virtual box. At CRE, we have some softwares like Docker, Rocket, Cryo. All right. So these are some container uh, containerization tools that I have mentioned here. Container D, LXC, LXG, Rocket. All right. And Docker. Docker is the one which is in most demand. All right. There are other as well. Some organization are using different CRE as well. But we are talking about Docker here because this is the one which is in most demand. All right. And here we used to create your virtual machine where we have to give fixed allocation of resources. Whenever we create them, whenever we reboot them, we have to give a fixed allocation. <clears throat> but in containerization, we don't do hardware level virtualization. In containerization, we do OS level virtualization. How is it different? It is different in a way that if I'm going to create a container, it is going to behave exactly the same as your virtual machine. Okay, so you can consider that your container is exactly similar to your virtual machine if we talk about the functionality, but where it differ. All right, first major difference lies in your OS level virtualization, and it means <clears throat> that you are not going to share the resources in fixed definition you're going to use the OS as a fixed definition. For say, if I'm going to create a container of RHEL, okay, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So if I'm going to create a container, then I don't have to give any fixed assignment that it is going to take five core of uh, CPU. It has to take 20 GB of your RAM. Okay, I'm not going to give any definition like that. If I'm creating a sushi container, Again, I don't have to give any definition like five core of CPU, 20 core of uh, 20 GB of RAM or five uh, terabyte of this space or any kind of configuration. I don't have to give. So how they are going to work. So team, they are going to work exactly as any application runs on your system. Okay. So how any application runs on your system? Consider I am having a Google Chrome. I have a Skype. I have a Teams. I have Outlook how they use resources on your laptop. We have a large pool and these resources take as much as they want in the real time. They are dynamic in nature. All right. Consider I'm using Google Chrome at now. It is taking less space, less resources. But if I open multiple tabs, it is going to consume more resources. Okay. So it is dynamic in nature. Similarly, your containers are too. Okay, your containers by default take negligible resourcing to stay alive. All right, this my Google Chrome is running as of now. It is taking this much of memory. It is running uh, using this much of CPU. All right. If I open more tabs, it is going to consume more memory. It is going to consume more CPU. If I'm going to close all the tabs, if I'm going to close your Chrome completely, it is going to release release all the resources to the pool. 
so that other application can take care of that. Okay. Similarly, your containers do the same. Your containers take negligible resourcing just to stay alive. If your application is having a load and your traffic is increasing, they are going to take the resources from the pool dynamically. You don't have to do any reboot or anything like that. Okay, so that is one thing. Another thing is your containers are not complete operating system as compared to your virtual machines. Okay, for example, I'm running a Red Hat container. Okay, so this Red Hat container is also going to have some image, but that image is not going to have a complete operating system. It is going to have just the basic libraries or binaries of Red Hat so that you can have a similar environment for Red Hat Linux. Okay, consider my this virtual machine is on <clears throat> Windows and I'm running a Linux container. So that Linux container is just going to have the libraries and binaries of your Red Hat just that so that you can have the environment of Red Hat Linux. It is not going to have a complete operating system. It is going to use the OS level kernels from your server, physical server. Okay, so what advantage does it provide? First advantage, as it is not a full in nature. When we are talking about your virtual machines images, which ranges from 1 GB to 2 GB, your images in your Docker containers hardly takes few MBs. Okay. We have the lightest uh, images with uh, 50 to uh, 100 MB as well. Okay, so they are quite light in nature. That is one benefit. Another benefit, as it is not a complete operating system, the reboot time has downgraded significantly. Okay, the reboot time in your virtual machine ranges from two minutes to five minutes, but in containers, your uh, reboot time is a fraction of a second mark my word fraction of seconds okay not even a complete second it takes it reboots just like that within a second so these are the beauty with containers okay so we have the most demanded docker container all right we are going to have a few labs also on that so that you can have a good idea what basically a container is so team any question till now any question you want to ask? Um, Gaurav, you are asking how many containers we can have in a machine. You can have n number of containers in your machine. Just consider uh, it like as an application. You can ex have n number of application in your laptop, right? You can install n number of application on your laptop until and unless your physical resources are exhausted or your uh, CPU cores or any other resources are exhausted, you can have n number of applications. There is no limit like that. Thanks, Anome. Uh, Sanjay, can we run Linux kernels uh, if we are talking about OS level virtualization? And if you have your operating system as Windows, you can have your Linux containers. And Linux containers doesn't have Linux kernels. It has Linux libraries and binaries only. Uh, Guru Nathan, don't mind if I call you Guru Nathan. All right. You have a long name. So Guru Nathan will be convenient. All right. So you're asking what is the purpose of hypervisor in the virtualization? Uh, Guru Nathan, the purpose of hypervisor <clears throat> is to provide you the virtualization. If you have a laptop, I cannot create a virtual machine like just like that. I cannot divide my resources on my physical laptop just like that. I need some software and that software is hypervisor. <clears throat> Uh, Sanjay, yes, we can run a Linux container on a Windows machine as well. All right, because at the end of the day, nowadays your Windows laptop are also using Linux kernels at the back end. That is what happens. <coughs> As containers will have partial, uh, then to what extent or to what part of the host will be utilized, Gopal? <coughs> okay, 
So Gopal, yes, as uh, you already said, it is a partial operating system, and I already told you that your partial operating system contains the libraries and binaries of your operating system. Okay, so it is going to give you an uh, a look and feel of your container. All right, so if your container is running on the Linux, it is going to give you a look and feel live or with the libraries and binaries and all the requirement of your application. Whatever the your application requirements are with the libraries and binaries, your container is going to fulfill them. Otherwise, all the kernel parameters, all the hardware level resources will be taken from your full operating system at the back end. Sarat, you're asking, uh, will you be covering Windows pods creation <clears throat> on a Kubernetes master? Uh, Sarat, no, we don't have your uh, Windows containers as of now. All right, we have your containers of your Linux flavor only. All right, and these are the containers that you will be dealing in your examination as well. Okay, so everything will be done practically on your Linux environments. And Derek, I guess you're asking, so what is different with physical looks like it's almost same because we have done hardware allocation and we can put application on the top of the OS. Please correct me if I'm wrong. The difference is that you can run multiple application of the similar nature. Okay, if I talk about your physical server that you are not using any virtualization or containerization, <clears throat> if you want to run a Tomcat application, you can run only one Tomcat application here because it is going to occupy some ports, okay? So the port that is taken by default from the Tomcat, it is going to occupy that port. And if you want to uh, run any similar kind of application on the same server, you cannot because that port is occupied. So for that purpose, we need virtualization. We can run multiple Tomcat application with the port availability on the virtualization. All right. Uh, Sarath, master is on Linux. Uh, your master and your worker nodes all are going to be on the Linux flavor. Uh, yes, Sarath, uh, I understand that you mean creating Windows spot, but no, that is not what we are going to cover in this. Okay, Windows spot or Windows container, you can assume it's same. I'll discuss more on pods and containers as well in the coming session but not right now. <clears throat> can we run uh, Sri Rama? Can we run Linux container on Windows host without virtual mach uh, machine? Okay. Okay. Sri Rama, you have mixed everything totally. Okay. If you want to run Linux container or any kind of container, you used to have your Hypervisor, uh, sorry, not hypervisor, not virtual machine. You need to have some CRA. Okay, so yes, you can do with your CRA on Windows. Kushagra is asking the difference between Alpine and normal Ubuntu images. Okay, Kushagra, there is no much difference. Just Alpine images are very light in nature. Okay, they don't have all the functionality. For example, in your uh, Ubuntu, you have your bash prompt. In Alpine, you don't have bash, you have shell prompt only, okay? So Alpine are light in nature and because of that, they have limited functionalities. But Ubuntu has full fledged functionality of your any Linux flavor. Okay. Kabil, yes, we can install your uh, Kubernetes on Red Hat version as well. And if you want the steps for that, I'll provide you that. Okay, no worries. Ashok, you're asking containerization is a hardware. No, containerization is a software, first thing. Where we install CRE. Containerization is a concept, okay? Ashok, containerization is a concept. Like virtualization was a concept, okay? We used to have hypervisor, your VMware virtual box. Similarly, in containerization, containerization is a concept. It is not a hardware. Where we are going to install your CRE. CRE is your Docker or any other software that is going to allow you to create your container that will share your OS resources.
Mosomi, you are asking use case of container D and Docker. Okay, Mosomi, both are providing you containers. For example, if I give you a very basic example, if you want to have some operating system, you have n number of failure, mm, not n numbers. All right, like if you want to have a Windows laptop, you can have your Windows operating system. If you want to have a Linux failure, you have your uh, um, Linux flavor operating system, you like your Red Hat, your Ubuntu, your Sushi, your CentOS. All right, so you have multiple flavors. Similarly, your Docker and Container D are two flavors of your containerization. It is your call with which you want to proceed. Okay, it depends on the organization what containers technology they want to use. If they want to go with Docker containers, they can go with that. If they want to go with the Container D containers, they can go with that as well. Okay, both provide you same thing, but by the different vendors. That's all. All right, so team, I'll be asking you to hold on your questions now. All right, let's proceed a little bit further so that we can understand all these things practically. Okay, and I guess uh, in the previous tender also asked you to have your GCP account ready so that you can practice here. All right, and the reason is that why we prefer GCP over AWS because in AWS, your free tier allows you to create very limited kind of resourcing. Okay, so if you want to create any CD instances, you're going to have one core of CPU, one GB of RAM and a free tier. If you're going to create any heavier machine, it is going to charge you. And that is why we prefer GCP because here you can create a heavier machine as well within your credit limit. Okay, so that is what we are going to use. So let me create a machine here. I show you that what conf, how uh, configured machine we are going to use for a labs. Okay, so for say I'm naming it as a Docker machine. Let me change the region as well. <clears throat> okay, so for the practical purpose, we are going to use two uh, core of virtual CPU and four GB of RAM. The image we are going to use will be Ubuntu. Not Sushi, Ubuntu. Okay, so when I gave my examination uh, of uh, CK, they used to provide Ubuntu only. Nowadays, they are also providing Ubuntu only, but at that time, it was providing Ubuntu 16. Okay, so I guess they are moved to Ubuntu 18 now. So Use Ubuntu 18 machine, select. We are going to allow full access to all cloud APIs and we are also going to allow HTTP and HTTPS traffic. That's it. This type of configure machine we are going to use for our practical purpose for all the machines, whether it is your Docker labs or your Kubernetes lab. Okay, so team, I'm going to give you a few commands so that you can have a basic understanding about containers and then we are going to jump on the Kubernetes part then. Okay, looks like our machine is ready. We are going to connect from right here. Okay, till the time it is making connections, I want to share something with you, all of you. <clears throat> Onome, yes, you can use your CentOS servers also, but all the labs will be based on Ubuntu, okay? I'll be doing everything on the Ubuntu. If you want, you can go with the CentOS also, and if you want steps for CentOS, I'm going to share that also with you, okay? Why not Docker Swarm then Kubernetes? Okay, I did a guess. I'll come back to your question. Okay, as of now, we are just discussing about your containerization, your containers. <clears throat> Once I'll start with container orchestration, then I'll answer your question the difference between Docker Swarm and Kubernetes. All right, so team, one thing that uh, all the content, all the things that you already have with your LMS portals are definitely with you. 
all right all the course content all the video lectures all the prerequisites everything you do have on your lms portal and it is more than enough for your practice okay but i want to give you something more than that okay so team this is a github repository that is going to help you with all the labs okay everything that i'll be sharing every content that i'll be doing every lab and every project everything is here in this repository okay so this repository i'm going to share with all of you it is a open source library in the github okay i am pinging this in the chat box okay so team this is the repository that i have shared with all of you and this repository is going to have all the things that you need for your examination point of view and for your practice point of view also all the uh, test cases all the yaml files all the syntaxing everything and during the class also i am going to refer to this repository so that you can you know how you are going to use this repository for your practical purposes okay so i have pasted this in the chat box i request you all to have it copied and bookmarked with you all right consider you want to understand more on dockers all right so you do have everything in your prerequisites but if you want you can refer to this repository as well so here is a folder called docker if you want to know how you are going to install your docker there is a file called install docker manual all right so team as you can see if you want to install docker on ubuntu these are the commands that you want to use if you want to install your docker on centos these are the commands okay so some of the people onome and some few other people were also wanted to know that how you are going to do the things on centos this is the repository for you you can use this repository and have your commands ready with you all right so what i'm going to do i'm going to quickly install your docker on this machine <clears throat> okay nothing much it is doing it is just doing the apt get update if there is any docker components previously installed on the server it is going to remove it first remove it first then it is going to update your machine then it is going to install some transport and certificates for your docker then it is going to copy your docker image your docker software on your server and then it is going to update it and finally it is going to install your docker cli docker and your container dio okay this is all what it is it is going to do i am going to run the same on this machine all right so team we i am installing your docker now and looks like it is done okay looks like all the commands are not executed i have to install it one by one So team, I'm just installing your Docker software right now. If you have any questions, you can ask. I'll be answering that. and that's the last command okay so many questions bishop are we going to use vm in virtual google cloud for the practical purpose or other gcp specific service as well because gcp is not allowing me to create account i have got one digital ocean i can get vms here uh rishab yes uh, as per your content of the class everything will be done on the virtual machines only okay so it is not going to uh, be a issue but 
just for some extra additional knowledge what i'm going to do i'm going to share a few concepts that you can have on the managed cluster only okay for say uh, we have google kubernetes engine okay it provides you some other specification as well it is not going to help you in your examination but it is going to help you in your real time environment that is why i'm going to uh, touch some topics from there as well just for your knowledge purpose just to, to give you something extra but yes for your examination point of view everything will be covered on the virtual machines only Anil, as of now, yes, I have installed your CRE. Adirika guest, your uh, Adirika guest, can you try all the commands that I have just shared? Yes, probably you are not using the right operating system. Okay, please check your operating system whether it is your Ubuntu or any other flavor. And depending on that, use my repository to install the softwares. Okay, for Ubuntu flavor, use these commands. So this is just to have your users. So I am going to do everything with the root, so you don't have to worry about that. If you are working on Ubuntu, these commands are enough. And if you are working on CentOS flavor, these commands are enough. Yes, Anil. I'll be sharing the commands also for the CRE. Whatever I am going to run. Yes, Adirika. Yes, uh, Girish. Okay, got your name. So yes, uh, I'm going to run some commands. You can also practice that at your own, so that uh, you'll be clear <clears throat> if your Docker has installed properly or not. Okay. All right. So team, these are the steps to install your Docker, and let's execute few commands. It is 71 IST. Okay, so I thought that we are going to assign one hour for the Docker, and then we are going to jump on the Kubernetes part. Okay, so we have 10 minutes more. So let's see what we can cover on Docker, because Docker is not a main topic. It is just a brief idea about the prerequisites. For that, also I assign one hour, just so that you can have a better understanding. <clears throat> All right, so team, I'm going to execute few Docker commands so that you can understand what exactly Docker is. Okay, so in your virtual machine, you can also install your images from open source, but if I talk about your Docker, sorry, Docker has its own Docker hub. Okay, from where you can download all the images. So this is the website hubs hub.docker.com. You can go to this. You can create your own account. Your own account will help you to create your own images and upload that at your own repository. Okay, so you can have your account here. You can sign up. It is free of course if you are using any open source containers or if you are uploading your containers that is publicly available. You can sign up for free. There is no charges. But if you want to have private repository, then it is going to charge you. So as long as you are using public repository, it is completely free. So you can sign up and you can have your own account. For example, I want to have a Tomcat image. What Tomcat image is going to do? Tomcat image will have some operating system, partial operating system, and it is going to have a Tomcat installed also. Okay. So what it helps? It doesn't have you the challenges that you want to create a container you want to have some image you have to create a container then you have to install tomcat in it so this part is eliminated if you use any tomcat image it is going to have some operating system libraries and binaries for your container and it is also going to have tomcat installed in it if you want to have some plain operating system you can have that also if i'll search for ubuntu you have ubuntu image also so you just have to download this Ubuntu image. It is the official image and you can create a container with Ubuntu and then you can install Tomcat if you want to. But what is the purpose? You have already a Tomcat image. You can use that image and your Tomcat is good to go. If you want to have Nginx, you also have some Nginx images. Okay, so we have all the ready-made images here, which you can use for your own purpose. 
so let's try to use some of them okay as so now you can see there are no images or no containers if i want to have some image downloaded first let's see if we have any images as well so you can see there are no images as of now if i want to download some image i can simply use a name this is your nginx you can install any specific version as well of your image all right as of now i'm going to use the latest one for latest i don't have to mention anything docker pull nginx So now you can see it is downloading the docker image and it is downloading the docker image from your docker hub itself okay your docker image is as of now public repository so you anyone can download it with this command you can also download your docker nginx image so if i'll do docker images you can see there is a docker image all right but if i'll search for docker containers container is not created as of now all right now you can see that your image is downloaded now you want to create the container with this image all right for that you have command called docker run hyphen d hyphen p and your image name the image you are using is nginx so now it is has created your container docker ps okay so you can see this is your container right this image it has used okay it was created 8 seconds ago and it is up from 7 seconds so you can see 8 second ago it was created and 7 seconds ago it was up so reboot time you can consider is negligible all right you can see this port number as well so your nginx is running on this port number on this machine okay your nginx runs by default on 80 port number but the port it has used for this virtual uh, this machine is this one all right consider i want to create another container of same flavor all right that was i need i executed similar command again so now you can see i have two containers running both are of nginx flavor all right but you can see the port number of nginx container is 80 port number because your container your nginx run on number 80 but as we have different containers it has taken the different port number for your machine so it is showing 000 it means it is going to take the ip of your <coughs> instance all right this is my machine i'll copy it let me paste it here and let me provide the port number so now you can see i have two containers running both are of nginx flavor all right but you can see the port number of nginx container is 80 port number because your containers your nginx run on port number 80 but as we have different containers it has taken the different port number for your machine so it is showing 000 it means it is going to take the ip of your <coughs> instance all right this is my machine i'll copy it let me paste it here and let me provide the port number welcome to nginx okay this is the port number of your first and i can use the port number of your second container as well with the same ip i'm just going to modify the port number so there is no different both are nginx container that is why you are seeing the same page but now it is going to different container earlier it went to this container now it went to this container <coughs> okay so you have created the container it is doing its functionality it is providing you an nginx space if you want to make some changes if you want to go inside your container we have the commands for that as well so docker exec is the command to go inside your container all right you have to provide the container id as well and then you have to give a prompt with what prompt you want to log into your container i want to log into my container with a bash prompt okay so team now you can see the prompt has changed 
earlier the prompt was root at the rate docker because docker is the name of my machine right docker is the name of my machine and now the prompt has changed root at the rate and this is your container id it means now i am inside my container if you want to verify you can verify that as well consider let's see what operating system flavor it has as a container okay so you want to go to this file cat etc os release okay so team you can see this is a debian flavor container all right so if i come out of this container with control pq all right control pq is used to come out of a container all right and if i'll see my operating system of my host machine we already know that it is your ubuntu but just to verify right you can see your physical server on which i am working right now is of ubuntu flavor 18.1 this is what we choose earlier right but the container that has nginx installed in it is of debian flavor okay this is how your container varies okay so team anyone else have any question i hope it is clear to you akhil yes your docker exec command will work docker exec command is working on your operating system machine okay where you have the full operating system alpine is a image that doesn't have the bash prompt so what difference you are going to see for example if i'll do docker exec hyphen it and the container id of a alpine image with bash prompt you won't be able to enter all right you have to give a shell prompt here you have to mention sh then only you are going to log into your alpine container because there is no bash prompt so i hope that answers your question akhil okay anyone else any other question okay thank you thank you for confirmation <clears throat> okay so team with docker also you can do a lot of functionality you can create your own images as well you can do your container orchestration also to some extent <clears throat> so what we have covered is less than 10% of your docker container okay but i have covered the part that is necessary for you all right this is all you need for your kubernetes as per from your docker part other than that your docker container is also a big topic it also takes four to uh, four weeks has a complete course all right <clears throat> so i just gave you a basic idea that is going to help you with this course now we are going to move forward and we are going to go to your kubernetes okay so what is kubernetes kubernetes is not your containerization tool kubernetes is your container orchestration tool so what is the difference okay so at the organization level this question is for you people all right so i want answers from you in any organization if you want to deploy your application are you going to deploy that application on a single machine or on a single container is it a wise call is it a wise call to have your application on a single container on a single machine no right great all of you are answering superb absolutely correct yes so the thing is at organization level you are not going to have a single container or a single server you need something more than that okay if i'll take a real time example in any organization you don't work as a single contributor right if you have a team you have a team there you don't have a single contributor consider in i'm in my organization i'm the single person i'm also working on the incidents i'm also working on the user stories i'm also working on the defect it doesn't work like that i'm not going to do everything at my own because it is a big failover because of some reason if i am on leave on a some day then all the things will be impacted 
your incidents, your user stories, your defects, everything is going to impact. So what we do, we used to have a team, right? We have 10 members of team or 20 members of team and we have designated some responsibilities to each team member that you're going to work on the defects and you are going to work on your user stories. You're going to work on the incidents. We have a team there, right? Similarly, you have your multiple containers to be holding your application. All right. We are not going to have a single container. We are going to have multiple containers for your application, for the failover, for the load balancing, for multiple reason and number of reasons. You're going to have multiple containers. You're not going to create a single container. All right. With that understanding, consider in your real time scenario that I have taken an example of a layman example that you have a team in your organization. You are not a single contributor. So to manage those group of people, consider I have a team of 10 members where everyone has some responsibilities. So are they sharing the responsibilities among themselves at their own or they do have a manager above that above them? In a group of 10 people, they don't share the responsibility at their own call, right? They have a manager. Every team has a manager. And what is the responsibility of the manager? Manager has a responsibility to distribute the work among all the resources in the team so that things get done in time. Okay. And there is no load. So what are the responsibilities of a manager? It is going to distribute the work. Okay. It is also going to measure your performance that how you're performing. All right, and it is also going to take the responsibility if some team member is absent because of any reason it is going to delegate that responsibility from that member to some other member. Right. So these are the responsibility of the manager. They are also going to go your performance. They are also going to help you with all the responsibilities. They're going to distribute the work. Everything will be done by the manager and the real work will be done by the team. Similarly, in your container world, you have multiple containers. Those containers are not going to share the responsibility among themselves at their own. They need some kind of manager as well. And that manager is your container orchestration tools. Okay. Container orchestration tools like your uh, Docker is one of them. Sorry, Docker uh, Swarm is one of them. All right. Your Kubernetes is another Kubernetes. Uh, container orchestration tool. All right. So these container orchestration tools are not the containerization tool. <clears throat> okay. Very important words. Kubernetes is a container orchestration tool. It is not a containerization tool. Kubernetes doesn't provide its own container. They just do the management of the container of any other flavor, whether it is your Docker or rocket or LXC or LXZ or container D. You can have any flavor of your containerization. Your Kubernetes is going to do the orchestration. It is going to orchestrate your containers. It is going to manage your containers. All the responsibilities that I told you of the manager will be taken care by your Kubernetes as a container orchestration tool. Consider you have a cluster. All right. You have a five nodes cluster because of some reason if one node goes down. All right. So your Kubernetes is going to take the responsibility to migrate the containers of bot from that node to another container. As I told you that if some member is in your team is absent, his work will be assigned to some other people by the manager. Similarly in Kubernetes also, Kubernetes is going to assign the containers of the failed node to some another node. All right. It is also going to check the performance. It is also going to check how your containers are performing. All right. It is also going to assign. It is also going to distribute the containers among the cluster. All right. All the responsibilities that I shared with you of a manager will be done by your Kubernetes or any container orchestration tool. <coughs> Next question. Why we are just starting about Kubernetes? We have other tools as well. For example, Docker Swarm. Docker provides its own container. So we can use Docker Swarm also. Right. Why go with Kubernetes? First and the biggest answer for that is that your Docker provides you containerization only with the Docker containers. Okay. You cannot create any other container. Kubernetes provide you that flexibility that you can have your containers of any other flavor. 
so in docker swarm you can create only docker container in kubernetes you can create any kind of containers your docker lxc lxg or any flavor so that is the biggest feature of your kubernetes kubernetes doesn't uh, limit you with any single flavor docker swarm does all right another difference is your docker swarm doesn't provide you the functionality that kubernetes provide for example if i'll talk about auto scaling this is one of the feature auto scaling feature in docker swarm is not available okay you have to scale your containers in docker swarm <coughs> manually but if i'll talk about kubernetes you have auto scaling enabled you don't have to put any manual efforts your kubernetes does it automatically so these are some of the features and some other features are also there the security that is provided in kubernetes uh, like role big uh, role based access control okay these are the features of kubernetes which is not present in your docker swarm okay so functionality wise docker swarm is not that advanced if i talk about in comparison with kubernetes that is why your kubernetes is most in demand at these days your docker swarm is not okay so kubernetes provide you more functionality it is more flexible it is more complex as well to understand as compared to docker swarm because of the functionalities whoever gives you more functionality is definitely a little complex but in real time organizations we need functionalities whether it is complex or not okay so that is why your kubernetes is most demanded container orchestration tool in the organization at this point of time all right any other question any question till now yes no maybe So team, one important tip for your examination point of view. Okay. So what I'll do, I'll keep giving you examination tips in between our sessions. Okay. So it can help you in your examination. Okay. Uh, okay. We have few question. Why we go for containerization? Why not image management? Because uh, it is. Is it because container is running instances? So Mit. Uh, Sumit, I'm not sure if I got your question. Why we go for containerization? Why not image management? Image is your operating system image. Uh, consider that you have a laptop, all right? And in, on your laptop, if you want to have your Windows operating system, are you going to have your Windows operating system on your fresh laptop? You're going to have some bootable device. You'll have some software in your CD or any bootable device like pen drive or not. All right, you're going to connect that with your laptop and then you're going to install your Windows operating system on your laptop. So what that pen drive is doing, your pen drive or your bootable device is your image. Okay, it is portable. With that single image, you can create multiple operating system. You can have that pen drive connected to your laptop. You can have your Windows operating system. You can connect that pen drive to some other's laptop also and you can install your Windows operating system there as well. So that bootable device is a single image which is creating multiple operating system on multiple laptops. Similarly, if you talk about an image, your image is a device which is going to help you create multiple container of that same flavor. Okay, so image management also take place. You have to manage your images as well, but that image is just a script. You don't have the container there. You have to create a container. All right. So Sumit, I hope I answered your question. 
we can use auto scaling for the instances right <clears throat> Uh, at your guess, auto scaling is going to if you talk about instance level. Okay, if you're doing the instance level auto scaling, it will not be managed by Kubernetes, it will be managed by your cloud provider. Consider if you're working on AWS, you have created multiple EC2 instances, or if you're working with GCP and you have multiple VM instances, then if you want to do the load balancing between those machines, <clears throat> it will not be taken care of by the Kubernetes because that is the infrastructure that is provided by Google Cloud. You have to do the load balancing at the Google Cloud front. Kubernetes is not going to manage. Kubernetes is going to do the load balancing between your containers. All right. Okay, so team one team I was going to give you about your examination. I don't know how much of you know this or not. <clears throat> if you are preparing for your CK examination. During your examination, your examiner allows you as of now, if you know that your Kubernetes examination is taken care by CNCF. All right, so CNCF allows you uh, to open your official Kubernetes website during the examination. Right? So during the examination, you can open your official Kubernetes website in a single tab, not multiple tabs. You cannot open multiple tabs. You cannot launch Google on any tab. You can just open a single tab apart from your examination tab. And in that tab, you can open your Kubernetes official website for syntaxing or any, any other help. Okay, so I'll suggest you to have a bookmark like this. Okay, you can see that I have created a bookmark, KTS. All right, in this you have multiple things. Installing your cube ADM and any other topic. All right, so you can see it has commands as well. If you want to install your cube ADM, how you're going to do that, all the commands are here so that during the examination, you don't have to memorize the commands or anything. You can simply go to this link and you can have the command with you. Okay, you can choose the version as well. As of now, we'll be working on the 19th version. All right, so all the commands are here. So have this thing in your bookmark, all the links which are going to help you when you during your examination and how you're going to get these bookmarks. All right, I have created that also for you. Go to the same Git repository. All right, there's a folder called other. In other, you have an HTML file. Where it is, where it is, HTML. Okay, here is your Kubernetes bookmark HTML file. Okay, you can simply Google how to have your uh, Kubernetes. Uh, sorry, you can simply Google how you can have your bookmarks imported from HTML file. Simply, you can have the similar tab here. So during the examination, you can directly go to the field and you can open the page. So this is how your it is going to help you in your examination. But just a single tab that is also from the official website. Joy, I have already shared the GitHub repository link with you. Let me share it that with you again. Joy, I have shared the link with you on one to one chat as well. And I'm also pasting the same link on the chat box again. Okay. Have this with you. All the content you're going to find here. Uh, Chagannath, you're asking the browser tab is on a laptop machine or in the CK and uh, lab environment. CK lab environment, they're going to provide you some virtual machine where you have to do everything practically. CK examination is not an optional uh, multiple choice question. They will give you a scenario and you have to execute some commands on the terminal. They also provide you one to terminal. Okay, so you have to create your cluster. You have to create your pods or deployment. All the things we are going to cover in the classes. All right, so that is a terminal where you will be executing and it is also going to be a browser window. Okay, so in the browser window, you can have an additional tab with the Kubernetes official website link only, not even Google. All right. 
Yes, Adhirakas, exam is completely practical. You have to create the objects, you have to create the deployment, you have to create the pods, you have to troubleshoot. They will give you a scenario that this is the problem you are facing in the cluster, how you're going to troubleshoot it. Everything will be done practical. Okay, they will provide you up and running cluster. They will provide you a cluster and then they will ask you to do the things. Okay, so this is your official Kubernetes website. Apart from that, uh, uh, if you know that your examinations are held by CNCF nowadays, okay, Kubernetes was initially with uh, Google earlier, all right, it has stayed with Google for uh, created it as a open source. Now your cloud native computing foundation manages your certification, all right. So if you can go for the CK administration, CKA, you can also go for your CKAD. Okay, that's your call. <clears throat> During the class, we are going to cover both the certification. By the end of this course, you will be able to complete the certification of CKA and CKAD as well. Okay, CKAD is the lengthy one because it has more topics. CKAD is your Kubernetes, uh, certified Kubernetes application developer. CKAD is that. So that has a little lesser concept than CK and we are targeting for CKA. So if you are done with this course, if you're done with these classes, you are done with the content, you can opt for any examination, CKA and CKD both. Okay, here are your examination details, how your examination take place, what is the uh, deadline, what is the weightage, everything you can find, all the details are here. All right. So team, any other question before I move forward? Mon, uh, CNCF Cloud Native uh, Computing Foundation is a organization that is uh, managing your Kubernetes nowadays. All right. All right, team, so now we are going to start with your Kubernetes architecture as the first topic, all right? Before starting that, shall we take a break? Yes, no? All right, so team, let's take a 15 minutes break. Okay, Gopal, you can come back in five minutes. Great, okay, but still, we are going to take a 15 minute break, all right? So I'm going to put a timer here. See you in 15 minutes.
Sí, I'm back. <clears throat> A quick confirmation from all of you. Do we have all of you on board? Okay, few responses. Great. Okay, in this type of uh, confirmation, I get all the names on the chat box. All right. So, team, uh, let's get started. All right. So, this is what we have understood so far. Now we are going to understand about the Kubernetes architecture and then we are going to do the Kubernetes installation. All right. So first thing first, this is your architecture of Kubernetes. Okay. This is already run. Let me draw it again. All right. So Kubernetes as we are already clear is your container orchestration tool. All right. So container orchestration tool it is and it also distribute your resources across multiple nodes. All right. So considering that we have a multi node architecture in this multi node architecture, considering <clears throat> this is going to be our master. Okay, your one node is going to be a master node. And in Kubernetes, your worker nodes are simply called nodes. Okay, this is your node one, node two, and node three. So this is how we are going to proceed. We are going to have one master machine and we are going to have multi and in this architecture, the machines that we are going to create will have uh, two core of CPU and four GB of RAM. Okay, this is what we are going to follow for all the machines. If you want to have higher machines, that is completely your call. But this kind, uh, this loaded machine will be enough for our Kubernetes practice okay so now we are going to do mention the components of your master nodes and your worker nodes all right so if I talk about your master node components you have four components here okay first is your API server Second is going to be your ETCD or first let's understand about Schedule. Next is going to be your <clears throat> controller manager. And the last component of your master node is ETCD. Okay, so team, these are the four components that you have on your master node. If we'll talk about Kubernetes master architecture. Okay, what are the responsibilities of all these components? Now we are going to understand one by one. Okay, first is your API server. What your API server does? Consider that we have already seen practically how your Docker works, right? So if you can see, control C. Okay, connection timeout, no problem. So in Docker lab, you have already seen that all the commands that I'm giving starts with a Docker word. Okay, all the commands starts with a Docker keyword, Docker PS, Docker images, Docker exec, Docker um, run, all the commands start with a Docker keyword. So that Docker keyword is a client. Okay, that is a client that interacts with the Docker software on that particular machine. Similarly, with Kubernetes, there is also a client. Okay, and that client is called kubectl. Okay, so kubectl is a client that deal with all the Kubernetes related components in your Kubernetes installation or your Kubernetes management. All right, so all the commands that you're going to execute on Kubernetes cluster will start with a kubectl keyword. 
Similarly, like Docker keyword was used to do with all Docker related operations, kubectl is going to be the keyword that will start the command to interact with your Kubernetes cluster. All right. So your kubectl directly interacts with your API server. Okay, all the commands that you're going to execute your API server on the master component is going to be the one that will manage all the communication. All right. So team allow me a few minutes after that I'll be taking your questions. All right, let's discuss about the master components then I'll take your questions. So all the things that you're going to do with Kubernetes cluster, you will start with kubectl and that kubectl will address the API server component on your master and then it will take all the actions. Okay, if you want to do kubectl get pods, kubectl get nodes, kubectl create any resources, your pods, container, whatever, all the commands that you'll give with kubectl will interact with the API server first on your cluster. Okay, so API server is the first point of contact in your cluster. It will manage all the communication inside the cluster. API server is responsible for all the communication, whether that communication is being done with your kubectl, if the communication is happening between these components as well. Even these components cannot interact directly with each other. If ETCD wants to talk to controller manager, it has to connect via API server. Any node component wants to connect with your master, it has to connect with the API server first. <clears throat> okay, so that is about API server. Next is your scheduler. All right, so scheduler does what? Scheduler is like an HR in your company. Okay, so scheduler is like an HR. What HR does? HR hire people and they assign those resources to the different different teams depending on their specialty and depending on the requirement. Right, that is the responsibility of an HR in an organization. That responsibility is being fulfilled by the scheduler here. Consider I want to create a container. Okay, pod container, you can use these keywords interchangeably, but as of now, I am using container keyword because I haven't told you about pods right now. I hope you might be knowing with the previous lectures, but I'll explain you again. So, as of now, I'll be addressing them as a container. So, if you have a container and you want to create a container, you will come to your API server with the kubectl command, definitely. All right. Now, your scheduler is going to be the one who is going to assign the node to that particular container. Okay. Scheduler will decide, okay, this container should go on node one. This container should go on node two. Depending on multiple factors, we'll discuss about those factors as well in the later stages. But as of now, understood that this node has higher resourcing. Okay, this rose, uh, this node has some specific uh, importance with your storage. All right, so we have multiple nodes with different different specifications. This is CPU highly based. This is memory based. This is storage based. Okay, so depending on your requirement, depending on the scheduler decision, your container will be assigned to a particular node. It will do the scheduling. Okay, that's about your scheduler. Next is your controller manager. So controller manager is a kind of manager and it is a combination of multiple managers. Okay, controller manager is not a single component. You have multiple controller managers, but if I talk about in general, controller manager is the one which matches your desired state equals to actual state. Okay. So we have multiple controllers like your node controller, your pods container. Okay. We have deployment. We have daemon set. We are going to discuss about all of them in detail in depth. But as of now, they all are called controller manager. And what is the responsibility of container management? Container management makes sure that your actual state is equal to your desired state. What does that mean? Consider I have a requirement that I need four containers of my application running all the time. Okay, across the node, it can be across the nodes. No problem with that. Okay, my application, I have a requirement that my application container should be four at a time for the load balance purpose or for my application purpose. 
so at a, any point of any given point of time my actual state, my desired state should be four so who is going to make sure that uh, to that all time your four containers are running your controller manager is the one who is going to make sure that you have four containers running all the time it means because of any reason because of a problem or something reason i went to this node and i deleted this container maybe intentionally maybe accidentally so what will happen my desired state was four but my actual state has become three right i asked for four containers but now only three containers are running so now controller manager will come into picture controller manager will see that desired state is four but actual state is three so what controller manager is going to do controller manager is going to create that container again itself there is no human intervention required and this concept is called self healing okay this concept is called self healing in kubernetes it means because of some reason if this container goes down or this container goes deleted your controller and manager is going to create a container itself without any human intervention that will be done automatically okay that is one thing that is one of your controller manager role consider because of some reason your node is not reachable right your node went unreachable so your container also goes down so your controller manager is going to take the responsibility to migrate that container or create the similar container on some other available node okay so that is the responsibility of your controller manager all right and the last component is your etcd okay so what is etcd etcd is your database okay all the information about your cluster that how many nodes are there how many containers are running how many pods are running how many deployment daemon set or any other object all the information about your cluster is stored in your etcd database okay and etcd database is your uh, database with key value pair okay it is not a sql type of database it doesn't create tables or something like that etcd is a database with key value pair you will have a key and you will have a value and it will show the details like that so that is the responsibility of your etcd consider that i executed a command of kubectl get nodes it means i want to know the details about my nodes how many nodes are there in my cluster so how the flow is going to be your kubectl will give the command kubectl get nodes it will ask your api server that i api server tell me how many nodes are there in my cluster api server will say okay fine i'll do that i'll check so api server will ask the etcd database because all the information are stored in your etcd so it will ask etcd that how many nodes are there etcd will fetch the details and give it to the api server back and then api server will give you the results on the screen that how many nodes are there in your cluster okay so team these are the four components of your master node now if you have any questions now you can ask i'll be taking questions now Okay, a big one from Adjutica Guest. If we have multiple master nodes and 20 to 30 worker nodes, <clears throat> then uh, when we can set up Kubernetes cluster, then token we get to installation is on all the worker nodes. Is there a best way? any best approach to do in the real time scenario okay adurica guest you have a long question that if you have multiple worker nodes say 20 or 30 and if you want to gen, uh, have the token uh, with cube ctl uh, uh, sorry cube adm join command okay so if you want to do it on the 20 or 30 nodes is there any better way to do that so that can be done with some other devops tools not by the kubernetes say uh, you have your ansible ansible is a configuration management tool you can have that same command same token executed on 20 to 30 worker nodes with a single point okay that can be done with other devops tools and your configuration management tools for say ansible Shiju, 
you are asking, isn't that the API server that receive instruction from the controller manager to create the container and communicate to Kubelet on the worker nodes uh, and make it happen? Yes, Shiju, that it is. But I think you are one step ahead. You are asking about the Kubelet. Kubelet is a worker component that I haven't discussed as of now. Okay, I have just given the brief idea on the higher level how these four components works. Okay, API server is a single point of contact. If any worker node component wants to talk to master, it will talk to API server. If any master components want to interact with each other, say controller manager to etcd, your uh, API server will come into picture as a mediator. So all the things happen through API server. It receives instruction from everywhere. These four components we can install on different machine. No couple, you have to install all these four components on a single machine. Okay, there are two ways of installation: hardware and QBDM way. I'll tell you about both of them. All right, but you have a master, and all those components must be running on the master itself. If you go QBDM way, it will do it automatically. Editing a guest, uh, no container uh, runs in master node. Uh, I guess I'll come back to your question later. Okay, I'll ask the same question to all of you, and then you will answer me that if container runs on the master node or not. ETC will contain all containers ID and other specification. Yes, Anil, all the details will be stored in the ETC. Sanjay, can we? Uh, can you explain? Uh, call flow for one container creation. Sanjay, yes, I'll do that once I'll discuss about the components of your worker nodes. After that, I'll do that. Arjun, you're asking, can we uh, access ETCD directly to view the data inside the files? Uh, yes, Arjun, if you want to see the details of ETCD, you can do that as well. But that is not required, although all the commands you do with a kubectl command. But still, if you want, you can do that. We can take the backup also of ETCD. In fact, in your examination also, they do ask how you can take the backup and restore your ETCD database. This kind of question comes. Okay, uh, okay, and we'll cover that also. Siddharth, can we have uh, multiple master node? If yes, how the ETCD is syncing up? It is automatically by design. Yes, Siddharth, we can have multiple uh, master node. Even if I'll tell you honestly, in real-time organization, it is always suggested to have at least three master nodes. Okay, and Kubernetes is the one who is going to manage your ETCD. It will keep it in sync. Okay, no manual work required there. Sarat, what's special about CNCF project? I could see ETCD as a C, uh, separate CNF, CF, uh, CNCF project. CNF, uh, CNCF is an organization, is a foundation that manages some software that are known, uh, not owned by your organization who generated them. For example, I'll say that Kubernetes was originated in Google. Okay, after that, Kubernetes, uh, your Google gave it up as an open source. All right. So if you want to have some certification, if you want to have some expertise in some tools where you can showcase your skills for that purpose, certification comes to picture. Now for open source tools, how you're going to have that? Because no company is there who is going to manage certification for that. So CNCF is an organization which helps you with some uh, open source tools where you can earn certification and showcase your skills. So CNCF doesn't hold the certification only for your CKA, CKA or CKAD. It holds certification from other tools as well. <coughs> Akhil, is there any command to see the ATCD details? Akhil, all the details that you see uh, with kubectl command, as I told you, kubectl get nodes and you get are details that how many nodes are there. You do kubectl get pods. You get all the details how many pods are there. You, you do kubectl get pods hyphen o wide. It means you are asking about all the details. So that is the way how you get the details from etc database. How etcd differs, uh, differs from uh, CSI in team storage in Kubernetes? Edirica guess. Okay, CSI, uh, can you explain in detail? I'm not sure how you're talking about this. Yeah. 
is edcl command part of ck uh, yes jagannath sometimes they do ask it is not a mandate that you will get that question okay but yes etcd cl command is also important for your examination point of view and i'll tell you that also when we come to that part okay so many questions on edcd can we use edcd outside the master node yes you can use your edcd outside but there is no use actually okay etcd is used by the master components etcd is accessed by api server if you take the backup of your etcd somewhere else as well it is of no use because api server is the one who uses your etcd is there any uh, link for stateful set stateful and stateless with etcd akhil i am not sure what is your question stateful and stateless is a type of property of your objects if you talk about etcd it is a stateful set if i'll talk about that okay container storage interface so uh, yes i do recall guys that is a different concept okay we are not going in details about your container storage interface because it is about your container details only okay it so the details about your containers only but etcd is the one which holds the details about your complete cluster not just about your containers also about your services also about your uh, your kubernetes services your uh, nodes your components everything about that joydeep i got your message i mean externalize etcd out of the master node and refer to the etcd okay no joydeep that doesn't work like that you have to have your etcd on the master node itself akhil can you please explain about stateful set and stateless properties okay akhil stateful properties are there uh, for example consider that you you have a database okay that is a stateful it means stateful means that with time the state of your object is changing you have a database you have some insert commands you have some update commands you insert new data you eject some data you delete some data so it is dynamic in nature your database state is changing every second whenever a command is executed against it okay so that is your stateful property what is your stateless property consider you have an application you are using that from your browser okay so on browser if you refresh it again and again again and again again and again it is not going to change it is going to be just like that so that is a stateless property okay so you can use a stateless object again and again but it properties its state is not going to change stateful properties are the objects whose state get changed whenever we do some update or deletion or increasing anything like that since etcd is a key value uh, pair kind of db can we put our own details in terms to let say environment variables across cluster siddharth you have your environment variables sub, uh, topic also in kubernetes we are going to cover that but we don't do that directly into etcd okay you do have environment variables in kubernetes but we define as it as a separate object we'll see that in further classes so basically controller manager does the job of monitoring all, all the nodes and pods yes i did guys at this point you can understand it just like that okay we are going to discuss about controller manager in depth later on where you will discuss all the components all the type of controller managers okay siddharth no we cannot put our own details in the etcd database okay if if you want to create a database as a container to store your own details you can have your database containers also okay for example you have mysql container image you can use that create your own container but etcd is specifically designed to hold the details about your kubernetes cluster not your own details
do we have stateful and stateless application demo uh, also could you please provide a scenario of stateful and stateless example akhil yes uh, like all the application containers that we are going to create whether it is your nginx or tomcat that is going to be an example of your <coughs> stateless application okay that is going to be an example of your stateless application we have a stateful set also an object in kubernetes and we are also going to cover that not right away i guess on the third or fourth week possibly okay but we do have stateful set in kubernetes also where we can create your database containers and we'll cover that also all right anything else okay so team hold on your questions first discuss about the components of your worker nodes and then once our complete architecture is created complete we'll take few more questions and then we'll do the installation so now what are your worker nodes component first and the most important is your kubelet all right next is your uh, cri next is your proxy okay so these are the three components of your worker nodes now let's understand about them first is your kubelet okay what is the responsibility of kubelet if i give an example if i tell you <coughs> kubelet is a teacher in our school okay i'll give an example consider we have a school right in that school you have a principal that principal is your master node all right and you have so many classrooms you have uh, classrooms from all the classes all right so in all the classes you have a teacher right in all the classes you have some teachers who are going to manage that particular class and all the reporting from that class will go to the principal via teacher only okay so your master node or your api server is a principal okay your kubelet is a teacher of all the classrooms okay one teacher will all will be there in all the classes one kubelet will be there on all the nodes all right and your containers you can consider your containers as your students okay in any school if you have students you can consider your students as containers so in one single classroom you can have multiple containers you can have multiple students but you will have going to have one teacher similarly in all the worker nodes you can have n number of containers but kubelet is going to be one who is going to manage them <clears throat> okay so kubelet take care of all the components on your worker node whether it is your container or anything else it will make sure that your containers are up and running it is take all the instruction from the api server consider that one pod is scheduled on your node one okay so scheduler will decide that node one is going to have that container api server will instruct the kubelet okay api server will instruct the kubelet that your node has been assigned to create this container so create a container on your node itself so kubelet is going to take the responsibility all right kubelet is the agent of all your worker nodes now consider a request came that you have to create one container now kubelet is going to create uh, have a container runtime interface what is your container runtime interface it is simply your docker software okay you have to install your docker software on all the nodes so kubelet will instruct to docker then consider your docker is your monitor in the class okay so when teacher assign some uh, doing some work it will create a monitor from the students who will manage the class for that time so docker is a container runtime interface it will take the instruction from kubelet to create a container or delete a container all the container related commands will be executed by docker itself and it will be instructed by the docker kubelet if you want to have some another type of uh, cri you can have it for example you can have your uh, container d lxc lxz okay you can have any type of cri next is your proxy so what is your proxy proxy helps in your networking consider that you have one 
container running on node one and one container is running on your node two on node three okay inside a kubernetes cluster all your containers can talk to each other in any cluster in a complete closed environment or cluster whether your container is residing on node one or node two or node three they are allowed to communicate to each other and that happens with the help of the kube proxy kube proxy provide the networking so that you can have your containers talking to each other across nodes okay for that purpose we install a cni as well okay so what is cni <coughs> cni is your container runtime interface <coughs> So you have to install CNI as well separately. Okay, so you have to have your network plugin also. So Kubernetes is doing all the things. Why it is not providing you networking functionality? Can anyone tell me why Kubernetes is not providing uh, network plugins? Docker. If you talk about your Docker containers, if you talk about Docker Swarm, they have their own network. Okay, that is called CNM. in docker or docker swarm they provide their own networking but kubernetes doesn't provide any networking plugins why they can do that but why they don't kushag do no that is not the answer anyone else who can try why kubernetes doesn't provide you network interface when it can Shiju, you are absolutely correct. Siddharth, you are also. Nitesh, yes, orchestrator can also provide you uh, functionality of CNI. Also, me, okay, to some extent, yes. Edirica, yes, by default they do, but with the help of some components, right? Anil, no, no, that is not the case. Ashok, yes, to the some extent you are right. No idea, guys. Open source, okay, Sanjay, all right. Okay, so team, let me give you the answer. Okay, Rishabh, okay, got it. All right. So team, I told you that in Kubernetes you can have any CRI. you can have your docker you have container id you have you can have container d you can have lxc you have lxc you can have cryo you can have rocket okay so if you have docker you can have a proper networking but if you have another if you are using container d how your kubernetes is going to manage all the cnis for that you have a lot of variety with containerization tool docker cryo lxc lxc how kubernetes is going to know that which cni is going to be there for that particular cri so kubernetes say bring your own container and bring your own network as well okay because network is dependent on your container cri okay so if you are bringing your own own cri bring your own network as well okay that is the reason for that okay so team these are all components of your kubernetes architecture okay all same are mentioned here also that i have mentioned okay api server listens on the default port number 6443 okay 6443 is a default port number for api server all right key value pairs are there for your etcd i told you controller manager manages your actual state with desired state all these components i have already told you all right cni the cni supported by your cube uh, kubernetes are a lot you have 10 to 12 uh, cri support but most use are flannel beef and calico okay we'll be using beef for our own but you can use any it doesn't provide any difference okay that is complete to your call <clears throat> all right now if you have any questions you can ask Shijo, uh, what is C Advisor? C Advisor is not a mandate component. We are talking about the mandate components. 
of uh, Kubernetes. Anil, I'll come to QBDM and services also. Okay, QBDM is not a component. QBDM is an installation way. I'll come to that part also. That is my next part. <coughs> Arjun, can you please summarize network dependency one more time? Arjun, uh, networking is there so that you have a complete cluster, right? You have multiple worker nodes. So it is important that uh, your consider maybe your database pod is running on node one and your application pod, pod is running on node three. Okay, so it is very important here that your both the containers should talk to each other, but they are across nodes. All right, so it is important that these two containers should be able to talk to each other across node. For that purpose, we need networking and kube proxy is a component that allows that kind of communication. All right, and that networking is also not provided by default by the Kubernetes. You have to bring your own CNI, Flannel, Weave, Calico. These are the type of uh, network plugin you can use any. When I'll do the installation, I'll show you that practically as well. Yes, Rishabh, these are third party CNIs. Jagannath, yes, Kubelet is also required on the master component, but as I said, your master components are specific to your master component, okay? But your worker node components are also on their master. That is the difference. Akhil, yes, you can create your different CIDR block as well, okay? Although it is not required, but if you want, you can have your own CIDR block. Sri Rama, you are asking, can you have different uh, CRIs across nodes? No, uh, Sri Rama, you should have a single CRI across your cluster, not even across node one or node two or worker nodes, across your cluster. One cluster, one CRI. Ashok, you want me to explain CRI again? CRI is not a nothing. It is just a containerization software installation. Okay. If you want to have Docker container, Docker is going to be your CRI. Container, runtime, interface. That's all. So whatever the containerization technology you are using, that is called CRI. If you have installed Docker, Docker is going to be your CRI. If you are having a container D, then container D is going to be your CRI. If you are using Cryo, Cryo is going to be your CRI. That's all about it. Can we control Kubelet with kubeadm command as flows kubeadm, uh, kubelet, api server and kubelet? Sumit. Uh, yes, Sumit. Yes, we can do that. I'll explain that in detail later on as kubelet is runs as a service, not as a component. I'll show you that later uh, during the installation. Ashok, you're asking what is the roles and how it works. So role is an advanced topic of Kubernetes. As of now, we are discussing about the architecture itself. So we'll come to the roles as well, but after some time. Master can be a VM and workers can be in servers, right? If we have to deploy a bare metal. Yes, Sarat, you can definitely have that, but you have to set up your own networking across those machines, okay? You can have any kind of infrastructure. You can have a VM, you can have an in-situ instances, but proper networking has to be set up there. <clears throat> if you are using Docker, we uh, no need CNI. Edureka guess no, if you are using Docker as your CRI, still you have to bring your own CNI, okay? Docker CNI is helpful when you use Docker Swarm, but we are using Kubernetes. So you have to bring your own CNI with Docker as well. Can you explain more about CNI, how it works? Couple, if you allow me, I will do the installation, then I'll explain you more on CNI. It will be more clear to you. As of now, I have explained you everything on the drawing, but when I'll do practically, you will understand better. If CNI is outside Kubernetes, then what is proxy? Little more elaboration. Anil, yes, I'll do all the elaboration. When I'll do the uh, installation, I'll show you all the components thoroughly and it will be more clear to you then.
Okay, Sri Rama, I think I answered your questions already. Sumit, can we control cubelet and cube uh, as a flow? Okay, Sumit, I think we have already discussed that. I'll let you know about the cubelet a little bit later. Joy, can we restrict cube proxy only between two nodes where has pod one and pod two? No, Joy, that is not the case. Cube proxy is managed by your Kubernetes itself. Okay, you won't have much say with the cube proxy. You'll see that. Can we have different OS kernels across nodes? Jagannath, yes, you can have, but it is always suggested to have all your worker nodes on the same platform. You can have different platform, but it is not recommended. Uh, Sarat, uh, CIDR is not important. If you don't know about that, CIDR is an IP range, IP uh, block, where you can have your containers created in that IP range. Okay, so that is not important as of now. You can ignore that. Is CNI manages the master and custom network since uh, master IP address is not coming under CIDR block. We provide. See, master components are different. If you have mentioned any CIDR block, that CIDR block will be used for your user managed containers. But if you talk about your master and worker node component, they don't uh, strictly follow your CIDR block. CNI depends on CRI use set. Does that uh, mean flannel? Kushagra, I didn't say that CNI depends on CRI. Okay. It is not the case. CNI doesn't depend on CRI. It is just Kubernetes says that if you are bringing your own CRI, you bring your own CNI. So there is no link that uh, Docker works with flannel only. Container D works on Vivo only. It is not the case. You can have any kind of CNI. You can have any kind of CNI. There is no link between them. But you have to bring both the things at your own. Okay, I think all the questions are covered as of now. Okay, that was a big time this time. All right, so team, as you have understood the architecture, now we are going to do the installation part. All right, so there are two ways of doing the installation. One is your hard way, second is your cube ADM way. Before explaining these ways, I want to ask a question to you. Maybe that was covered earlier or not, I am not sure, but I hope you can answer. Your Docker is installed on all your worker nodes. Okay, your worker nodes, you have your Docker. Do I need to install Docker on your master node as well? Question for you people. Do I need to install Docker on your master node as well? Nitesh, Eduriga guest, you are not right. Kapil, wrong answer. Anil, wrong answer. Gopal, again, wrong answer. Sri Rama, wrong answer. Govinda, Sumit, Kushagra, wrong answer. Okay, so team, I have taken the name of the people who have not given the right answer. Joydeep, again, wrong answer. All right, apart from that, who else have answered, answered it correctly? Now I'll tell you the reason. Okay, so now there are two ways of installation. One is your hard way, second is your cube ADM way. Hard way, as the name suggests, is actually the hard way. All right, so you have to assign some master node. You have to install your API server separately, your scheduler separately. You have to install your ATCD database. You have to install your controller manager separately. Everything needs to be done manually. Okay, that is why it is called hard way. With kubeadm way, kubeadm is a utility that help you install all the components with a single go. Okay, so kubeadm way is the way which is widely used nowadays. Your examination also come on the kubeadm way. 
so you don't have to go hard way and that is also not recommended because the same thing can be done with cube atm with very ease okay so we are also going to do it with the cube atm way now the next thing is all the components are installed automatically with cube atm how that is done cube atm creates all these components api server scheduler controller manager etcd docker or docker is already installed proxy proxy and okay all these components runs as a container on your master node you have these four master components api server scheduler controller manager etcd all these four components run on your master node as a container when you do it cube adm way master node also because all the master components are also running as a container when you need a container you need a docker okay i hope it is clear to you shall we move to the installation now great thank you <clears throat> okay so for the installation steps also you have everything on this repository i have shared with you you have to go to the install folder you don't have to read all these uh, readme files you just have to go to the bottom of this page and all the steps are mentioned here yes kushagra you don't need docker on the master if you are doing it hard way okay you are installing all the master components at your own so you don't need docker on your master node until unless you want to assign some nodes some containers on your master node itself otherwise you can ignore that okay so someone was asking that if you want to create your cluster on the uh, linux flavor or red hat flavor or on uh, centos flavor yes you can do so i have created the documentation here for you if you want to do the installation on ubuntu all the steps are here step 1 step 2 and step 3 but if you want to do it on the centos like flavor i have set up all the commands here itself okay so if you want to create a cluster on the centos flavor you can do that also with all the steps mentioned here but in the class we are going to follow the ubuntu side all right now again i am going to create the nodes for that all right i have already created kubernetes master machine it is just a blank machine nothing is installed there i have just named it like that i have created your node one let me create one more machine <coughs> for your kubernetes node two okay k node two zone i'm going to keep it like this same 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 sorry not debian ubuntu 18 select sorry <clears throat> okay now i'm going to connect to these machines Yes, Kapil. If you want to do the hardware, uh, hardware installation steps are also there in the GitHub repository. At your guess, in the examination you get Ubuntu flavor. Okay, that's why we are following it on the Ubuntu. Okay, I am connected to all my machines. These are completely blank machines as of now. i'll switch to the root user okay i am connected to all my machines these are completely blank machines as of now <coughs> i'll 
fish to the root user. All right, so I'm connected to all my machines. Now I'm going to do the installation. So team, all the steps that I have mentioned in the GitHub repository, these are all standard steps. These are uh, taken up from the Kubernetes website itself. Okay, all these are official steps, nothing of my own. So you can rely on that. I have just copied it here so that you can have everything at one place. But these are the official documentation step itself. So first step is your own. You have need to step one executed on all the nodes, whether it is your master node or your worker node. These steps need to be installed on all the machines. First, you are just installing some transport and certificate responsibilities. Then I'm going to do the Docker installation. Docker installation is also required on all the machines as we have already discussed. Then we are going to install kubelet, kubeadm, kubectl on all the nodes. Okay. So these are the steps. Let me copy paste it on all the machines. I'm simply going to copy paste all of them. Okay, it is done on my one machine. On second as well. Third as well. Sumit, so, that is your call. Okay, for the lab purpose, I'm doing everything from the root user. If you want to create a different user and do all the things with that, you can do it from the different user as well. Once your Docker installed, I'm going to install your Kubernetes components. Just not executed on this one. <laughs> All right, your Kubernetes components now. So once your all cube related components are installed, now you have to decide which machine is going to be your master. Okay, so which machine is going to be your master? Now you have to make decision. As of now, all the commands have been executed on all the machines. Now, when you want to decide that which machine is going to be your master and which machine is going to be your node, you have to make sure that you understand the concept of cube ADM in it and cube ADM join. Okay, the machine that you want to make as your master, you have to initialize it with cube ADM init command. Okay, cube ADM init command is the initialization command. And if I talk about in a 
technical term this is called boot strapping your cluster okay in layman language if you want to initialize your cluster if you want to initialize your master it is cube adm in it if you talk about the technical term if you want to bootstrap your cluster you have to decide your master with cube adm in it command okay so wherever you're going to execute your cube adm in it command it is going to become your master so here it is on master only you have to run this sudo cube adm in it command if you execute this much only it is going to be enough ignore pre uh, pre flight error it is optional arguments if you want to pass you can if you don't you cannot you don't all right so it is optional pre flight errors are if sometime it gives some warnings messages and it stop your installation because warning messages are just warning without them you can proceed with your installation that is why this argument has been passed if you don't want you can ignore it so i am going to execute this on your machine which i want to read as a master this is my master machine i am going to execute cube adm in it it is going to initialize or simply say it is going to bootstrap your cluster so team installation is a important part for your examination point of view also so we are going a little slow here all right we'll make sure that everything is clear to you it is an important part Okay, so team, it is important that you see this message that your Kubernetes control plane has been initialized. It means your master has been identified. <clears throat> All right. After that, once your Kubernetes control plane, control plane is simply your master, has initialized successfully. All right. Now to start using your cluster, you need to run the following command as a regular user. All right. So let me copy paste it somewhere. else first and then i'll explain you the significance of all the commands okay so team if i'll see kubectl hyphen hyphen version or kubectl version it is sorry my bad So if you will see that your Kubernetes version is installed, your client is installed. It means your kubectl. Kubectl is a client. Kubectl is installed. You can see the version is v one dot two one. All right. Team, hold on your question for a little while. I'll take your question a little bit later. All right. So if I do kubectl version hyphen hyphen short to have a shorter output, you can see the client version is v one dot two one. and then you get a message that the connection to the server local host was refused refused okay so you are getting some errors if i do kubectl get nodes it should get me some output but it is also giving me some error the connection to the server is refused so it is giving me some issues right something is not right why because as of you know if we install java somewhere we have to set up your java class path as well right we have to specify some paths so where your kubernetes config file is present it is not accessible to your kubectl command right now that is why it is giving you error all right so if by default your kubernetes is installed in etc location etc kubernetes okay this is a location where your config files are installed okay this is the main file which you require for your kubectl command all right this is the most important file 
so you have to provide the path of this file as well to get the output okay if i do kubectl hyphen hyphen version hyphen hyphen short and if i give this path also cube config equals to this location and your admin config file can you see the output now you have the server version also earlier it was not visible it was giving you error but once you gave the cube config path it gave you the output again if i'll do the similar with cube ctl get pods or nodes see it is giving you output as of now you just have master that is your control plane master and this is running from last 3 minutes this is your version so now it is giving you output so the thing is you have to give the cube config path now with every command if you are giving you your, your cube config path it is a overload for me i cannot remember the path every time i don't want to give the path every time i want to have this automated and for the same purpose kubernetes has suggested you these options okay it has asked you to create a cube a dot cube folder in your home location i'll execute it okay so if i'll do ls hyphen ltra you can see a dot cube folder is created here now now what i am doing i am copying the same file admin config file to the folder that i have just created all right and i am also changing the ownership of that consider i am not doing this with the root user i want to do it from some other user so i have to change the permission of this executable file i have done that now i don't have to give this cube config i just have to do the command cube ctl get nodes you get the output you want to do cube ctl version you the cube config path now okay so now you are good to go you just have to execute the command you don't have to give the cube config path and that is why these are the steps suggested by kubernetes itself okay alternately we you can export also but this is what you should do next you should now deploy a pod network to the cluster now comes a part of your cni i told you you have installed the docker you have installed the kubelet you have installed the kubectl everything is installed but kubernetes say ping your own cni as well and kubernetes help you with the suggestion as well okay it gives you a link also you have to go to this link copy it and open it in a browser okay here you can see you have a wide variety of network plugins you can have asi anfria calico canal cilium cni geni contev contrail flannel netter a lot of variety is there so it is up to you whichever you want to use you can use as of now i am going to go with a vpnet here is a vpnet one you click on this one and you just need to execute this command okay copy it and execute it the same command i have given in the steps also you can see kubectl apply hyphen f and the vmnet line this is exactly the same like this so that is what i have said i have provided you to everything at a single place otherwise all the steps are from the official documentation itself this is my master kubectl hyphen apply you can see some components are created and that is why it was showing status as not ready because your networking was not available okay there was no network on your cluster and that is the reason your master was in not ready state now once your networking has been created now your master is in ready state here you see earlier it was not ready because there was no networking you have created your networking you have installed your network plugin as suggested by the kubernetes and after that you have the ready state 
so that is about it then you can join any number of worker nodes by running the following command now this is the token command you need to execute on the worker node so that they join your cluster and you can see this is your cube adm join command and this is the ip of my master node if you want to verify you can verify as well my master 10 12802 10 12802 and 6443 i told you this is the port number of your api server so i'll execute this on the worker nodes and worker nodes will connect to your api server of master node and become their worker nodes same command on node 2 as well So on your worker node one, it has been done. On worker node two, it has been done. Come back to your master, kubectl get nodes. Okay, now you can see that your Kubernetes master was already there. Your k node one and k node two are also a part of this cluster now. Okay, both are in ready state, both are none. Okay, because these are not the master, that is why you get a none status. And they were created 32 seconds ago. Okay, so team, this is the complete installation way. All right, uh, here it is. So all the steps are here from the official documentation. These are the commands that we executed already. This is the VNet con uh, connection string. You can do the kubectl get nodes. On the worker nodes, you have to do kube adm join command. That is also provided here. And if you want to do it on the CentOS, you can do on CentOS. How to find a kube adm join token? Consider that later on you want to get, uh, add another node onto your cluster, but you don't have the discovery token this is a command that you can execute to have the token generated again so that you can add any n number of worker nodes later on to your cluster as well okay so all the helpful commands are provided here now i'll take your questions Joy, do we need to remember all these installation steps uh, for CKA exam? Okay, so Joy, the question uh, is good. I hope all of you might be having this question. You don't have to remember all the commands. As I told you, all the commands I have provided you in the repository for the first time installation. Okay, what I will suggest you first set up your cluster from this GitHub repository. And once you are confident that your cluster is up and running, Go to your official documentation and have the installation done by there. Okay, go to the KDS, installing kubeadm. Go to this page. All right, what are the basic commands that you want to execute are all here. And here it is. Ubuntu, Debian, Hyperdose, whichever flavor you want to use, all the commands are here. So if you want to see, significance see if you talk about docker docker will be provided in your examination okay docker will be installed by default you don't have to install your docker so on your examination cluster these things will be done automatically you have to take care of only these commands if they ask you to install the cluster so the same commands are provided here as well you go to this website that is why i suggested you to have it a bookmark have these commands handy Open the tab, simply go to your cluster, uh, your bookmark, and click on this. Simply have these commands copy pasted on your cluster right away. So that is why it helps to have bookmarks. All the commands are available onto here. All right. After that, what's next? Use kubeadm to create your cluster. Click here. This is how your installation should look like. You can see all the output that we have already seen. 
okay all the commands are provided here to create your directories to transfer your config file all right all the commands here you want to have your uh, plugins any plugin you want you can have it all the commands are provided here as well so i suggest you first go from the github repository link all right once you are confident with the installation do try the installation once again from the official documentation as well that is my suggestion Kabil kubeadm comes as container with four components used to install master but see kubeadm install on all the nodes kubeadm i have installed on all the nodes that is optional if you don't want to install kubeadm on all the nodes you can ignore it okay i have installed kubectl also on the worker nodes just to keep everything handy okay you can see i have installed kubectl on your worker node itself but you cannot run kubectl command on your worker nodes all right it is just for a general purpose to keep the step simpler that is why i have installed all the components on all the worker nodes if you want to specifically install kubeadm on master you can do that if you want to install kubectl on your master specifically not on your worker nodes that is also okay once installed cni it will use their own network range or is it possible to change the cid uh, to change the cni default value range couple yes if you want to change the cni range you can change also for that when you do cube uh, init you have provided an argument ignore pre flight errors you are going to give another flag for your cidr where you are going to mention your cidr block range so you can do that as well Ashok, I think your question is already answered. From where I copied all the commands, I have also shown you on the the official website. And you can have this bookmark. All the bookmarks are I have already provided you here. Simply go to other and have your bookmark downloaded from the HTML file. You will have all the bookmarks, whatever I have filled here. Siddharth, it mentioned to run the command as normal user, but I guess you did it as root. Did I miss anything? <clears throat> okay, Siddharth, that is up to you. As of now, I am doing it for the practice purpose. That is why I am doing everything from the root user. If you want to create another user and execute the command from different user, you can do that. But we are doing practice. If we'll talk about the real time scenario, if you are working in an organization, definitely it is suggested to have a different user. but we are just learning the concept that is why i am doing everything from the root user what pl uh, platform we will get one two or uh, got of that is your call when you created the vms you chose which platform you want you can have your ubuntu you can have red hat that is up to you can we open the notepad during exam Masumi, they provide you a notepad space also. Okay, during the examination, they provide you a notepad space where you can do your rough work. In exam, we have to create notes on any public cloud or any other arrangement. Sanjay, they will provide you a up and running cluster. Okay, they will have, they will give you machine terminals directly. all right so you don't have to take care about the back end whether it is gcp or aws they will provide you machine terminal you directly work on there so there is no need to worry about the back end whether it is public or private cloud can a cluster have many nodes yes joy we have already created two worker nodes for this cluster you can have n number of nodes 10 20 13 that is up to you kushagra is it uh, like cni like lanel calico have their predefined cidr yes kushagra by default they use their own predefined cidr you want to give your own specifically you can do that otherwise they will work it at your their own choice please how do i download the bookmarks from my uh, onam simply you can google it otherwise if you want my help i can do that also simply go to your bookmarks all right here have uh, import bookmark and settings you can import here first download this html file and then go to your bookmarks import bookmarks and settings
and somewhere from here you can download your bookmarks mm, just a minute it is a simple process you can google it also if it doesn't help let me know tomorrow i'll help you Gaurav, I got your question during exam only. I don't know what exactly your question is. Please keep your question in a single message. Sir, a three-start strategy for master. We'll discuss that later on. Okay. How to remove a note, how to add a note, how to change your master. Everything will be done, but a little bit later. Can I have a mix? OS VM in a cluster including mix Linux flavor and Windows Linux flavor. No, Siddharth, Linux type of flavor. Uh, you have to have Linux type of flavors, not Windows flavor included inside your cluster. Ideally, your complete cluster should be of the same flavor, whether Ubuntu or Fushi or CentOS. But you can have a different in a same cluster, but it should be of Linux flavor. You can have Sushi, you can have CentOS, you can have Linux, you have Ubuntu. In a same cluster, you can have that. But it is not suggested because it's complicated things. What uh, during exam, what platform will we get Ubuntu or it? Got up, all the examination will be done on the Ubuntu. That is why we have chosen Ubuntu for our labs. Sanjay, can we get exam syllabus, topics, percentage? Uh, Sanjay, on the last day of our course, I am going to show you a complete picture. I will give you so many tips and tricks for your examination as well. But still, if you want to see it right away, you can go to the CNCF website. You go to the certification. Certified Kubernetes Administrator. And here you get the weightage. Okay. Your architecture installation configuration weightage weights 25%. Workload and scheduling 15%, service and networking 25%, storage 10%, troubleshooting 30%. Okay, and you get two hours to complete your examination. Machines in the organization don't allow internet, so can we install cluster there? Kushagra, yes, you can install your cluster there as well, then you have to go the hard way. Ashok, examination fees, I guess it is somewhere around 21,000. I have to double check that. But I think it is somewhere 21,000 rupees in INR. Somewhere around that. Don't remember the exact cost right now. But if you want, I'll come back to you with that. Edurika, I guess you are asking, is there any mock test or question bank that we can learn? At Eureka Guess, all the repository, all the examination guide is provided on the GitHub repository that I have shared with you. Okay, you will get everything here. For example, your examination preparation documents are also here. Okay, CK part one, part two, part three, all the guides are provided here for your examination point of view. Okay, if you want to know all the details about your examination as well, you can see old version of examination has three hours but nowadays you have two hours of examination questions ranges from 18 to 19 questions somewhere around you have in your latest examination way passing percentage has reduced to 66 percent earlier it was 74 percent now you just need to score 66 percent that's all okay all the details are provided here for your examination point of view also okay it will help you thoroughly apart from that you get two attempts for your ck examination okay so if you want to have a real-time scenario, real-time example, you can offer an examination once you clear it is very good. But because of some reason, if you were, couldn't make it, you get second attempt also in the same phase. So one time fees, you get two chances for your examination. Shiju, Sanjay, I think you got your answer for the passing percentage now. How difficult is in the exam? Any idea on the passing percentage in the first? Okay, Arjun, I think you got your answer as well. Okay, so all the things are here in the repository. Go through this repository, play with this repository. It is going to help you a lot. Okay. So team, last thing I want to show you for today. Okay. 
don't ask me much question on that i'll explain you all the things tomorrow i just want to show you a small thing today cube ctl get pods hyphen n cube hyphen system okay so team this is the command with which you can see all the components which are running where okay you can see apis uh, etcd is running on master cube api server is running on master cube controller manager is running on master but you can see three cube proxy why three cube proxy because one proxy is running on on the node on master as well on all worker nodes as well scheduler is running on master vnet containers vnet pods are also running on all the three nodes okay core dns is used for the naming convention okay so this is the command with which you can see all the components which are running pair okay complete explanation i'll be giving you tomorrow about all this okay so as of now i think we are done for today so how was the class a question for you okay great good kushagra good let me know what you want to get for the excellent thank you excellent okay superb all right so team one more thing i hope uh, your previous trainer has also told you that or not i am not sure okay so in edureka it is the excellent trading which actually counts okay good is negligible good is equivalent to bad or something okay so it is very important that you provide your written feedback as well and if you like the content if you like the way i deliver things provide your feedback as excellent if you have any complaints and if you want anything to be changed the way i teach you can give your good bad average as per your choice but do provide a written feedback as well written feedback also matters a lot and if you like provide an excellent so that it counts all right so team i guess uh, we are done for today if you have any questions you can ask if anybody wants to get unmuted you can ask else we are done for today we can have the session tomorrow again and we'll proceed further uh, yes kushal there is a scale ashok yes uh, if everything goes fine if your feedback goes fine if feedbacks come into my favor then you are not going to change any trainer now onwards i'll be completing your complete course all right so team yesterday we have already discussed about uh, some of the agenda from yesterday like cube architecture we did the installation we bootstrap the cluster we checked the components uh, we saw the directory structure folders which i was talking about and uh, the api resources container network and pods these were the topics that we were supposed to cover yesterday but we didn't so we'll start right from there and then we we'll cover these topics we'll see how your multi container pods works we are going to see some commands with pods we we'll see what kind of static pods or init pods are there with we'll see about labels limits and moment variables what are props in kubernetes and what are the services all right so this is the agenda and we'll try to cover it today if not we'll pass it on to the next week but we are not going to rush into anything okay so we are going to start but still if you want to ask any question from yesterday's class anything which was not clear to you which you want to share which you want to discuss so first we can start with that if you have anything from the yesterday's class and then we are going to start for today so if you have any questions you can ask
okay when we want to join to the worker node we need to execute a token certificate if we lost it where can we find it okay got it sure i think this question is from edirica i guess i cannot see your name so you're asking if you lose your token then how you are going to have it back that is what i have provided you in the github repository links you can go to your install folder and this is how you're going to find your token back okay this is the command that you need to execute on the master node and this is going to provide you the token again if you want to add another worker node to your cluster okay in the node or master i have performed all the installation activity as root when i tried to run docker ps or docker images as normal user getting error hope we don't need to worry as k8 will take care of internally got permission denied while trying to connect to the docker socket okay uh gopal uh, we are going to see few commands with docker also but uh, that is not a mandate but uh, we'll see uh, let's see i am going to provide you further steps and if you won't be able to do that then we'll see further what is the issue uh as we are one week behind do we need to finish second week quiz because it's showing deadline for the third and fourth grish okay grish and grish and everyone it is not the case uh, it is okay if you delay your quizzes you can complete your quizzes once we are complete with all the classes you get some grace time once we are done with our eight weeks content then you get some grace period of i guess uh, eight to 10 days and then you can also complete your all the quizzes so no need to rush on that okay all right so team i guess we can start for today all right okay so this is my master note all right <clears throat> and yesterday before leaving i showed you one command cube ctl get pods hyphen n cube hyphen system i don't know if you understand about this command or not yes here it is okay so team one question for you now all right the thing is you can see all the master node components all right all the worker node components are also here etcd api server controller manager proxy is also there scheduler is also there okay you have already seen that we have installed your cri as well separately docker on all the machines still there is one thing missing can anyone tell me what is that uh ashok i don't get your message screen is big unable to see the service i'm not sure what you're trying to say can you please explain more clearly Shishu, yes, you got it. Gopal, you got it too. Venkateshwari, you can see etcd right here. Here it is. Yes, Arjun, you got it. Uh, team, anybody else is uh, facing any chat screen visible to all of you? Uh, Virish, these are the pods. Sanjay, networking is not right. Ganapati uh, database is the etcd, so database is also there.
Joydeep, all pods, these are the pods right here. Okay, Ashok, uh, I think all can see my screen properly. Uh, I am not sure if you are facing any challenge with the screen peak. Uh, can you connect back if that is a problem with you? Uh, Rishabh, as of now, I have specifically mentioned cube system namespace. So that is why you are seeing cube system namespaces, uh, pods. So you cannot see pod of any other namespace right now. I'll come back to that also. I haven't discussed about namespaces right now. I'm just asking as for the architecture, which component is missing? <clears throat> Grish, no network is also there. Sanjay, you got it right. Okay, okay guys. So the thing is, Kubelet is missing. If you remember the architecture, many of you gave me the right answer. All right. So there was one component on the worker nodes that is called Kubelet, which is not there. So Kubelet is not there. Why? Everything runs as a pod. I told you in KubeADMware, but Kubelet is not there. No, Shiju is not like it is inactive. It is active. That is why you get the output of kubectl get nodes. And you guess even all the three proxy, two proxies are coming from the worker node. Sanjay, so you can see the master node components as well. Sorry, worker node component also here. Master can get details from everywhere. No, Gaurav, that is not the case. Some pods are already running on the worker nodes. If you want to see, I can show you that also. See, two VBnet pods are running on worker node one and two. Two proxy pods are running on node one and two. Siddharth, you gave the right answer. Ankur, so do you. Great team. So the thing is that kubelets run as a service. Okay, kubelet is not running as a pod. Kubelet runs as a service on the worker nodes or on all the nodes. Okay, so if you want to verify that your kubelet is working or not, you have to check it if it is running as a service. Service kubelet status. Okay, so you can see that kubelet here is running as a service. Okay, so this is you have to remember that kubelet is not a pod. Kubelet is a service. All right. So we have already seen all the components which are working here. Uh, Ashok, uh, still you are facing the challenge with the screen size. Okay. Ashok, there is some challenge from your end only because I cannot uh, see any other complaint from any other candidate. So it has something to do with at your end only. If I'm going to reduce the size, it is not going to be uh, very visible to all of you. Otherwise, the content I want to show. If you are connecting from your mobile, I'll suggest you to connect from a laptop so that it will be visible properly to you. Uh, so is it better now? I have reduced the size of the window. Ashok, is it better now? Uh, Ashok, I cannot reduce the size uh, more than that because it is going to hide the content for all other people. Yes, please try login again. Okay, guys. Okay, so this is what we have seen so far. And I think if this command still are working or not, let me see.
okay let it be now uh, let it be for now all right so team the next question <clears throat> now you understand the architecture completely right so here was the architecture all right so consider that i gave a request to create a pod or container something like that so how the flow is going to be now okay so any command i am going to give with the cube ctl i want to create some pod i want to create some container so how the flow is going to be <clears throat> i'll give the command with cube ctl it will be heard by api server first okay api server will listen to the request and it will check with the scheduler that at which node is capable enough to have that pod or container okay so api server will check with scheduler and scheduler will see depending on the details stored in etcd that how many nodes are there how many worker nodes are there what are the capabilities of the worker nodes which node has what configuration how much ram is there how much storage is there okay so scheduler via api server will check the details from etcd and once it get the details that this node is properly suitable for that scheduler will instruct api server that you should recite your container on node 2 and thus api server will connect with a kubelet of node 2 and it will instruct to create a container on that node after kubelet gets a request kubelet will ask docker to create a container on the node 2 this is how your complete flow is going to be okay so next thing is what is your pod and what is your container what is the difference between a pod and a container sanjay the role of the controller is to maintain the actual state with desired state consider that i want 10 pods running all the time and because of some reason if i deleted one of my pod accidentally from the node it is going to check that if actual state is matching the desired state it will see that desired state was 10 pods but actually only 9 pods are running so controller is going to spin off one another pod automatically without your intervention that is the role of controller uh yes okay so team the thing is that a pod and a container is nothing different but just a wrapper around your container okay there is a container and if you wrap a container with a layer of kubernetes object called pod then still it is going to be the same okay so it is identical a container is same as a pod in kubernetes only the difference is it add a additional layer called pod in kubernetes but why kubernetes wrap another layer okay now that is a question if a pod is also a container just a wrapper around it why we are having a different terminology the thing is whenever you delete a pod sorry a container whenever a container restart it changes its ip and it changes its ports okay thing is whenever you delete a pod or whenever you restart sorry whenever you delete a container whenever you restart a container when you want to create a similar container again what happens every time the ip of the container changes and the port number also get change okay so that is the story with docker containers why kubernetes have pods uh, additional layer around the container because the container ip is going to be changing every time as a basic nature of docker container whenever the container restarts whenever the container is deleted and re uh, recreated the ip of the container is going to get changed the port number of the container is going to get changed as a basic nature of docker container but in kubernetes 
pod provides you that functionality which doesn't change the IP of the container. Okay, the IP inside the pod of the container will keep on changing, but the IP of the pod will remain same throughout until unless you delete the pod directly. Okay, whether your container restarts, whether, uh, whether your container gets deleted and recreated, if your pod is still there, the IP is going to stay consistent with pods in Kubernetes. Okay, uh, the thing is, what is the role of Kubelet in master? Uh, Sarat, as I told you that Kubelet is a class teacher in your class, which take care with of all the components, right? So there are some static pods as well. I'm going to tell you about that concept. For that purpose, we need Kubelet on master. So I'll answer your question practically a little bit later in today's class itself. But pod deployment, uh, pod deployment and replica sets are given in controller. It should instruct to API server. Uh, it should instruct to scheduler via API. Uh, Sanjay, I'll show you the flow practically, okay? Allow me some time. As of now, I'm explaining you about the Docker containers and Kubernetes pod. So let's understand about that first. Yes, Girish. You're right. We have elastic IPs here. Okay. So the thing is, pod doesn't change its IP, which provides some good functionality with Kubernetes because Kubernetes is going to address the pod every time. In Kubernetes, you don't address the container, you address the pod. And the IP of the pod is going to stay consistent whether your pod gets restarted or not. Okay. So that is one major benefit in pods. Next thing. Consider that you have two interdependent uh, containers. Okay, so you have an Nginx container which is serving as your application container, and second is your Splunk container which is getting the logs from the first container and completing your functionality. Okay, so your requirement is that you have an application container and you have a log container which is getting all the logs from your primary container. If you talk about Docker, okay, if you talk about Docker, you can see that both the containers are dependent to each other. If your Nginx container goes down, means your application is down, what is the purpose of Splunk? It cannot get logs from anywhere, right? Similarly, if your Splunk container goes down, your application is running, but you are not able to fetch the logs. Still, my purpose is lost. Okay, so the thing is, I have two containers which are interdependent on each other. If one goes down, another one is useless for me. Right, so that is the story about Docker containers. So it is a problem for me. Now, consider inside a pod, it is always suggested to have one container inside one pod. Okay, it is always suggested to have one container inside one pod, but depending on the requirements, you can have multiple containers inside a pod as well. Okay, so both the containers will have their own IP addresses and still you will have a single IP for your pod as well. Inside your pod, you have two containers, but pod IP address is going to remain just one. All right, because they both are serving as the same functionality. It runs as an application and it gets the logs. So both the containers are dependent on each other. That is why I am putting both the container inside a single pod. If you want to see how it works, you can see here as well. Can you see VBnet pods? In VBnet pods, you are seeing two by two. It means inside a pod, there are two containers running and both the containers are up and ready. For all the others, you can see one by one. One by one means inside one pod, there is one container only. But if you see for the VBnet, VBnet has some functionality. That is why it has two containers inside one pod and both the containers are up and running. If one container goes down, it will show you one by two and it will show you not ready. That is the feature of having two containers inside a pod. 
if my two containers are interdependent to each other consider that my splunk container goes down because of some reason my pod will show not ready status or unavailable status that is why we have two containers or more than one containers inside a pod if they are interdependent if one container goes down the whole pod will not be available for the purpose consider your application pod goes container goes down your splunk container is there still my pod will be unavailable so this container will also won't work at all okay so team i hope containers and pod is clear to you what is the difference between a container and what is a pod let me know if you have any questions if it is clear to you then we are going to have some practical things okay gopal sanjay got your answers prishab okay thank you ankur all right so team let's move forward all right and let's start creating your pod now now you understand the concept of pod now we can create pods will be do demo of creating a multiple container and pod yes anurag that is what we are going to do real soon today itself okay i'll show you multi container pods as well all right so team as i told you that your kubernetes has pod as an object not your docker containers all right so you like replica set and deployment so if you want to know that how many objects are there there is a command called kubectl api resources okay so team you can see all the objects that are there in kubernetes kubectl api resources they are binding component statuses config maps endpoints events limit range name spaces nodes are there as we have already done kubectl get nodes right we have pods we have persistent volume claims and a lot many objects are there we are going to learn about all the objects that is the thing we are going to learn about all the objects okay so these are the complete name if you want to use short names as well you can use a short names as well okay like for nodes if you don't want to or don't want to write complete nodes you can use no as well right if you want to see kubectl get no see i still got the output so these are the short forms if you want to use short names you don't want to use the complete name because some names are really big like you can see this one or this one this one you have a lot of objects with long name so if you want to use a short name you can use a short name as well so this is one of the command that i wanted to show you now consider in docker if you want to create a container you use docker run command okay so you will see that so many commands in kubernetes are very similar to your docker commands okay you are going to see that so first of all if i want to see if any pods are running or not qctl get pods is the command okay as of now you can see no resources found in default namespace now i want to create some pod in docker i run do docker run in kubernetes also i do kubectl run kubectl run and let's name a pod as show then i have to give the image which image it must be using for say i'll use nginx image right now okay so this is the syntax kubectl run your pod name hyphen hyphen image and then give the image name you will see that a pod is created kubectl get pods okay 
Now you can see a pod is running. There is one container inside it and one is also ready. So the status is running, that's why, and the age is 20 seconds. Now if I want to have a better look to it, I'll do kubectl get pods hyphen o wide. It is going to give you a wider output or a lot of details. Okay, so you can see the name ready running status restart as of now it is has not restarted age is 44 seconds and this is the IP if you want to curl this IP you can see uh, nginx output here See you get the message welcome to nginx when I curl the IP Okay, it is also showing you that it is residing on K node 2 All right, I told you that Kubernetes scheduler decide where your pod is going to be living. It decided it as node 2 and that is why you can see this pod is running on node 2. Okay, so if I'll show you something more about this. If you want to get more details about your pod, you can do kubectl describe pod and pod name. Okay, it is going to give you a lot more details about your pod. Okay, from here it started. It gives you name, namespace. You can see where the it is running, where it started. All right, the IP. What is the container ID actually? Which image it is? Okay, so a lot more details. Important part is here. The events. So team, with the events, you can see the complete flow, how it actually went. First of all, when I gave the command from API, uh, kubectl to API server, API server check with the scheduler, and scheduler decided that this pod should be assigned to node 2. Afterward, the responsibility went to kubelet of your node 2, and it pulled the image of nginx, it successfully pulled the image in this much time and then it created the container and then it started the container okay this is your complete flow how it goes when you request something to kubernetes whenever you create any object is it clear to all of you Yes, Ganapati, you can use hyphen O white to get a wider output. If there are more details with any command, it is going to show you that. Achirika, I guess you're asking, can we force to create image to specific node? I think you want to create a pod with a specific node. Yes, we can do that and we'll see that also. Yes, we'll see that. We can do that. Sanjay, how many pods can be created in one node? Okay, there is a lot. Okay, so it was never a situation to reach, reach the limit. That is why I'm not sure. Still, you can see the capacity here. All right. Afterwards uh, of 19th version, there cannot be 5,000 nodes, more than 5,000 nodes. Not more than uh, 1,000, 1.5 lakh of total pods. Okay, 3 lakhs of total container, not more than 100 pods per node. So this is the limits. It's saying container means nginx, uh, what about pod? <clears throat> okay, Grish pod is already there. Pod is a logical wrapper around your container. So if your container is running on node 2, Kubernetes is going to identify it as a pod. Okay, so in description, it is giving you all the details. Description is a complete detail, right? So if a container is created inside a pod, it is giving you the events about that only. This container was created inside a pod. This container was started inside a pod, and that is why you are getting the output of kubectl get pods like this. We saw that this pod is running on your node 2. 
we can verify that as well i'll come to your note 2 okay docker is already installed here docker ps grep show okay here you can see this is your container id this is your image this was running from last five minutes and these are the details so you get the container running on your node 2 you can verify that with docker command as well okay so now we have seen the description also in description you get all the details about your pod all the details about your container and all the event logs are also there all right but in enterprise level at enterprise level we don't create a container or pod from the command line with like just i did like kubectl run pod pod name that is not the practice that we actually follow at industry level we write yaml files okay you have to give a complete definition into a yaml file to create a pod or any other object in kubernetes we never do that from the command line this was a starting that is why i showed you from the command line but we use declarative syntax declarative syntax is called your yaml files so whenever we are going to create any pod any container any object in kubernetes we are going to do that with a yaml file okay so how the yaml formatting work i hope all of you are pretty much aware about yaml is there anyone who don't know yaml if there are people who don't know about yaml i can give you a brief idea about it so that you can clearly understand about your manifest file because yaml is really important to proceed with this so if anybody has any doubts if anybody doesn't know about yaml you can let me know i'll give you a brief idea Okay, uh, there is a very interesting question from Sarat. Okay, all right team, I'll give you a brief idea about YAML formatting also. But there is a very interesting question from Sarat. Nobody else asked about it. Okay, Sarat is asking there is a pause image in the worker node. Right, so team, this is a very important question okay you might get this question in some of the interviews if they get very detailed all right so the question is there is already one container running with the name of shub but still there is another container running of docker which is a pause container what is that why there is a pause container running along with your nginx container the image is also different but the name is same why anyone no sanjay kushagra you're right you got the correct answer grish yes to some extent abhinav you got the right answer Masumi, no, it is not a prop. Okay, team, one thing I told you when I explained you about your pods and container. I told you whenever a container restarts, whenever a container gets deleted and recreated again inside a pod, the IP of the pod is going to remain the same. Right? Uh, no, Anurag, that is not a command. So these pod container, whenever you create a pod with a single container, one by one, one container one pod still inside that same pod uh, another container is always created which is caused called a pause container and this pause container is used to retain the details about the container because i told you in docker every time the container gets recreated or restarted it changes its ip but pod doesn't do that 
that is why there is a mechanism in pods that whenever a container is recreated its ip will remain the same and that details will be fetched from the pause container okay that is the purpose of your pause containers so whenever you create a pod with one container a pause container always starts with it to retain the information about the container because of some reason if container goes down or it gets restarted pause container will fetch all the details and give it to the container so that the ip address of the pod will remain the same so that is about it now let's have some idea about your yaml formatting okay so team yaml is nothing yaml the full form is yaml and a markup language okay yaml is not a markup language it is a data serialization language okay it is a structured format so there is only one rule in yaml okay if you want to do anything with the yaml there is only one rule that you have to follow the indentation okay you have to give spaces wherever necessary and no tabs important part is this you cannot tap anywhere in the yaml it is going to cause indentation error so always use space bar when you write the yaml file okay in yaml also there are three features okay you can have a scalar you can have a dictionary your map or you can have an array or list i have given the complete examples about that also okay in scalar scalar is a very basic thing you will have a key and you will have a value okay so in yaml you follow key value pairs again okay you will have one key and you will have one value okay so in scalar it is the most simplest one you will have some key and you will have some value for example name is shum okay or i give a variable a i'll give the value as 5 okay scalar is just a key value pair next is your dictionary or map in dictionary you will have multiple attributes about a key and those attributes will have multiple values there is going to be one key but there is not going to be one value it will have multiple attributes and it will have multiple values for example if i have a car as a key okay what are the attributes of the car the car will have some name the car will have some color okay they will have some engine specification okay so in dictionary or map dictionary means that you will have one key and it will have some attributes and those attributes are going to have values okay so this is example the last one is array and list in array or list you can say there is going to be a key and there are going to be some values there are not going to be any attributes okay for example consider in array and list there is a list so list is going to have multiple values so now i am not talking about a car i am talking about cars there are going to be multiple cars okay so multiple cars if i will do this let me remove this part and let me remove this part okay so in car if i'll talk about dictionary you can see i am talking about multiple attributes of a single car in array or list there are going to be cars and there are going to be values there are not going to be any uh, attributes cars multiple names bmw audi tesla or many more okay so these are the three definitions in your yaml formatting scalar dictionary and array and the beauty is this that you can use each of them inside other one you can have a array inside a dictionary you can have a dictionary inside an array so that is also possible and that is why i just removed it so now you can see cars have some array array r bmw audi or tesla now what i have done inside an array i have defined a dictionary if you can see right so you can see this is just similar like this i'll have a car i have a name i have a color i have a engine and this is similar to this bmw is a name inside that i have defined name as bmw color as red so what is happening 
I have defined a dictionary inside an array. Again, I have done that. For audio also, there is a name called Audi. There is a color called green. Okay, so I have defined a dictionary inside an array. So the important part you have to follow is about the intention. Okay, so if you're using your Notepad++, if you go to languages, you can see there is a YAML formatting. So you have this look, this kind of look. You can see a key started and then I gave two spaces. Okay, for the definition of an attribute. If I misplace any spaces, it is going to create an error. You can see this key starts from here and ends here because the indentation is exactly the same. If I change the indentation, see, I gave two more spaces. So what happened? This attribute two becomes a part of attribute one, not a part of the key. You can see here, your attribute two is a part of attribute one now because of the indentation, it has changed. So it is very important that you follow the indentation very properly. It should get aligned. It should have proper indentation. If I remove the spaces, you can see that your key started from here and attribute ends here. Okay. After that, another attribute started because the space has been changed. So this key has just completed with attribute one. Now you have attribute two and attribute two have a part called attribute three. So it is very important that you pay attention to the indentation and spaces in YAML. So this is about your scalar dictionary and array. I hope it is clear to all of you. No, Gopal, you can give as many spaces as you want. It is just a practice that we follow to have two spaces. If you want to have more spaces, you can have more spaces as well. See, now I'm giving four spaces. But still, you can see the indentation is correct. Your key starts here and ends here. So it is general idea that you give two spaces that is more than optimum so that it is clearly visible as well and it is not wasting more spaces. So that is why we give two spaces. You can give three, four, five as per your requirement. Okay, so team now when your indentation or YAML is clear to you, now I am going to show you some of the YAML files with which we are going to create your pods. Okay, there is a folder called pods. And I'm going to pick one pod example from here. Okay, there is a pod.yaml here. Okay, so team, this is how you are going to have a definition of a pod. Okay, this is how you are going to create a pod in YAML. Now the question is, what is this API version here? What is it? any object in Kubernetes, whether it is a pod or deployment or service or whatsoever, whatever you are going to create with YAML inside Kubernetes, there has to be four fields mandatorily. Okay, four fields are mandatory. And what are those four fields? You always have to mention the API version. You always have to mention the kind. You always have to mention metadata. And you always have to mention the specs as well. So whenever you create any object in Kubernetes, you have to mention these four always without fail. Otherwise, your object is not going to get created. So Kubernetes has defined these four parameters as mandatory. So from where we are going to fetch these information? I'll show you that here. So with kubectl api resources, you get all the details about all the components, right? What are all objects you can create? Pod is also one of them. Now you can see uh, this is a full name and this is a short name. This is the API version here, v1. It is visible you here, all right? You can see I have mentioned v1, API version. So you can see the API version here, v1. For all the objects you can verify. <clears throat> Okay, it can be namespace or not. I'll tell you about that when we talk about namespaces and this is the kind. Okay, so if you want to create a pod, you have to mention the API version from this table and you have to pick the name 
as kind okay here you cannot use short name so if you want to give here as just a PO <coughs> like it is mentioned here <coughs> short name from a, uh, for a pod you cannot use that you can see PODES PODS pods but what is the kind kind is spot you have to mention the kind here all right so you can see that I have mentioned the kind as pod or if you want to get more details you can use explain command kubectl explain pods <coughs> kubectl explain pod here you can see what is the kind pod you have to mention this kind here next is version v1 you have to mention that here api version colon v1 okay then you get other details as well that what are the description what is a pod pod is a collection of container that can run on a host this resource is created by client and schedule onto host okay you get some one liner description with of all the objects here as well you can use explain command with any object okay and what are the fields it is mandatory you can see here in fields you have to mention api version you have to mention kind you have to uh, mention metadata and you have to mention the specs the status is optional if you want to mention you can if you don't you don't but these are the four mandatory fields you have to mention in a yaml file now let's see about this definition i have mentioned the api server version api version i have mentioned the kind then metadata <clears throat> what is the metadata metadata is the details about your ports or container okay what's the name it is going to have your pod will be named as pod one okay labels i will come back to uh, labels later as of now you can ignore it okay metadata is pod one what are the specification you have mentioned the name in metadata but what are the specification your pod name is going to be there but what kind of container i'm going to create how many containers i'm going to create which image i'm going to pick for the container that all you are going to mention under specification okay so now you can see that specs have containers and what is it it is a array sorry uh, just a minute so you can see it is an array now specs containers and then under containers you can see container have some attributes container name is going to be tomcat image is going to be tomcat and if i'm running a tomcat i can give the port number as well if you want if you don't want you can skip this part so ports container port tomcat will be running at port number 8080 okay so this is one example i have multiple example of single container port as well okay this is another definition this is another definition if you want to use this one okay so that is up to you you can use anyone as of now i'm going to pick this one VI pod dot yaml okay so you are going to write a VI editing file I'll paste the content here and I close it okay now if you want to create any object from a file or yaml file the command is kubectl create hyphen f if you are giving a file name and then the file name okay so you can see pod one is created with the yaml file kubectl get pods okay as of now you can see the status as container is getting created that is why it is showing you zero oblique one tomcat is a heavy container that is why it takes some time until the status is creating container it is showing you zero oblique one it means it is not ready still taking some time <clears throat> why container port is an array uh, most of me that is how it's formatting it is in yaml that is understandable by kubernetes 
do we need to remember these YAML formats for exam? I do recall, yes, you have to understand about the basic concept, what are the mandatory field. But if you don't want to remember, I'll show you that also. How you can avoid remembering all that. But still, four fields, you have to remember that you have to give four fields. Okay, so team, now you can see that pod one is created and it is also running. All right. Let's see where it is running, shall we? So you can see the pod one this time is running on node one. So it is always changing the node, okay? Because both the nodes have similar configuration, that is why it is going in down drop in. First it's created on node two, then it created on node one. Can we uh, use more than one kind in a single YAML file? Uh, Ganapati, yes, you can use, but the thing is, you have to use for all the objects. Okay. Uh, let me show you that. Just give me some time. So, team, if you want to delete all the pods at a single go, you can do that also. kubectl delete pod. Okay. If you want to delete a specific pod, you give kubectl delete pod and pod name. If you want to delete all the pods, you are giving going to give a flag call hyphen happen all. Okay. With this command, you can see that pod pod one and pod ship are getting deleted. So both are deleted. I'm removing the pod uh, file also. So if you want to give more than one kind, then you have to give a separate definition as well. Okay, so you can see I have uh, differentiated with uh, three hyphens. If you want to create two pods at a single time, you can create two pods as well. VI pod dot YAML. Okay, give as many definition as you want. I have given twice the kind now, right? You can see kind here and kind here. But with that, I have given different API version again. So whenever you are giving multiple kinds, you have to give all the fields again because you are creating multiple objects this time. Okay, so now I'm going to create pod one and pod two as well. For that, I have to give two separate definition that I can give in a single file. kubectl create hyphen f pods dot yaml. See, now two pods are created. You can create multiple objects in a single YAML file as well. See, both the pods are running from a single file that you can do. Uh, can we install a pod on specific node? Yes, Himashu, we can do that and we'll see that further. Yes, Akhil, I'll show you that just in some time. Thank you, Ganapati. Siddharth, you're asking coming back to pause container, is it created per container? If yes, then the total number of uh, containers running on the node would be total two. Is that fair understanding? Yes, Siddharth, you're absolutely correct. Your understanding is completely right. Uh, how both ports, ports are created in less than uh, this time? Govinda, the thing is, this time your image was already downloaded. Right, you understand that Nginx is a light one, so it gets downloaded easily. But Tomcat is also getting created very soon this time because it was already created earlier. That is why your image was there on the node and it picked the same image. But if image is not there, it has to download by image also. So that is why it takes some time at the first go. Sanjay, how two bots are created? Because this time I gave two definition in my bots file. You can see in this YAML, I have given two definition, one for port one, port one and one for port two. That is why two ports are created.
in docker swarm we used to run docker prune hyphen a to clear all the unused images or container how about in query uh, okay satish if you want to delete the unused images then you have to do it manually okay <clears throat> because kubernetes doesn't take care about the images that is why we install docker on every machine right you understand that we install docker on all the machine what is the purpose of installing docker on all the machines because kubernetes is not going to take care about the images kubernetes is going to delete is not is going to delete the pods only it is going to delete with the containers it will play with the containers and pods only it is not going to take care about the images so if you have to delete the news images you have to go to the nodes and use your docker command only sanjay why it should be one i have given two definition If I remove one definition, it will create one pod. If I have given two definition, it will create two pod. If I give, uh, give three definition, three pods here. Any restriction when we create pods apart from four mandatory component in the YAML file? Uh, no, Arjun. It is not a restriction. You can give as many fields as you want. Going forward, you will see how many components are actually there and how much. Detailed definition you can give. We'll see that as well. Sarat, the image is going to get downloaded where the pod is assigned. If your pod is assigned on node one, your image will be downloaded there on node one. If your pod is assigned on node two, image will be downloaded at your node two. Because you have to understand the basic flow. The node has been assigned for the pod. If node two is assigned. then the docker living on node 1 will take care about creating the container and downloading the image so is it fair to say that the total limit provided by kubernetes is actually half let's say uh, 10k in the total limit so actually containers it is supported 50k uh, okay sadat it actually never happen that you reach this limit it is also not suggested because you if you have this much load you will create multiple clusters and multiple nodes okay this is the maximum limit it has defined but we never go as per the maximum limits if you have this much load you will have to create multiple nodes and multiple cluster how can we create two pods uh, himanshu you are asking how to create two containers inside a pod team a humble request to all of you okay a humble request to all of you will cover everything how to work with multi container pods i have already told you many times just bear with me please ask the question from the content that i have just delivered okay when i am asking you to ask question ask the question from the content i have just delivered once it is clear to all of you then i am going to move to the next part so first i am trying to make you understand how one container works inside a pod if all of you understand that properly then i am going to move to the next part so definitely we are going to see everything how multi container pods works as well but one step at a time fields in metadata are compulsory sanjay that is up to you if you have given the field called metadata under metadata it is dependent on you under metadata name is mandatory labels are not so that is up to you in my, under metadata name has to be always there other things are optional if you want you can give if you don't you don't give gobinda so right now in which nodes these pods are created okay let's we can see that kubectl get pods okay hi from white okay you can see pod 2 is running on node 2 and pod 1 is running on node 1 sanjay yes pod will not get created if metadata field is empty you have to give the name even if we create two pods from one yaml file it will spread across multiple worker nodes as per the schedule activity is it current understanding yes joydeep you have also seen that now uh 
Okay, Ashok, you are asking about the pause container again. Okay, uh, Ashok, I'll tell you that. So, Ashok, the thing is, I told you what is the difference between pod and a container. Okay, container whenever gets restarted, its IP or its port number is going to get changed. But whenever a pod dies or gets recreated or gets restarted inside a pod, its IP remains the same. How its IP is sustaining? Whether the pod, even when the container was related, how the IP sustained? Because pod always create a pause container inside itself to hold the details about the container. Whenever a container is created, it is going to show the networking details about the pod's IP and port number. All the details will be stored in a pause container. Pause container purpose is to show the details. So even if your container gets deleted or gets restarted, it will get the same details every time it's, get, it's getting created with the help of pause container details. So I hope it is clear to you now. Akhil, you have the uh, GitHub, web, uh, GitHub repository link, right? So all the structure are there. I'm giving you all the examples right from there. Yes, Govinda, scheduling is done by the scheduler. Paypal, uh, you are asking about the algorithm that scheduler takes. Scheduler takes a lot of consideration. If you want to see, I'll show you kubectl get uh, notes. So there's a question from Paypal that on what basis your notes are decided for the pod assignment. kubectl describe. So now these commands must be handed with you that what described us, right? kubectl describe node, node 1. Let's describe it. Okay, so Prempal, the thing is, it takes the information and it checks for certain tick marks that if it is proper, healthy or not. Okay, it will check that network available is not available or not. Network unavailable, it is false. Is there any memory pressure on that particular node? False. Disk pressure is false. It means there is plenty of disk space. PID pressure, process ID pressure is also not there. The status of the node is ready or not. So these are the certain checks that your controller does on all the nodes. And depending on that, it assigns the pod to your nodes. Okay. So it gets all the details and then it is going to check for that. It is also going to check that your kubelet is available or not, or your node, node is available or not. If node is available, is there any memory pressure? Is there any network unavailability? All the multiple checks are done, and then your scheduler decide that this node will be suitable for your container or pod. I hope it answers it. Couple uh, nominated node is the node where the pod is assigned. Ganapati, you are asking if one node is down for some reason. Will Kate take care of the running uh, those node in worker machine automatically? Ganapati, if one of your node goes down and there are certain pods running, if a node goes down, controller manager will take care to migrate those containers to another node. For example, there is one pod running on your node too, and the details are stored in etcd. So controller manager is going to see that your node 2 is not reachable. It is failing with kubelet connection. So what it will do, it will delete the details about that pod on node 2 in etcd and it will migrate that container or pod on node 1. Okay, that was a long question answer session. I hope it is clear to all of you now. Now, so many things practically, okay? Now I'm going to bore you a little bit with theory part, okay? Because this part is important for your examination point of view only if you're opting for CKAD. If you're opting for application developer part, then it is important for you 
theoretically otherwise if you are opting for cka it is not that important now i am going to move to multi container pod now okay so with the definition there are three type of multi container pods as per the definition okay so deep again telling you this is just for the m pod it is important for ckad examination point of view they might ask this question theoretically otherwise this question is not going to come for your ck examination and honestly speaking this is also not helpful for your practical work life also if you are working in industry it is not going to help you at all okay i have really seen the use of this so this is just a definition how your multi container pods are there are three types of multi container pod one is your sidecar second is your ambassador and third is your adapter so these are the three definition for your sidecar containers there are three type of sidecar uh, multi container pods okay so what are they we are going to see about that a little bit of theory so first is sidecar container sidecar derive their names from the motorcycle sidecar okay so the thing is inside a container there are going to be two pods now uh, sorry two containers we are studying about multi container pod so definitely there are going to be two containers inside a single pod first type is sidecar container in sidecar containers you will have two containers and one container will be called sidecar that is extra seat so in kubernetes what it does your container works perfectly well without the sidecar container but with it it can perform some extra functionality okay so the thing is a sidecar container enhances the main container in some way adding functionality to it consider that you have two containers one container is going to be there as a main container okay one is going to be your application container and your sidecar container is going to give some details to it if i talk about a layman example okay let me take a layman example consider you are watching news okay on news channel you are watching news there is an anchor on the screen okay so the anchor is reading news for you what happens there is going to be a helper at the back end who is going to provide the details to the anchor okay it is going to pass on some checks it is going to pass on some paper to the uh, with the news to the anchor and then the anchor is going to read the news for you so the anchor is your main container and the helper who is passing on all the details is your sidecar container it is injecting the details it is injecting the information to the primary container so this is about your sidecar container okay second is your ambassador what happens at in ambassador your second container is used for traffic routing okay so there is going to be one primary container your application container and there is going to be second container called ambassador container it is used for traffic routing okay for example you can see an ha proxy ambassador container receives network traffic and forward it to main container so now your second container is not passing on some uh, details or functionality to your primary container it is just routing the traffic so that from the outside world no one can reach to your primary container directly it has to go through the secondary container so ha proxy like you can say as a load balancer your second container will work as a load balancer the purpose is we don't want to give the access to the primary container directly to the outside world so that's why we have we use ambassador okay so you can read all the details all the definitions here i am giving you on the higher level okay so a uh, layman example for ambassador okay um let me think of something okay consider that uh, you are going to meet some celebrity or you are going to meet some minister or some politician some uh, anyone just like that okay you want to go to uh, go to meet a politician so your politician is sitting inside a room okay you cannot directly go or barge inside his room there is going to be a pa there is going to be assistant all right you have to talk to the assistant first and then that assistant is going to have your appointment and then you can go inside the room to the politician with the pa 
PA is going to guide you when you can go inside and when you are going to meet the person. Okay, that is a layman example for ambassador. So team, I am giving layman example so that you can connect better. All right, the third one is adapter. So the thing is with uh, the third type, it is about the data reading you can say. Okay, as of now you can see in sidecar, your sidecar container pass on some injecting data to the primary container. In ambassador, it gives you the routing. Second container is used for the routing purpose. Third type is where you get the details from the primary container to the secondary container. And that is called your adapter container. Consider that you want some logging. This is the example which I gave you here. Okay, this is the example which I gave you here. There is an application container and those application logs are getting written to your secondary container. You are also running a Splunk container so that your Splunk container will get the logs from your application container. So this is a good example of your adapter container. Adapter container doesn't give any details or routing to the primary container but it get the details from the primary container and write down some logs. Consider you have an application and you want to have the logs written properly inside a container. So that... All right, so team, these are the three theoretical types of multi-container pods. I hope it is clear to all of you. Let me know if you have any doubts. Shagal, you are asking what is the purpose of SA proxy uh, load balancing inside a pod. Consider you have three containers running inside a pod. Multi-container pod can have two or three or four. There is no rule that inside a pod you can have only two containers. You can have three containers also. Consider you are having two application container and one SA proxy so that you can do the load balancing between two containers. So there you are going to use the SA proxy. Rahul sir, how to uh, share IPC memory or POSIX queuing with multi-container uh, pod? Mm, Rahul, I'm not sure about this one. If you can give more details about IPC share memory and POSIX, uh, because honestly, I don't know much on POSIX here. Adirika guess you are asking to repeat on adapter. Okay. So Adirika guess adapter is a completely different type from the other two. On the other two, you have seen sidecar containers. Your primary container get the details from the sidecar container. In adapter and ambassador, your primary containers take the routing from their secondary container. In these two, your primary container is taking details from other one. But in adapter, adapter it works as a vice versa. It is an opposite situation. In uh, adapter, your primary container gives the details to the secondary container. Okay, like your application is being accessed, how many times your application is being accessed, you have to write down some logs about that. Okay, so you are using a Splunk container or maybe you are using a database container as well. Okay, your application is having some uh, front end from that your data is getting stored onto the secondary container and that is your database container. So here your database container will act as an adapter container because it is taking details from the primary container. It is not giving the details to the primary container. Okay, so you can see the flow where it goes. In adapter, adapter takes the details from the primary container. Primpal, can we see Kubernetes cluster using CLI? Details having all nodes join. Primpal, that we have already seen, right? This is your command line, right? kubectl get nodes. You can describe all the nodes and the installation we have done yesterday. 
so i am not sure if you were there in yesterday's class or not so you can have the recording your recording must be uploaded on the portal you can watch yesterday's recording yesterday we connected everything from the cli we bootstrap our cluster and we added all the nodes to the master from the command line itself Shiju, uh, where do we specify the type of multi-container pod in the definition? Shiju, if you are uh, talking about the YAML files, there we don't define the type, whether it is a sidecar, it is the basic understanding. As I told you, this is a theoretical part only. You are not going to use it anywhere in the practical YAML files. We don't mention anywhere sidecar or massive, it is just a concept. So that is why I said, don't pay much attention to it if you are opting for CK or if you are targeting for interviews or some uh, real life work. It is not going to help you. It is just a theoretical concept. Does SEO use a sidecar container? Yes, Abhishek, you are absolutely correct. STO is used as a sidecar container. So, Premal, if you were there yesterday, so Eli, adding your notes and everything. Yes, Shiju, it is based on the containers we have inside a pod. It is just about your understanding. Okay, so team, I hope it is clear to you. Shall we have an example with this? With example, it will be more clear to you. kubectl get pods kubectl delete Pods hyphen hyphen all. Okay, so team, let me show you a practical example about all of these. <clears throat> okay, so for your better understanding, uh, ambassador is there a sidecar container. <clears throat> there are a lot of details, volumes are also there. That concept <clears throat> I haven't shared as of now, but inside containers, you can see. This is your first container, Nginx, okay, and second is your Debian. What is happening in this one? You can see there are some data being written in the HTML file here in the sidecar container. This is your second sidecar container. You can see I haven't mentioned anywhere that it is a sidecar. It is just a concept. So what is happening? It is writing some data into some HTML file, okay, still volumes concept is there. So you don't know that but you can understand that what I am doing while true it is passing the date into an HTML file and it is going to sleep for a second and it is going to do the loop okay so this HTML file will be passed to your Nginx once your Nginx container is running okay so this is a location it is going to be there so what is happening some HTML file is being written and it will be passed through the Nginx container so it is a classic example of your sidecar container it is passing on some details from the second container to the first container okay that's about it and then ambassador legacy fruit service okay this is a open source GitHub repo, oh, sorry, Docker repository. You can use this image also. All right. So second container I am giving of a HA proxy. Okay, so that it is going to do the load balancing with your pod. It is just for traffic routing. HA proxy is being used for the traffic routing. And the last one is your adapter. So here are your containers. First is your application container, Alpine. It is doing something, right? It is writing date in the top file, and then it is going to sleep for five seconds. Second is your adapter container here. Okay, this is we are picking from Alpine. We are going to run some command. Now what it is doing, it is doing the cat on the top file which is being written on the primary container. So whatever work is done on the primary container will be stored in your secondary container. That is what we are doing here. Okay, so this is the theoretical concept. I am going to pick this example for the practical one, multi-container pod. 
okay so what we are doing we have given api version we have given kind we have given metadata and now we are going to give the specification under metadata name is multi container pod okay here what i am going to do i am going to run two containers okay one is going to be your nginx one and second is going to be your alpine one okay so this example i am going to show you practically we have multiple dot shamal escape by insert so team what is going to happen in this one first is your nginx container nginx container does have a application page in with it all right so it is going to run but second container i am taking as alpine and alpine is a os based image so it is going to be live for 60 seconds only after 60 second your container is going to die out okay so that is what i told you if a container dies inside a pod in a multi container pod your pod is not going to be available for that time right so let's see what happens here cube ctl create hyphen f okay cube ctl get pods if you want to see the continuous output of this one you are going to put a watch watch and then the command cube ctl get pods okay it is going to give you the output for every 2 second refresh rate you can see 17 19 21 okay so you can see two pods two containers are running inside a pod a container contains a pod contains two container and both are up but your one alpine container is going to die out after one minute okay let's see what happens then two by two running status restarts are zero and it is almost 60 seconds now you can see 1 by 2 and not ready status okay it means what happened your alpine container died out and once your alpine container was died your kubernetes or you can say your controller manager took care of it because the status was not ready it restarted your pod your pod got restarted it means your container which died out of alpine it was restarted and that is why you can see the status as restart 1 okay again your alpine container is going to die out after 1 minute 60 seconds and again it is going to restart your pod but the ip is going to stay the same now you can see 2 minutes are there again it is going to get restarted status will be not ready for a while not ready 1 by 2 now it will restart it okay now it is in flashback loop and second restart now you can see it is restarted twice okay so team this is how i wanted to show you the concept of multi container pod even if one pod has two containers and one containers dies out because of any reason your pod is not going to be available and it is going to restart itself again and again every time shishu uh, you are asking this example doesn't fit into any other type we discuss yes shishu as i told you this the three types i told you is for the theoretical part only you might be using that in practically somewhere the concept i wanted to show you of a multi container pod that how one containers dies out and pod gets unavailable so yes the example i showed you practically is not a part of any of those three you can have that uh, ready with you all the yamls are there you can simply have a yaml file here and kubectl create it
uh, yes team so somebody asked me earlier that can i define a particular pod to a particular node if i can do that or not so yes we can do that qctl get pods first let me delete all the pods from here okay we have already deleted all the pods so as of now no pods are running okay so team the thing is if i want to have a pod on a specific node we can do that and those kind of pods are called static pods okay so what i'm going to do i am going to pick a definition of a single pod this is my pod <coughs> and uh, this is my pod.yaml i am going to pick a basic tomcat image and going to create a pod and how i am going to create that i have to go to a specific location on a specific node okay consider i want to assign that pod on node 2 so i have to go to node 2 directly okay so first there is a file called uh just a minute as i told you on all the worker nodes you have a kubelet okay and kubelet runs as a service so for the kubelet service all the definitions are placed at this location where lib kubelet on every node okay whenever your kubelet service is running it will be located at this location where library and kubelet so team here is a file called config.yaml Okay, we are going to see this file, vi config dot yaml, and there is something called a static path, pod path. Okay, so team, here is a key value pair called static pod path, etc. Kubernetes manifest. So I am going to pick this location. and i'm going to go to this location as of now this location is empty on your worker node right so what i'm going to do i'm going to place a yaml here pod dot yaml any name you can give this definition i'm going to place here and i'm going to save it okay so this definition i have saved directly on my node 2 now i'll go to my master node i just executed kubectl get pods it showed me nothing can you see the difference now kubectl get pod is going to show me some output now a pod 1 is going getting created its name is also a slightly different earlier the name was pod 1 now you can see k node to also written in the naming convention kubectl get pods hyphen o white the definition i have placed at node 2 and that is why this pod is getting created on node 2 so if you want to create a pod on a specific no node so what you are going to do you are going to go log into that particular node come to this location it is a kubernetes manifest and place a yaml file here it is going to create the pod on directly on that node okay one more difference i am going to show you now it is up and running it is running on node 2 kubectl describe pod and the pod name team tell me a difference here with all the definition we have seen so far what is the difference this time here is there something missing or is there something addition something plus or something minus tell me the difference gopal shiju jagannath abhinav 
Ganapati cubelet is here. Cubelet is here. Cubelet is not missing. Rishabh, Kushagra. Nitesh, that is done, but something is missing, Nitesh. What is that? Masomi, no, that is not the case. Girish, right? Ankur, Kapil, Gaurav, Adirika guest, right? Yes, Siddharth, correct. So, team, what happened here? The thing is, as a general rule, if you do anything from the kubectl command, okay, this thing should have your better understanding with the architecture. Okay, so what happens whenever you do anything from the kubectl command, it goes to the API server and then scheduler decide which node will be chosen. Okay, and once that, once scheduler has chosen, then kubelet is going to take care of all the further work. Now what we did, we skipped this complete portion. Okay, we didn't give anything from the kubectl. We didn't went to API server. We didn't ask the scheduler. We scheduled it directly. And then we instructed the kubelet. So all the previous steps we have skipped and we have instructed the kubelet directly to create the container. Okay, that is why scheduling is not done by the scheduler. You have scheduled and you have went directly to the node and ask the kubelet of that particular node to create the pod. So kubelet can be instructed by the API server. That is also the case, but you can instruct the kubelet directly also. Okay, so that is one case. Now, tell me one thing. Can I delete this pod with kubectl delete command? If I delete this pod from here, kubectl delete pods and this pod name. If I do this, what will happen? I didn't create this pod with kubectl command, but if I delete this, what will happen? Kushagra, absolutely correct. Shija, you are also right. Kapil. Okay, so many answers. Shiju, Kapil, you are right. Mosami, right. Rishabh, you are not. Partially. Gopal, absolutely correct. Adhirika, guest, okay. Girish. Anil, uh, Jagannath, okay. Okay team, great answers. Some of you have given the right answers, some of you haven't. Okay, So let's see what happens. Let me try to delete this. See, I was able to delete it from the master itself. I was able to delete. Kubectl get pods, but it got created again 12 seconds ago. It got created again. So if you delete a static pod, okay. So team, these are the pods which are called static. Why these these are called static? Because you have defined the definition directly on the node. You have directly inserted to the kubelet of that node. So that is why these pods are called static pod. If you provide a definition at the manifest location, these are called static pod. So what I'm going to do. I cannot delete this pod from the kubectl command because this pod is being managed directly by the kubelet. Okay, so what I have to do, I have to delete the YAML from here. Then only you will be able to delete this pod. Otherwise, your kubectl delete command will not help you at all. See, your pod is gone. Now, I am going to show you something very interesting. Okay, so pay attention and see it. I'm going to execute an old command hyphen n cube hyphen system. Gaurav, what if node goes down? Will the controller take control of it? No, Gaurav, if your node is gone down, 
then that pod will be gone also static pods remains with the node no matter what if your node goes down your static pod will be gone as well <coughs> so team this is the old command which i showed you earlier cube serial get pods hyphen and cube system can you see something here when i created a static pod the naming convention is like that your pod name hyphen node name so this is your static pod can you identify the static pods here for your master node can you identify the static pod jagannath no weave not is not the one sorry uh, jagannath you said it is easy yes it is shiju no weave net is not kushagra you are right arjun yes i am asking about which are of these are static pods maswami uh, rishab ganapati kapil Gaurav, Rishab, yes, all gave you, you all of you gave the right answer. Okay, so team, all the components which are of mass here are static pods, are static pods. Cube CTL get pods hyphen n cube system hyphen o wide. so all the components which are running on master are running as a static pod okay all of them are running as a static pod so what can we do can we delete this qctl delete pods the scheduler one hyphen n let's try to delete it team i have deleted the scheduler itself i deleted the scheduler and the scheduler came back online 7 seconds ago okay so this is the basic nature of static pods if you delete it with the cube serial command it will not be deleted or it will be recreated again all right so that is why all your master components runs as a static pod and you know the location etcd kubernetes manifest okay this is the location for all your static pods you can see controller manager api server scheduler etcd these four components are running as your static pods so is it clear to all of you any doubts with the static pods any question on static pods no questions great why code dns is not a static pod okay okay so team as of now don't question me on other pods okay core dns is there and cube proxy is there weave net is there these are different type as of now i have explained you about the static pods that is why i have shown you the static pods there are some demon set as well there are some deployments as well when i'll come when i'll cover the deployment and demon set part then i'll show you about these naming convention how these pods are running okay so that is a topic about later and in real world why do we need uh, why do we need static pod anil i gave you a complete big picture of the real world why do we need static pods because your master components are running should be running on master only right these are also pods your master component should be running on master only your cube api server or controller cannot live on node 2 or node 1 
you have to make sure that they are running on node one itself that is why they are static pods so that is a real time scenario for this your master components are static pods and that is a real case here yes got up during the exam you will have the access to all the cluster machines kapil no you cannot make the entry in the etcd it is completely managed by the kubernetes you cannot modify the entry in etcd database <laughs> Arjun I think I answered your question as well what is the real time scenario for your static pod these are the real time scenario your master components are running on the master node itself they are supposed to be living there only your api server cannot reside on node 2 or node 3 that is why they are created as a static pod otherwise kubernetes would also have created your api server controller manager as a normal pod it could have done that but they have created them as a static pod because they are supposed to be running on master node only similarly if you want to have some uh, logs connection okay you want to collect log from all the nodes so what you are going to do there should be a pod running on all the nodes so you can create a static pod that this pod will pick all the logs from this particular node itself not from any other node so there you can also use static pod okay so team next topic now Chandrasekhar, yes, Kubernetes do have a GUI console as well. Okay, we are going to see that as well. But I think that is going to be in the uh, sixth class, I guess. Probably we are going to have the GUI console of Kubernetes on the eighth, uh, sixth class. Okay, so team, now another situation. <clears throat> consider you have a pod okay this is my pod and i am going to create two container inside this pod okay or uh, let me give you a layman example now okay first i'll give you a layman example then i will give you a practical example consider you went to a restaurant okay so think you went to a restaurant and you ask for a order you place an order okay your waiter came to your uh, table he asked for your order you gave the order all right and after that your manager came of that hotel okay or that restaurant manager came to you he said that wait for some time sir you have to wait for some time because the chef is not ready the chef has not arrived the chef is on his way once chef will be there in the kitchen he will cook your food and then will be able to serve you food right so as a customer what you are going to say as a customer you are going to say that if the food is not ready if the chef is not here so why have you opened the restaurant till now you should not open the restaurant till your chef is ready in the kitchen to cook meals right so that is going to happen so you went to a restaurant the chef is not there chef is on the way so you are going to complain that why your restaurant is open if your chef is not ready first your chef should be there and then only you should open your restaurant all right now taking the same example in your real time situation consider you are working in a multi container pod okay this is your pod and you have two containers and assuming this is a side car container okay this is a side car container what happens in a side car container your side car container is going to cook something and then it is going to provide to the main container right your side car container is going to cook some scripts and those scripts will be passed on to the primary container all right so whenever you create a normal multi container pod both the con both the containers comes online at the same time so what will happen your primary container will have no data until your secondary container 
is going to cook something for it okay consider you have an nginx container and your html file is getting ready index.html is getting ready by secondary container and then it will be passed on to the primary container but you started a normal multi container pod both the containers came online on the same time but your primary container has nothing to display because your sidecar container is still working your sidecar container is still cooking <clears throat> so in that scenario your container will be up your pod will be up because both the containers are online your pod is also online so but it is not serving the request so you have created the application you have the application container you have the sidecar container you have the pod everything is online but still you are not getting your application result on the front page because your sidecar container is still cooking so this is not a situation that we want to encounter this is not a situation that we want to encounter in those scenario we use init container in place of keeping it as a sidecar container what i am going to do i am going to put it as a init container how a init container is different now once your init container has cooked the meal then only your restaurant will be open okay only when the chef is ready in the kitchen then only your restaurant is going to open so what happens first if you have defined a init container your init container will complete its job until and unless your init container completes its job your pod will not be available okay your pod will not be available until your init container has completed its work and died out it will cook some meal it will pass it on to the primary container and then your pod will be available so your init container will do its job your pod is unavailable till your init container is working and once your init container has completed its work then your container primary container will be available then your pod will be available and it can die out so init container has a basic nature to do its work and then die out its liveliness doesn't depend on pod availability okay let's see this practically and then it will be more clear to you okay where is in it here is an example for this one okay so team api version you have defined kind you have defined metadata you have defined specification you have one container that is of your nginx we are defining volumes as well now in it container you define separately okay inside containers you don't define in it container you define in it container separately okay so in it container i am defining as alpine i am taking the image alpine some commands will be executed init container demo works will be written to the index.html then it is going to sleep for 30 seconds okay so your init container is going to be live for 30 second in the meantime your pod will be unavailable okay and we have also defined the volume to pass on this html file to your primary container okay so i am going to use this one now another thing so team every time i don't want to create a yaml file on my node what i can do i can simply use raw formatting from here click raw have the url and create your pods directly cube ctl create hyphen f and give the path directly cube ctl get pods so team now you can see it is zero oblique one because your init container is working right now watch cube ctl get pods okay it is 16 seconds because it was supposed to live for 30 seconds so for 30 seconds your init container is working and your ready status of the pod is zero oblique one so your primary container will not be online till your init container is working okay so now you can see your init container has already completed its work and then your init container died and your primary container is running as one oblique one okay so what was happening here some text was there in it container demo works i wanted to write this content into an index file 
and then this index.html I pass on to the nginx. Okay, so by default nginx shows you welcome to nginx, but I don't want to see welcome to nginx. I want to see init demo works. That is why I created the file in a different init container. Pass on that cooked meal to your primary container. If I'm going to curl this pod now. This was our init container. <coughs> Sorry, this was our nginx pod. It should have shown me welcome to nginx, but I have modified that as index.html. So I should get a different output. See, now if I curl, it shows me a different message. Init container demo works. All right. So team, this is the concept of your init container. Init containers are used to do some predefined work first and then pass it on to the secondary container which is your primary container sorry and then that primary container will be live to keep the pod online your init container can die out after that let me know if init container concept is clear to all of you Yes, no, anything clear, not clear, doubts, anything. Rahul, no, it is not mandatory to give the sleep time. See, uh, this work in it container and creating a, a HTML file takes fraction of second. I wanted to show you how in it container works. That is why I asked for sleep for 30 seconds. Otherwise, you won't have seen that practically so I gave 30 seconds sleep time just so that you can watch it how your init containers actually work so it is not mandatory joy the we pass the information using volumes okay you can see I have created volume here volume mounts and volume so volumes is an advanced topic. I know it is creating a little gap. I understand that, but volume concept is big. I want to have it for a dedicated day. So I will take that, but we are transferring this with a volume and volumes also we are going to cover a little bit later. Akhil, yes, I want to explain all the commands, but all the things won't be clear because as I can, uh, you guys shown you, that volumes are also there and it's a concept which I haven't explained to you as of now. But still, in Alpine container, what I'm doing, I'm having the shell prompt, okay? Then I'm providing command, sh for shell and hyphen c is for command. I'm passing some commands. What commands? First, it is going to create a directory. Then it is going to create a blank HTML file with touch and then it is going to pass init container demo works content into that empty file and then it is going to wait for 30 seconds so this is uh, this is what the commands are doing is the init container runs along with the main container or it has to complete before the main container start gopal first your init container will work and after that your main container is going to be live okay they both run uh, they don't run along Okay, first your init container will work, then your main container will be online, and then your pod will be online. Uh, Kapil, you want me to explain once again? Okay, uh, let me know where I am falling. I will explain you again. Let me know what is not clear to you. Init containers are the containers which are initialization containers. Init containers full form is initialization container. It means first your initialization container will work. Your main container will not be live till then. Your pod will not be live until then. Once your initialization container has done some initialization, has done its work, then it will pass on that information to the main container. And then your main container will be alive once your init container has completed its works. And then your pod will be online. Is it necessary for init container to pass something to the other container? Richard, that depends. You have to give some work to the init container and once that work is completed, then only your uh, other container will be live and 
pod will be live. So it is not necessary, but it is the functionality of an init container. Otherwise, if you are not passing anything to the primary container, then what is the use of init container? It is not necessary. It is a use case actually. Will init container always die out of after work or will it retain? Yes, Adhirika, guess your init container will always die out. Okay, it will not retain. Your init container is destined to die. So init container is physically not created as we have seen one oblique one. Yes, Anil, as I said, init container has to do some prerequisite. That's all. And once it is done, your init container will die out or your primary container is going to be live. Because you can see here, in containers definition, I have given only one container. Init container is given in a different definition. So your pod will consider its container only whatever has mentioned inside the container. Pod will not consider init container as containers. Chandrasekhar, you are asking real-time example of init container. I have given you real-time example. You have an Nginx image, but why you don't have, want to have an Nginx container right away. If you want to create your own application and you are using your Nginx image, are you going to have the Nginx page welcome to Nginx every time? Nginx is just a web server. You want to use it. You want to uh, pass on your own HTML files. If you are taking the default HTML file, then it will show you welcome to uh, welcome to Nginx. You don't want that. So this is a real time scenario. What you are going to do, you are going to cook some HTML pages into init container and those HTML page will be passed on to the Nginx pod so that you can have your own Nginx web page, web based application. If you want to have your own, you have to pass on your own HTML file and those are created into init containers. Unable to curl pod IP uh, during an initial cluster build, we pass on cube init hyphen hyphen pod CIDR block. Jagannath, uh, then uh, what is the output of cube CTL get pods hyphen O wide? You have to pick that IP and curl it there. Sumit, how to check uh, init has issue while initialization in, is there any logs? Sumit, okay. Sumit, your init container also have logs, but as you can say that your logs are gone when your container dies out. Okay. So what you can see, I have created some HTML file. I can have those log also onto the volume mounts. Okay. So Sumit, it is a basic concept as we also understand with the containers. If your containers dies out, you cannot see the log. So that is the basic nature of containers. In that situation, whether if you are talking about Docker or Docker Swamp or Kubernetes anywhere, if you want to retain the logs of a container, you have to use volume. Even in Docker, you use volumes to retain the logs of a died out container. Similarly, with init containers, with containers, with pods, with anything, if you want to retain the logs, you have to use volumes. Rishabh, is it necessary for init container to pass something to the main container? Rishabh, no, it is not necessary, but the functionality is for that purpose only. Okay, uh, Siddharth, uh, Siddharth, is this a big volume concept that you're asking right now? Yes, it asks for user share Nginx HTML location is the default path. I understand that, but it is a volume concept in Kubernetes. If you want to know what I did, I created a volume here. Okay, I created a volume of my volume name. Okay, and then the my volume path was slash init container. So I created that path in the init container. All right, and pass on that volume to my volume, my wall. Then what I did, I mounted the my wall inside my Nginx container at this location, user share Nginx HTML. Okay, so whatever the work was done in the secondary container or in it container, I pass on that value into user share Nginx HTML in Nginx container with the help of volume.
init container concept uh, and we need to use image init container and we cannot pass command directly into the init container couple i pass on all the commands into your init container itself you can see all the commands that i am executing here mkdir touch echo everything is taking place inside your init container you must know we can create only one init container okay init containers are supposed to be only one inside a pod if we use the exact method and go to the nginx container more on board will we see the init container part details akil there is a volume concept i will request you to leave it as of now okay you will be able to understand the volume concept when i explain you volumes that is a big concept okay i cannot tell you on the fly but inside your init contain inside your main container of nginx i have given the content to value a user share nginx html itself uh kushak that is the formatting that kubernetes yaml formatting has suggested us web server in container and in container as are different here generally should be the same anil no that is up to you you can have the main container and in container of completely different flavor there is nothing it generally it should be same or not that is your call you want to cook something you can cook anywhere you want to cook in your kitchen you want to cook in the restaurant that is up to you i want to cook in alpine image that is my call is there any specific reason why we are not mentioning in log in object command and append that f for the every restart mm, why we are not mentioning in log in object command sumit you can do that okay it is just an example it is not a standard it is just an example you want to use logs to do all this that is your call okay it is just an example i have multiple examples here thing is i just want to explain you the functionality if you want to do with the logs if you want to do with the sleep command if you want to do it with the volumes that is completely up to you see this is another example many of you are asking that is your init container always supposed to pass on some information to the main container no it's not but that is the reason why we use init container in this uh, what i'm doing i'm using a busy box image it is going to sleep for 60 seconds and after that your main container will come online okay so team i want you to practice this example at your own okay you are going to do this your init container will be live for 60 seconds it is not going to pass anything but in the meantime your main container will not be live once your 60 seconds has passed then your main container will come online and then your pod will be available so it is not mandatory to pass on the information from your init container to main container but that is the reason why we use it <clears throat> but you mention image name so it will use alpine images so instead of using image we can directly start command like ch no couple you have to give something at least okay you cannot write some commands you have to use the command somewhere right init container is going to cook something then only it is going to pass on something to to main container you need some space at least right if you have open a restaurant you need a kitchen you need a space for that you cannot cook anywhere you cannot cook on your customer table right so you need a space that is why we are using init container we cannot write the commands just like that anywhere <coughs> all right so team any other question till now we are done with the init containers and static pods Fanny, you are asking if I can explain you uh, on props once. Okay. 
okay team so one thing is here for you actually this is the agenda that i follow for all the days okay but i took this batch from the um, middle so that is why i am not able to strictly follow it but i am going in the same flow if you can see okay the day one i take only for docker okay so this is how i go for the first day i cover only docker commands everything with the docker second day we start with uh, kubernetes architecture installation bootstrap component folders api resources and pods okay so as i took it from the middle that is why we had a little overview of docker and we also did the same of uh, day 2 on our first day okay afterwards we discussed that how we are going to work with yaml we studied about multi pods we studied about static and init pods okay this is what was supposed to be on day 3rd but we have discussed some of them on last class as well okay so currently we are at this stage <clears throat> and how we are going to move forward further uh, we are going to discuss about namespace labels limits variables okay this is about it then we are going to discuss about your controllers your rolling updates and your services and uh, today only we are going to discuss about props as well okay i think it is not mentioned here props okay so next we are going to discuss about your controllers how many type of controllers are there and then we are going to see rolling updates rollbacks we are going to discuss about services we have multiple services we have node port service we have customer ip that we are going to discuss next day we are going to discuss about storages how many types of storages are there pb pvcs okay all of them we are going to discuss then we are going to discuss about your config map secrets we are going to discuss about your cloud disk and service load balancer Cloud disk and service load balancer is not important for your examination point of view, but I'm going to cover so that you will have some idea because these two concepts come under your uh, cloud managed Kubernetes cluster. Okay, so this is not for your examination, but it is an important point. I want to give you some overview on this. Next day, we are supposed to cover our scheduler, how we are going to schedule our pods on different different nodes with your taints and tolerance, your empty uh, volume, and everything. We are going to see about your namespace limits. We are going to see your ATCD backup, how we can do that. We are going to see something on monitoring as well. On next day, we are going to discuss about your networking, your securities, how you use your context, how you use your config file. All right. And on the last day, we are going to do some troubleshooting. Okay. Once you all the concepts are clear to you, then we are going to discuss about how your troubleshooting actually works. Because all the things that we will have covered by day seven will be important for your examination point of view, and on day eight, so that we are going to do the troubleshooting, so can, so that you can uh, have some idea how your examination happens. After that, we have your ingress, we have stateful sets, we have headless services, we have Helm as well. These things are not important for examination point of view, but I'll give you some idea how you are going to use it. Also, we are going to see about your HPA as well, your horizontal pod auto scaling. And then we are going to discuss something on examination. So this is how I carry my batches with all the topics. This is how we are going to move forward with it. As of now, we have discussed till init pods. Now we are going to discuss about your namespaces, labels, limits, variables, props, controllers, rolling updates, rollbacks, and services. So this is our agenda for today. Any other question before we start for today? Okay, I guess not. So we are going to move forward and today we are going to start with your topic called namespaces okay team so
so as you all know that i start with a very basic example for the basic understanding in a layman language all right consider this is a house okay this is a big house inside this big house we have multiple rooms all right this is your room 1 this is your room 2 your room 3 and room 4 okay so this is the house and we have multiple rooms here we have four rooms now every room has some resources right consider that on room 1 you have a bed you have a television right you have fan okay similarly all the resources all the rooms have some resources just like this you have some bed you have some tv you have some fan okay so you do have in every room <clears throat> and you have some common area as well okay for say you have a uh, drawing room you have a hall okay where you place the fridge okay so some of the things which are placed in common area okay so that it will be accessible to all the rooms this is how it happens in a house right so a uh, one question can you control the television of room 1 from room 3 a person who is sitting in room 3 can he control the television which is placed in room 1 okay provided there is no smart gadgets allowed okay so thing the thing is you cannot have any smart gadgets no right so if you are sitting in room 1 the owner of room 1 cannot have access to any resources of room 2 or 3 or 4 similarly it happens with all the rooms but there are some common resources there is a common hall there is a common fridge all the people from all the rooms can have access to that fridge because that is a common resource okay similarly now in kubernetes these different rooms are divisions right in a house rooms provides isolation they provide division similarly in kubernetes cluster these rooms behave as a name space all right so in kubernetes cluster you are going to have a single cluster but still you want to provide some level of isolation you want to have some projects which will not interfere with the resources of different project okay consider this is your project 1 this is your project 2 project 3 project 4 in your kubernetes cluster you have the same cluster you don't want to create multiple clusters so you have just one cluster and you want to have some kind of isolation between these project so that they don't interfere with each other i want the person who is managing who is working on project should work on project 2 only he should not interfere whatever is happening in project 3 so we provide that kind of isolation in kubernetes with the help of name spaces this is what we call name space you are going to have a same single cluster it is going to be a single cluster but in that single cluster we isolate the space in name spaces so that they don't interfere with each other all right we are going to see that practically as well let's connect with the machines so here i am on my master machine okay so team i have connected to my master machine and as of now you can see there is one pod running all right so the team uh, the thing is whenever i do any command it shows me an output that one pod is running 
all right but as you already know that we have some pods of api resources your uh, api server your master components your atcd pods those are also our pods but we cannot see that here we cannot see that but if we want to see that we have to give some flag that is hyphen n cube hyphen system then only you see all those pods if you don't give this flag you don't get the output right so the thing is this cube system is also a namespace okay if we talk in the layman example this is the powerhouse okay consider out of all these house uh, all these rooms you have created one room as a powerhouse which provide uh, for household resources like it is a store room you place everything here all right so all the basic components all the system level components resides in your cube system namespace for example if we'll see <coughs> cube ctl get ns earlier i did cube ctl get pods now if i do cube ctl get ns ns is a short form of namespaces okay so you can see we have four different namespaces first is default second is cube node leases and cube public another one is cube system so you can see these cube system resources are your system level resources that is why they are placed in a separate namespace so that nobody interfere with that and whenever i don't give whenever i do not give any flag if i do cube ctl get pods if i don't give any flag it goes to the default namespace for example if i do this cube ctl delete pod and this pod name it is related cube ctl get pods so now you can see <clears throat> no resources found in default namespace so if you don't uh, don't give any flag it goes to the default namespace all right so this is how you are going to deal with it namespaces provide you isolation we are going to see some practicals as well i'm going to show you okay then i'm going to take your questions so if you want to provide some isolation you create namespaces all right no problem we can create some namespace as well kubernetes give a functionality of that as well so let's create a namespace first cube ctl create ns okay this is the simplest command you can use to create a namespace cube ctl create ns and then the namespace name for example i am using the development one okay now you can see namespace dev is created cube ctl get ns okay now you can see a new name is here your development now if i want to create some resources in this particular namespace i have to give the flag of hyphen n and before that uh, uh let me show you this first then i'm going to show you something else okay i'm going to create one pod cube ctl run dev pod hyphen hyphen image i'm using nginx one if i run this command only cube ctl run dev pod hyphen hyphen image nginx if i'm going to execute this command only your pod will be created in the default namespace but i don't want to create in default namespace so what i'm going to do i'm going to give a flag hyphen n hyphen n stand for namespace and then dev okay now you can see a pod is created if i do cube ctl get pods you won't get the output because this pod is created in the dev namespace so i have to give hyphen n dev as well only then i will be able to see this now your this pod is created in dev namespace now how you are going to identify what what resources can be created inside a namespace and which resources cannot get created inside a namespace because i already told you 
because some of the resources for example television it is a room level resource okay but fridge is a house level resource similarly you have some namespace level resources and you have some of the resources as cluster level resources cluster level resources are accessible to all of them but namespace level resources can be created inside a namespace for example if you see this pod is running here if i'll do hyphen o white you can see this was placed on k node 1 so even if you can see the pod is logically inside a namespace but still it is using the same nodes it means nodes are not your namespace level resource nodes cannot be namespaced nodes are cluster level resource but your pods can be a namespace level resource so earlier also i showed you one command kubectl api hyphen resources okay this command we have already used earlier so all the components names are here <clears throat> and it shows you which can be namespaced okay so if you'll see pod you can see that pods are namespaced equal to true it means you can place your pod inside a namespace but as i told you nodes are not where are nodes can anyone see nodes here yeah, nodes are here <clears throat> so you can see that nodes cannot be namespace because nodes are cluster level resource they are not node uh, your namespace level resource all right kubectl get ns now if i am going if i am going to destroy this room okay if i am going to delete this room completely so all the resources will also be gone okay i don't have to remove and everything particularly one by one but if i delete if i destroy this room everything along with it will be gone kubectl get ns kubectl delete ns dev so if i am going to delete this namespace all the objects which were created inside this namespace will be gone as well so you don't have to remove everything one by one if you want to delete the complete namespace you can delete it on the go so team now if you have any question now you can ask uh sarath what about c groups i'm not sure you, uh, what about you're asking about uh, what you're asking about okay gorov i think i already answered your question how does this separation to place in cluster can we have ports ports with different names based on same nodes yes we can and i think you were able to see that practically as well Fanny, we haven't discussed anything about replicas till now. Okay, we are going to discuss about replicas, but we have to hold on for this. Okay, so please ask the question whatever we have covered so far. If you have any doubt in that, then do ask. Otherwise, those topics will also be covered. Gopal, you are asking how to make dev namespace as default namespace. gopal we can do that the thing is it will be done in the security part okay if you want to make some any other uh, any other namespace as a default namespace that topics come under context okay so it comes under context and security once we will discuss that topic at that time i am going to show you how it actually works how you can make any other namespace as a default one that is a advanced topic that is why i cannot give it to you uh, give it to you right away
if the pod is deleted, it should be deleted. Uh, okay, already covered that. Can we limit resources at namespace level? Kushagra, yes, we can. We can do that. We can have the limitation on your namespace level as well. Okay, you can see that also here. We have that in our agenda. Where it is? Yep, on day six. On day six, you can see namespace limits. We can put both kind of limits. If you want to do resource level limitation, that this much of CPU it should consume, this should, this much of RAM it should uh, consume, or how many number of pods it should get created. It means object level resourcing and your uh, hardware level resourcing. You can put limits on both. Ganapati, no, we cannot create nested namespace. Okay. No nested namespaces. Yes, Akil, uh, it is about different different projects as well. If you want to dis, uh, divide it as per dev QA prod, you can do that. If you want to have different kind of project, different application, you can have one application on one a namespace, different application on different namespace. So it is a logical division. You can use it as my as the way you want. Anurag, namespace is a logical division. If you don't want any interference, by default, there is no interference between resources of namespace A and namespace B. But still, if you want to have networking capabilities between different namespaces, that a namespace A resources should be able to talk to namespace B resource, we can do that. We can see that in the networking concept. On day seven, we are going to see, uh, discuss about networks. There you'll see by default it is not allowed but if you want you can allow that as well amar you're asking can have two namespaces and different pod inside our node yes amar you can namespace is a logical division okay we have three worker nodes with master okay so namespace a will also create all the pods on k node one k node two all right, and if you have created a namespace two, they are also going to create the resources on node A and node two only. Because we do have that nodes, we have created multiple namespaces. We are not adding multiple nodes. So ultimately the same nodes are going to be consumed. So nodes are your hardware level division. That is a different part, but namespace is a logical division. Primpal, what is the use of default namespace? Okay, uh, if it does not have much isolation security as compared to other namespaces. Okay, Primpal, uh, everything, uh, every tool provide you something by default, right? So if you're going to execute some command, for example, kubectl get pods. If you execute this command, or if you execute hyphen n default, both are going to work as same okay just for the handiness they have provided one namespace as a default one they don't want you to give every time the flag as hyphen and default they don't want to execute longer commands okay that is why they say if you don't provide any flag we are going to use the default one and you can change that as well so to have your commands handy that is why we are using like this that is why they are providing a default namespace whenever you create some source they should get created inside some namespace right why are we using namespaces what is the role here uh, sort of i told you that in the beginning itself right if you want to have different projects for example you have a same cluster and you are having different application you have three different application and you want that three applications should have completely isolated environment. So you are not going to create three different cluster of Kubernetes. You are going to use a single cluster of your Kubernetes, but you are going to namespace them so that there should not be any interference. Your node, uh, your project A, your application A will not be interfered with the resources which are residing in your namespace B and namespace C. So to provide your 
logical isolation that is why we use name spaces i mean kernel concepts how name space originated sarat if you are going to how it is originated you have to go to google and they have created complete kubernetes on golang all right so they have complete code how all the resources are originated we are discussing about the functionality what is kubernetes and what functionality does it provide how it originated that is a completely different topic here Imagine if database pods are on another namespace, can it be accessible by pod application which is sitting on another namespace? Yes, Imagine. If you want to do that, you can do that. Okay. By default, the networking doesn't allow you with cross namespace resource utilization. But if you want to do that with the networking concept, you can do that as well. You can allow communication between two namespaces as well. If any, no, there is no as such limitation like that. Okay, you can create as many namespaces as you want. Rimpal, you are asking, can we create pod on a specific node? If you were present in my previous class, you must have known that. Okay, we have discussed how we are going to create your specific pod on specific nodes. If you were not in my previous class, I request you to have the recording of my last class. I have already shown a complete practical on that. Static words are there for this. Sanjay, you are asking, uh, can you show processes running in any namespace? Sanjay, by default, Kubernetes doesn't allow you to show real-time processes. How much uh, your resource utilization are there? We have to install Matrix Server for that. Okay, Matic server is also a kind of deployment that you can have so that you can see the resource utilization. As of now, we have not covered that part. We are going to see that, but not right away. Uh, team, allow me a minute, please.
Oh, hi. Sorry to bother you. Oh, I had to do something in a rush. Ashok, no. If you have created a namespace one, you cannot rename it. Okay, you just have to delete it and recreate it. Chandrasekhar, the namespace name uh, cube node leash and cube public are not used anywhere else. Okay, this is used for the internal processes of Kubernetes. So, anywhere in your practical experience, anywhere in the examination. There is no question and nothing related to cube node leaks and cube public. You will always be dealing with default namespace and cube system. That is all. So you can ignore cube leaks and uh, cube public as well. Uh, Sumit, if I'm using same resources in two different namespace, how the memory and CPU utilization happens for both of them? Is it separate or both consume the same resource? Okay, okay, Sumit. Uh, the thing is, you have to understand a part that if you have a same, you cannot have a same television in different rooms, right? There is a television in room one, and there is a television in room two as well. They might be similar, they might be identical, there might not be any difference with the configuration of the television, the number of channel, cable connection, remote can be similar, everything can be similar, but. These two televisions are completely different. They are individual. They are unique. They are unique to the rooms. So anything which you have in namespace one and you have the similar object in namespace two, they will be two different unique items. So they will consume the resource as per their load. Consider you have a nginx pod running on namespace one and you have another nginx pod running on node two. So if any application hits comes on your first nginx pod the resource consumption will be there and whenever your application target will hit your second nginx server so it will be consumed from node 2 so they might be identical but still they are unique in their own way Moswami, in uh, component status, my scheduler and controller manager is showing unhealthy. Why? Because of network. Okay, uh, Moswami, we have to see that. We have to troubleshoot that. Uh, you have to see that if you have uh, installed any third party CNI as well. If CNI, uh, CNI is not available, it might show you uh, unhealthy. Okay, so please check that your CNI is in place or not. And still, if it is unhealthy, we have to troubleshoot. We have to do the kubectl describe command. And with describe command, we are going to see how the things are happening at the backend, if there is any issue or not. All right. Any other question, team? All right, let's move to another concept now. Now the part is consider on a uh, in a cluster. Okay, we have a cluster. Inside that cluster, I'm going to create multiple pods. Okay, your namespace is gone. Okay, so we can ignore that now. Consider inside a cluster <clears throat> inside any particular namespace I am creating multiple pods okay so team on the higher level I want some kind of identification okay definitely uh, these all pods might be of uh, different different flavor right one may be your nginx second may be your httpd third may be your redis okay that is based on the functionality but i want to have some kind of differentiation as well okay like this is my production pod this is my dev pod this is my uh, qa pod 
okay so if you have same application and your same application running in all the environments so all the images will be same all the pods will be same but i want to have some kind of identification all right so for that purpose we use some kind of labels okay now again i always try to give examples as a layman examples all right so a layman example for this consider uh, you are inside your kitchen all right inside your kitchen inside your kitchen you have multiple jars right in some jars you place sugar in some jars you play, uh, place salt right in some jars you have uh, something else okay so how do you identify on which particular jar what is actually inside if you are no man then how you are going to identify that which is sugar and which is salt you cannot identify that right so what we do over the jar we place some kind of label we place some kind of sticker okay and with that we can identify okay this jar contains some sugar this jar contains some salt okay so what we do we place some kind of sticker or simply you can say we put some kind of labels over the jar so that we can identify that this jar contains sugar this jar contains salt right similarly in kubernetes as well we place some kind of a label on our pod so that we can do the identification okay so how it goes let's see that practically this is my master machine okay so if you want to give labels it is very easy if you do it from the command line with the imperative com imperative commands kubectl run pod1 hyphen hyphen image <coughs> nginx all right now if you want to give labels you can simply give it by providing two slashes and label as a keyword okay hyphen hyphen labels equals to in single quotes i am going to give all the environment uh, all the labels so the thing is i am saying that this pod belongs to the environment which is of production okay so that is i have given all right so i have given only one label as of now let's create multiple pods with multiple labels two okay the environment for this pod is going to be dev okay everything is same name is different image is same now i want to identify this pod as a dev pod i can give multiple labels uh, as well okay i'll say that owner of this pod is shop okay i can give that this pod is also created let's create another pod this is my pod 3 all right and this uh, pod belongs to say production environment okay and this time i am not giving as owner i am giving another one type what kind of pod it is what type of pod it is i'll say this is this is the database pod okay so you can see i have created three pods cube ctl get pods you can see three pods are running here pod 1 pod 2 pod 3 now you may ask that what is the use case of labels okay what is the use case we have understood the functionality how they uh, provide the differentiation but what is the use case consider inside your cluster 100 pods are running okay consider inside your cluster 100 pods are running out of them there are some database pods as well there are some application pod as well there are some middleware pods as well okay so how you if you want to see only pods which are database pods how you are going to see that you have 100 of pods you are not going to filter it one by one you need some kind of filtration okay so what i am going to do i want to see just database pods outside uh, out of those 100 pods i want to get the output only for the database pods so listing command is same you see till get pods this is going to be same hyphen l i can give and then i can give the type equals to database okay 
so whenever you give hyphen l flag and you provide the uh, pod definition or pod label then you are going to see the output for that only okay now what i need i need to list the pods which are owned by shub only i don't want to see any other pod i just want the list of pods which are owned by shub okay do that you can see only pod 2 you want to see only production pods you don't want to see any development pod you don't want to see any qa pod no problem you can do that env equals to broad now you can see only two pods pod 1 and pod 3 because these two pods were defined as environment equals to production okay team so this is how you are going to give your labels to your pods okay so where does this label occurs label occurs on the pod level so any doubts with the pod now Krish, you are asking label should be unique in same cluster, right? If you give, if we have, if we give same name, Krish, yeah, they don't have to be unique. You can see I gave environment equals to production to two pods. Okay, so it is an identification. In a layman example, you can have sugar in two jars. You can have salt in three jars. So you are going to place the same sticker on all three of them that this is salt. So your labels does not need to be unique <coughs> for creating pod instead of run we can uh, use create yes Sanjay if you want to use your YAML formatting you want to have your manifest file then you can have labels inside your uh, manifest file as well with manifest file only if you use create command okay I'll show you that how we are going to use your uh, this just a minute yeah so I'm going to show you how you are going to use your labels inside your manifest file as well I'll show you that Jagannath how uh, do we use and or uh, or condition while selecting labels uh, Jagannath, it's not about AND and OR. If you want to give two variables, you can give two variables that you can do. Owner equals to show. Okay. No. Even I haven't tried that any time before. So, no. If you are using your labels for listing, you can use only one label at a time. Uh, maybe with a comma. So this is a different question. I have never encountered this. No, it doesn't work. All right. Any other question till now? Oh, you it is working for you why not for us you are asking how uh, can labels be assigned to the existing pods go whenever you create a pod a label is created by default okay and my is dev I have already given
Okay. Was I doing any spelling mistake? Okay. So yeah, it is an and condition. All right. It is not an or condition. It is an and condition. So both the condition, if both the conditions satisfy, then your hyphen L is going to give you the output. All right. So uh, somebody was asking if I do create a pod without a name, uh, without a label, and if I want to label it. So the thing is, uh, by default, whenever you create a pod, a label is defined there. All right. So let me show you. Kubectl run hyphen hyphen image nginx. Okay. I have to give the pod name as well. Pod four. All right. So if you're going to execute this much command, you haven't given any label. Still, by default, some labels are placed at the backend. If you want to see that, we can see that with the dry run command. You all know that, right? Dry run command we have already executed. F and O, YAML. Okay, so team here you can see whenever I create any resource, a by default label is already placed. Okay, so run pod four. We haven't given this label, but it is created by default. So labels are always there, whether you give it or not. If you give, it will use that label. If you won't give, it will have some label by default at its own end. Okay, so if you want to see that as also. Let me show you for something else. Okay, let's do the try run for this command. All right, <clears throat> so team, here you can see, here it didn't took the default one, right? Whenever you define the labels explicitly, the labels are going to be just like that. Labels, environment equals to prod, type equals to DV. All right. So if you don't give labels, some by default label will be there. If you will define the label, default label will be gone and the labels that you have defined will be there. Okay. So if you want to create it from the YAML manifest, you have to give the labels under metadata. That is how it is going to be. Okay. Any doubt with labels now? Any other question? What is the other possible uh, use case of labels other than justifying filter, just filtering and identification of pods? Primpal, uh, we use labels very handy. Okay. Uh, then uh, how we are going to proceed, you will see how much we are going to use uh, your near labels. Labels are used with your uh, node selection as well. Okay. If you are going to use your props, we are going to use that uh, in props. I'm not sure. But uh, yes, labels do provide a vital role. Okay. As we are going to proceed, I'll tell you where, where labels are being used. But as of now, you just understand that labels are used for the identification purpose. Where will we use uh, labels? I'll show you that later. Any other question from labels? Clear to all of you? Okay, looks like not. All right, so team, next concept we are going to cover is your environment variables. Okay, now we are going to discuss about your environment variables. Environment variable, as the name suggests, right, we have some kind of environment variables in any uh, machine. 
okay so whenever we create some pods we might need some of the environment variables inside our container as well okay we have discussed about namespaces labels environments variable we are on okay so we want to provide some kind of variable inside our container as well how we are going to have that environment variable we are going to use the same way as we used your labels uctl delete pods hyphen hyphen all okay <clears throat> so now first i'm going to show you the right one then i'm going to create the label actually sorry environment variable so to run any container or pod you use kubectl run command okay again i am defining pod 1 image and genex earlier i gave labels now i am giving env env is your environment variable keyword okay single quote start for say i am giving as training equals to cka all right quotes close if i'm going to execute this much a pod will be created with a container as a environment variable with training equals to cka all right but see uh, let's see the try run first try run equals to client okay and then hyphen o yaml okay so team where does your environment variable reside you can see that okay labels comes under metadata so label is a property of a pod that is why it is coming under metadata but where is your environment variable environment variables comes under your container specification okay so all the environment variables are your container level resource so any environment variable you define will be inside your container container specification you can see specs container environment name is training and value is ck means training is equals to ck now i am going to create this container as well okay let's remove that dry run okay your pod is created if i want to log into my pod how do i do that kubectl exec command we have seen that nothing new and then i am going to give the pod name pod1 and then some bash prompt now you can see i am inside my pod okay so if you want to see environment variable what is the command print env okay so you can see that whenever a pod is created whenever a machine is created we have some variables environment variables created by default okay some environment variables are your image based okay you have nginx image so some environment variables coming from that you are using it as a kubernetes uh, pod that is why you have some kubernetes level environment variable as well but you have the environment variable that you have defined as well okay so it will have the environment variable that you have created if i'll come outside control pq all right let's have an example from the repo as well shall we Oh, where are pods? Here it is. Do we have any environment variable pods? So, yeah, here it is. I'm going to pick this one. So, team, what is happening here? I'm going to create a pod. This is the name of the pod. I have given a label as well. 
all right these are the specification containers is if you want to have the image from a private repo or uh, not from the git repo uh, sorry not from the docker hub right away you can have gcr uh, repo as well this is your google cloud repo okay i am giving the environment variable as welcome equals to hello from the environment and ck exam equals to ck exam version 1.18 okay so this yaml i am going to take cube ctl create hyphen f okay your pod is created cube ctl get pods still creating it is a heavy image so it is taking some time yeah now it is ready all right so your environment variable uh, pod is created if you want to see the environment variable you can again see that in this one also cube ctl Uh, just a minute. Yeah, cube ctl exec hyphen it. All right, pod name hyphen hyphen. If I'll give bash, I will be logged inside to my pod or container with a bash prompt. If you want to provide some command right away, you can do that as well. What I want to do, I want to go inside my container and have the print env. So I don't have to go inside my container. I can say I can simply give the command right here itself. Okay, so I did hyphen hyphen print env and I give the environment variables right here. You can see welcome, hello from the environment and ck exam ck exam version one point eight. So if you want to provide <coughs> any environment variables like this, you can provide with environment variables. <coughs> env is a keyword. And how, if you want to give it inside a definition, a YAML file, we have seen that as well. Okay. Any question with environment variables? Uh, sir, will it be used across cluster? or we have to set it per cluster environment variables rahul it is not a cluster level resource at all if you have multiple kubernetes cluster that is a completely different thing okay we are using it inside a cluster and even if you have to give the environment variables environment variables are are at the container level not even at the pod level so even if you're creating two containers and you want to pass on the environment variable to different containers, you have to mention it specifically. Okay. So it is not even at the cluster level, it is at the container level. Jagannath, uh, you're asking if we have multiple containers inside a pod, is it the environment variable available to pod the container? Jagannath, you can see the definition here. Okay, this is one container definition. Inside that container definition, you are giving variable. If you want to have another container, you are going to have this complete definition below and you give another environment variables. So if you want to have two containers inside a pod, you have to define environment variable twice. Okay, because it is container specific. Okay, <clears throat> now we can see pretty much responses, so we can start now. All right, so team, we have uh, covered environment variables, we have covered limits. Next thing that we are going to cover are probes. Okay. So team, there are two type of probes. First is your liveliness. OK, 
Okay, and second is your readiness. Okay, so you have two types of probes. First is your liveliness probes and second is your readiness probe. But what actually probes are there? Okay, before understanding about type of probes, what are probes actually? So team, now you can see that one of your pod is running, right? <clears throat> pod one is actually running. But how do you find out that your container inside this pod is healthy? Your pod is running, everything is fine. But how do you know that your container is working fine? Your container is healthy. Or say your container is serving the purpose that for what it is created. Consider you have created a container. Okay, you have created an Nginx container. It should by default listen to port number 80. Okay, but because of some reason, it is not listening to port number 80. It is listening to port number 800. Okay, and you are checking your application on port number 80. So your application won't be available at you to you at port number 80. All right, it means your functionality is not being served, but your container is running, your pod is running. Right. So in these scenarios, your probes comes into picture. OK, probes are nothing but probes do the health check. All right. Uh, Arjun, you are talking about our Docker commands. We don't want to do anything with the Docker. We are going to do everything with the probes. Right. So the thing is, I want to do some kind of health checks or condition checks from Kubernetes itself. I don't want to go to any other tool. All right. So for that purpose, Kubernetes provide you probes. Okay, and there are two type of probes as I told you. First is your liveliness, and second is your readiness. I'll show you this right away practically so that it will be more clear to you. All right, here it is probes, and this is your liveliness probe. Let's see what it is actually. Okay. First is your API server version. All of this is clear to you. Metadata, names, label, this is all clear to you. All right. The specs, termination, grace, uh, period, you can ignore it for now. All right. You have container, your container name, your container image, and your port number is 80. All right. Nginx container will be running on port number 80. And I have put a liveliness prop check here. Okay. I have defined a liveliness prop. It means it is going to do some kind of check. All right, these are comment out. All right, I have just written here so that you understand that what you can do. Consider your application has some application URL, right? You can provide that at the HTTP get, provide the URL here. If that URL is working, then your container is fine. If not, it means your liveliness prop is failing. All right, you can check for some path also, right? That it a particular path is created or not. If that particular path is not created, it means your container won't be serving that purpose because we want that part to be there. So you can do the path check as well. You can do the port check as well for your application URL. Consider you have a database port. In database port, you work on TCP ports. So you can see that if your TCP port is working or not, right? So these are the checks. Let's take this file and create your pod and then see how it goes okay so what is initial delay second it means it will wait for five seconds after that it will check for your liveliness prop it is not that if your pod is created it will do the check initial right away it will have an initial delay of five seconds after five seconds it will check and it will check after every five seconds liveliness prop will be checked after every five seconds that it is uh, VA L dot YAML. Okay, so I have placed this YAML file here. All right, so as of now, you can see I'm checking port number 800. So it should fail because your container port, which is available, is port number 80. So I have given a wrong port number. So your prop should fail. So let's see how it goes. Create hyphen F L dot channel. Okay, so your Nginx demo pod is created. Kubectl 
get pots okay i should have all that cube ctl delete pots I'm just removing the PBS pod, which are of no use for us now. see your engineering spot has restarted twice right earlier it was zero restart now it has restarted twice why is that so now see it has restarted twice three time restarts so why it is restarting again and again because you have placed a probe check liveness probe is as per its own name okay so team for the basic definition you can understand what is the difference between liveness probe and readiness probe i will define uh, i will give you the readiness probe as well but it is right away from the name liveless probe it means your container will not be live if the probe is failing if the probe is failing it will delete the pod and it will restart the pod again and again again and again until and unless your pod is listening it to it correctly okay now you can see it has restarted four times now it has a crash loop back it means it is again deleting and creating again and again let's try to explain it also qctl describe pod pod name team what error you can see here unhealthy where liveness prop failed it tried to do the tcp and this is your uh, I, this ip is of your uh, pod okay so if you want to see cube ctl get pods hyphen o white okay 10.44.02 10.44.02 is the ip of your pod and the port number it is trying to listen is port number 800 and its connection is refused that is why it is keeps it is keep on restarting this pod now you can see it has been restarted five times okay so it will keep doing that until unless your prop is passed all right so if i delete it kubectl delete pod pod name okay your pod is deleted Let's modify it. Okay, this time I'm going to check for your liveness port in number 80. All right, let's try it this time. Kubectl create hyphen f alder channel okay there's some matter with the formatting i hope it should work now line number 17 okay one two three four five six seven Let's see it on the GitHub repository itself. Yeah, here it is <clears throat> on the same line.
I had to uncomment the HTTP get as well. Okay, because earlier we were checking for TCP port, TCP socket. Now we are checking for HTTP port. Okay, so now your port is created. Kubectl, uh, just a minute. Kubectl get ports. Okay, now it is running. It is not going to restart. If we want to verify, we can describe it. Kubectl describe port port name. Okay, now this time you can see there are no failures. Your probe is passed successfully. There is no problem with that. All right, everything is normal here. So this is how your liveliness probe work. If your probe is failing, if your probe is failing, it will keep on restarting your port until unless your check is passed. This is the story of your liveliness probe. Okay. I hope it is clear to all of you. <clears throat> Any question with liveliness prop? Okay, some of you answered as well. Okay, thanks, Anil, Gopal, Gaurav. All right, so uh, Arjun, under liveliness prop, we have TCP socket and other definition. Is there a man page like in Linux uh, for us to know that available condition and parameters available in Kubernetes? All right. Uh, so Arjun, yes, there might be on the official documentation. It must be there. All right. So probably on this. Okay, so this is the official documentation. Whatever the probes you can use will be provided here. Okay, all types of probes, what are the condition, everything will be placed here. And I have also placed the examples here. All right, so you can try the examples that I have placed here. Okay, I open the same page. Your ports and under ports you have probes. Okay, so I have placed multiple conditions here. So whatever the application you have, if you have database port, there are two type of ports itself. Okay, first is your database port. On database ports, you can do the health check on the TCP port. So that is one story. If you have application port, how you can test about your application? There might be a URL, there might be a port number. So only these kind of checks are there if you want to do it on the condition in probes. So first is your liveliness probe that we have already discussed. And now I'm going to discuss about your readiness probe. Before that, if you have any questions, you can ask. I might have missed some questions as of now. Can we generate uh, some alert? Yes, uh, Ganapati, again, if you want some alerting system, that is a part of monitoring. I have uh, repeated it today many times. Okay, if you want to get some alerts, if you want to get some notification, that is a part of your notifications, uh, sorry, monitoring. So yes, these things can be done. You can get the output all the time, but with the help of monitoring. So that is the part we are going to discuss later on. Any other question with the liveliness probe till now? All right, so let me show you another example for your readiness probe now. It will be used for only port or we can use other couple I have shown you here. I request you to pay attention. I have already shown you and discussed multiple times. It is not just port, you can give the path as well. You can give your application URL as well. You have multiple things. 
so it is not only with board it is with the path as well it is with your application url as well i have shown you that okay so let me show you another example of readiness prop this time all right so now you can see all the definitions are exactly same your kind metadata name labels all right container name image everything is same container port number all right readiness prop okay this time i have given the definition as readiness prop in the previous definition it was liveliness prop here that is the only difference apart from that i am doing the health check for your http get itself okay port number again i am checking for 800 okay this is not the correct value you can understand that because your nginx is listening at port number 80 again i have given the wrong port number so that we can see what actually it does i'll have the yaml kubectl create hyphen f your pod is created kubectl get pods okay so team now you can see it is returning can you see any difference with the liveliness prop it is running and it is not getting restarted any difference you can see in the output gobal shiju anil you are right kapil pay attention still not the right answer arjun kadavati yes kapil now you saw it right feni yes mosami yes chandrashekhar still you have to get it yes rahul yes sort of this uh, i haven't given the right port number okay so it is a problematic situation right now but what is the difference i haven't given the right port number i'm asking about the readiness prop you have to see the lower one lower port rp engineering demo yes sir the port is not getting restarted we have seen that but what is the difference team can you see the ready status as zero oblique one right so readiness prop is not making it ready to serve the application okay your pod is running your pod is not getting restarted but it is not allowed to serve the request okay your hotel is open your restaurant is open but your kitchen is not ready so it is not serving any customers right now right that is why it is showing zero oblique one it means you have zero container running inside the pod right now why is that because you have a prop condition and that is failing if you want to see you have to do kubectl describe pod and pod name okay now you can see warning unhealthy okay readiness prop failed at http get port number 800 it is failing at your port number 800 connection refused okay kubectl get pods you can see it is still not restarted but it is zero oblique one so what is the difference between readiness prop and liveliness prop the name explains itself okay liveliness prop it means your container will not be live okay in liveliness prop your container will not be live in readiness prop your container will not be ready that is the difference in liveliness prop your container will not be live it means your container will be killed and it will keep on restarting it will keep on recreating again and again until unless your prop is passed in liveliness in readiness prop it won't make it ready it means if your check is failing it means your container is not ready to serve the purpose okay it will keep on waiting it will not make it ready until unless your check is passed 
Even now, if you check, it is show. It will show you zero oblique one. Even after three minutes, it is not restarting. It is just not making it ready in readiness problem. Okay, so let's try to edit it. Cube CTL edit pod pod name. I'm not hundred percent sure if your props can be modified in the real time. Okay, so the team uh, thing is. It is not always that you can modify everything with the running parts. There are some fields that you can modify. There are some fields that you cannot modify. Okay, edit cancel no uh, valid changes. Okay, so this value cannot be changed. Cube CTL delete part hyphen hyphen all. Okay, I'll take this definition. V I R dot YAML. Okay, I'm just modifying the port number. I'm giving the right one. Port number eighty. Cube CTL. Create hyphen F. R dot YAML. Cube CTL get ports. See now your prop has passed, and that is why it is showing you one oblique one. When you gave the right port number, it allowed it to be ready. Your readiness prop passed, so it made it ready. Cube CTL describe port. RP port. Okay, so you can see there are no problems this time. Everything is running perfectly fine. Okay, so readiness probe won't make it ready, and liveliness probe won't let it live until and unless your probe is passed. These are the two probes which is available in Kubernetes. We have discussed both. Let me know if you have any problem with any of that. Any question with liveliness probe and readiness probe? Ah, uh, yes, Jaydeep, you were right. But if the container itself is not ready, then will it be able to ping URL? Anil, no, that is not the case. Ah, uh, it means your container is created. Your container is created and it is available. But the prop is not passed. It means there is something going on inside the pod. Okay, the example I gave you earlier in the earlier classes. For init pod, init container, it means that your restaurant is open, but your kitchen is not ready to serve. It means you place the readiness prop where there is some cooking required. Okay, it is not that once your container is created right away, and it will start serving the request. Your purpose is once your container is created, it has to cook something. It has to Create some HTML pages for your Nginx uh, web server, or it has to do some work. After that, it is going to serve the request. So for that purpose, either you can use init container, or either you can use readiness prop. So you will place the readiness prop for five seconds, or ten seconds, or one minute as per your requirement. After that, it will make your container available. Your container is created; it is waiting to make it available. Okay, I hope it is clear to you, Anil. Can we have dependent pod to be created later based on the other pod uh, prop success? Uh, Ganapati, no, that is not the case. If your one prop is failed, props are basically on a particular container itself. Okay, you cannot define a condition for another container or pod based on the props defined on one container. Okay, for that purpose, you have init containers. props is done on the specific container itself suppose my container uh, is taking second seconds for starting and liveliness initial delay is 5 second in that case my pod will continue to restart forever yes kushagar that is going to be the case so you have to place your props very intelligently 
if you know that your container comes up online after second seven seconds so at least you should have a initial delay of nine seconds or ten seconds at least in production uh, should we always use readiness prop it is it a good practice yes i did a guess it is a good practice that is why readiness and liveness props are there for do the health checks okay also if you want you can use both the props itself okay there is no hard and fast rule you can use only one prop you can use both the props and here is also another example for that okay in my app dot yaml okay so you are going to practice this one at your own right you can use your own image i have used my own image okay so it is up to you i have also used the readiness prop here and i have also used the liveliness prop here okay so in http get you can see i have provided the path as well it means i will provide the ip address colon port number slash pet clinic and then you are going to do the complete check okay if you want to execute some command as well okay you don't want to do this check on the url you can use the command as well it means curl localhost colon 8080 slash pet clinic okay so if you want to execute some command as well you can do that also all right so team if props are clear to all of you we can move to the next topic can we kushagra how to decide which prop to use <coughs> uh, use cases please <coughs> kushagra use cases i uh, have explained to some extent okay readiness props are mostly used when we have some uh, containers that has to cook something so there is some time after that they will be available okay so it is not a uh, on the go <coughs> so once your container is created once your pod once your pod is created it is not going to serve the request right away it has to wait some time after that it is going to serve the request in that case we use readiness prop okay and i told you that you can use both the props itself so they are for the condition check it is up to you which check you want to use liveliness prop is consider you have some application with which you don't want to have some wait because you know once your container is live it will start serving that request right away okay so there is no purpose of waiting for some initial delay second or for being it ready there you use liveliness prop it means your container is live it should start serving the request right away if it is not serving the request it means there is some problem with the container and it should be deleted and recreated again so in that case you are going to use your liveliness prop all right could you please explain the difference between initial delay second period seconds and timeout seconds okay there are so many variety okay first is your initial delay second it means this check will not take place when your container is created your pod is created for 5 more seconds okay consider my container and pod is created right now so it will wait for 5 second before doing the readiness prop check okay that is your initial delay second it will wait for 5 seconds after creation of your pod and container then it is going to do the readiness check then you have period second it means it will keep on checking after every 5 second consider your application is currently available okay your application is available your application url is working and after some time what happen your application load increase which your container was not able to handle and that is why your application has stopped responding on that particular port number your application is not responding anymore so how then how you are going to check that your prop is being passed and failed it means it is a period second that it will check after every 5 second even if your prop is passed even if your prop is passed once it will keep on checking after every 5 second consider after 10 minutes your prop has failed so again it will make your container as not available 
or it will delete your container based on the readiness prop and liveness prop it will take action but it will keep on checking after every five seconds that is your period seconds and timeout second timeout second is once your prop has failed okay if your prop is getting passed it will check after every five seconds but your prop has failed then there comes your timeout second once your prop is failed it will check after every three seconds this time okay that is your timeout seconds so this is the definition of all three so i hope it is clear to you will you will be covering how to use local images in kts uh Sarath, how what do you mean by local images the images which are uh, downloaded on the machines so that is all okay i guess So even if you have local images, if you have a remote images, it doesn't matter because the image downloading is done by your Docker. Kubernetes is not downloading any images. Okay, Sarat, if you remember, I have shown you today itself how to use local repositories, registries. Okay, I have also shown you how you can use Google registry as well. An example I took just uh, today was from google registry here you can see i am also taking the image from a privately owned registry as well okay so both the example i have shown you the maximum period second we can set and uh, it should be minimum suggested sort of that is all dependent on your business requirement okay it is all based on your business requirement that how much minimum uh, downtime you have signed with the client what is your service level agreement that your application will be available 99.9% .9 of time okay so it is all dependent on that that what how much maximum period seconds you are going to define what should be the minimum value so it is based on your business requirement you can give any you can give two seconds you can give five seconds you can give ten seconds and it is also dependent on your image okay that how much how heavy your image is how much time it is going to get downloaded how much it time it is going to uh, have something cooked if your container is cooking something then how much processing it is going to do how much scripts it is going to execute so it is all dependent on that that how much processing needs to be done and what time it takes to do the processing consider you are executing some script before your readiness prop okay so your script execution take five seconds then give the initial delay second of seven seconds if your scripts execution take 20 seconds you have to give the initial delay second of 25 seconds then so it is all dependent that how your business is defined how your processing is being done at the back end All right. Okay. So team next topic. All right. Props are covered. Then we had services, but to uh, services are on this agenda as well okay so what we are going to do we are going to cover services at once only okay first we are going to discuss about your controllers all right so it is an interesting topic all right so do pay attention <coughs> i hope you'll like it all right so first is your rc first controller we are going to discuss is rc which is called replication controller Okay, so team, let's discuss about your controllers. How many type of controllers are there? So when we discuss about the architecture, if you remember, I told you there is a controller manager, right? In the architecture, you know there are controller manager and I told you there are multiple controller manager. It is not just a single component. You have your node manager, you have your pod manager, okay? 
so we have multiple controllers control manager contains multiple controllers so we are going to discuss about those controllers now all right so first thing first as we have already understood that it is never suggested to have a single container for your single application right because there is no load balancing being taken place no auto scaling is there no load balancing no uh, distribution of traffic okay there is nothing so if there is only one pod it might get failed it might get restarted and during that time your application will be not available so what we always need we have some multiple replicas we need to have multiple replicas so that even if a container goes down your customer will be able to use your another container to have the application availability okay so for high availability we always create multiple replicas of your single application pod for that purpose one of the controller is called replication controller okay so team the thing is i have to tell you replication controller is kind of obsolete now it is depreciated all right but i am going to give you some idea about this okay first is your replica controller replication controller it is all right qctl api hyphen resources where is replication controller it has to be somewhere this object is called replication controller all right and the short name is rc so if you want to define the application controller you can give rc as well all right but the kind you have to mention is replication controller so what is replication controller i am going to create three replicas of my same container all right let's take an example directly so that it will be more clear to you you have to go to the controllers replica controller all right so team let's try to understand it what replication controller actually does okay first is your api server all right kind is replication controller this time what is the name of replication controller is tomcat rc all right under specification i have defined three replicas it means i am not going to create a single container i am going to create three containers of the same type so that load balancing can take place okay for high availability selector field is application tomcat it is for your uh, labels okay template so now under template you are going to give the definition of your pod okay this is your application controller this is the name of your application controller and under specification template you are going to give your tomcat pod definition okay what is the metadata tomcat is going to be the name of your tomcat pod okay tomcat rc and this is going to be your label i am defining label as well so tomcat is the name of your pod here i am going to put some label also pod is equals to tomcat rc app equals to tomcat i am giving some labels and what is the specification of that pod containers i am going to image name the user container name as tomcat and this is the image i am going to use learn devops tomcat this is from the private registry okay so let's have this example let's have the raw format i'll copy it kubectl get pods cube ctl delete pods hyphen hyphen all cube ctl create hyphen f 
So team, I am going to create a replication controller. I am going to create a RC. All right. So let's see kubectl get RC. So you can see the desired count is three. How much current state is three? It means I must be having three pods. What I desired was three pod and how much I'm actually having three pods. As of now, none of them is ready. Okay, now you can see desired was three. I asked for three pods. Current state, there are currently three pods running and three pods are ready as well. kubectl get pods. Okay, so the naming convention you can understand. This is the name of your replication controller. Okay, first the name of your application controller, then some random alphanumeric string is going to be there. And you can see the three pods created at the same time by the replication controller. So whenever you want to have multiple replicas, you are not going to create them one by one. You are going to use replication controller. All right. So I told you this is a controller. What was the responsibility of controller manager? Controller manager responsibility was I have some actual state and I have a desired state. It has to manage them. Because of some reason, if one pod goes down, it should get created automatically. Right? That was our expectation. Let's try to delete one of the pod. kubectl delete pod pod name. Okay, once our pod is deleted, still you can see current is 3, ready is 3. Why? You can see when I deleted a pod, another pod came online 16 seconds ago, right away. So what your replication controller did, even if one of your container goes down, even one of your pod is deleted manually, your replication controller is going to manage the state no matter what. Okay, so it will still be there. You can delete all, it will create them all. kubectl delete pods hyphen hyphen all. I'm deleting all the pods. Still, you can see. You can see the RC. It is 333 again. Why? Because all the pods are created again with the help of your replication controller. Okay. So if you have to delete the pods, you have to delete the RC. kubectl delete RC, RC name. And once your application controller is gone, your pods will get terminated. All the pods are gone. Okay, so team, this is the story of your replication controller. Yes, Sanjay, self filling it is. So team, any doubts, any question with your replication controller? Because if uh, the pod goes down, then application controller will handle and create new pods. Yes, sort of, you're right. Team, any question with replication controller? Clear to all of you? Sumit, you are asking, can we edit any specific pod within RC? No, Sumit, you cannot do that. The reason is your replication controller is managing them and the purpose of replication controller or is load balancing. So load balancing will be done or with similar pods. If you have different kind of pod, then there is no load balancing between them. Okay, so all the three pods, all the replicas that you have defined, should be exactly the same. So, with or it has to be unique under RC. Okay, I already answered that. Kushagra, does it create a static manifest like Kubelet uh, do for the static pods? 
no kushagra there is no static manifest right here okay replication controller manages it at its own at the back end there is no manifest with uh, like your static bots or something okay replication controller manages it at the back end yes himanshu we can modify the replicas in the real time as well okay that is my next part to which i am coming okay so team if it is clear uh, let me have next thing how to create new replicas based on traffic ganapati i am coming to that only okay i am coming to that only okay so team as i already told you that your replication controller is obsolete now okay it is depreciated why it is depreciated because it is being replaced by another object called replica set okay your replication controller has been replaced by rs that is your replica set so why is that <clears throat> because your replica controller had some short falling that is why your replica set removed or uh, those short coming and replace it with the replica set so what were the challenges with the replica controller and what are the additional feature we get in replica set we are going to see about that first thing first again i am going to take a lame an example this time <clears throat> Mm, yes kushagra you are right okay so team uh, let's take a lemon example all right consider you are working in an organization all right you are working in an organization and the, a new project came and that new project asks for that you want to have at least four five, uh, five people with kubernetes expertise okay as of now there is a manager in your team okay there is a manager in your team and these are your resources okay i'm not deleting these images consider these are also human resources so what is the manager is doing manager has a person in his team who is of linux expertise okay your manager has another person with database expertise your manager has already a person in a team with kubernetes expertise okay then a new project came and that new project asks for four people with kubernetes expertise skill set okay a new project came to your manager and it asked for four people with kubernetes expertise all right so what happened your manager went to another person in human resourcing okay your manager went to hr and he said there is a new project <clears throat> i need four people with kubernetes expertise okay you have to hire four people that have the skill set of kubernetes okay so what happened there is already a person with kubernetes expertise already there in his team okay so now how many people does it require for the same skill set how many people we have to hire this time do we have to hire four people or do we have to hire three people yes rishab you are right team so the new project came it asked for four people with kubernetes expertise all right but inside our team we already have one person with kubernetes expertise then how many people we have to hire this time right himanshu sanjay adhirika guys you're right kapil you are not okay team try to understand this i already have one person in my team with kubernetes expertise okay the project requires four people so i already have one people why do i have to hire four more people i'll have five kubernetes experts in my team if i hire four i already have one why cannot i consume this person in the new project also right 
so i have to hire only three more people because i already have one person in my team with kubernetes expertise i can consume him also in the project he can also contribute and i can have three more people so this much of smartness was not present in replication con replication controller okay this smartness was not there with replication controller if you have created a replication controller if you have mentioned four number it is going to create four replication controller it is going to create four replicas no matter what if the similar pod is already running okay if the similar pod is already running it is not going to count it in it in it is going to create four pods no matter what it is not going to take care that if already a pod is running with the same functionality or not it is not going to worry about that it is going to create four pods right away replica set came with some smartness okay replica replica set came with some smartness it said okay if i already have a pod with the same functionality and you are asking for four replicas i am going to create only three replicas i am not going to create four replicas okay so i already have one i am going to count it in right so that is why your replica set is a smarter one it is also going to look into the cluster first that if a similar pod is running or not and if it is there it is not going to create another one if it is asking for four it will create three because one is already there all right now i am going to take an example for that all right so team now you can see the kind is changed now i am using replica set the name of replica set is test and i am asking for three replicas here comes something in picture which is called selector field okay selector field was not there in your replication controller but selector field is here in your replica set it is going to match the label here okay it is going to match the label now under template again under template you have to give the definition of your pod okay metadata labels the pod label is going to be tier front end and specification i am going to use a container and the name of the container is lb and this is going to be your image name okay so i gave you an example that a person is already there with the same expertise so what i am going to do i am going to create this container with the same label first kubectl run pod 1 hyphen hyphen image you can give any image okay uh, httpd all right now i am giving labels equals to i am going to give the same label tier equals to front end it is important the spelling is exactly the same you see till get pods okay so now a pod is already there all right now i am going to use this definition let's see if it is going to create three or it is going to create two your replica set is created the short name for replica set is rs cube ctl get rs okay the name of your replica set is test desired is three current is three ready is one as of now okay now all three are ready as well cube ctl get pods so team can you see it only created two pods it didn't create three pods why it didn't create three pods because one pod with a similar label was already there so replica set do the identification based on your labels okay that is why in replica set selector is an important field how it is going to check that similar pod is running or not 
how are you going to define inside your kitchen consider you are inside your kitchen how you are going to see that how many jars are there of sugar you have to check the label for that right inside your kitchen you are going to check all the jars and you are going to see the sticker or label on the jar that how many jars are there of sugar right similarly your replica set checks for your selector field it has to match the labels if any pot is running with a similar label it is going to count it in in okay so if i am going to delete this pot this time if you remember i created this pot manually but now it is a part of replica set when i created it independently it was alone it was not a part of replica replica set but once i created the replica set it became a part of replica set if i am going to delete it now it will get recreated see another pod was created 13 seconds ago why because i already had a person maybe this person resigned if this person resigned then now i need at least four people all right earlier i was asking for three people because i already had one person but that person also resigned so i have to have four people now that is why another pod came online all right so team this is the additional functionality that you get with your replication set now coming back to the previous question if you can scale it again or not all right now the use case consider you started your new application okay you started a new application of your own now what is the situation consider just a minute team here it is okay so team this object is called a replication controller all right and the short name is rc so if you want to define the replication controller you can give rc as well all right but the kind you have to mention is replication controller so what is replication controller i am going to create three replicas of my same container all right let's take an example directly so that it will be more clear to you you have to go to the controllers replica controller all right so team let's try to understand it what replication controller actually does okay first is your api server all right kind is replication controller this time what is the name of replication controller is tomcat rc all right under specification i have defined three replicas it means i am not going to create a single container i am going to create three containers of the same type so that load balancing can take place okay for high availability selector field is application tomcat it is for your uh, labels okay template so now under template you are going to give the definition of your pod okay this is your replication controller this is the name of your replication controller and under specification template you are going to give your tomcat pod definition okay what is the metadata tomcat is going to be the name of your tomcat pod okay tomcat rc and this is going to be your label i am defining label as well so tomcat is the name of your pod here i am going to put some label also pod is equals to tomcat rc app equals to tomcat i am giving some labels and what is the specification of that pod containers i am going to image name the user container name as tomcat and this is the image i am going to use learn devops tomcat this is from the private registry okay so let's have this example let's have the raw format i'll copy it kubectl get pods kubectl delete pods hyphen hyphen all kubectl 
create hyphen f so team i am going to create a replication controller i am going to create a rc all right so let's see kubectl get rc so you can see the desired count is 3 how much current state is 3 it means i must be having three pods what i desired was three pod and how much i am actually having three pods as of now none of them is ready okay now you can see desired was three i asked for three pods current state there are currently three pods running and three pods are ready as well kubectl get pods okay so the naming convention you can understand this is the name of your replication controller okay first the name of your application controller then some random alphanumeric string is going to be there and you can see the three pods created at the same time by the replication controller so whenever you want to have multiple replicas you are not going to create them one by one you are going to use replication controller all right so i told you this is a controller what was the responsibility of controller manager controller manager responsibility was i have some actual state and i have a desired state it has to manage them because of some reason if one pod goes down it should get created automatically right that was our expectation let's try to delete one of the pod kubectl delete pod pod name okay once our pod is deleted still you can see current is 3 ready is 3 why you can see when i deleted a pod another pod came online 16 seconds ago right away so what your replication controller did even if one of your container goes down even one of your pod is deleted manually your replication controller is going to manage the state no matter what okay so it will still be there you can delete all it will create them all kubectl delete pods hyphen hyphen all i'm deleting all the pods still you can see you can see the RC. It is three, three, three again. Why? Because all the pods are created again with the help of your replication controller. Okay. So if you have to delete the pods, you have to delete the RC. Kubectl delete RC, RC name. And once your replication controller is gone, your pods will get terminated. All the pods are gone. Okay, so team, this is the story of your replication controller. Yes, Sanjay, self filling it is. So team, any doubts, any question with your replication controller? Because if uh, the pod goes down, then application controller will handle and create new pod. Yes, sort of, you're right. Team, any question with replication controller? Clear to all of you? Sumit, you are asking, can we edit any specific pod within RC? No, Sumit, you cannot do that. The reason is your replication controller is managing them and the purpose of replication controller or is load balancing. So load balancing will be done or with similar pods. If you have different kind of pod, then there is no load balancing between them. Okay, so all the three pods, all the replicas that you have defined, should be exactly the same
Sumit, or it has to be unique under RC. Okay, I already answered that. Kushagra, does it create a static manifest like Kubelet uh, do for the static pause? No, Kushagra, there is no static manifest right here. Okay, replication controller manages it at its own at the backend. There is no manifest with uh, like your static pods or something. Okay, replication controller manages it at the backend. Yes, Imanshu, we can modify the replicas in the real time as well. Okay, that is my next part to which I am coming. Okay, so team, if it is clear, uh, let me have next thing. How to create new replicas based on traffic. Ganapati, I am coming to that only. Okay, I am coming to that only. Okay, so team, as I already told you that your replication controller is obsolete now. Okay, it is depreciated. Why it is depreciated? Because it is being replaced by another object called replica set. Okay, your replication controller has been replaced by RS. That is your replica set. So why is that? <clears throat> because your replica controller had some short falling that is why your replica set removed or uh, those shortcoming and replace it with the replica set so what were the challenges with replica controller and what are the additional feature we get in replica set we are going to see about that first thing first again i am going to take a layman example this time <coughs> mm, yes kushagra you are right okay so team uh, let's take a layman example. All right. Consider you are working in an organization. All right. You are working in an organization, and the, a new project came, and that new project asks for that you want to have at least four, five, uh, five people with Kubernetes expertise. Okay. As of now, there is a manager in your team. Okay. There is a manager in your team, and these are your resources. Okay, I'm not deleting these images. Consider these are also human resources. So, what is the manager is doing? Manager has a person in his team who is of Linux expertise. Okay, your manager has another person with database expertise. Your manager has already a person in a team with Kubernetes expertise. Okay, then a new project came and that new project asks for four people with Kubernetes expertise skill set. Okay, a new project came to your manager and it asked for four people with Kubernetes expertise. All right, so what happened? Your manager went to another person in human resourcing. Okay, your manager went to HR. And he said, there is a new project. <clears throat> I need four people with Kubernetes expertise. Okay. You have to hire four people that have the skill set of Kubernetes. Okay. So what happened? There is already a person with Kubernetes expertise already there in his team. Okay. So now how many people does it require for the same skill set? How many people we have to hire this time? Do we have to hire four people or do we have to hire three people? Yes, Rishabh, you're right. Team, so the new project came. It asked for four people with Kubernetes expertise. All right. But inside our team, we already have one person with Kubernetes expertise. Then how many people we have to hire this time? Right. Imanshu, Sanjay, Adirika, I guess you're right. Kapil, you're not. Okay, team, try to understand this. I already have one person in my team with Kubernetes expertise. Okay, the project requires four people. So I already have one people. Why do I have to hire four more people? I have five Kubernetes experts in my team. If I hire four, I already have one. 
why cannot I consume this person in the new project also? Right? So I have to hire only three more people because I already have one person in my team with Kubernetes expertise. I can consume him also in the project. He can also contribute and I can have three more people. So this much of smartness was not present in replication con replication controller. Okay. This smartness was not there with replication controller. If you have created a replication controller, if you have mentioned four number, it is going to create four replication controller. It is going to create four replicas no matter what. If the similar pod is already running, okay, if the similar pod is already running, it is not going to count it in. It, in. it is going to create four pods no matter what. It is not going to take care that if already a pod is running with the same functionality or not. It is not going to worry about that. It is going to create four pods right away. Replica set came with some smartness okay the replica replica set came with some smartness it said okay if i already have a pod with the same functionality and you are asking for four replicas i am going to create only three replicas i am not going to create four replicas okay so i already have one i am going to count it in right so that is why your replica set is a smarter one. It is also going to look into the cluster first that if a similar pod is running or not. And if it is there, it is not going to create another one. If it is asking for four, it will create three because one is already there. All right. Now I'm going to take an example for that. All right. So team, now you can see the kind is changed. Now I'm using a replica set. The name of the replica set is test and I'm asking for three replicas. Here comes something in picture, which is called selector field. Okay. Selector field was not there in your replication controller, but selector field is here in your replica set. It is going to match the label here. Okay. It is going to match the label. Now under template again under template you have to give the definition of your pod. Okay. Metadata labels. The pod label is going to be tier front end and specification. I am going to use a container and the name of the container is LB and this is going to be your image name. Okay. So I gave you an example that a person is already there with the same expertise. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to create this container with the same label first. kubectl run pod1 hyphen hyphen image you can give any image okay uh, httpd all right now i am giving labels equals to i am going to give the same label tier equals to front end It is important the spelling is exactly the same. QCTL get pods. Okay, so now a pod is already there. All right, now I am going to use this definition. Let's see if it is going to create three or it is going to create two. Your replica set is created. The short name for replica set is RS. kubectl get RS. Okay. The name of your replica set is test. Desired is three. Current is three. Ready is one as of now. Okay. Now all three are ready as well. kubectl get pods. So team, can you see it only created two pods? It didn't create three pods. Why it didn't create three pods? Because one pod with a similar label was already there. So replica set, do the identification based on your labels. Okay. 
that is why in replica set selector is an important field how it is going to check that similar pod is running or not how are you going to define inside your kitchen consider you are inside your kitchen how you are going to see that how many jars are there of sugar you have to check the label for that right inside your kitchen you are going to check all the jars and you are going to see the sticker or label on the jar that how many jars are there of sugar right similarly your replica set checks for your selector field it has to match the labels if any pod is running with a similar label it is going to count it in in okay so if i'm going to delete this pod this time if you remember i created this pod manually but now it is a part of replica set when i created it independently it was alone it was not a part of replica replica set but once i created the replica set it became a part of replica set if i'm going to delete it now it will get recreated see another pod was created 13 seconds ago why because i already had a person maybe this person resigned if this person resigned then now i need at least four people all right earlier i was asking for three people because i already had one person but that person also resigned so i have to have four people now that is why another pod came online all right so team this is the additional functionality that you get with your replication set now coming back to the previous question if you can scale it again or not all right now the use case consider you started your new application okay you started a new application of your own now what is the situation consider just a minute team just a minute be your yeah, team sorry so what i was telling you that in uh, consider you have created your application in a single pod okay but now your application is getting viral now your application is getting viral now a single pod is not able to handle that much request how you are going to multiply it how you are going to create multiple pods so that load balancing can take place okay earlier your application was so small that you created a single pod now your application is getting viral it is getting all the loads so now you want to have some load balancing and you can also not delete your previous pod okay so in that case your application was created with a single pod initially now your application is getting viral you want load balancing so you create replica set so earlier your single pod was serving the request now your all the pods will serve the request so even if one pod goes down your another pod will be available as of now you have asked for three consider you want to have more replicas now because your application is getting more viral no problem you know the command cube ctl edit rs test okay you have defined in replica 3 you modify it ask for 5 this time okay you can see your replica set has been edited cube ctl get rs now you can see 5 cube ctl get pods you can see four two more pods was created just away 12 seconds ago okay so in the run time you can have multiple replicas with replica set as well consider your application load has uh, decrease reduce the number no problem with that also okay as of now there are five i am giving two now the load is not that much again edit it cube ctl get rs cube ctl get pods okay you can see other pods are getting terminated only two pods will be live then 
because you have asked for two all the other pods will be gone so you can modify your replica set in real time as well okay let me know if you have any question with replication controller and replication set now yes anil images were different okay <clears throat> that example i have just taken but in the end level you don't use different different images you, you don't use different different pods okay your kubernetes is not going to identify on the image level okay your kubernetes identify on the label itself so if you have different different image if you have different different application it is not going to identify that it is going to check for the label so it is your intelligence as a kubernetes administrator that you give labels on the pod based on the similar image or similar functionality okay this is the smartness that you have to do as a kubernetes administrator that you don't use different different application for the uh, replica set on the base based on your labels you have to have same labels for similar application pods uh fanny yes uh, load balancing uh, scaling can be done i think i have shown you that jagannath if we have uh, more than the desired pod and replica set will it scale down automatically uh, jagannath no it won't be done automatically okay if you want to do it automatically you we have to use hpa okay but if we talk about replica uh, replica set itself you have to scale it down you have to scale it up manually it doesn't do it automatically what are the other criteria apart from match label in the object selector sumit so, that is the only case okay so sumit so, the thing is your replica set works on labels only you cannot do the uh, load balancing you cannot create replica set on any other term or any other object it has to take with labels only so that is also a use case somebody asked me earlier that what are the different use cases of labels this is the another use case of labels labels helps in load balancing in replica set and uh, deployment also that we are going to cover later deployment is the next topic for say so if you have more than uh, the desired pod in replica set okay yeah, i already answered this one how and which pods are getting terminated for fifo and lifo chandrashekhar that is not the case okay so if you know about the application pods application pods are stateless okay application pods are stateless it doesn't matter which pod is serving the request all the pods are completely identical because they are application they are stateless okay so any pod can get deleted randomly any pod will be created randomly load balancing will be done randomly among them okay so there is nothing like fifo or lifo any pod can be terminated if you are scaling down okay satish i think your question is also answered if the pod under is still serving some requests and we scale down how it will make sure that the pod is stateless and is idle and not processing anything okay so rishab again as i said it is a stateless server okay your pod is deleted you will have a slight glitch okay because uh, consider the pod which is getting terminated is still serving some request first of all that pod will be not terminated first priority will be if we have four replica set and we want to scale it down to two so it will always try to terminate the pod which are not serving any request but even if consider that you are scaling down to two and still three pods are serving request so one pod will be terminated which will, which is serving the request so there is going to be a slight glitch for the user it has to refresh the tab once the tab is refreshed your request will again go to the pod which is available out of the remaining two so a slight refresh is going to be there that's all based on cpu uh, and ram uh, limit we need to set replica set kapil replica set is a independent entity it is not related to cpu and ram okay cpu and ram limit you have to set at the container level and replica set deals with the replicas of your pod so there is no connection between them 
if you have to set the limits for cpu and ram you have to define them under containers definition and replica set is itself a bigger definition of your pods what is the other advantage of replica set uh, over replication controller so prempal the benefit is that you can scale it in the real time also you can have already running pods inside your replica set but your replication controller doesn't do that so that is the only difference between replication set and replica replica controller imagine sure that will be done on the round robin how user request will be handled by the replica pod if you know about the load balancing it is done automatically maybe your first request goes to pod 1 your second request will go to uh, go to pod 2 your third request will go to pod 3 again your fourth request will go to pod 1 again okay a big question from arjun if one pod is created manually for a specific ask and then the replica set will have three pods so it will create two pods if we delete a replica set will it delete the first pod which was created manually uh, yes arjun you are correct consider one pod was created independently and after that it became a part of replica set now if you are going to delete the replica set that pod will be gone as well because that pod doesn't have any identity as a individual now that part uh, that pod has a identity as a part of a replica set so if replica set goes that pod will be gone also himanshu it will be done automatically what will be done automatically uh rishabh uh, okay <coughs> replica set is used only for stateless object okay but if you want to use stateful set there is a object itself present in kubernetes called stateful sets okay so replica set replication controller is used for stateless objects and if you want to use stateful objects we have uh, stateful set we are going to discuss that at the end of the class or course i mean to say okay you can see on day 8 there is a topic called stateful set uh kushagra you are asking can replica set pick up static pod with same label no kushagra it cannot okay it is actually good question i haven't tried that any time okay so uh, try it out find it out at your own to be honest i haven't tried that so i cannot give you an answer with certainty but you can try that create a static pod with the same label and create a replica set as per my understanding as per the architecture i don't think it will be controlled by the master so it won't count it as a replica set as per my understanding but honestly i haven't tried that you can go and uh, go on and try that kushagra yes himanshu your uh, request will be handled automatically using the load balancing akhil you are asking what is the difference between stateful and stateless okay akhil consider your application nginx page okay you have an nginx page that is a stateless it means is its state is not changed over the time your nginx has some html file it will keep on displaying that as many time as you want to refresh it it is going to show you the same request so it is stateless you cannot change the state of that but if you talk about a database pod or a database container it means there are going to be there are going to be some entry in your database your database is going to have some updates your database is going to delete something your rows will be updated your data will be updated deleted so that is stateful it means its state is changing every time if you do some update the state of your database pod is changed if you delete some rows if you enter some rows insert some rows update some rows the state of that pod is changing so that is a stateful set so i hope it answers you okay what 
what is variables mentioned okay uh shishu that is your environment variables that we have discussed today okay those are the variables Akhil, uh, that is a question of uh, advanced topics. Okay, so I won't be able to answer it right away. Any relation between volumes of stateful set and stateful sets, stateless set. Okay, so that is an advanced topic. Once we'll cover that part, once we cover the volumes, once we go to the stateful set, then I will be able to answer that. Okay, so it is an advanced topic right now. Any question? All right. So team, yesterday we have discussed a lot. right and uh, as per our agenda that we have here yesterday we were able to discuss only rc and rs okay rc was replication controller and rs was replica set and we saw that why rc got depreciated why rc is no longer much in use and what advantages that rs provided us over rc because of which that uh we prefer rs in place of rc all right so anybody has any doubt till now whatever we have discussed till yesterday any question any problem from yesterday class any doubt so everything is clear till yesterday just connecting to my machines first proceed further all right yesterday we discussed about your controllers we started about our controllers and our s and rc were the controllers that we discussed yesterday and we are going to move forward and discuss about your deployments at what is deployment in a kubernetes all right first thing first deployment is simply an extension to your replica set all right rc was depreciated rs came into picture and what is your deployment deployment is simply an extension to your replica set what do i mean by that deployment is exactly similar to your replica set in fact whenever you create a deployment a replica set is created at the backend by default okay just like you understand that whenever you create a pod a container is created at the backend right just to make you understand i am explaining you with this example whenever you create a pod a pod is created yes that is true but at the backend a container is also created similarly whenever you create a deployment a replica set is created at the backend automatically okay uh t 
team am i audible to all of you right i got a ping that i am not audible to someone please confirm if you can hear me all right thank you i got your responses isn't simply an extension to your replica set but why deployment came into picture and why replica set was not enough we are going to understand about that all right so team consider that uh, we have a situation in an organization all right i hope this example was clear to you so we can clean it up and have a different drawing all right so this is your kubernetes cluster all right and what you have you have uh, for say three replicas of your application okay team uh, before explaining this to you I want to ask you that how many of you actually knows about green uh, blue green deployment asking generally not in the same context you don't have to know about kubernetes i'm simply asking what is a blue green deployment how many of you knows some of you do and some of you don't all right so no problem i'm going to explain you from the scratch all right in general scenario in a general scenario i'm talking if you are going to do a blue green deployment if you generally want to do a blue green deployment what you do you have a version 1 of your application okay consider this is your version 1 of your application in this you have three pods or three replicas okay so your application is currently learn, running on version 1 all right that is called your blue deployment now what you do you create a exact replica with the latest version okay you create the exact replica with the updated version currently my application is running on version 1 now i have created a similar deployment of version 2 and i'm going to call it as a green deployment now simply what i'm going to do if uh, somebody is using my application okay someone is using my application and currently it is pointing to your blue deployment that is currently your version 1 i'm simply going to change the pointing of my application to version 2 it means i am going to have a negligible downtime currently my version 1 is also running version 2 is also running and as of now my client are using version 1 i'm simply going to change the routing okay i am just going to change the routing uh, like if i am having route 53 entry or something like that simply i am going to change the routing and i will now route all the traffic to version 2 which was already in place before so both the versions are running at the same time you simply change the pointing that is your blue green deployment generally speaking not in the context of kubernetes in kubernetes also we do the same just like that so i told you that it is exactly the same as a replica set but 
डिप्लॉयमेंट कम्स विथ सम एडिशनल फीचर्स और सम एडिशनल फंक्शनैलिटी ऑल द फीचर्स दैट रेप्लिका सेट हैव डिप्लॉयमेंट ऑल्सो हैव बट डिप्लॉयमेंट प्रोवाइड यू सम एडिशनल फीचर विच इज नॉट प्रेजेंट विथ रेप्लिका सेट फॉर एग्जाम्पल thing we already have in agenda is rolling updates and roll back this feature is not available with replica set but it is present in your deployment but what is that let's try to understand that consider i do have an application and i want zero downtime even if i do have a blue green deployment setup where i'm simply going to change the pointing still it is going to have a little bit of downtime at least okay a little bit of downtime is going to be there for sure just for a fraction of second even but it is going to be there because it is going to shift from version 1 to version 2 but i don't want to have a downtime at all and i still want to update my application how i am going to do that i still want to update my application but i don't want to have a downtime at all i want my application to be up and running all the time in that scenario what happens okay uh let me remove it from here and let me write it here it will be a better place to understand all right in this scenario what i am going to do if i do have a deployment in kubernetes so what will happen i will replace one pod at a time okay first of all what i'll do i will take my version 1 down and i will replace it with version 2 okay don't think that i am having all the pods at the same time as a blue green deployment okay in my cluster at a time i have only three pods all right so what i do i will replace one pod at a time so i first replace my first pod which is now version 2 <clears throat> and other two pods are still running at version 1 all right so what's going to happen some of the users might experience version 2 most of the users are going to experience version 1 but my application is not going down version 2 is also there version 1 is also there next once it is working fine once it is stable i am going to bring my pod 2 of the same version and remove my version 1 pod one pod at a time not replacing all of them not creating multiple pods at the same time i am just replacing it one at a time after that once two pods are working fine Finally I am going to bring down my last pod of version 1 and I will replace it with version 2 pod. Okay? So you can see what is happening here. I am replacing one pod at a time. It is called rolling updates. Okay? This is called rolling updates. It is not a blue green deployment. It is not replacing all the pods at the same time, but one pod at a time. Similarly, if you talk, uh, talk about roll backs, roll backs also happen in a similar manner if i want to roll back to the previous version like uh, the client started uh, pointing out that i do have some bug there is some problem in the application okay what i'm going to do i'm going to roll back in that scenario what i'm going to do again i'm going to do it one at a time first i will take down my first pod and replace it with the previous version once it is working fine i will bring my version 2 version 1 pod and i will bring my version 2 pod down one pod at a time similarly bring down version 2 last pod and replace it with the version 1 of the last pod so this is called your rolling updates and roll backs this feature was not available with replica set but this feature is available with deployment So team this is the concept of deployment let me know if you have any doubt if you have any problem we are going to do the lab on deployments but before that i am going to touch base on the concept called services 
okay to understand the deployment practically it is important that you understand about service as well so before doing the practical on deployment we'll understand about services but conceptually let me know if you understand this or not very good <laughs> in only two situation you don't get any doubts either you understand everything or you don't understand anything okay all right team so team next concept i am going to start is of services okay and i'm telling you beforehand it is a tricky concept okay so i need your complete attention here i will try to make you understand with ease okay but services is a typical concept okay it is not that easy at all okay but still i'll try to make you understand but i need your complete attention here as well okay if you will miss anything you will miss everything i am telling you Just let me clean my environment. So team, I have just created a nginx pod right here. Okay, I have just created a nginx pod. Hyphen O wide. Okay, I simply created a pod which is a nginx pod. It is residing on node one, and this is the IP of the pod. Okay, so team, if I want to access this pod. from outside world can i do that with this ip i want to use my nginx web page okay if i do curl operation with this ip internally i can see the page all right you can see welcome to nginx it is visible to me but if i want to have this access out to the outside world okay i am simply using uh, creating my application for the outside world definitely for the client all right so they so they want to have access to this to the outside world as well so can i use this pod ip for external uses can i no of course right definitely not so if i am going to use this on the browser it is not going to give me any response this ip is provided to the pod by webnet the cni that we use and that is used for internal purposes only 
if i want to have access to this container from the outside world i need something else all right i need something else consider this is your cluster okay this is your cluster inside your cluster you have a contain you have a pod okay team i am going to show you all the layers here right now okay because your container is covered in this much layers all right so this is your cluster inside your cluster you have a pod and inside your pod you have a container and here your nginx is running all right and the nginx container is having this as a pod ip this is your pod ip now if you want to access your nginx pod from the outside world you cannot use it directly this ip is not going to work for that purpose we need something which is going to route our traffic to this internal ip all right we need something that is going to route the traffic to this container inside to this ip internal ip for that purpose we use services in kubernetes this routing is achieved by using services we need something some object it is a object of kubernetes like pod nodes similarly services is also a object in kubernetes which helps routing our traffic from outside world to your particular container all right and how does it actually work for that you create a service type all right first we are going to discuss about node port and then we are going to understand about the another one okay you create a service and that service is uh, first type is your node port node port provide you some kind of port number okay it provides you some kind of port number for let's say uh, 30000 okay 30000 is a port number so what you have to do <coughs> you have to use the ip of your cluster machine okay ip of any working machine worker node all right you are going to use the ip address of any of the worker node along with the port number and then it will is going to route your traffic to the node port and then finally you will be able to access your pod okay i am going to show you this practically all right uh, just give me a minute please so uh, let's try to create a service from the command line first using imperative way all right so command is pretty different here here we don't use kubectl create or kubectl um run all right or apply something we simply use kubectl expose okay to create a service this is the keyword you are going to use so what i did kubectl expose we are going to expose our pod right now okay as of now we have a pod we are going to expose it then pod name <coughs> i hope this is the name of the pod yes it is all right and now i am going to name that service as well okay 
every object does to have a name we created a bot and we named it as shub all right now i'm going to create a service i'm going to name a service as well shub svc this service i'm going to create all right now you have to give the port number nginx by default runs at port number 80 you all know that all right i am also going to give a target port i will explain you later why i am giving port again and again again 80 and then i am going to give the type okay what kind of service i am going to create i am going to create a node port service all right that's all this is the command you can see service shub svc exposed all right so simply you can do kubectl get services okay or simply put you can use svc services short name is svc all right so now you can see shub svc is created type is node port this is the ip of your service okay so team don't get confused this is the ip of your service this is not the ip of your node this is not the ip of your pod this is the ip of the service that you have created all right and the port routing is from 80 port number to 30851 all right so team the thing is the node port has a port range all right whenever you are going to create your node port service it has the port range and it ranges from 30000 to 32766 okay whenever you are going to create a node port service it will range under this only if you want to give your own port number you have to give the port number within this range if you don't do that you are going to have the randomly generated number from this range only all right so what i told you if i want to access my application now i am going to use this port number along with the ip of any of the worker node for say i am going to use uh, one of my machine ip vm instances let me take the ip of node 1 node 1 ip i will place it here i will place it again here on the diagram as well for your understanding i'll give a colon and then i'm going to give the port number what is my port number Three zero eight five one, and i'm going to use it like this ip colon port number team your application is now exposed to the open world now you can access it from the browser earlier you were not able to do that now your application is available to the open internet okay so this is the main type of service which is required to expose your application to the outer world the thing is whenever you define type as node port whenever you define the type as node port kubernetes understand that okay if you are defining node port it means you want to expose your application to the outer world all right hence you are able to access it from the open internet and it is completely up to you you can use any ip you can use your master ip as well you can use your worker node ip as well all of them will work properly without any problem if you want to you can verify it as well now i have used my master ip along with the port number still you can refresh it as many time as you want you are going to save the same page all right so what do you understand by this your services is a cluster level resource services are cluster level resource what does it mean that your service expands across your cluster 
you can use your master ip you can use your worker node 1 ip you can use your worker node 2 ip there is no problem with that all the ips will work because service is deciding on every particular node once you have created a service all right i have provided you the range of the node port ip now i am going to explain you the flow how it actually grow, goes Okay, does it going to is it going to expand or not? All right, it doesn't expand. I was just trying to make it a little fat. Okay, no problem. So you can see your node port service also gets an IP address. Okay. What is the purpose of this IP address? We are going to see that. All right. Now you can see I have written all the IPs here practically so that you can connect better. All right. To understand it better, let's try to describe your node port service. kubectl describe svc shub svc. Okay. We can describe anything. And hence, we are explaining it again. All right. So, team, what you can see here, let's see about the description. It is, this is the namespace, uh, default namespace, labels. All right. It has some label called run equals to show. Selector is also run equals to show. Type is node port. All right. So team, you can see a selector field here as well. This selector field is coming from where? kubectl get pods kubectl describe pod and show. All right. So you can see there is a selector field as well. And this selector field is picked by the command that we provided earlier. And it came from your definition of pod. Okay. You can see the definition of pod. There is also a label called run equals to show. So it picked that only. All right. And based on that, based on that label, it picked the endpoint. What is your endpoint? endpoint is the ip of your pod okay you can see 1041 or 104401 endpoint is 104401 okay the command we used selected all the pods which are running with the same selector field that you have defined okay we define the pod name we expose the pod with pod name okay it does, does not understand anything with the pod name. What it do? If you have given a pod name, it will check the label on that pod. It will make that as a selector field. And if any pod is running inside your cluster with the same label, it is going to have the endpoints of that only. Okay. I'm going to show you that with another example. Okay. As of now, you can understand it divert the traffic based on your selector field all right and this is your endpoint endpoint means ultimately this is going to be your final destination of the complete routing this is the ip of your service so what happened once you have defined anything you have a master ip or a worker node ip all right you are going to use the node port once you use that node port, node port understand, okay, I'm going to divert this traffic to this particular IP. This is your service IP. All right. You use the IP, use any IP of your worker node or master node. You use a port number along with that. Once you use that port number, that node port number uh, divert your traffic to the service IP. 
once you use this port number it is going to divert the traffic to this ip okay and this ip have some endpoints what are the endpoints your port number and then it is going to divert the traffic finally to your port and that is how we are able to see your nginx page right here okay so to use a port an application outside your cluster you have to use a service called node port okay so team this is the complete flow i understand that was a little typical but this is a tough topic i try to make you understand with the drawings as with the best possible ease let me know if you do understand this or not okay as of now i have shown you example with a single port i am going to show you the same with a different example as well where i am going to have multiple replicas okay but still if you understand this this was a most basic example i could have taken let me know if you have any doubt or it is clear to you fenny it there is no concept like firewall here right now all right firewall was i just gave an idea yesterday because somebody was having issues firewall doesn't apply here all right we are talking about services services are used to expose your internal application to the outside world and the service which expose your application from internal to external is called your node port service okay let me know if you have any doubts sumit uh, what if i have same uh, two labels with two different endpoints how to pick one on the node port since we are assigning service over name as match label do we have any provision of picking respective endpoints among both no sumit you don't have the provision to pick the specific endpoint endpoints are always chosen based on your selector field okay based on your selector field based on your labels your endpoints are selected if you want to choose the endpoints everything manually then what is the use of automation okay you want to automate things you don't want to create it more manually if you want to do it manually with the endpoints simply it is a overhead and we are moving towards automation and that is the use of labels here another use case of labels why we use labels because we want to automate the exposing of services we don't want to do it manually all right so this is the importance of label that is why you choose your labels very carefully got a what is the role of port and target port what happens uh, what will be the flow in case of multiple port container okay got of the first point is your port all right so you know that you have a port and you have a container all right and you also know that your container also has some ip okay and your port has some uh, also have some ip okay so the port number you are using the port number you are using is for your port okay but you know that your application is running inside a container and the container also have some port number your application is also running on a port number inside your container so internally also you have two different ports understood so the endpoint that you are giving okay you saw that i gave the endpoint as target port 80 and port number 80 this port number 80 i am giving for your port that is why you can see the endpoint as the port ip and the port number this is about this but still inside your port you have a container which is with a different ip with a different target port it is possible it can have a different target port so you give the target port here as well that at what port number your application is running inside the container for the sake of simplicity we keep it as same or or right not to confuse anybody it is a normal practice that we use target port and port number same but target port is a port number inside your container and the port is of your port
all right and yes you can have a multi container pod as well okay you ask about the flow in multi container pod if you understand it properly when i explain you multi container pod multi container pod also serves with one container only even if you have two containers or three containers only one pod is going to be there which is going to serve for your application so routing will be done to that particular container as well in multi container pod you understand there is a site ka container where some uh, site or container pass on some details to the main container there is ambassador where, which is helping to route the traffic your first container will not be accessible to open world your second container is going to divert the traffic so all in all whenever you use multi container pod as well traffic will be routed to one container only what about multi port container mm, okay akhil you are asking about multi port container pod okay you can have a multiple pod uh, port but still your application will be running on one port only even if you are using your application without the concept of kubernetes or services or anything like that whenever you use a, a nginx container simply put you use a port number with it all right so if your application is running on different port you have to create a different service to expose that different port number all right so if you your application have multiple port and having uh, different different services at different different port you have to create different services what do you mean by a service in a is a cluster level resource can you explain that one again and you're a guest okay so you're asking why i'm why i said the service is a cluster level ip uh resource sorry because whenever you using the uh, ip of the machine i told you you can use the ip of any machine you can use the master ip machine you can use your node one ip you can use a node two ip it means your service is residing with all the ips all right you can use any ip so you can use the ip of any machine inside your cluster if your cluster contains 10 machine 20 machines you can use the ip of any machine what does it explains you that you can use any nodes machine so it will be accessible from everywhere it will divert the traffic to anywhere you are using your worker node one ip but your pod is running on node 2 so how it is going to access it doesn't matter because your service reside on all the machines okay it can divert the traffic from anywhere that is why it is called your service uh, is the your cluster level resource it means simply it cannot be name space you can say in simple words okay i told you there are two type of resources one can be name space one cannot be and the uh, objects which cannot be name space are called your cluster level resource so your services are also cluster level resource rahul uh, could you please ex also explain how i connect to a service from container to outside world database rahul i am not able to understand your question okay you want to <coughs> have a connection between a database pod from outside world <coughs> okay i'll come back to that one okay that is a different type of uh, service called cluster ip once we understand about node pod then i'll come to cluster ip uh, service and then i will answer your question okay that is my next part what is the target port mentioned in the command is that a port uh, pod port uh, satish i think i already answered that i am going questions one by one can access this port by cluster ip instead of node or a master machine prempal if you want to access it from the outside world you cannot use cluster ip okay you cannot use the cluster ip anywhere cluster ip is also a internal component it is not an external component only the node port the port number is the external component what is the target to uh, joydeep i think i answered that as well i guess https for the service will be a different topic anil that will be a part of security okay we'll talk about certificates as well 
is there any way we can specify the node port manually yes akhil i have given it from the command line if you want to do you can give it with the manifest file as well okay the yaml files there you can define your port number manually still if you want to see i can show you right away okay so you are asking can i use my port number manually at my own definitely you can do that and for that what you are going to do qctl get svc all right if you are going to define it from the manifest file simply you can do that or you know how to do it qctl edit command right all of you are aware of it qctl edit svc shub svc all right here you can see there is a node port component all right you want to modify it do it 32 000 okay i am modifying it okay your service is edited <coughs> now you can see the traffic is going to be routed from 32000 port number all right now if i'm going to refresh it it is going to fail because this port number is no longer in operation i have to modify it see now it is working on 32000 port number so if you want to modify if you want to have your own port number you can do it with the declarative syntax sumit yes i am going to explain you the scenario where there are same labels inside a cluster okay i show you the same thing with your node port service so that you can understand it better uh then if i use one port number for on one port it can be used for another port no rahul you have to use a different port number try to understand that if you are talking about the port and target port that can be same for different port okay consider i am having two different port port to serve for two different services and they both are running on port number 80 then that is okay all right then that is okay your application 1 is running on one port 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 a your application 2 is running on port b both are serving at the port number 80 so both the ports are running at port uh, port number 80 both the container are running at port number 80 that is their internal setup now you are going to create two services first service will be created for application a and second service will be created for your application b now both the service will have some different port number node port okay your first service is going to have some uh, node port of 31000 and your second node port service is going to have a port number of 32000 so the routing will be done based on the labels now all right definitely your end point will have the port number as 80 because both the application are running on port number 80 but your node port is going to be different all right uh, how can we predefine our node port i think i answered that also gorav all right how to modify the port number port and container is having the same ip sanjay uh, no that is not for sure because kubernetes doesn't understand any of your container ip okay but it does know that there is a container running and some application is bonding at this particular port number all right when i run kubectl api resources uh, it shows me a service is namespace equals to 2 Yes, I did. I guess you can have a namespace. You can create a service inside the namespace. That is all okay, but it spans across your cluster. I said it is a cluster level resource because it spans across your cluster. You can use any cluster IP, machine IP. All right. Okay. Still, some people are getting confused with your. Uh, port and target port okay some of you are getting confused with the port and target port 
let me try to explain you with a layman example okay as i always do all right container uh, consider you live in a society all right consider you live in a society all right now somebody wants to come to your house somebody wants to come to your house so that person is asking for the guidance is asking that how should i come what should be the route how should i reach to your place all right so what you are going to do first of all you are going to tell that person that you have to come thus to the society okay and at that society there is going to be a gate number 80 okay first you come to my society and my society don't come from any gate number there are multiple gates okay there are four gates but don't come from any gate you enter from the gate number 80 into my society all right once you have entered into my society okay once you have entered into my society my flat number is also 80 okay so how you are going to reach to my place first you have to come to my society in my society you have to enter from gate number 80 and once you have entered my society my flat number is also 80 okay so this is how you are going to reach me so the society gate number you are describing the society gate number you are describing is called your port and your flat number your absolute address is your target port okay your flat number is your absolute target port number so i hope with this example port and note uh, port and target port is clear to you uh gorav i haven't tried that actually okay so i'll suggest try at your own gorav is asking if i can have same uh, note port under two different name spaces okay give it a try at your own honestly i haven't tried that okay so team conceptually is it clear to you okay it is a big topic it is a little typical is note port clear to all of you i am going to take another example of note port but till now if it is clear to you then i am going to move forward now we have seen how it works with a sig- single port sorry now let's see how it works with a multiple port okay i am going to take an example of your uh, replica set okay we understand about the replica set now mm, let's take the second example so team i have shown you how you are going to work with a single container and a single endpoint now we are going to see how we are going to deal with the replica set this is the definition of your replica set okay sample is going to be the name of your replica set rs okay your labels are going to be i am defining the labels as well okay app equals to sample app tier equals to front end this is the labels i am defining at the replica set label so what is going to happen okay this uh label is going to stay with your replica set not with your pods okay i am defining the labels at the replica set label now how much replicas i want i want three replicas what is the selector field now i am defining the selector field all the pods which have the label front end equals to uh, tier equals to front end will be a part of this replica set okay 
I am giving the same label on your replica set as well, and I am giving the same label as a selector for my pods. If any pod is running with a tier called front end, that will be a part of this replica set. Metadata is the definition of your pod. All right, container. I am using a, a private image here. All right, sample app two. Name of the container is going to be test, and the port number where this container is running is your. 3000 so as per the drawing this 880 is going to be 3000 this time okay the absolute target port all right so i have created a replica set with this definition i am creating a service in the declarative syntax as well okay i have shown you how to create a service from command line now i am telling you how to create a service from yaml API version v1 kind of request service. This is the name of your service. All right, sample SVC is going to be name. Labels I am calling app equals to front end. All right, specs under specs I am defining type. Type is going to be my node port. Okay, I am defining port as port number 80. All right. So as I told you, for the sake of simplicity, what I am doing, I am keeping your port uh, port port number. as same okay for the sake of simplicity only all right protocol is equals to tcp you can give now selector field so i am defining this service should expose all the pods all the objects with the label called front end tier all right i am going to take the raw format and create both the objects in a single go Cube CTL create hyphen F. Okay, you can see your replica set is also created. You can see your service is also created. Okay, to see all the objects, you have a simpler command. Cube CTL get all. Okay, you do cube CTL get all. Everything from the particular namespace will be visible to you. And let me do it O wide also. All right, so team, let's try to understand about this now. All right, first of all, I created a replica set. In replica set, I have three replicas. All right, you can see selector field as well here. Now you can see three pods are created. Okay, one is running on node one, two are running on node two. All right, and I created a sample SVC service also. Type is node port, and it has a port number this. All right. Now let me explain you this with a diagram again. All right. Consider this is your cluster. Okay. This is your cluster. This is your master machine. This is your key node one. This is your key node two. Okay. Now, in between you have a your service, okay. And as as I told you, your service expand across your cluster, okay. It is connected with all the nodes, okay. So if you give your master IP, if you give your key node one IP, if you give the IP of key node two, all will work, all right. So with the IP of your master, master IP. you give the node port all right it will divert the traffic to your service okay what is your service ip this is your service ip all right now if i'm going to explain this service cube ctl describe SVC, sample SVC. Okay, now you can see when I have a selector field, it will pick all the endpoints. Okay, you can see ten thirty six zero one zero two and the old one as well. 
okay then 3602 103601 and 104402 it have the endpoints of all the ports all the replicas of this replica set all right it has the endpoint so you can see you have three ports here So team, this is the complete diagram for your understanding. You can use your master IP, you can use your noteboard IP or node IP, all right, along with the noteboard. It is going to divert the traffic to your service IP, all right. This is going to be your service IP and that service IP is going to do the load balancing across these containers, all right. To show you that, let me have it here, okay. I do have already the IP of one of my machine. All right. Let me have the port number. What is the port number of your service? It is 31205. Okay. So team, why took I uh, why I took uh, my own image because I wanted to show you this. Okay. First of all, you can see the container ID is 6HH6G2. Okay, first of all, my traffic is going to my first spot. If I keep on refreshing it, you can see the ID is getting changed. MLK 94. Now my traffic is going to the third pod. Okay, I'll keep on refreshing it. Okay, now again it went to 6HS62. Now it went to first one. Okay, so it is doing the load balancing now. Okay. First, it is going to send the traffic to port 1, then it is going to send the traffic to port 2, then it is going to uh, send the traffic to port, uh, port 3, okay? So, for load, uh, load balancing also, it is helpful. If you have multiple ports, it is going to do the load balancing itself. Service is going to do the load balancing, all right? You can refresh it as many times as you want. HP, MLK. All right, every time you are going to see a different output because your request is getting served by a different pod every time whenever you do the refresh. It is doing the load balancing as well, depending on the endpoint of your service. All right, so team, now here I'm going to conclude the topic of node port. All right, we spent a good time on this. This was a confusing topic. I do understand. All right. Let me know if it is clear to you or if you have any doubt, okay? Don't hesitate. If you don't understand anything, let me know. I'm going to explain all of that all over again. But it is an important topic. You should understand this. Let me know if you have any question. If not, I'm going to move to the second type, that is cluster IP. Paypal, you're saying when we uh, we have created service, it is behaving like a cluster as showing service IP under cluster IP. It seems the service act like a cluster. Okay, Paypal, if you're talking about this cluster IP, this is the naming convention that Kubernetes has done. Okay, I know it is a little confusing because you have another type of service also called cluster IP. And in this table, they have also said it as a cluster IP. So ignore for it, you can understand that this cluster IP is your service IP only. Okay, we are talking about this service IP. Joydeep, can you show which external IP to access for node port? 
joydeep i told you you can use the external ip of any of the worker node as of now you can see i am using 34123 96 211 all right and this machine this ip is of my master all right 34123 96 221 i can use the ip of any of the external machine i can use of master i can use of worker node 1 worker node 2 any external ip will work along with the node port primpal and do the load balancing among the nodes primpal if you want to do the load balancing along the nodes among the nodes you have to do it from the gcp okay <clears throat> because your nodes are managed by your gcp if your node goes down kubernetes is not going to manage it okay if pod goes down kubernetes will manage but if node goes down kubernetes is not going to manage you have to manage it from the gcp okay so actually uh, to be honest there is a provision you can uh, get confused that which ip should i use should i use the master ip should i use the node 1 ip should i use the node 2 ip consider if your node 2 goes down your service is still available but your node 2 is gone how your node 2 ip will is going to respond definitely that is a good question for that purpose we use a load balancer we create a load balancer okay on gcp on gcp we are going to create a load balancer and that is also a part of kubernetes as well when we use gke if we use managed service we can create a third party a third type of service as well called load balancer okay then we are going to give the ip of load balancer okay we are going to give the ip of the load balancer and the port number then it is going to divert the traffic to any of the nodes all the nodes will divert the traffic to your service ip and then service ip will divert the traffic to your pods i know it is a big thing okay so we'll take one thing at a time all right so first we are going to understand about node port then we'll discuss about different type of services can we change the pod ip from 300 to something else in this example okay got up there is no pod ip of 3000 ip doesn't stand in 3000 if you are talking about the port number node port you can definitely edit as i told you all right in this definition you can simply modify this port number okay whatever the port you want but i created the application right this is my personal image and i know my this personal image is responding to port number 3000 all right as we all know that nginx listen as port number 80 I know my this application is running on port number three thousand. Okay, so you cannot change this at the container level, but if you want to change it at this level, you can do that. Fanny, you are asking. Please explain on how container port and target port is different. Uh, Fanny, I explained that already with this example. Okay, I told you this is my target port. This is my port. All right, the port number that my container responds to is my target port, and the port number that my pod responds to is my port number. I explained you with an example. If you heard me, okay. Consider if somebody wants to come to your house, what you are going to do? You are going to tell him that enter in the society, enter in the society from gate number three thousand, okay. And once you have entered the society, you are going to come to my flat, and my flat number is also three thousand, okay. So the target port is the absolute endpoint, okay, where your application is actually responding inside the container. That is your target port. and if you talk about port that is your pod address or your society address why we gave container port in yaml instead of target port as they are same arjun if you have a if the port numbers are same okay if your port and target port both are same in yaml you don't have to give both if they are same 
if they are different you have to specify specifically if both are responding to the same port number you can ignore target port in your yaml sarat uh, you can see my github repository you might see an example but it is not a good practice to have a different target port and port number okay we never follow it anywhere whether it is your examination you can do that but it is never suggested whether it is for your examination point of view or for your real life example for your industry experience it is never suggested to use a different target port and port number if you can you can but it is not a good practice that is why you won't see any example in my repo as well for this one okay are you talking about this container port fini okay if you are talking about this container port this is your absolute address as i told you all right this is a port number of your container because i know my application is running on this port okay so whenever you define it in the yaml you tell that your application is running on this port number this is a part of replica set this is not a part of your service whenever you create a container you always tell that your container is running at this port number so this is a part of replica set if you are going to create a pod else well of for your application you tell that your application is running at this port number node port details can be specify in the yaml file akhil i already created the node port service with the yaml itself you can see that right this time i created a node port with the yaml format Gaurav, please correct me if, if I'm wrong. We define pod port while creating a service, right? Or it gets uh, defined while creating pod. Gaurav, uh, you define that at the port number uh, when you create the node port, because you define the node port to which port it should go to the pod. Okay, a node port. The uh, whenever you create the pod, pod takes up the default port number of the container okay by default you can modify it manually if you want but whenever you create a pod it takes the same port number of your container as well and when you expose your pod you have to define which port number you are going to expose so that is why you define that in the service request Finny, if you want to change the container port, you have to modify your image, okay? Because when you were creating your image, then you define your port number. Akhil, three one two one five port is not port is not mentioned. It is mentioned, Akhil. Okay, you can see this sample SVC. You can see it is. running at port number 31205 your application is running at 3000 but your service is exposed as port number 31205 any other question any other doubt with the service team if you do understand the node port a quick yes from all of you akhil yes 31215 is not mentioned in your yaml but if you want if you want to define it manually you can do that okay because i ask kubernetes to randomly define which node port it wants to give but if i want to give it manually i can give that also and where does it decide if you have understand all the concept which I, which i have taught you so far you can understand where i am going to define my node port number if you want to do it manually kubectl edit 
SVC. Sample SVC. Okay. Under specification, you can give your cluster IP also if you want. Otherwise, it is a job of your uh, VMNet, so you don't do that. <coughs> Under specification, you will give up ports. Under ports, you will give hyphen and note port as whatever the port number you want. So if you want to define it manually, you can define that also manually by defining it into your YAML. Okay, you can see there are ports, right? Here are ports in the YAML also under specs you have ports. All right, under specs you have ports and I have defined the port number for my application. If I want to give target port as well, I'm going to define here. If you want to give the node port or else well, of your choice you can give that also you can see I have commented it out okay if you want to give you uncomment this and give your own value if you want Joydeep you want me to give the expose command okay Joydeep let me share all right otherwise everything is there on the git repo Still, if you people want me to give the expose command, let me give you. Joydeep, I have shared the command on the chat box to the entire audience, okay? You can pick it from there. What if I don't want to use the pod port same as container pod? What change do I need to do? Gaurav, for that purpose, this is the command that I have showed you recently, all right, to expose your pod. Your target port is the port that your container is running on, all right? If you want to change the port number of your service, you give it 800 here, okay? The one you want, you can modify it from here. Yes, Fanny, you can use my own image. Okay, that is not a problem. That is an open source image. So if you want, you can use my image. You can pick the complete YAML right from here. You don't have to make any changes. It will be accessible to you as well. All right. So team, this is the topic that we have just covered about your node port service. All right. Second type of service I'm going to explain you. Second service is called your cluster IP. Services. Okay. So there are two types of services. First is your node port. Second is your cluster IP. Okay. We have these type of, two, uh, type of service. We have a third type of service also called load balancer, but we are going to discuss about that later. Because your raw Kubernetes doesn't allow this, if you are using cloud managed Kubernetes, <clears throat> whether it is your GKE or EKS whatsoever, then only you can use this. Otherwise, it is not supported. So we have discussed about Notebook. Now we are going to discuss about your cluster IP. Can we define the port through command and through YAML file? Is that correct? Yes, sort of. You can define it from both the places. You want to define it from the YAML, you can do that. If you want to define it from the command line, you can do that. Okay. So, team, the basic difference between node port and cluster IP is that whenever you create the node port it exposes your application to the outside world but whenever you create the cluster ip your application is not exposed to the outer world okay i'm going to show you this practically okay by default if you don't give any type by default if you do not give any type your uh, you will have a cluster ip type of service okay i'm going to create it right away kubectl svc.yaml 
sorry my bad svc dot yaml all right so team what i have done i am going to create the service again i am going to change the name of the service okay sample svc uh, cluster okay this time i am going to create the cluster ip all right but and if you want to create your cluster ip service you don't give the type if you want you can give the type if you don't define any type it will take the default value and the default value is your cluster ip all right let me create this service now without mentioning any type i have just commented out the type cube ctl create hyphen f svc okay the naming convention is not valid let me modify the name sample svc 2 i am giving okay now you can see your service is created cube ctl get svc all right so team now you can see sample svc 2 is created that is your cluster ip type okay and sample svc is of type node port all right i am going to have it as describe and you guys will tell me that what is the difference between these two okay so team i have defined both i have described both sample svc and your sample svc2 you guys tell me what is the difference answer answers like that type is node port and type is cluster ip okay don't give me this description tell me what else is different don't give me type okay Absolutely correct. Okay, so team, all of you are giving right answers. All right, I'm not uh, going to take the names right now. Okay, because all of you are giving the right answers. First thing first, that you don't have a node port. Okay, if you don't have a node port, how your application is going to be exposed to the outer world? Okay, so whenever there is a node port, your application is exposed to the outer world. But at your cluster IP. service you don't have the node port it is completely missing all right so it means your application is not exposed to the external world okay here you can see external traffic policy is cluster it means you can use any ip of the cluster machines okay it means external traffic policy that is also not available here so we understood that node port service exposes your application to the outer world but your cluster ip doesn't do that your cluster ip doesn't do that so what is the purpose of this what is the purpose of having a cluster ip if it doesn't expose your application to the outer world it doesn't make any sense right so why do we create it
ओके फैनी अखिल यू आर राइट अर्जुन यू आर ऑल्सो करेक्ट एट यू रेका गेस्ट यू आर ऑल्सो करेक्ट आई कैन नॉट सी योर नेम कपिल एब्सोल्युटली करेक्ट मौसमी यस गिरीश टू सम एक्सटेंड नॉट एक्सैक्टली ओके जॉयदीप यस ओके सो टीम आई विल एक्सप्लेन यू डायरेक्टली बाय द यूज केस ओके फॉरगेट दीज आर द नोट्स ओके कंसिडर दीज आर योर एप्लीकेशन पॉट्स ओके दीज आर योर एप्लीकेशन पॉट्स इन द सेम क्लस्टर यू आर रनिंग योर एप्लीकेशन रेप्लीकास एज वेल and in the same cluster you are running your database pods as well okay so what you need to do your application should access your database pods internally inside you have a replica set for your application and you have a replica set for your database pods as well so what happens you need the communication to happen inside your cluster only okay the communication between your application pod and database pod is internal you don't have to expose that so if you want to expose your database pods to your application pods you use a cluster ip okay you use your cluster ip so what will you do you create a cluster ip so that the communication will happen internally your database pods will be exposed to your application pods only so this is the only difference cluster ip is used for internal communication and your cluster node pod is used for the external communication so if you can see here kubectl get svc okay these three services i created right these three services i i created but kubernetes cluster ip service is also created automatically when i created the cluster when i bootstrap a cluster because this is the cluster ip that helps with all the communication inside the cluster i told you that whether your pod is running on node 1 and another pod is running on node 3 it doesn't matter because internal communication can happen how that internal communication can happen with the help of this cluster ip okay that is why we create cluster ip service all right so team if all of this is clear to you i am going to delete everything let me know if you have any doubts if you have any question with your node pod or cluster ip services let me know i am going to delete all of them rahul if your database is running outside if you are using some rds services or managed database services all right in that case you have to expose your application via node pod okay and multiple security constraint is also going to be there so that is a part of security but if you want to expose anything from out to outside the cluster whether it is on the browser whether you want to expose your pods to a external database you have to use node pod then okay uh rahul i am audible to all of them what i said is if your database is outside to your cluster then you have to expose your application pods via node pod service okay if it is inside the cluster cluster ip if it is outside the cluster then node pod
Anil, if you want, uh, you are saying that application to database connection is made through connection strings. So we use cluster IP. So Anil, that is an advanced topic. If you want to connect from one pod to another pod, and that is a database pod. So you have to use a connection string. You are absolutely correct. So what you have to do, you have to pass on some config maps and some secrets to that pod and then connect it from there. Okay, so for that purpose, you should understand about config maps. You should understand about secrets. That is the topic we are going to cover further. But how those pods will be exposed that we have covered so far. All right, so team, I hope all of it is clear to you. All right, so I know it was a lot to take. So what I'll suggest you take a break digest all of it okay take a break digest all of it come back after 15 minutes and after that we are going to move further and then we are going to see the deployment practical lab all right so team shall I break Alright, so team, uh, come back after 15 minutes. We are going to see the lab on deployment now. See you.
I'm back. Team, do confirm me follow if you are also back. responses I can see the strength is around 50 responses from all of you Once you have understand the concept of your services, now I will take you back to the deployment. All right. Now I'm going to take you back to the deployment. So you do understand the concept of deployment conceptually. All right. First, on a very basic note, I'm going to create a deployment from the command line. Okay. Just for the basic understanding. All right. Syntax is pretty much clear. All right. CTL create deployment all right and then you give the name of the deployment for example I'm saying show dep all right and then I have to give the image as usual okay simplest way I'm creating a deployment your deployment is created cube CTL get all okay so team now you can see our deployment is created as ship tab all right this is the name of your deployment I just created it from the command line it is giving one by one okay I didn't give how much replicas I want so if you don't give any replicas it create one replica by default and with that you can see a replica set is also created as I told you in the beginning whenever you create a deployment a replica set is created at the backend and whenever a replica set is created a pod is also created and you can see one by one the pod is there all right so what you can understand you can see the naming convention this is the name of your deployment your replica set first has the name of deployment and then alphanumeric string for your replica set now see the naming convention of your pod your pod naming convention is deployment name hyphen replica set name hyphen alphanumeric string for your pod all right now consider you want to upscale it so as I told you all the functionality from replica set is present in your deployment first we are going to see that all right we are going to scale it kubectl command is scale okay kubectl scale deployment you can give deployment or you can use deploy keyword as well deploy is a short keyword for your deployment all right you can use both name ship dep all right hyphen hyphen replicas you have to give the replicas like this all right i want three replicas kubectl scale deploy deployment name hyphen hyphen replicas all right your deployment has been scaled kubectl get all all right deployment three oblique three replica set desired three currents three and ready is also three and now you can see three pods running all right naming convention is still the same first your deployment name then your replica set name and then alphanumeric string for your pods All right. Clear to all of you. I'm 
downgrading all in a single go. Now let's take some advanced example from the Git repo. Okay, I have some examples here. Deployment example one. The DevOps, uh, I want to use a specific image. Let's see where is it. All right, so team, this is how you can create your deployment manually from the command line. And if you want to create a deployment from YAML, this is how you are going to do it, okay? I'm not going to create it right away. You understand the concept, all right? Your API version, your kind is deployment. Metadata may, uh, in metadata, you have to give the name of your metadata. You give labels to your deployment as well. Specs, you say three replicas, and also it does have the functionality of replica set. So if any pod is running with this label, will be selected by the selector and will be brought under your deployment. And under template, you give the complete definition of your pod. This is the name of your pod. Sorry, this is the label to your pod. And this is the specification for your container. All right. No Kadesh replicas means the total count. It is not plus or minus. You give the total number exactly. Okay. So consider if you want to downscale, how you're going to downscale it. If every time the replicas number you give is plus, then how you're going to downscale? Right. So if I want to downscale, I'm going to scale it to one so that it is going to have only one replica. It is going to have only one pod. Okay. So team uh, now when the concept is clear to you, okay, now we are going to see how you can perform rolling updates and rollbacks. Okay, the main functionality that I told you that deployment have, we are going to see an example for that one. That is going to require quite of a lab. All right, let me take the example for this. Deployment example three is for your rolling updates. Okay, first we are going to understand about the concepts. What are mentioned here, then we are going to see a lab on this. API version deployment, kubeserv uh, is the name of your deployment. That is all clear to you. All right. Under specs, I am giving five replicas. It means I want five replicas running all the time. All right. Next is minimum ready second. It means once your pod is created, it is going to wait for 10 seconds to make it live. All right. What strategy I want to type? I want to do the rolling update. Okay. Replacing one pod at a time is called rolling update. Now, under the definition of rolling updates, you give two main definition, maximum unavailable and maximum search. What is it? Okay. Let's try to understand that. So team, whenever the replacement take place, okay, replacement takes, uh, can take place in two ways, right? First way is that first your old, old pod, uh, pod will come down and second pod will take place. Okay. So team, the thing is when I'm doing this replacement at some point of time inside your replica set, you have only two pods while I'm replacing the first one. There is going to be some time when there will be only two pods, even for a fraction of second, even for a fraction of second, there will be a moment. Then there are only two pods when I'm replacing it. All right. So at that time, what I can say, I can give maximum unavailable. Okay. This is maximum unavailable. It means there is a possibility that I am asking for five replicas, but during the replacement, there can be a time that there will be only four pods. Okay. There will be a situation. Then there will be one number less than the total number. So what I'm defining for that, I can say that maximum can be one available. If I'm asking for three, there can be a time during the update. Then there will be only two pods minus one. 
all right that is maximum unavailable so if i am doing the replacement one pot will come down and another pot will take place during the meantime there will be a gap so that is your maximum unavailable so there is one this is the one way of replacement what is the second way of replacement second way of replacement is i won't take it down first i will make another one available then i will bring down the first one okay so what is happening in this scenario in this scenario there is a situation there is a time where there are four pods running at a time there will be a fraction of second that there will be four pods there will be all three pods of version 1 there will be a version 2 pod as well okay for the fraction of time when i am placing it and taking it down so this is called maximum search it means it can allow maximum number of one plus maximum search it can allow one more pod inside the deployment for a fraction of second that is i am allowing okay so this is about maximum unavailable and maximum search all right other definitions are same to you selector field match labels template is the template of your deployment all right sorry pods and then i am creating a service as well okay i am creating a service also notepad service i am exposing my application with port number 80 target port number 80 okay so as i told you earlier if you don't want to give target port you can skip it if it is same with your port and target port if you want to specify you can specify them as well okay so now what i am going to do i am going to create this deployment and this service i'll take the raw format kubectl create hyphen f kubectl get all all right so team you can see our deployment is created as of now pods are not available so it is showing you zero in replica side it is also showing zero because your containers are getting created all right this is a little heavy image that is why it is taking some time let's wait for it So team you can see all the pods are running all right all the five pods are running you have a cube serve service this is the node port ip okay so if you want to use this actually i told you this is the ip which is never used for the external world okay you use a uh, machine ip with a port number but if you want to check it on the local you can curl this ip as well okay because this is an internal ip it can work internally okay it will give you the response all right and you can see that it is also doing the load balancing this is v1 from pod d7 it is from vt it is again from vt so it is doing the load balancing okay it is always going to this one although no worries okay so it does a load balancing now we want to see the functionality that if we want to update our application how it is going to work all right so i am going to have some sessions this one and i am going to say here sudo su hyphen this is my node one and i have a node two as well let me have this one also let's have them side by side so team i am going to show you something very interesting now all right so keep an eye here 
first i am going to do the curl operation in a repeated cycle on node 1 all right so what i am going to do i am going to create a loop here while true okay colon to curl i am going to curl the ip of the service all right and i am going to ask it to sleep for 2 seconds okay do the call operation then wait for 2 second all right then give me a space or give me an enter all right and then this loop should be over okay so it is going to do the call operation on this cluster ip this service ip for repetitively and it is going to wait for 2 second after doing it again and again okay so you are getting the responses this is v1 pod from cube serve and it is always going to different different pods okay now the requirement i told you i want to have this pod version updated okay i want to replace the image for say okay this is the update you are going to do on your application you are going to update the version all right so i am going to change the image of my pod all right for that purpose what i am going to do cubectl set command okay if you want to modify the image you use set command set image on your deployment okay what is the name of your service service name is cube service sorry what is the name of your deployment your deployment name is cube serve set cubectl set image your deployment object name and then the name of your object all right app equals to lead devops this was my repository cube serve all right and colon v2 okay so it is not right i am like i am giving a random number v1 v2 okay this is the command that i have Uh, these are the images i do have on my repository version 1 version 2 version 3 i have three versions of my uh, image on my repository before executing this i am going to do something here as well okay uh cube ctl get rs okay okay sorry you cannot do that cube ctl doesn't work here all right no worries uh all right so what i'm going to do i am going to set the image here deployment name is cube serve e okay team you can see that deployment app cube serve is updated okay cube ctl get all okay i am going to do it on a watch cube ctl get all <clears throat> all right team now you can see on deployment 6 by 5 is ready because you have maximum surge of 1 okay and now you can see there are another replica set is also created you can see your old pods are getting terminated your new pods are coming online you can see the version update some are responding as version 2 and some are responding as version 1 all right here you can see previous logs earlier it was providing all the output from version 1 then it started providing from version 2 then sometime it was responding from version 1 sometime it was responding from version 2 and with time you can see all of the outputs are coming from version 2 all right and here you can see your deployment is again 5 by 5 there was a time it was 6 by 5 all right and two replicas were created this is your old replica set and this is your new replica set and again your pods are here okay so this is the part you have done control c cube ctl another command is roll out history history deploy and deployment name okay history all right so 
team this is another command called kubectl rollout history deploy kube serve all right as of now i haven't given any message that is why you can see none otherwise it can show you that currently you have two versions you have version 1 revision number 1 revision number 2 it means you have two version it means you have two replica set at the back end all right now consider i am going to change it to the third time all right this time i am going to define as version 3 all right and as of now you didn't get any message this time i want to have some message for that purpose you are going to have as hyphen hyphen record equals to true okay as of now you can see there is no record but if you want to record if you want to have some messages here you have to set hyphen hyphen record equals to true team do pay attention this is important for the examination point of view okay during exam they do ask you that have some records for your deployment history okay you cannot record the history if you don't give this flag and how you are going to see the output you have to know this okay kubectl rollout history is the command and if you want to update this is how you are going to update it all right i am doing this it is updated kubectl get all you can see five public four two are up to date four are not up to date i am getting the third replica set now your pods are getting terminated and you can see the output here okay v2 v3 you can see some output are coming from v2 some output are coming from v3 all right so you can see all the replicas are replaced four are available one is remaining you see sometime four will also come online your old old pods are terminated your new pods has taken the place so team this is called rolling update okay this is called rolling update all right so let's check out the history kubectl rollout history deploy kube serve all right so team as you can see in earlier one you cannot see any output but now when you use hyphen hyphen record equals to true this command was present here okay so make this a habit whenever you do the updation in deployment always do record equals to true then only you are going to see the output in the uh, rollout history otherwise it won't be available to you all right kubectl get all so team one question for all of you okay one question is for all of you when i updated the deployment deployment remained the same okay deployment remained the same there are no multiple deployments here but there are now three replica set why there are three replica set why it hasn't updated the previous one why it is creating a new replica set can anyone answer so team this is my buggy application okay now there is a question for all of you this is the second question i am going to ask all right why it created multiple replica set why it didn't update the same replica set shichu jagannath gorav you are correct adhirika guess you are not mohan you are correct absolutely anybody else want to give a try yes ankur akhil no no that is not the case adir agrish no no prempal you are correct okay team now let me ask you another question maybe then you can answer okay now you can see some internal error has occurred and this is from this pod okay so what is the case what is happening here consider i have updated my application to version 3 but that version 3 has some bugs okay version 3 has some bugs so what i need to do i want to have the previous version because this bug this is a buggy version i cannot have it my clients are going to run away so what i want to do i want to roll back i want to have the previous version 
but if it is going to update the same replica set how i am going to have the previous version right so i hope now you can answer if i want to roll back how can i roll back team if i want to roll back to the previous version how can i do that uh fanny no i don't want to do the edit yes arjun you are correct gorav if you delete the old replica set manually then it is not it won't be able to give, go back to the previous version ashok correct girish you are also correct fanny we don't want to do the edit all right so team if you want to go to the previous version okay if you want to go to the previous version you are going to undo the changes okay cube ctl roll out undo okay i am going to undo it deploy deployment name cube serve hyphen hyphen to hyphen revision okay so team this is the keyword all right this is a keyword now it is up to you to which revision you want to go you want to go to revision 2 you can do that you want to go to revision 1 directly you give the revision number okay if you want to undo you give the revision number whichever you want so i want to go back to the version 1 directly okay so you can see roll back i am going to put a watch here all right now you can see that first replica set has started getting populated desired 2 current 2 ready to now it has modified 4 now desired is 4 your current replica set is only showing 2 right let's see the output you can see there were some errors from version 3 now you started getting version 1 and now you are consistently getting your version 1 because your first version is been populated all the bots are available and you are getting all the responses for your version 1 all right so team this is how you are going to do it all right if you want to go to the previous table version this is how you are going to do it uh and you guys you are asking for the commands where are all these commands i can show you that twitter repository there is folder called others all right day 3 and day 4 text okay the init command is also there okay expose commands are also there these are the commands cube ctl rollout status cube ctl rollout status is here all right you can pause and resume as well okay delete deploy all the commands are here okay rollout history undo to revision to revision 1 okay all the commands are here so where educa on your repository others day 3 and 4 all the commands are here Yes, Gaurav. If you want to go from revision one to revision two, you can do that also. Okay, you can do that because now it is inside the repository of uh, Kubernetes. Kubernetes is managing all three version. You can simply use undo command and go back to any version: version one, version two, version three. All the versions will be available to you. All right. So team deployment is clear to you rolling updates rollbacks it was a big topic all right this is one of the biggest topic that runs into continuation services and deployment otherwise all the concept are independently running this was the biggest concept that works collaboratively 
your services and deployment rolling updates and rollouts. Preamble, there are no other deployments. For example, if you want to ask about role, uh, there is a Canary deployment as well, okay? And there is a blue-green deployment also in uh, Kubernetes. There is a rolling update, which is there, all right? But during the examination only, they ask about rolling updates only, okay? You can have type uh, strategy as rolling updates. You can have the strategy as Canary. You can have the strategy as blue-green. But in the examination, they only ask about rolling updates. And even though in the organization, rolling update is the most popular one. All right, team, any other question till now? If not, I'm going to move forward. Team, quick yes from all of you if deployment, running updates, rollbacks, and services are clear to you. Instead of rule out, undo what if set the images. Sarath, you can set the image as well, but you want to do everything from the command line. Why you want to mess up with the manifest files when all the versions are managed by Kubernetes? In the last version three, all the users were affecting uh, when rolling update is applied. Yes, Primpal, all the users were affected. Some users were getting the output from version three. Some uh, users were getting the output from version two. We saw that with the curl operation. Okay, so it is still curling repetitively. So it works like that. All right. So what happens? Sometimes you get a output from version one. So as many times as you refresh, as many times the user is going to refresh his browser, it is going to see a different output until less the version has stabilized. But there won't be any downtime. It will always get some output. Uh, Shiju, what is pause and resume you are asking uh, from the commands you I have shown you, okay? So the thing is, consider your four pods are replaced, one pod is not replaced, okay? You want to pause it for that time, okay? Your rolling update is taking place, your three pods are replaced, two pods are not replaced. And you want to pause it for that time. There you use a pause value. And when you want to resume, then you use resume. Anil, uh, props are defined under your pod definition. So in your deployment, you have pod definition as well. There you can define your props as well. So you can use all these things. See, all the things that I'm uh, teaching you, you can use collectively. Okay, it is not dependent that you have to use the props only when you are defining only a pod. Okay, we are understanding about the concepts. You can use all the concepts collectively in a singular way. In the continuation to the previous question, is there a way to verify and split the deployment by percentage? Uh, split the deployment percentage? I don't understand, Primpal, what exactly you're asking for. Okay, please uh, ask more clearly. I was not able to understand. So team, as of now, what I'm doing, I'm deleting all of it. kubectl, delete all, hyphen, hyphen, all. Okay, and we are going to move to the next concept now. Oh, okay, Shiju. Okay, I got the answer now. Okay, Primpal, yeah, Shiju understood your question and she answered. Sorry, my bad. So if you want to do it with the percentage basis, okay, how much percentage you want to update? Okay, as of now, we have given the values, maximum search and maximum unavailable. If you want to do the deployment on the percentage basis, then you use a canary deployment. Okay, that is not going to come under rolling updates. It will come under canary deployment. Okay, 
टीम नेक्स्ट टॉपिक नेक्स्ट कॉन्सेप्ट वन क्वेश्चन वन क्वेश्चन टू ऑल ऑफ यू सो टीम एज ऑफ नाउ विथ ऑल यूर अंडरस्टैंडिंग यू अंडरस्टूड दैट इफ यू डिफाइन फाइव रेप्लिकास ओके इफ यू डिफाइन फाइव रेप्लिकास इट कैन ऑल रिसाइड ऑन नोट वन ऑल्सो टू कैन रिसाइड ऑन नोट वन थ्री कैन रिसाइड ऑन नोट टू और राइट वन कैन रिसाइड ऑन नोट वन टू कैन फोर कैन रिसाइड ऑन नोट थ्री और राइट it is completely dependent on the scheduler okay you cannot make that call that this pod should go on that node that pod should go on that node if you are using some replicas you cannot define that all right if you want to use static pod that is a completely different story but consider you want something with which you can place one pod on every node okay if you have asked for five replicas one can go on one four can go on another one Two can go on one, three can go on another one. But what you want, you want one pod should go on every node, and even you don't want to give the replicas number. Okay, you don't want to give the replicas number. You don't want to give five replicas or three replicas. You want your cluster to decide. You want that one pod should go on all the nodes. If your cluster have four nodes, if your cluster have four nodes. then replica should be four automatically you don't you don't want to give the replicas number and you want those four replicas one to be running on each node one should run on node 1 another one should run on node 2 one another one on node 3 another one on node 4 okay so even if you add another cluster uh, another machine to your cluster okay you add another node to your cluster so one more replica should be created and it should go on the last one so your requirement is one pod on every node so team can anyone answer can we do that can we achieve that with all the concept we have understood so far can we do that no anil in it container won't work grish how we can okay people who are answering yes do let me know how as well no anil i don't want to use static pods gorav i don't want to do that okay uh, ankur you are way ahead of us okay you went to affinity abhinav you got it adurika guess you think right okay so many people are giving me advanced topics tens all right sort of no i don't want to do it with static pods because with static i have to log into all the nodes manually consider you have 20 nodes are you going to log on on all 20 nodes manually and do it enjoy the place nothing like custom scheduler <laughs> okay team so i told you there are multiple controllers okay there are multiple controllers rc we have discussed rs deployment we have discussed next is daemon set so daemon set is a one that creates one pod on every node okay you don't have to define the replicas you don't have to manage everything you just define a definition of daemon set and one pod will be created on all the nodes okay let's see the example for this controller all right there has to be some demon set okay demon set example 1 okay so team this is the definition you have to give the kindest demon set okay the name of the demon set is my demon set i have given some labels as well then specs and selectors okay if you want to skip this part you can leave this okay this is not mandatory for a demon set under template you can see this is the definition of your pod the pod names are this they also have some labels and then the uh, your container specification all right and you can see i can give the limits and request as well so you can use all the concepts all together okay so team in this definition you can see i have nowhere mentioned the number of replicas okay there is no mention of number of replicas so let's try to create this demon set cube ctl create hyphen f 
demon set okay you can see your demon set is created cube ctl get the short form for demon set is ds okay so team you can see it took it from itself okay i never mentioned two replicas but is it kept two desired two current and two are ready to update and two available okay i never gave replicas equals to two it created two replicas at its own how cube ctl get pods hyphen o white okay so team you can see it placed one at node one and another on node two so this is the feature of demon set that it is going to place one pod on every node now let's come to the use case so what is the use case of demon set okay so team i am going to show you uh, one important output and you will understand that first use case on the enterprise level i'll say consider that you have 50 nodes inside your cluster all right and you want some kind of logging enable okay so what you are going to do you are, you want to place a splunk container a splunk pod on all the nodes so that it is going to catch up the logs from all the nodes okay you want to do that you create a daemon set that is the enterprise level requirement next cube ctl get all hyphen n cube system so team now you are going to see everything that i have taught, taught you today okay all the components of your cube system are right in front of you okay so team you can see core dns core dns runs as a deployment okay and we have two replicas with that we have a core dns replica set as well right so core dns this one is running as your deployment okay core dns is running as a deployment now <coughs> cube proxy and vnet okay this is a use case i told you that if i'm using proxy proxy should be running on all the nodes right proxy should be running on all the nodes that is why i want to have it as a demon set i need cube proxy on every node i am going to define it as a demon set okay vnet that is your cni sorry vnet is your cni so a cni should also be present on all the nodes that is why i have created the vnet as a demon set i haven't kubernetes did okay so now you can understand about all the components okay core dns both are running as a deployment and replica set etcd is running as a static pod static pod static pod cube proxy as a demon set all right scheduler as a static pod vnet as a demon set okay so all the concept that we have understood kubernetes itself is using the same concept at the back end okay so team any question with the demon set and everything that we have understood so far any question any doubt everything is clear to all of you jishu please go ahead anybody else any other question the use of the service ashok if you have uh, attended my first class that was third in this complete curriculum first two classes were not taken by me i took the third class so in my first class i told you 
that weave net is your cni okay that is your network i told you kubernetes doesn't provide its own networking so you have to pick your own networking so weave net is a component that provides you networking we have taken it from there okay shiju you are asking that kube proxy and calico node or weave net is our daemon set so why they are running on master as well okay so all right shiju you saw that when i created the daemon set those daemon set were executed on node 1 and node 2 only that was not created on master but here weave net and kube proxy are running on master as well why is that so okay that is your question so the thing is when you you are using a default namespace okay default namespace is set up in a way that it is going to only take the instruction from master okay this is a concept of taints and toleration i can also tell you okay so you have to define taints and toleration so for cube system namespace we have defined master as also a node because it is a master level component it is a system level components so in cube system namespace we have defined it in a way that master is also considered as a node all right but if we are creating a daemon set in a default namespace or in some other namespace it is go not going to here treat master as a node so that is the story here and to understand with the, uh, this in depth we have to go to the taints and tolerance we were supposed to uh, cover it today but i don't think we are going to reach to that point today okay so i hope that answers your question cube system namespace treat master also as a node and other default namespace treats worker nodes as just nodes all right so team next uh, topic is your jobs okay so team what are jobs consider uh, if you want to have some proper operation and then that is run okay this is what we have seen in init containers also in init containers what happens they do their job and they die out okay these are the story of init containers uh prempal if i had one node in the cluster then how daemon set are managed among all the nodes is the daemon yes prempal if you have added a new node okay you are going to generate a new token so you are going to regenerate the previous token and you are going to execute on it on the worker node so your new worker node will be added to your cluster all right and when kubernetes will understand that there is one more node daemon set is going to create it automatically okay daemon set will be scaled from 2 to 3 and a new pod will be placed on node 3 it will be done automatically okay so team actually what i was trying to say that you know the basic nature of init containers they do some work and they once their job is done once their job is done they die out all right they pass on some information to the primary container and blah 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 whatsoever but they are destined to die similarly consider you want to execute some jobs okay consider uh, you want to run a scan okay you want to run a scan on a particular time in your system so what you are going to do you are going to do it with the job if you want to do it on the uh, random basis you are going to create a job in kubernetes and then that job is going to do the work and then it is going to get die okay then your container will die once its job is done so for that purpose we use jobs in kubernetes that is your next type of controller okay let's see its definition so team uh, the next two topic is job and cron job so don't ask me about the use case because that is actually not really used anywhere okay this is just a concept that can help you in the examination <clears throat> they might ask you but in practical life it is never used so the kind is job all right we are going to do some countdown okay back of limit you can ignore it for now <clears throat> metadata is a name container i am going to name the container as countdown 
CentOS is the image I'm going to use. I'm going to do the min bash and I'm going to execute this. Okay. It is going to write down numbers from 9 to 1. That is what is it is supposed to do. I'll take the raw format. kubectl create hyphen f job. I have created a job. kubectl get job. Okay. You can see this is running from 5 second and it is not completed yet. The number of operation you are going to provide, it is going to show you. Okay, completion you can see 0 oblique 1. Now the completion is 0, 1 oblique 1. kubectl get pods. Okay, you can see that countdown, uh, countdown pod is 0 oblique 1. It was ready for some time, but once its job was completed, you can see the status changed to completed. Okay, so the job ports shows you status as completed once their job is done. All right, so they runs to completion and their status changed to completed. Now it is a job. You want to see the logs as well. Okay, so you can say the same task I can do with a normal pod as well. So why do I want a job? Because job retains the logs as well. If you want to do the same task with a normal pod, you can do that. But once the job inside the pod is completed, your pod will be deleted. Okay, your container will die out or your container will restart based on the policies you have defined. So once your container is gone, once your container is died, the logs are also gone. But if you have done that with a job, your container will stay there and will have that logs. So what is happening actually your container has died out, but your pod is still there so that you can catch up the logs. Okay, so if you want to know the logs, kubectl get job, you get the job name, kubectl logs and the job name. Mm, sorry. Okay, you have to do with the pod. <coughs> My bad. kubectl logs, pod, and the pod name. What is wrong? Okay, kubectl log and directly the pod name. All right, you saw that countdown happen. This was a task. But if you would have done this uh, with a normal pod, this log was not able to show you because it would have died out or restarted. So if you want to retain the log of some jobs, you use the job type. Yes, Shiju, it is useful for the background task. Absolutely correct. Okay. And with this, this job will be executed in the real time, right? This job will be executed in the real time. But consider you want to schedule this job. All right. If you use a job, it will be executed right away. But if you want to schedule a job, that cannot be done with a job. You can do that with a cron job. That is your another kind of controller. Okay, cron job example one. If you want to schedule something, you are going to schedule it. Okay, this is another kind cron job. Name of the cron job. Under specs, you have to mention the schedule. Okay, you have mentioned you have to mention the schedule. So you can see, I am asking it to execute every one min, uh, second. Sorry, minute. All right. So if you want to know how this formatting is done, it is just a basic Linux concept. All right. It is not a Kubernetes concept. You should know this from your Linux administration or Linux knowledge.
simply check out for the format or your cron job format is there it is a linux concept not your kubernetes one okay this is how you define and what star and what place means what you can see here all right so you can see the example here execute after every 5 minutes and we have given the same format but in the place of 5 we have given one all right so it is going to execute after every 1 minute all right so about the formatting you can understand it from the google it is a basic linux concept not a kubernetes concept so what i am going to do i am going to have the raw format for this and i am going to schedule a cron job and it will be executed after every minute job will be completed once but cron job will execute as many time as you want create hyphen f this all right so what is happening it will execute after every minute what will happen this is the metadata this is the definition of your pod all right it is going to sh uh, this is the name of your container this is the image of your container what it is going to do it is going to write down the date and it is going to highlight a message hello from kubernetes cluster and this will be done after every minute so let's see if it is happening or not kubectl get pods all right you can see this pod completed its job kubectl logs and this one this is the time at this time it showed the message kubectl get pods okay another pod will be live it might take some time you can see this is the definition of your cron job team can you see another pod was created okay difference you can see 60 second is the difference that is 1 minute so after every 1 minute a new pod will be created and it will give you some output so this is the latest one kubectl logs pod name okay so this job will keep creating every job after every minute okay after another minute you will see it will be creating another pod for the particular job okay so team with this your these uh, concepts are covered we have covered all the controllers rc rs deployment jobs cron jobs daemon set okay so team the thing is your jobs and cron jobs are important for your examination point of view that's all okay they don't have any much job in the enterprise level but it is important for your examination in exam 90% of chances are there that you will get some question on job and cron job for sure okay there are high chances of getting question from jobs and cron jobs so you can see another pod is created now you can see four pods right so if you want to delete it you have to delete the cron job i am deleting everything as of now all right so team now if you have any question from jobs and cron jobs now you can ask <coughs> Kushagar, can we restart the job? Yes, you do have the YAML file with you, right? The number, uh, the number of time you are execute the executing the same YAML file, it will create the job again and again. But it is for the real time. If you create a job, it will be executed right away. It will not be scheduled. But with cron job, you can do the scheduling as well. Premal, you are asking, can you please create cron job for existing job? Countdown was created. 
Okay. Primpal, that is just a concept. You have to pass on the arguments. Okay. Also, you have to decide that if you are giving the timer one. Okay. So the timer one has a particular task to do. So if you want to do it repetitively, you have to pass on the arguments only at that place. Okay. The arguments that you have placed here for the cron job, you can replace them with the arguments of your uh, job. Here it is. Okay. Replace this with this and you are good to go. If, if the pod is removed, then you won't be able to access the logs, right? Uh, Shiju, that is the importance of your jobs and cron jobs. Okay. Because pods are not removed until and unless you remove them manually. Okay. If you are doing all the things with a container or with a normal pod, your containers dies out inside the pod and you loses all the logs. But with job and cron jobs, your logs are retained. That is why a new sub, uh, topic was present in Kubernetes named as jobs and cron jobs. We could have done the same with the uh, normal pod as well. But we wanted to retain the log. That is why we have the concept of jobs and cron jobs. Team, anyone, anything else? Any question, any doubt? No? Uh, no, Gopal, you cannot log into that uh, pod. Actually, I haven't tried that, actually. Let's see that. Okay, I actually deleted all of them. QCTL, get pods. Okay, let's try to do that. Actually, I haven't done that. So Gopal is asking if the logs are retained. So if the container is also present or not. Okay, let's see that practically. In the meantime, any other question, any other doubt? Okay, so this job is completed. kubectl exec hyphen it your pod name <coughs> hyphen hyphen bash. Okay, so team, this is what I explained you actually. Okay. Pod remains completed, but container dies out. Okay. If you work with a normal pod, in a normal pod, what happens? Your job is completed by the container, it will die out. So it depends on the policy. If the container has died out, your pod will try to restart it. All right. But it is not the case with the job pod or cron job pod. It goes to the completion. So your container is completed, your container is removed, but your pod is retaining the logs so that you can check it out. Ashok, what you want me to explain again? Let me know. I will do that. But explain what? Okay, explain the job. All right, Ashok. Ashok, uh, the thing is, uh, if you want to have some task to be done, okay, for example, at the enterprise level, I am saying that you want to have 
some task of uh, scanning okay you want to do some scanning on your notes okay you want to do some scanning inside your cluster all right so even uh, you might want to know some count of your pods or something you want to do some particular task all right all right if you talk about deployment if you talk about pods they are working as your application pod they will be live all the time okay but you want some task to be done okay then those pods are not supposed to live forever they have to complete a task and then they can die out so these type of task are done by the job you want to get some work done get it done by a job you don't have to create the pod you don't have to create the deployment create the pod, uh, create the job and then once your job is completed for the pod your container will be deleted and your logs will be retained so that is the concept of job you want to get something done get it done by a job you cannot do that with a pod okay like i showed you i wanted to run a countdown timer okay so once that was done it was deleted where it was here all right i created the job in the job i wanted to have a timer that was the simplest example i have given you wanted to do some scan you can do that you can retain the logs but i wanted to run a countdown timer from 9 to 1 so it counted that and once it was done it was completed yes jagannath in the meantime if your container is live it is if it is doing the job you can log into that container in that case you can do that you can have a timer for 99 seconds and in the meantime if you want to log in you can log into the container all right so team if all of this is clear to you we can mark all of this as completed we have defined the controllers we have done with the rolling updates roll back run services all of this is completed next things we wanted to discuss was scheduling tenants and toleration name space limits drain and uncordon etc the backup monitoring volume this was the agenda we wanted to cover definitely it wasn't possible to cover all of it but no worries we were not able to start with this we are going to start this with with this next week all right so this is the agenda for your next coming saturday so team how was the class for today were you able to understand the concept today was a big concept that runs into continuation i tried my best to make it as much clear as i can okay great excellent thank you ashok good topic okay to mark your feedback also and if you feel it was good do let me know what you want me to do to make it excellent okay as i told you that is all the what counts here so team thank you for all your feedbacks i am do getting that i do read all the feedbacks thoroughly every single one all right and i really appreciate so keep doing that it gives me some motivation as well all right so team we are done for today do we need to go through the ppts as well for examination point of view exams gaur for exam you can cover as much as you want okay there is no limit if you want to go through the slides as well you can go through the slides all right it is going also going to help and also if you complete all the things in this repository then you can consider that you are well prepared for the exam as well arjun for the uh, you saying heavy topics can you please send me some labs question for us to practice so arjun if you have went through this repository everything is here all right everything is here troubleshooting scenarios are also there but we haven't discussed that so that is why i haven't showed you that all right if you want to know some exam preparation exam preparation topics are also here okay i have pasted here multiple pdf files some readme files are also there we dish with all the details 
all right some uh, scenario based questions are also there but i haven't shown you this to, uh, till now because it covers all the concept i am not going to open one pdf and show you all the topics which were covered so far because it contains all the topic so this is what i have kept for the last but still if you want to go through it you can go through it but if you want me to discuss these things i am going to discuss by the end of the session or the course imanshu i have already shared if you do have this repository you have to go to the other folder okay in other folder you have html bookmark okay google it how to download bookmarks from html file and you will have the similar bookmark with yourself from where can we get practice some mock test got for that at least you have to complete the course okay in mock test you will get the question from all the topics and you don't know all the topics as of now as per my teaching so many concepts are remaining so first you have to understand all the concepts then you can go for the mock test all right so a quick recap what we did last week all right we studied about your kubernetes controllers how many kind of controllers are there your rc rs and your deployment we talked about your daemon set we talk about jobs cron jobs all right this is all we discussed and we also studied about your services how many kind of services are there that is node port and your cluster ip we understood about all of them okay that is what we did yesterday sorry last week and today we are going to start with schedules scheduling all right we are going to see about tenants and toleration uh, we already understood about namespaces but today we are going to see how we can limit namespaces we are going to see drain and uncoordinating of nodes etc backup we are going to see about monitoring also today and if time permits we'll see about volumes as well okay this is the agenda we have for today before we get started if anybody has any question from the previous session you can ask whatever we have discussed so far anybody has any question at all okay so in that case team we are going to start with today's agenda all right our first topic for today is scheduling all right so team in the basic architecture class we already studied that we have a scheduler also there as a master component how many of you remember what is the purpose of scheduler anyone what is the purpose of scheduler Thank you. 
distribute task as in what that is not a clear definition Mosomi yes you're right Shiju Akhil Sanjay yes you're correct Ankur Jagannath yes Joydeep Girish yes Akhil Satish Himanshu yes you are all absolutely correct okay so the job is scheduler to decide to which node your pod should get assigned to okay we have a master and we have a three worker nodes as if i am showing you all right so first your request go to the api server and api server ask your scheduler to which node your pod should go to all right but we have also seen that we can force a pod to decide on a particular node as well right we have already seen that how with the help of static pods all right we have done with the help of static pods <clears throat> but there are some criteria based on which we can also ask the scheduler to make the pod go on a particular node itself yes that is also possible okay so for scheduler we are going to see how the scheduling happens and how we can ask the scheduler to assign a pod to a particular node today we are going to see that okay so the scheduler based on the below criteria decides that a pod should go to a particular node first and foremost uh, foremost is hardware resourcing First is your hardware resourcing. It means how your hardware is configured. Is there enough RAM or there or not? If there enough disk space is available or not? If there are enough CPU cores are available or not? Okay. How your physical server is configured? How your physical configuration of your nodes are configured? So if there is any pressure or not? Okay. That is the first criteria based on which your scheduler decide that which node should be chosen if any node has any kind of pressure it means it doesn't have enough ram it doesn't have any C enough cpu core it has lesser disk space it is not going to schedule the pod on that node it is going to choose anyone else okay first is your hardware resourcing second is your node selection okay second is your node selection third based on labels also we can define that this particular label should be there if your pod should be assigned to that node okay that is one next is ports based on volumes as well okay i'll let you know about the volumes concept as well we have taints and toleration and we have affinity okay now we are going to see all of them first is your hardware resourcing it means based on your hardware resources it defines that which node should be chosen so let's see that also kubectl get nodes okay we can define any node to see how it behaves for example if i am going to define k node 1 kubectl describe is the command that you already know node k node 1 okay so it gives you complete complete definition about the node how it is like all right and here you get all the definition what are the condition based on which it decides all right 
first you can see that network unavailable if the network is available or not the status is false it means network is there it means vnet is available next is your memory pressure that is also false it means kubelet has sufficient memory all right kubelet has sufficient memory available next is your disk space cannot uh, kubelet has no disk pressure kubelet has no disk pressure pid are there enough process ids available or not to handle the request kubelet has sufficient pids ready it means that kubelet is posting ready seated it means that your application is sorry your node is available your not uh, node is available and is ready to take the request all right all the information you get from here so first was your hardware resourcing next is your node selection you can choose on which node your pod should reside you can give that in the definition as well next is labels similar to that node selection it chose on the basis of labels as well we are going to see that practically next is port consider that my application is going to listen to a particular port and that port mapping needs to be done on the node level as well okay so it is going to check that which node is uh, have the available port okay for example this my application listens to port number 80 and that port number needs to be mapped from the node level as well so it is going to check that on which node that port is available so whichever node is going to have that port available it is going to assign my pod to that particular node then we have volume concept all right so volumes i am going to explain you once we discuss about volumes all right this is the last topic in our agenda for today if everything goes fine otherwise tomorrow we are going to study about volumes next is your tens and toleration and affinity okay so there are some topics that we cannot do anything okay hardware four items node selection labels tints and toleration and affinity okay consider i came with a request that i want to create a pod okay this is your n1 this is your n2 and this is your n3 okay so i came with a request that i need to create a pod all right i can give it in the definition that it should go on a node whose name is n1 okay as simple as that okay i came with a request for a pod creation and i said that i want the pod to be created on the node whose name is node1 very simple you go to some uh, person's address all right he give you the absolute address come to house number 83 okay then you are going to directly go to the house number 4083 as simple as that okay so example we have in the same git repository you have to go to the repository pods and placement all right so this is the first example all right we are going to create a deployment with two replicas all right in your pod definition in your pod definition you see something extra called specs under specs you have something called node name you have to give the name of the node and then your no, uh, pod will be assigned to that node only okay so here it is node 1 and our name is k node 1 so we are going to have the copy of this node.yaml okay the name of our node is k node 1 we are going to save it kubectl create hyphen f node.yaml okay your deployment is created kubectl get 
pods hyphen o wide all right so these are the previous jobs or something okay here you can see that cube serve has created two pods eight seconds ago and both the pods are created on node one okay both the pods are created on k node one because we gave as a node name specification that you have to go to the node one that's all as simple as that all right next item consider your pods are colored a bit okay just take an example consider you have multiple nodes all right in a cluster we have already two but consider in your environment you have five type of nodes okay you have five nodes now next is you want to give a definition that your no, uh, pod should go on some particular node you can give the node name directly but no you don't want to give a particular node you want to give some kind of nodes all right consider you have defined some nodes as your production nodes some nodes as your testing environment node all right so when you are creating some testing pods you want them to go on the testing node itself maybe you have testing node one you have my you may have three testing nodes you have three production nodes all right so you want them to go only on the testing nodes you don't want to create your pod on the production node in that scenario looking at this diagram how you can define okay you have one yellow node you have one green node and you have two blue nodes so i want my pod to go on some blue colored node only okay my pod should go on some blue color node only if there are two it can choose any out of those two but it should not go on yellow or it should not go on green but any blue node if there are multiple it can choose at its own okay there comes the concept of your labels okay you can put labels on your nodes itself in previous classes we have seen that i can place a label on my pod that is what we have seen so far but we can put a label on node as well that is allowed that is possible i can put a label on my node as well all right for that same purpose we have another example here node selector pod okay in this you give some label definition this time you can see there is a difference earlier we had node name now we are using node selector under node selector we have something called a label all right so first let me assign a label to one node cube ctl uh just a minute yeah cube ctl label node i want to assign some label to k node 2 all right and what label i am assigning color equals to green okay now you can see that your k node 2 has been labeled all right if you want to see cube ctl describe node k node 2 let me have the grep because it provides me a bigger output okay you can see that your k node 2 has been labeled as color equals to green simple now i am going to have this definition and create my replicas 
it is also going to create two replicas but it should get assigned to the node who has the label of node selector that is color equals to green from here i am going to take the draw format cube ctl create hyphen f and create okay cube serve name already exists cube ctl delete all hyphen hyphen all Okay, my previous deployment name was also cube serve. That is why it is giving conflict error. So before that, let me delete everything. that's done <clears throat> okay you can see that your deployment has been created let's see where your pods are assigned this time see both the pods are assigned to node 2 based on the label you can label as many nodes as you want Okay, I can have five nodes labeled out of my 10 nodes in my cluster. So it will choose out of these five nodes only where your pod should get assigned. Okay, so team, any question in your node name and node selector? Is it clear to all of you? Any doubts, any question? Okay, if any, you want me to repeat the node name. Node name is simply you have to give the node name. Okay, it is as simple as that. You have to provide on which node your pod should get assigned to. Here I gave labels. In node name, you give the name of the node. You can see I have simply given the name of the node. Under specification, node name equals to node 1. You give the node name, K node 1 is was, uh, was in our case. You give here K node 1 and it will be scheduled on that particular node. That's all. Sumit, why we have used specific node selector rather than only selector? Sumit selector works with your pod labels. Okay. You have to provide the difference and that is how your Kubernetes has defined the naming convention. If you use selector, it is going to check for the labels on your pods. If you give node selector, it will check the labels on the nodes. Yes, Gaurav, you can have multiple node labels. You can give as many labels as you want. Okay, so if it's clear, let's take the next topic. All right. Now, when you were creating the pods till now, it was a decision was made by the pod. All right. Your pod was choosing the node where it has to sit. Your pod gives the definition that it wants to sit on node 1 in case of node names. When it comes to your labels, 
again your pod was the one that makes a decision that i will sit on either this node or either this node okay now if you want to give some complex situation okay if you want to give some complex condition for example looking at the current picture i want my pod should not sit on blue color nodes okay in the previous example we asked our pod to sit only on the nodes whose label has blue all right now i want to give some complex situation that my pod should be sitting on node which are not blue colored which are not blue labeled or i want my pod to sit either on yellow node or either on green node but not on blue color node so you are trying to understand right it if i want to give some complex situation some complex conditions in that scenario affinity comes into picture okay with node name and node selector you can give simplest condition but no i want to give complex conditions for that purpose affinity comes into picture all right let's take an example you will understand better that way okay there is an example of affinity again i am going to create a deployment with three replicas all the other definition are already clear to you okay now under specs you have affinity under affinity you have node affinity okay first point first you have two types of affinity first is your node affinity second is your pod affinity i'll explain you one after it after another <clears throat> first we are going to discuss about node affinity what is node affinity okay in node affinity you give complex condition based on which your node is selected where your pod should be living okay now under you have a big string preferred during scheduling ignore during execution okay i'll let you know about that now you can see i have given the weightage okay in weightage you can see i have given two condition this is my first condition of weightage 80 this is my second condition of weightage 20 it means when the pods will be created it will try to fulfill the condition with 80% weightage when the pods will be created it will try to fulfill the condition which has the higher weightage if this condition is not able to fulfill if this condition is not able to fulfill then it is going to go to the weightage 20 part otherwise otherwise it will first attempt to make the pod in this condition all right now you can see i have given complex situation weightage is 80% and i have given the preference it means prefer this if preference is not possible go to the other one all right so if i haven't given the preference it means it has to fulfill this condition only if this condition is not fulfilled it will keep the pod in pending state okay if i don't give preference it means it has to fulfill this condition only it means if this condition is not able to be fulfilled it is keep the pod as pending state but i have given preference first try this else try this okay consider you want to come to some pretty place all right he instructed you on the roadways okay he said that you have to come straight after that you have to take a left all right if the right, uh, left turn is busy come straight if the uh, straight way is also busy if there is traffic if your left is traffic your uh, straight is traffic take a right turn then also you can come to my place okay so that is about preference you first prefer the left turn if that is available if there is traffic come straight in the similar way i have given the match label conditions also key is zone and operator is n and values are this okay so if any node has zone equals to east or west okay you can see if any node has zone either east or west your pod should get assigned to that node only if there is no node with such labels then check for another label where type equals to web okay 
first try to fulfill the condition with heavy weightage that is 80 percent that if there is a node with label as zone equals to east or west assign my pod to that node if not if that is not available try to find a node whose type is web and assign my pod to that node okay so that is based on weightage now there is a keyword called preferred during scheduling ignored during execution what does it means it means when my pods are getting created when it is doing the scheduling then try to fulfill this preference try to fulfill this preference and ignore during execution consider while the pods are getting created i change the label on my node that is a possibility that when the scheduler was scheduling the pods there was a label on a particular node but when the pods were getting created you changed your label so it is going to ignore if your pods are getting created it is going to ignore even if you change the label it is going to check the labels only when you are scheduling the pods okay so this is your first keyword you can have it in a different way also okay this is your first keyword your second keyword that you can use is apart from preferred you can use required okay these are the two options that are provided by kubernetes first is preferred during scheduling ignored during execution so it is going to decide based on the weightage if you give required during scheduling and ignore during execution so it is going to check for the proper labels if the labels are not found it is going to keep your pod in a pending state if you have given required during scheduling so there are two possibilities preferred during scheduling or required during scheduling in required it has to fulfill the condition otherwise it is going to mark as pending state for the pod if you have given preferred it is going to give the preference if any of the preference is not fulfilled it is going to assign the pod on any random node okay so that is about preferred during scheduling and ignore during execution so this is about it okay last part which i want to uh, let you know before showing the practical is here you have chosen the node affinity okay here you have chosen the node affinity it means all the labels that we are talking all the conditions that we are giving are based on your nodes if i am talking about the labels zone equals to east or west type equals to web or not okay these labels should be checked on the node level if your nodes are having those labels or not another thing that you can give here is pod affinity okay this is your node affinity next is your node affinity uh, pod affinity in pod affinity it checks if on node 1 a pod is running with such label okay you already have some pod running already beforehand so consider on node 1 you already have a pod whose label are zone equals to east or west so it is going to schedule your new pod on the same node where you have a pod with similar label okay that is a little advanced query than node affinity in node affinity labels are checked on the node in pod affinity your labels are checked on the pods if any pod has a label of east or west and that is residing on node 3 then your new pod will also get created on node 3 so this is the basic definition so team based on the definition anybody has any doubt yes girish we can change the weightage that is completely up to you you can give 60 40 you can give 50 50 you can give 30 70 that is all up to you okay or let me show you this example practically then i'll take your question okay so i am not going to fulfill any condition from the 80% weightage what i am going to do i am going to put a label of type equals to web to your node 
all right cube ctl label node let's label your node one this time all right type equals to web okay your node one is labeled let's create this uh, deployment with affinity cube ctl create hyphen f all right your deployment is created cube ctl get pods hyphen o wide okay so team you can see all the pods all the pods are created on node one based on the condition you define in affinity okay it tried to find the condition with 80 percent if i would have given here required during scheduling and ignore during execution in that case weightage doesn't mean anything it is going to check for this condition hard code if this condition is not fulfilled it is going to make your pod at pending state all right so if you would have given here required but i have given the preference first check for the higher weightage preference if not fulfilled go for the lower weightage and you can see it has chosen based on your lower weightage because higher weightage condition was not fulfilled there was no label with zone equals to each of s so it look for the type equals to web and it schedule your pod on node 1 which was labeled accordingly so team any question with affinity this time what are the different parameters that we can use apart from weight for node or port affinity arjun it is not Port affinity, it is pod affinity, POD, pod affinity. And how uh, can we get the list? So, Arjun, these are the only conditions, okay? I have given all the possibilities in this example, okay? With key value players, uh, value pairs, you can give multiple operators, multiple operators are there, all right? Where zone in east or west or you can use the operator equals to okay so these kind of operators you can give otherwise all the things are same i have already given you how many type of variety is there different parameters here you can use node affinity and pod affinity here you can use preferred or you can use required okay so i have already given you the maximum number of possibilities Then why we need person in required as it is going with the first one. Grish, no, my pod was created with the second condition. It tried to search for the first condition because the weightage was 80%. If that was not fulfilled, then it is going to change check for the lower weightage condition. Okay, Grish, I think you had some confusion. It didn't go with the first one. It went with the second one because it was not fulfilled. I labeled my node one as this. Okay, okay, got it. Yes, Girish, if you have given required during scheduling, then this weightage and preference keywords means nothing. Okay, then you don't have to give the weightage, you don't have to give the preference if you are using required during execution. Akhil, I'm not sure what you're trying to ask. No team, I have not seen mentioned in the YAML. We are not dealing with the base uh, based on the node name. We are dealing with the labels on your node. Akhil, if you don't mind, can you keep your question written and ask it at the end of the session if you want to get unmuted? Okay, I request you for that if that is possible. Team, uh, please allow Akhil to get unmuted for a while. Okay. Usually we don't do that. 
ये सकल यू कैन म्यूट योर सेल्फ एंड आंसर क्वेश्चन हेलो आर यू टू हियर मी ये सकल Yeah. Uh, okay. Actually, in the diagram you showed, like uh, we we use affinity in order to. I mean, if we if we not we don't need to deploy it in the blue color node, uh, and all others node has to be deployed. Uh, so that is the purpose of affinity, right? And in affinity, uh, we have you have mentioned. Conditions. You can okay. give simple okay. conditions so, with node selector. Okay, so the label type—I mean, the labels uh, might be mapped with the different node. I mean, the yellow and the green node. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now it got clear. I got confused. Like since it was not mentioned, like a um, just a single statement, uh, how it is identifying as a small node. Yeah, that is what I said. If you want to use complex condition, so definitely it is going to be a little complex. Okay, here we are deciding based on multiple factors. We are not simply saying that go on the node which has blue color. So I mean, if we have the two uh, conditions uh, satisfied, then how it will? If two conditions are satisfied, then it is going to do round robin. If two nodes are satisfying the same condition, it is going to assign one pod to each of them. Round robin. One pod to each. Okay, okay, okay. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, Shiju, with required. uh will it go to the second weightage if the first one is not uh, met should you if your condition is with the required then you won't give any weightage okay weightage is only given when you are doing the preference if you have used required it means you have to fulfill the condition dedicatedly you cannot go to first option or second option options are only given when you have preference okay consider the layman example if there is a uh, road road to come to my place okay i said take the right if there is traffic on right side come straight if there is traffic on right uh, straight as well come right hand side okay i have given you condition but consider if there are no multiple roads there is a straight way that's all so you have to come straight way you don't have any option similarly if you have options then you give preference either take a right turn either take a take a left turn or come straight if there is only one road if you want to fulfill only one condition that is required so you have to be on that path only okay with required you don't give any weightage with preferred you give weightage but with required you don't give any weightage uh gorov i don't have an example ready with a pod affinity with myself right now okay but if you want i can provide you an example tomorrow or maybe next week but right now i don't have that example with me also comment said assign the label to node so if we are not able to match the label in the node does it add the label no arjun you have to put the label beforehand okay it is just for your understanding i have commented it out it means if you want this condition to first of all you should have some uh, labels assigned to that node that is about it okay so this is the comment for you to practice yes kapil weightage is similar to your pod priority also yes you are correct okay any other question team if it is clear to you we are going to move to the next topic that is stains and toleration okay that is a hell of a interesting topic 
let me know if everything is clear to you now we are going to move to the teens and toleration okay seems like it is clear to all of you so we are going to move to the next topic that is teens and toleration and before explaining to you that i'm again going to take a layman example okay a layman example we are going to take a little story so that you understand it better so team uh, a real time example okay recently uh, we have been dealing with covid right and we have different different zones in our area these days there are some red color zones which has heavily infected people okay we have some yellow color zones also it means there are some infections but not that bad okay and we have green color zone where there are no infections right i'm taking an example of covid situation of the lockdown and restrictions in the society all right so you have three zones you have green zone you have red zone you have yellow zone it means the red zone is very critical it is not suggested for anyone to go in that area right if i'll talk about a normal person let me remove the color now okay consider as a normal person if i want to travel as a normal person if i want to travel all right in that case i can simply go to the green color zone there are no restriction right if i am a normal person and i want to go to a particular node or particular area it has to be green zone only because i am not allowed to go in the red zone because we, there is a se uh, severe infection there i can get ill so if i want to travel i can simply go to the green color zone with some restrictions i can go to the yellow color zone also but i cannot go to the red color zone at all okay there are certain restrictions all right now consider i am another person all right i am another person based on my profession i am different from this one okay earlier i was going as a normal person as a normal person i was not allowed to go to the red color zone but i was allowed to go to the green color zone but now consider my profession is of a doctor all right or my profession is of a police all right i am a law and order person or i am a healthcare person all right i am a doctor i am a police so are there any restriction for me to go to the red color zone as well if i am from law and order or if i am from the medical facilities are there any restrictions for me to go to the red color zone no right if i am a police if i am a doctor i can go to any color zone i can go to the red color zone i can go to the green color zone i can go to the yellow color zone there are no restrictions for me all right so what is this it means that your red color zone is tainted okay your red color zone is tainted it means your red color zone is tainted so what does it means anybody cannot come to this area anybody cannot come to this area if anybody wants to come to this tainted area it should have some particular tolerance associated with itself okay so if somebody wants to come to the tainted area it should have proper tolerance then only he should be allowed to that area okay 
Now, the same example. What I am going to do? I am going to taint my node. Technical word is taint. I am going to taint some of my nodes. And with that, a simple pod cannot get assigned to that node. If I am creating a simple pod, it is not going to get assigned to that node for whatsoever reason. Okay, it will not allow it because that doesn't have the tolerance. I have to give the tolerance to that pod or deployment or replica set. Then only it is going to assign that pod on that node. Otherwise, if the pod doesn't have any tolerance, it will not allow the pod to get created there. Okay. So this was the story time. Okay, that is over now. Now we are going to see this practically how it actually happens. Pod. kubectl delete all hyphen hyphen all okay so let's see the definition the example that I had just given you I'm going to use the same values here as well Once everything is going to get deleted, I am going to taint one of my node. Okay, everything is deleted. Now, if you want to taint a node, all right, the keyword is kubectl taint. Okay, taint is the keyword. Taint node. Consider that I am going to taint my node two. All right, kubectl taint node node two, and I am giving a label kind of this zone equals to red. All right, with that I am going to give a flag schedule. I'll explain you about the flag, but as of now understand that I am marking that as a red zone with the taint okay you can see that your node 2 is tainted now kubectl describe node key node 2 grep hyphen i taint okay you can see that the node 2 is having taint with zone equals to red all right, so what happens here? kubectl run pod one image, sorry, hyphen hyphen image. Okay, I have created pod one. Let's create multiple pods. Okay, so all these pods are the simple pod, normal pods. They don't have any privilege. They don't have any tolerance. All right, they don't have any special privileges. So all the four pods are created. kubectl get pods hyphen n hyphen o wide. So team, can you see all the pods are going to node one only? Okay, because node two is tainted. And all the pods that I have created doesn't have any special privilege. They don't have the tolerance. So that is why they all went to K node 1. All right. Now let's see this example. Under specification, I am giving tolerance. Okay. Under specification, I am giving toleration. It means if the zone is equals to red and effect is no schedule, then create the pods. It means this definition is going to have privilege that it can assign the pod on node 1 also and node 2 also. We are told that YAML. Okay, that's my definition. Kubectl 
create hyphen f tall okay your deployment is created okay it created all the pods on node 2 itself okay so it created all the pods on node 2 but you have to understand that it can create the pod on node 2 as well and it can create the pod on node 1 also okay it has the privileges so it can go on the green zone it can go on the red zone it can go on any zone if i'm a police person if i'm a doctor i can go on any zone okay but as of now it has created all the pods on node 2 otherwise it has the privilege to create the pod on node 1 as well okay now before taking your question i am going to show you one more thing okay that what is no schedule okay apart from schedule there is another keyword called no execute so what is the difference no schedule means let me explain you with the same example here okay let me explain you with the same example consider it is a red zone area all right so in the red zone area there is a no schedule it means a new person should not go on that node does it mean the people already residing there they have all they have to leave as well okay so team what i'm asking you that in the covid situation if any zone is marked as red does it mean the people who are living there they have to leave as well no right they have to stay there they cannot go out or nobody from the outside come can come inside all right so it is the same as no scheduling it means the people who are living at that area they will continue to live there no new people should go there similarly in no schedule that if any pod is already running on the tainted node it should keep on running there all right if any pod is running on a tainted node it should continue to live there it should not get reside so that is the condition of no schedule the another thing is no execute okay if you are going to taint a node with no execute okay it means that you have given the red zone as a some other epidemic okay it means you have to leave the place that place is not uh, suitable for living at all consider that this region is going to get flooded okay there is a warning there is a forecast that this area is going to get flooded all right so what happens all the people who are living in that area which is under the forecast of getting flooded you have to leave that place no new person can come inside even the people who are living in that area they have to leave as well okay because the flood is suspected so that is the condition of no execute if there is a condition of no execute it means you should leave that node immediately no new scheduling is going to happen but even the pod which are running on that node they should also leave they should also not reside okay consider i am going to taint my node uh node 2 itself with no execute now cube ctl taint node key node 2 again i am going to taint my node 2 with series situation okay this is the label i am giving situation equals to serious with no execute okay your node 2 is tainted team can you see all the pods which were running on node 2 are getting terminated 
all the pods which are running on node 2 are getting terminated and new pods are getting created on node 1 four seconds ago four seconds ago again four seconds ago so all the pods which were running on node 2 are getting migrated to your node 1 because it is an emergency situation this is a serious situation okay so all the pods on node 2 will migrate to your node 1 okay you can see all the pods from node 2 are have migrated to node 1 all right and if you want to remove the taint okay if you want to remove the taint how you are going to remove the taint all right you simply put a minus sign or hyphen sign at the end okay in the same command just give a minus sign at the end that's all okay you can see that your node 2 is untainted kubectl <coughs> run pod 5 hyphen hyphen image nginx okay still uh, pod 5 went to node 1 okay but now it allows you to create pods on node 2 as well okay so team i will tell you the use case of this okay now i will tell you the use case of taints and toleration so before i explain you the use case let me know if you understand the concept or not i said this because once i asked you to ask question you ask for the use case okay so if somebody has the question of use case don't ask it because i am going to tell you next apart from that if you have any question do ask me and i'll answer Any question, any doubt with taints and toleration team? Is it clear to all of you or not? <laughs> okay, let me tell you the use case of this also. All right, then you might ask some questions. Team, in your Kubernetes, you have already seen that some pods do run on the master node kubectl get pods hyphen n cube system and hyphen o white okay you can see that ATCD is a static pod. I can understand. API server is also a static pod. I can understand. Similarly, with your controller and your scheduler, these are your static pods. We have a YAML place at a particular location. So that is why they are running on this node. So again, tens and toleration doesn't come at that place. But in the class, when I explain the daemon set, right? somebody asked me that your VPNet or QProxy is running as a daemon set but it is running on the master node as well, right? Your cube proxy, it is also running on the master itself. So when I'm defining a daemon set, it is not scheduling any pod on the master. It is scheduling the pods only on node one and node two. Why it is not scheduling on master or why your cube proxy is running on master as well? Why your webnet is created on your master itself? Why is that? Even if you create any pods, they are only scheduled on node 1 or node 2. Okay. Team, try to understand this. Consider this is your master now. Right. In your cluster, you have your node 1 and node 2 and you have a master node. Your pods are always getting created on node 1 and node 2. Your pods are never created on your master. What could be the reason? Anyone? You can schedule your pods on only worker nodes. They cannot get scheduled on your master. Why is that? Shiju, yes. Masumi, yes, you are right. Arjun, correct. Shiju. 
यस जगन्नाथ अंकुर यस ग्रीश संजय नो यू आर नॉट करेक्ट अर्जुन आदित्य यस कुशाग्र एब्सोल्युटली करेक्ट टीम योर मास्टर नोट इज टेंटेड ओके your master notice tainted that is why no pods are getting scheduled if you want to have some pods on your master note as well you have to give the toleration okay rishab i think you got it your master note is also tainted if you remove the taint from your master note you can schedule your pod on your master as well or if you give some toleration then your pod can also get created on your master as well okay cube ctl get notes cube ctl describe note master grip hyphen i taint okay team you can see that your master node is tainted with master colon no schedule okay this is the taint that is available on your master node so if you want to schedule some pods on your master node as well you have to give the toleration with this also or you can remove the taint then any simple pod can get created on your master node all right so if you want to see this as well we can try to see definition of this cube ctl describe pod pod name hyphen n cube hyphen system grip hyphen i toleration okay you can give you can see this pod has some toleration that is why it is allowing it to schedule on your master node otherwise it would have haven't done that kushagra in your practical experience you have to give in the key value pair this feature your kubernetes is taking by default so that is why they have used it like this okay otherwise you have to give it in the key value pair some functionality kubernetes has restricted for the users all right so this is the functionality it is with kubernetes itself team any question with taints and toleration now if it is clear to all of you we are going to move to the next topic now Arjun, Arjun, that I have already shown you. Here you can see under specification of your pod, you give the toleration. All right. So this topic is also completed. so from here scheduling is already done node name labels node selectors affinity taints and toleration these topics are complete
लोक शाग्र यू कैन नॉट गिव इट इन इन द इम्पेरेटिव वे यू हैव टू गिव इट इन अ डेक्लेटिव वे ओके दिस फंक्शनैलिटी इज विद द डेक्लेटिव सिंटेक्स ओनली यू कैन नॉट गिव इट विद द कमांड लाइन All right, my pods are deleted. I am going to create some pods again. Pod one, pod two, pod five. Okay, all the pods are still going to node one. Why? Also removed. Again, I have to remove some of the parts. Cube CTL, delete. Find toleration, then pod should be created on tainted node. Always, no primal. It is not the always case. Okay, as I gave you the example, a police person can go to the red zone also, to the green zone also, to yellow zone also. Okay, so a pod with toleration can go on any node, either node one or node two. It has the power. It can go to any pod node. so it is not that it is going to go to the tainted node always uh at the guys you are asking when do we mark node as tainted is it during the patching etc no it is not uh, related to patching or some schedule uh, downtime or maintenance it is uh, just like that consider you have a node that has some higher configuration okay you have one more powerful node which has good uh, configuration of your uh, cpu or ram utilization and you want to keep it reserved for some particular application ports only okay so all the ports are running on the lower configured machine okay all the normal ports will keep on running on the lower configured machine but once you have some tainted node which has heavy configuration okay then you can assign your port there as taint and toleration you can give the toleration so if it is going to check for the toleration that it can go on any node now it is going to see that this particular node has the higher highest number of ram utilization or uh, cpu utilization it has higher buffer there so it is going to get assigned on node which is tainted so it has the power to go anywhere Primal VBnet is running as a daemon set. Okay, daemon set decides that one pod should be assigned to every node if it is not tainted. Okay, so when we created our daemon set, your node, your master node was tainted. That is why it didn't create any pod on master node, but created on node one, node two. But 
once you create the demon set with the toleration if you have created a demon set with a toleration it is going to place one bot on every node also on the master as well all right now let me show you the next topic with which i was trying to create the bots oh see all the taints are removed so there is no place of toleration you can see some of the pods are assigned on node 1 some of the pods are assigned to node 2 okay you can see that now next topic i want to cover is your training and uncordering Sumit, you are asking, can we taint any node on the fly? Say, if the pods are getting created on particular node, is it possible to taint a node? Sumit, uh, you have to pay attention. Okay, that is already covered. Okay, so team, please try to pay attention. All right, I have already answered this question. If you are talking about taints and toleration, it is also sorry. Okay, my bad. Sorry, Sumit, my bad. I covered the topic from the affinity where you do the required and preferred my way so you taint a node beforehand okay so it is also done with uh, preferred during scheduling and ignored during execution that is a basic nature of kubernetes okay that is a basic nature of kubernetes so if you have tainted a node when a pod is already getting created and if you have given no schedule Okay, you have to make sure that you have given no schedule. If you have given no schedule and you have tainted a node when a pod is getting created, then it is going to live there. Okay, it is not going to leave it. It is going to get created even if you are tainting the node at the same time. If you have given the no schedule. But if you have given the no execute and a pod is getting created, it will get terminated and it will get created on some other node. You have already seen all the already running pods were also removed when you give the no schedule. Okay, Sumit, I hope I answered you. Sorry, my bad. I thought I already answered that. All right, team. So the next topic is uh, still some questions left okay still some questions are left Shiju are you talking about this one this example I have commented out you can try this no problem so it is with the same no execute when I tainted the node from the no execute I did it from the command line right if you want to do uh, if you have created a pod with no execute as well so you can go okay you have seen when i give no execute it means all the pods will be migrated to another node also which are already running but still consider the example that i have given you okay this is the area where the flood has arrived it means all the people who are residing in that area they should leave but at least somebody has to go there, right? Some helicopters, some army people who are going to do the rescue operation, okay? So even in the flooded area, some rescue operation take place. So some people from the army, some helicopters are going to go there. But still, that place has to be vacated. So all the people who are living there have to leave. All the pods which are running with no toleration has to leave. But still, some pods can go there with the toleration and with the no execute toleration it means 
the people for the rescue operation the people from the helicopters they can still go in this region yes you you can create a pod but again you have to give the toleration with no executor as well is it clear that is the concept of taint and toleration so if you have taint you can give the toleration always whether it is no execute or whether it is no schedule what happens to the normal pod that is the difference with no schedule and no execute all right team so finally are the questions over from the taint and toleration so let me know then i am going to move forward Finally, all the questions are over from taints and toleration. Okay, I guess it does. So please hold on your questions now. Next topic that I want to cover is drain and uncorden. All right. So team, next question from a very practical way. Consider inside your cluster. Your manager has asked you that. Node one is running on the old operating system, okay, or all the old version of your operating system. You have to do the patching, or you have to update your node. All right. Consider that you have a node, and you have to do some upgradation. You have to do some plan maintenance. In that scenario, you have to bring this node down. Okay. in that case what is going to happen your pods will be terminated abruptly okay so as a kubernetes admin you don't want to do this you want to do this in a proper way right you don't want to bring your node down completely assuming that you have a scheduler you have a controller if the node is unavailable your pods will get migrated automatically to other nodes that is going to happen but as a kubernetes admin you have to take care of some maintenance activity as well because i told you your master will keep on trying to communicate with your node one if it is unreachable okay so there is going to be some memory pressure some cpu pressure on your master you because it is going to keep on trying that where is node one i have to search it for it so for the plan maintenance activity you have to drain a node okay so that all the pods will be migrated to another node and your master will be available will be knowing that you have trained your node willingly because of some maintenance activity in that case what happens you do the drain operation okay so simply you are going to drain your node for example kubectl drain k node let's train your node 1 what happened there are some panting uh, nodes to be trained unable to train this node replica set replica controller force okay let's try force command okay when you drain the node you get the message that node 1 is already gotten okay it means your node has been drained use ignore even set to ignore or right Okay, it is saying that your cube system, cube proxy, and weave net are running as a daemon set. So, if you want to ignore it, you have to use this flag as well. Okay, so you have daemon set. That is why it is asking you to ignore the daemon set as well. Now you can see it is evicting port one, port four, and port three because these were the three ports that were running on your node one. All right. So if you want to drain that node, they have to be evicted. So you can see 
your two four pods are affected cube ctl get pods should get created on your node to itself but it is taking some time i guess okay you can see that your node one is ready but scheduling is disabled it means you cannot schedule any pod because your node is drained so if you want to do some maintenance activity on this node you can do that Okay, okay, my bad. So team, if you create a deployment, all right, if you create a deployment, then it is going to migrate your pod. If you're creating a simple pod, it is not going to migrate. It is simply going to evict them. Okay, that is why you see that those pods are evicted simply. All right, they're not coming online because you created a single pod. If you have some pods running as a deployment, then they are going to get migrated to your node two. Otherwise, they won't. All right. And similarly, you have two options here. First is your drain. And second is your cordon. Okay, so it is similar to your no schedule and no execute. Okay, it is similar to your no schedule and no execute. Consider if you cordon a node. Okay, what you saw here that node one is already cordon. It means that your node was cordon already. It means no more scheduling will take place. All right, no more scheduling will take place. It means if you create a pod now. Node one will not assign, get assigned. Your node one will not get assigned because that node is cordon. So if you do kubectl cordon node one, it means no more new scheduling will take place, but the pods which are running on your node one will keep on running. All right, but if you drain a node, if you drain a node, all the living pods will also get removed. Okay, all the living pods will also get removed. So that is what we have already seen. If you want to uncordon a node, so if you drain a node or if you cordon a node, both can be removed. Both can be re uh, removed by uncordon command. If you drain a node, you do uncordon. If you cordon a node, again you do uncordon. Okay, it is going to remain the same. Cube CTL un cordon K node one Cube CTL get nodes. Okay, now you can see your node one is ready. Earlier it was ready, but scheduling was disabled. But now your node one is ready. Now, if you're going to create some pod, it will get created on your node one. But if you want to train a node, you have to make sure that all the pods which are running on that node one should be running as a uh, deployment or something. Otherwise, it will be removed. All right. Any question with train and uncordon now? Gaurav, you are asking, do we need to set up a CNI again uh, for drain node as VSNet uh, has been evicted? 
QCTL get odds. Gaurav, here is your answer. Your demon sets are already running. They are not removed. If you remember when we did the uh, cordon, uh, draining node. Okay. I asked to ignore the demon set. It means ignoring the demon set. That demon set will keep on living on that node. No more scheduling will take place. But it will keep on running. You can see all the pods were affected. But demon set were not uh, affected. Because it ignored them. Arjun, you are asking what is a mirror pod, why drain command does not work with mirror pods. Uh, Arjun, mirror pods are simply your static pods. Okay. Mirror pods are your static pods. So, if your uh, pod is running and being managed by your kubelet only, so definitely your kubelet, your API server has no control over it. So, training the node is done by the kubectl command, but a static pod is not managed by kubectl that is why it will keep on running there will be no impact of training a node all right team any other question from train and uncordon Uh, Kushagra, you asked earlier preferred no schedule means that if you know if your node has both the uh, taints, okay, if your uh, node has no schedule taint as well and it has no execute taint as well, so it is going to prefer first no schedule taint, it will take action based on the no schedule taint that is about the preference no schedule. All right, team, shall we take a break before moving to next topics? Okay, drain on cotton is also done. The topics which are left for today, we are going to see about the namespace limit, how to take ATCD backup, and how about monitoring. Okay, these are the topics left for today. I guess we are not going to cover volumes today because it is a vast concept. And it also needs to be done in a continuation. So next topic that we have for today is namespace limit. How many of you remember what is a namespace? Team, how many of you remember what is a namespace? Siddharth, Sanjay, Shiju, yes, absolutely correct. Yes, Arjun, these are the namespaces, right? Nobody else, nobody remembers what is a namespace? As we have already discussed in earlier classes that a namespace is a logical division of your groups all right consider uh, I have this is your cluster all right inside your cluster you have multiple namespaces okay 
So you have multiple namespaces. Consider this is your namespace one, namespace two, three, and four, and this namespace is assigned to me. Okay, this uh, namespace is assigned to a user called Shub. Okay, Shub came to me because I am a Kubernetes admin. So Shub came to the Kubernetes admin and said that I want a namespace so that I can have my own application isolated from all the clusters application. Okay, so as a Kubernetes admin, I said, okay, I'll create your namespace and I'll give it to you. But there is a challenge that I have to take care as a Kubernetes admin, right? That maybe because of some reason, his application code might have a larger impact that his code is buggy, his application is buggy, and it can consume complete resourcing of the node where it is going to get placed. Consider I'm going to create a pod, okay? And that pod is going to sit on node two. And because of it as a buggy application, it can consume the complete RAM of node two. It can, it can bring node two down, right? So as a Kubernetes admin, I have to ask him a question, okay? As a Kubernetes admin, I'm going to ask a question to show that how much utilization that you actually want for your namespace. Okay, so there are two ways in which the uh, user Shub can answer me, right? He can say on the object level that I want to create four pods. I want to create two replica set. I can want, I want to create one uh, deployment. I want to create five services, okay? Either Shub can answer me in this way that you can give the object count, okay? That is one way. Another way is that Shub already knows that his application is going to consume 5 GB of RAM. His application is going to consume two cores of CPU. So either Shubham can also tell me that his application needs 5 GB of RAM, two core of CPU, and accordingly I can assign the resource. So in a namespace limit, you can give the resource based on two trends. Okay, either you can give at the object level or you can give at the hardware level. Okay, on the object label, you can give the resource quota. Okay, the keyword is resource quota. You can give the resource quota based on the object count, five pods, two replica set, five services, three D1 set, like that. Okay, or you can create your service, or sorry, you can create your namespace based on the hardware resourcing. That it needs five GB of RAM, two core of CPU, like that. Okay, so these two examples we are going to see. Okay, examples are again in the Git repository. This comes under security. Okay, as a Kubernetes admin, I have to take care of the security that how much access the user is going to get on the namespace. Namespaces. Resource quota. All right. First, let's take the example of object count demo. All right, so first I'm going to create a namespace, okay? The namespace is going to be prod, okay? That is up to you. You can create the namespace as your own choice. You can create the namespace from the command line also that I have already shown you. Second is resource quota. I'm creating a resource quota. This is the kind, resource quota. And what is the resource quota? The name of the resource quota is going to be object counts. It is going to be a part of namespace called prod, all right? And specs are hardware li hard limits. Okay, how many pods? It should get create only four uh, pods. It should have only two replica set. It can create up to ten services. It can create up to two deployments and two replica set. So this is the definition of your resource quota of your namespace limiting. Let me take the raw format. kubectl create hyphen f this okay your namespace is created kubectl get ns all right your kubectl you can see now a broad namespace is sitting here
all right now i want to check the resource quota kubectl get resource quota okay if i'm going to give this much it is going to give me from the default name space so team i'll suggest you one habit okay i'll suggest you one habit whenever you give the commands for a particular name space always give it beforehand okay in the examination also it is important to remember because sometimes you miss the uh, putting the name space and because of which you get a different output and you lose your marks in the exam okay so always make it a habit to give the name space before any command right after the kubectl kubectl hyphen n and give the name space so that you don't forget about it because this is a common mistake in the examination you you are asked to give some output you give the output from the default name space and you don't give the hyphen n flag so always put it after right after your kubectl command okay so you can see kubectl hyphen n and get resource quota so what is the resource quota deployment as of now zero deployments are created replicas at 0 out of 2 pods 4 out of 0 out of 4 same with replication controller and zero services are created first i will create some pod kubectl run pod 1 and to hyphen hyphen image nginx always remember to give the name space first hyphen n prod okay your pod is created let's check the resource quota now resource quota is consume one oblique full let me create another pod two pods are consume out of four okay now i am going to create a deployment kubectl hyphen n prod create deploy dep is the name i am giving to the deployment hyphen hyphen image any image you can give okay i am using hdpd your deployment is also created now you can see three out of four pods replica set is one oblique to deployment is one oblique to all right so team if i want to scale my deployment now kubectl hyphen n prod scale scale deploy dep equals to replicas consider i want three replicas okay team you can see that i already have a deployment okay i am going to scale it my pods limits is 3 oblique 4 okay and i am creating three replicas one is already there it is supposed to create two more replicas but it is going to exceed my limit so team will it this command work what do you think is this command going to work or is it going to give me some error Okay, error warning. All right. Ajirika, guess. Mosomi, Shiju, Sanjay. Kushagra spelling mistake. Okay. Okay, Kushagra. Now you can tell me. Arjun, you can too. Himanshu, okay. All right, Arjun, got it. Okay, team, let's try this. Oh, it scaled. It scaled. Let's see what is happening here. You can see still your pods are four oblique four. All right. So how it got scaled to three? 
qctl hyphen n rod and get deployment team what can you see your deployment ready status is 2 by 3 okay your deployment ready status is 2 by 3 up to date are 2 and available are also 2 you asked for 3 replicas but it created only 2 it will wait if I remove any of the pod okay if I remove any other pod it is going to get 3 by 3 okay so it is going to be in the waiting state if the limit is reached it is going to show you 2 by 3 but once you have the available limit it is going to create the third one at that time okay so team this is the example for your object count limits okay now let's see another example where we have hardware level resourcing okay so again I'm going to create a namespace team a development resource quota compute resource quota team a <coughs> and your request this is the minimum request you are going to have you are going to have a pods with this request you can have the maximum request of one core CPU and maximum request of one GB okay it means whenever you create a pod with request and limit your request cannot exceed for one core of CPU so whenever you create a pod you can give the request less than one CPU you cannot give a request as two CPU okay similarly you have limits for CPU and limits for memory you cannot give a limit to a pod which is higher than 2 GB 2 core of CPU okay and similarly you cannot have your pod get created more than of 2 GB memory all right uh, can we combine object and resource based quota yes Kushagra definitely you can do that okay there are two types you can use so all the things that we are studying we are setting independently okay we studied about the props as well i told you liveliness prop and readiness prop i showed you differently but you can use it collectively same with the resource quota you can use them collectively and you can use it independently okay so team i have shown you the object level all right and this is your resource level i want you to practice on this one okay there is no difference everything is going to be same you already know how to put limits you already know how to put request to your pod all right we have already covered that part resource quota i have shown you from the object count so this is the part i want you to try at your own if you face any challenge do let me know i'll discuss that again in class but try it from your end once Shishu, this is your hardware level resourcing. Okay, this is your hardware level resourcing. It means that I am putting the limits on your hardware. That is your CPU cores and your memory utilization. I am putting the limits here. And what are the limits I am putting? I am putting the limits for the request also. Okay, so whenever you create a pod with a request and limit. Okay, request is the minimum part and limit is the maximum part whenever you create whenever you define a pod so I am putting limits on that also it means if I want to create a pod inside this namespace I cannot give the request for CPU core more than one core of CPU whenever I'm going to create a pod the request for CPU should be less than one core and the limit the maximum limit of the CPU of the pod CPU utilization should be less than Two core of CPU. Okay. Similarly, if I'm creating the pod and I'm putting the request for memory, I cannot give the request for memory for 1.5 GB uh, or 2 GB because the limit is set to one. So the request, the minimum RAM utilization you can assign to a pod in this namespace is less than one GB. 
and what is the maximum number of uh, RAM utilization that any pod in that namespace can consume is less than 2 GB. Okay, so Shiju, this is your hard available resourcing. All right. So team, any question with namespace limits? Is it clear to all of you? Is it clear to all of you? All right. Okay. Next question. <clears throat> so, team, I told you this part comes in your examination as well it is important for you in the real time scenario as well okay you have a master component called etcd okay there is a component called etcd and you know it stored the complete details about your cluster all right it shows all the details about your cluster in the key value pair so it is a database it is a database pod and it performs a very important role. So it is important that you take the regular backup of your ETCD so that if it is get it gets corrupted or something happens, you should be able to recover it. Okay, so ETCD run as a backup and it is important to take care of it. So how we are going to do that? We are going to see that now and do pay attention to this because it comes in your examination as well. If you're going to opt for CKA, there are 90% chances that you get the question for ETCD backup. 90% chances. Okay, so do pay attention here. First of all, you already know that your uh, ETCD runs as a static pod. Right? So team, at what location I can find the definition of this? If ETCD is running at the static pod, what would be the location to find it YAML? Question for all of you. Quara version, Kushagra, yes. Sanjay, yes, master, but at what location? Yes, Kushagra, you are right. Shiju, yes, static pod, uh, your ATCD runs as a static pod. If you remember the naming convention, first the name of the component and then the node name. That was the naming convention of any static pod. Shiju, it has suffix. Okay. Ankur, Edirika, guess, Abhinav, yes, you all gave the right answers. All right. So, team, let's go there. ETCD. Uh, sorry, ETC. Kubernetes. Manifest. Okay. <clears throat> so, you can see you have a ETCD YAML here. All right. So to take the backup of ETCD, there are certain values you have to take care. Okay. This is the complete YAML of your ETCD name. All right. It use multiple certificates also. Okay. So uh, this is a part of security that we are going to cover next week. All right. So certificates are there with which your components communicate to each other. Okay. Your API server communicates to API, uh, your ETCD your ETCD communicates with any other resource, all the communication happens with some certificates. Okay, so the important part that you have to take care on is three components. First is your cert file. Okay, this is your cert file. I'm going to put everything on the notepad. You have to take care of the cert file. You have to take care of the key file. and trusted CA. You 
should have uh, these three files with you so that you can take the backup of etcd all right and your etcd by default uh, listens to the port number 2379 okay this is the default port for the etcd and this is the ip address of your master node all right and to take the backup of etcd you should have the utility called etcd ctl okay you should have the access to etcd ctl whenever you work with kubectl it is similar utility that etcd ctl by default with kubernetes you get the version 2 of your etcd ctl but to take the backup you have to have the version 3 for that okay during the examination you don't have to worry about it uh, on the machine you will be giving your exam they will have etcd version 3 with you to take the backup all right but in our case we have to have the etcd ctl version 3 also so on this repository you have to go to components you have to go to etcd all right you have to install etcd ctl version 3 all right so you have to execute this command these are the standard commands from the official documentation there is no need to study about it all right during the exam you don't have to execute all of them it will be already executed okay you will have the etcd ctl version 3 with you but currently we don't have so we are going to execute these commands okay so your etcd ctl is already installed all right now to take the backup okay now to take the backup this is the command you have to have to take the backup let me have it in the notepad okay so team you don't have to memorize the complete command but you should know about the format first of all you have to use etcd ctl api version equals to 3 you have to memorize it all right after that like you give kube ctl command you give etcd ctl command all right then you have endpoints in the endpoints you have to give the ip address of your master machine that is your internal ip this is your master this is your internal ip of your master i am going to replace it 2379 is the default port number all right now you can see ca cert file all right this is the trusted ca file etcd uh, etc kubernetes pki etcd ca cert it has a sender path you can see all right next is your cert in cert it is the same one server dot cert all right then you have key file key file is also the same you can see and right where you want to save the backup all right i don't want to save at this location i want to save it at the temp location and give the name whatever the name you want to give all right so team for your examination point of view what you have to remember i am writing it down all right you don't have to memorize the key path all right you don't have to memorize the cert path you don't have to memorize the ca cert path you don't have to remember even the ip address okay and this is just a path also you don't have to memorize the path as well that will be provided to you during the examination consider you are in the examination and they ask you to take the backup of your etcd component okay so you have to remember this format they are going to ask you you have to take the backup of your etcd okay and they will give you in the question that this is the endpoint this is the ca cert file they will give you the cert file also they will give you the key file also okay they will give you all the details that what are the endpoints what are the, what is the ca cert what is the cert and what is the key file they will give you all the details but you have to remember this format how you are going to take the backup etcd ctl api version equals to 
then like cube CTL you have to use etcd CTL then endpoint csert cert and key and then snapshot save and they will give you the location as well that where you have to save the backup okay so this is what you have to remember and then they will give you all the values and with this I'm going to take the backup now okay you get the message that snapshot saved at etcd location this is your backup file so you have already taken the backup of your etcd ctl okay so if you want to know how to restore the backup that is not uh, never asked in the examination still if you want to study about it you can do that all right all the etcd operations are here all right how to get your bots how to get the format all right how to restore the backup it is never asked in the examination all right still if you want to know more about your etcd utility you can study it from here All right, this is how you are going to restore your ETCD backup if you want to. All right, team, any other question? Any doubt in ETCD CTL? How it is going to come in your examination? How it is going to help you? Any questions? Any doubt with ETCD CTL? Shagrid uh, 2380 port is not being used. I don't remember any component is using that port right now. Yes, Edurigas, if you're using EKS, uh, no, in EKS it is being managed by your, uh, if you're using managed service, then your master is managed by your cloud provider. So in that case, you don't need to take the backup of ATCD. Ashok, you're asking why we need to install ATCD CTL. If you want to take the backup of ATCD, you have to have the ATCD CTL utility. Without this utility, you cannot take the backup of ATCD. So if we make an error, uh, error during uh, taking a backup, is there a way to recover? Arjun, I already told you, if you want to recover the backup of ATCD, this is how you are going to recover. Uh, Restore it from the backup. No, sort of. Once you have installed your latest version, that is all. You don't have to execute these commands again and again every time. This is a one time activity. If you take the backup, if you want to take the backup at multiple times, then you have to execute this command again and again. Otherwise, installation is a one time job. Okay, Kushagra, as I said, I didn't, I don't remember if it is being used anywhere. Maybe it is getting used. this right so this is about the internal communication inside your cluster okay when your cluster is set up in the beginning at that time it uses the port number 2380 okay initial cluster setup Gaurav, can we restore the backup of PTCD from one master to another? Yes, Gaurav, definitely you can do that.
example how to verify if the backup is done properly uh just a minute Prempal, whenever you take the backup, you get a proper message that snapshot is saved here. Okay. If you don't get this message, it means the backup has some problem. Otherwise, if you get this message, you are assured that your mask, your backup is proper. No, while taking the backup, if we make mistakes, say with cert, uh, can we have to run to recovery operation? Okay, Arjun, if you have given any details by mistake, which is not right, okay, then you can take another backup and remove the previous backup. If you give any details that is incorrect, then your backup is corrupted. It won't restore it properly. Okay, so you have to make sure that you provide all the details properly. Then only that backup will be proper and it will be restored. If you give any details wrong, then your backup gets corrupted and you won't be able to restore it properly. Ashok, you want me to explain the syntax of restoration, okay. So Ashok, this is the syntax, all right. First, again, you have to give the mention uh, the version number, then etcd ctl command. Then you have to use a keyword called snapshot restore. If you want to do the restoration, you have to give the restore keyword. Then you have to give the location of your backup. All right. Another keyword is initial cluster. You have to etcd restore. This is the IP of your master component. Master node, okay. This IP is going to be a master internal IP, and then you have to use a port number 2080, okay. So as I told you in the uh, manifest file, 20 uh, 2380 is the port number that is used during the initialization. So if you are initializing your etcd again, if you are restoring, it means you are initializing it again, all right. And then initial advertised peer URL is again going to be same your internal IP and the port number 2380 and then name etcd restore if where you want to store your etcd backup all right this is about your syntax of restoring your backup So if we create a new cluster, restore this backup, the, uh, we'll have the identical to own one. Just Kushagra, that will be, but your all the components won't be there. So it is going to put uh, you through some conflicts. Okay. Because your new cluster should have all the components also that were running on the previous cluster. So it is going to give you some conflicts. Kushagra for etcd backup, this is the only option you have, okay. Ashok, your etcd is a database that stores the value in the key value pairs, okay. So it take the backup of that part. Your database has some key value pairs, it has a table structure. That table backup is taken in your etcd CTL. Team, you don't have to drill down it that much, okay? You don't have to drill it uh, down to that level. This is important for your examination point of view. Otherwise, it is always managed with your managed cluster itself, okay? At the enterprise level, you are mostly going to work with the managed cluster, whether it is your GKE or EKS, all right? So, ETCD backup is managed internally. You don't have to worry about that. Satish, if you want to take the backup of another's cluster etcd back uh, etcd then you may have to make sure that there is a connectivity between both the masters of different cluster okay 
you should be able to connect to that also there is some security features you have to use context that is the part that we haven't discussed so far you have to also manage about the context that is a part of security we are going to cover next week all right so if you want to connect to another cluster from your machine you have to make sure that your contacts are in place uh primpal is there in command to verify the etcd backup to double sure uh, that backup is not having any issue usually we do it in the database backup activities uh primpal there is a command uh, but currently uh, that is missing with me okay there is a command all right i'll provide you that command uh, tomorrow okay do remind me tomorrow i'll definitely share the command with which you can have uh, the check of the backup kushagra as i said uh, port number 2380 is used during the initial setup okay whenever your etcd or other components of your master are getting initialized okay at that time that port is being used so similarly when you are restoring your etcd it means you are initializing your etcd once again at that time your 2380 port number is used okay so team this is all about your etcd okay this is all about your etcd if there are no more questions we are going to move to the next part that is another interesting part you can say all right name space limit is completed etcd backup is completed last part for today is your <clears throat> monitoring okay we are going to see how you are going to monitor your components in your kubernetes all right so team if i talk about on a general level okay you have a linux environment if you want to see the real time consumption of your resources what are the commands that you use on a linux box if you want to see the utilization current utilization what are the normal commands that you use actually kushagra yes got it akhil correct rahul arjun kushagra okay got it all right <clears throat> so team the basic command that i am getting from all of you is the top command right if you want to check the real time utilization okay so can we use kubectl top command kubectl top notes okay it says some error matrix api not available format to get matrix it is not available okay so it is giving you some matrix is missing okay so what is it so team earlier in early days when you used to use kubernetes kubernetes used to come with a heapster okay if anybody of you knows earlier days kubernetes provided you heapster component so that you can have the real time utilization of your resource if heapster was there you could have done kubectl top commands and you get the output but heapster was removed in the further releases with kubernetes by after that kubernetes provide you an optional item called matrix server okay you can use matrix server so that you can see the real time utilization okay now it is not a part but if you want you can have that part let's try to install your matrix server okay your main repository it is a part of your monitoring okay this is your matrix server so team again this is from the official documentation if you are going to find it you can find it on the kubernetes website as well okay everything is a standard nothing is created by me only i have just organized it at the one place all right 
so you have multiple files here you have to execute all the files all together okay so what i am going to do i am going to clone this repository on my local git clone my repo okay it is clone server all right so team if you want to execute all the script and once you have to use cube ctl create hyphen f and dot okay all the yaml files at the present location will get created okay so you are going to see multiple components are going to get created okay your cluster role cluster role binding all right api server service account deployment services cluster role again okay so multiple components are created here with the help of all these components now you can use cube ctl top command let's try that okay it takes some time okay metric server takes some time because you already know whenever you create some pods it takes some time matrix not available yet you have to wait for some time all right so team it take some time to create all the components we are going to wait for that all right in the meantime if you have any questions you can ask so this is the matrix server that you have to install so that you can use a top command and see real time utilization of your resources kushagra yes you can name space the uh, uh, it depends okay if you want to namespace a matrix server there are multiple components that cannot be namespace okay you can see multiple components are here if you talk about deployment you can namespace it if you want to have services you can namespace it okay but you don't know about service account as of now you don't know about the cluster role cluster role binding these are the things that are at the cluster level these cannot be namespace okay so it depends like that Adirika, guess I suppose there is no metric server installed in EKS. If you want, you can install it, but I don't recall that it is installed by default. Yes, Mosami, if you want, you can have it on the managed cluster as well. So, team, now you can see that your metric server is installed. You can see the real-time utilization of your nodes. how much memory consumption is there how much memory is there consumed on the percentage level and on the figurative similarly with the cpu as well you can put it on the watch as well okay it shows you real time consumption similarly if you want to do with the bots you can do that with the bots as well okay real time consumption how much how many pods are consuming what resourcing okay so this is about your real time consumption with your metric server okay so that's all about it after that this is a very basic level of monitoring okay at the enterprise level you cannot depend on the top command simply you need something more than that okay for the same purpose prometheus is a tool that came into picture to provide you monitoring okay on the gui base on the dashboard base prometheus came into picture to give you a good level of monitoring okay now we are going to set up your prometheus here is monitoring 
all right uh, before matrix server you have prometheus as well all right and there is a file called prometheus.yaml okay it also contains so many items okay so this is going to get created inside a namespace first you are going to create a namespace config map you don't know as of now all right a lot many things are there you create also cluster role that you are not aware of right now cluster role binding deployment you are going to create you know about that what is a deployment you are going to create some services all these components are going to get created if you want to work with prometheus all right let's create it cube ctl create hyphen f prometheus dot jam okay so now team you can see that your service prometheus is already created under the namespace of monitoring all right so i have to do cube ctl get svc hyphen n monitoring okay you can see prometheus service is created as a node port it means that i can use this port number on the uh, web browser with any of the ip i'll take the external ip of my master I'll paste it here. I'll use the port number Welcome to Prometheus Okay, so team this is your Prometheus dashboard All right, whatever you want to carry you can query from here you can give your own query or you can use a query that is already provided by prometheus okay whatever the resource limitation or whatever you want to check you get a lot of details here all right whatever you want to see you can see it from here for example if you want to see anything related to your pods you have pod commands here okay this command will be provided here you do the execute this is your console output if you want to see the graph output you can see the graph output as well all right you can reduce the duration you can provide the timeline and your graph will be available to you for a lot of components whatever you want to have it okay cube ctl node names this is not a very good tool team to be very frank underscore node name cubelet underscore node underscore name execute okay you can see the node name as well all right you can see the tags also the uh, labels that we provided okay you can see the instance name as well all right this is your master component this is your uh, worker node one all right so all the output all the type of monitoring you can do it from the prometheus as well okay so this is a prometheus it reads all the details about your kubernetes components all right you can see all the graphs total request executed you can see the graphs as well okay so you can see the graphs just like this a lot of monitoring you can do from prometheus like this all right team any question from prometheus or monitoring as of now Simple. There is no way to take the cluster level backup. Okay, cluster is a combination of your virtual machines from the cloud provider. If you want to take that, 
it cannot be done by kubernetes you have to use some backup utility from your cloud provider yes uh, i guess it is a free tool we are not paying anything to see all this Sarat, you are asking what is the difference between Kubernetes dashboard and Prometheus. Sarat, Prometheus is used for the monitoring purpose only. Okay, it is going to monitor your resources. It is going to alert you whenever required. You can set up the alerting setup also. Okay, so that can be done by Prometheus. Kubernetes dashboard is something different. You can also manage your resources from Kubernetes dashboard. If you want to create some deployment, if you want to create some bots, you can do that from the Kubernetes dashboard, but that cannot be done by Prometheus. Does it store the matrix or it shows only the real time data? Kushagra, it stores the data, right? That is why you can see the time frame also, right? It stores the details as well. Got a monitoring part is not for your examination point of view. Okay, during exam you don't get any question related to your Prometheus. Okay, they already provide you metric server install. They can ask you about the resource utilization of any component in their real time. You can do that with kubectl top command, but they are not going to post any question related to Prometheus or something like that. Simple, uh, your Prometheus interacts with your master only. Okay, there is a component called CA advisor. Okay, when you install your uh, matrix server, there is a component also installed called CA advisor. And this component is installed on all the nodes. Okay, and with the help of your kubelet, CA advisor provide all the details to your master. Okay, and all the details are stored at the master. Your Prometheus interact with the master and get all the details from there. Sanjay, it is not a manual monitoring. You have to set it up once. All right, after that, you can set up the alerting as well. That if any certain threshold is reached, then you have to alert. All right, it is all about that you can set up your monitoring once and then it is going to monitor automatically. Edutica, guess what do you mean by custom metrics? It is a metric server that is going to do the monitoring. What do you want to customize it? You can customize the monitoring from the dashboard from Prometheus if any changes you want. It has all the things that you want to monitor. Akil, it is CA advisor that is installed on the worker nodes, which provide all the details to master via kubelet. Okay, so team Prometheus is your monitoring tool, but you can see that graphs are not very proper to see. They are not very delight to the eyes. Okay. So in that case, we use Grafana as well. OK, so what is Grafana? Grafana is a visualization tool. Grafana is not a monitoring tool. Grafana is a visualization tool. Prometheus monitors. And if you want, you can pass your Prometheus details to Grafana so that you can have a better visuals on your monitoring level. OK, so if you want to have your Grafana as well, you can have that. OK. At the same location, you have Grafana as well. kubectl create hyphen f Grafana. Okay, you can see your Grafana service is also created. This is your Grafana UI. This is the port number. Let me have the IP. T 
Assume welcome to Grafana. The default password and username is admin admin. Then you can change the password. All right. After you have that, install Grafana is done. You have to add the source. Okay, your source is going to be Prometheus. It is going to get the details from Prometheus. And you have to provide the URL of your Prometheus dashboard. I'm going to pick it up from here and paste it here. All right, that's all. You don't have to change anything. Save and data source is working fine. You get this message. After that, you have to click on the dashboard. All right. Now you can see this step is also done. You can create the dashboard. You can add a query, whatever you want to monitor. Okay, all the commands that you can take it from here itself. Take your Prometheus command, paste it here, and enter. Now you can see the output here. All right, you can reduce the time interval. What kind of visualization do you want to have? <clears throat> and it provides you a lot of settings. Okay, you want to create alerting, you can create the alerting based on your thresholds. Okay, you can reduce the timeline. Last 30 minutes. Last 15 minutes. You can save the dashboard also so that it is going to come on your dashboard front page. All right, you can set the refresh rate that after how much time your graph should get updated. Okay, so just like this, you have a lot of functionality that you can do with your Prometheus and Grafana all together. Okay, and to be frank, this is a part mostly done by the monitoring team. Okay, as a Kubernetes admin, you are going to set up Prometheus, you are going to set up your Grafana, then the monitoring threshold are set by your monitoring team in your organization. Okay. Prometheus Grafana is not going to help you anywhere in the examination. During your practical experience, you have to set up the dashboard and the setting up the monitoring and alerting system will be done by your monitoring team. But you should know that how you are going to see everything and all this. Ashok, there are plenty of monitoring tools. Okay, you have Datadog, you have uh, Logic Monitor, you have Nagios. Okay, so it is completely your call what monitoring tool that you want to use. But Prometheus and Grafana are the most widely used if you are dealing with Kubernetes only. Can we use this profan uh, this Prometheus crap data and visualize it in Grafana? Okay, I think this is an old question, Satish. We have already done that. Oh, yeah, all of the questions are old. I think I missed it earlier. Prometheus is total manual mentoring or is it work on the command line? Sanjay, you have seen that if you want to set the alerting, you can set also. Otherwise, if you want to see the manual monitoring, you can also do that with the Prometheus. And if you want to set the threshold, so that it can alert you automatically, you can do that also with Prometheus also. Saurabh, you are asking how to connect with uh, Prometheus and monitoring tool. You want me to explain again, okay? So you have to come to this repository, Educa Monitoring Prometheus, all right? First of all, you have to go to the metric server you have to install all these files. Okay, all these components should get created. Metric server should be installed first. Then you have to go to Prometheus and you have to execute Prometheus.camel. You have to execute these two steps to have your Prometheus dashboard. Or we will start with Kubernetes dashboard. Gaurav, uh, I'm going to show you the Kubernetes dashboard in the seventh class, okay? It means next Saturday, I'm going to show you Kubernetes dashboard. 
that is a part of security when we'll discuss about the context and security certificates that is scheduled for saturday coming saturday then i'll show you about kubernetes dashboard as well what is a good monitoring tool for uh, kds cluster god of prometheus and grafana as i told you are the most widely used is there a website where we can learn more about prometheus and grafana i am more interested to add various metrics and write custom rules arjun definitely they have official doc uh, documentation on their own website as well all right so you can go there and study more about it okay this is your prometheus official uh, website you can get all the documentation here and if you talk about grafana all right there is grafana as well everything you can find it on the official documentation so that data is stored in the container itself or the volumes is mounted for it kushagra all the data is inside, uh, stored with the volumes inside your pods okay that is up to you if you want to create a volume or not but whenever you create a container there is a volume inside it it is not defined properly that is a different way but whenever you have some container you are going to show some data so definitely some volumes are there you are not defining them explicitly that is your call Akhil, uh, Prometheus collect metrics based on the node exporter installer, right? Yes, Akhil, you are correct. At your guess, yes, we can do that. If any node goes down, we can set up alerting for that as well. We can do that. Okay, sort of. I have repeated plenty of time how to create your dashboards and monitoring. Okay, I'm explaining you once again. You have to go to Edureka and monitoring. Here, first you have to install your Matrix server. Go to Matrix server and create uh, have all these YAML executed. Kubectl create hyphen f dot. Once you have all these files at your location on your server. All right. Once it is done, go to Prometheus, and then you have to execute Prometheus dot YAML. if you want to have grafana as well execute grafana.yaml as well that's all can we also centralize containers and put logs in grafana a uh, centralized container as in what arjun i'm not sure what you're trying to convey centralized container Uh, yes, Mosami. As of now, your Edureka portal is showing you classes till tomorrow only. Okay, but don't worry. Once your next week starts, you will see your class nine and class ten link as well. Okay, as of now, you can see only eight classes. Next week, you are going to see your class nine and class ten link also. That we are going to cover next week. I meant to ask that uh, ask that matrix can be kept permanently by us or it get erased when the container pod series started. Kushagra, if you have used a explicitly defined volume, then it is going to store it. Otherwise, if your pod gets down or gets deleted or gets restarted, your logs will be gone. Your Prometheus and Grafana dashboard output will also be gone. Okay. So as of now, whatever that we have seen practically, it is going to remove it. if your pod restart if you want to store your data you have to use volumes we can have logs of all the pods and containers at one place in grafana arjun grafana is a visualization tool all the logs are getting stored in the prometheus only and it is just visualizing whatever is stored in prometheus grafana doesn't store anything in itself it is just a visualization tool prometheus is a monitoring tool
this Grifana can give you details about all the pods. Okay, as I told you that Prometheus has a lot of queries. You can use any query and you can see the output there. All right, team, I guess this is all we have for today. Okay, we have covered all the content that we were supposed to cover today. Tomorrow we are going to study about the volumes. All right, so team, how was the class for today? Did you understand the concepts? I tried to give you as many real time ex experience or examples I can give you. Great. So team, I do get all your feedbacks and I always appreciate whatever feedback you provide. I read each and every feedback. So keep providing that. It helps all of us. All right. So we are done with today's content. If you have any question, you can ask or you can stay. If you want to get unmuted, you can do that. Otherwise, we are done for today. You can mark your feedback and leave for today and we'll see tomorrow. Siddharth, how about node upgrade train quarantine activities manage cluster? Is it taken by the provider? No, Siddharth, if you want to train some node, if you want to update some node, you have to do it at yourself. The way I have explained you in the managed cluster also. Because in managed cluster, your master is only managed. Okay, tomorrow we are going to create a managed cluster also. Okay, tomorrow we'll see a managed cluster as well. So in managed cluster, your master is managed by your GKE or your AWS or Google Cloud, but your nodes are managed by the master. You have a command line console from where you can manage your worker nodes. So in managed service also, your master is only managed. You have to manage your worker nodes. If you want to train or coordinate your nodes, you have to do that. Do that. All right, team. So I hope uh, all the topics from yesterday were clear to all of you, right? We studied how we can do the monitoring, how we can train and uncordon our nodes. We studied about the schedulers, how many type of schedulers are there, how we can schedule our pods, right? We saw how we can limit our namespaces, <coughs> how tains and tolerations work. Right, that is all we discussed yesterday. Any doubts, any questions that you have from previous class? We can discuss it, uh, discuss it to now before we start for today, uh, today's agenda. Any doubts or question for today before we start? start for today. All right. So team, today what we have uh, with ourselves is today we are going to study about the storages how we deal with storages in your Kubernetes. All right, we are going to see how you, what is your empty directory, what is your host path, what is PV, PVC, that is your persistent volume and persistent volume claim. What are your storage classes, config map, secrets, cloud disk, service load balancer, stateful set and headless services. Okay, so team out of all these two odd topics, the cloud disk and service load balancer never comes in your examination, okay? 
cloud disk and service load balancer never comes into your examination why is that the reason is the cloud disk and service load balancer are a part of your managed kubernetes cluster okay the cluster on which we are working we can never use cloud disk and service load balancer we have to create a managed kubernetes cluster like your gke or eks only then we can use cloud disk and service load balancer apart from that on normal cluster you can cannot use it okay so as we have this is in our agenda i just wanted to show you because it never comes in your exam it doesn't help you with you with your cka but for your practical life you should know about it that is why i have included this and for the same reason we have such topics that you cannot do on these machines we are going to create a gke cluster as well okay so team on your google cloud okay you have to go to your this location and here you have something called kubernetes engine okay i'm telling you how you can create a managed cluster go to kubernetes engine and go to clusters you have to enable the billing so team all the topics we can practice on the normal cluster but cloud disk and service load balancer we need gke gke that is why i am creating the machine today all right you have to create the cluster you have to uh, use the gke standard one you can close all of this okay first thing first <clears throat> you can give any name to your cluster whatever you want okay this is your cluster name you can choose any region <clears throat> okay any region you can choose i'm just choosing it just like that okay and which kubernetes engine is currently with you okay you get a list here but as of now you can see only one is visible that is the previous stable version currently your kubernetes has 1.1 uh, 1.21 version but gke has 1.20 so you can choose this one that's all okay you cannot see uh, where are your nodes configuration for that purpose you have to go to default pool click on default pool right away all right and here you get the number of nodes okay i need only two i don't need three so i have made it as two after that go to nodes you can choose that your node should have which operating system okay from this list you have to choose the ubuntu one ubuntu with docker here you don't get the option to choose the ubuntu version okay that is managed automatically at the back end but we need ubuntu flavor what configuration your worker node should have that we have already seen when we create normal instance all right it provides 100 gb okay that is not required we need only 10 gb that would be enough for our practice okay apart from that you don't have to make any changes that's all and really you can go and create your cluster insufficient region quota to satisfy the request okay 
it is saying that region quota is exceeded so we have to change the normal region quota just a minute let's see where is your region cluster v6 let's change our region to central f Okay, it is not length for the quota. Okay, so it took the east one. So team, that was because I already have some east, uh, VM machines in the same region. That is why it was not allowing me. So you can try different zones or different regions as well. Okay, so it might take a while. Till that time, we can start with our agenda. Okay, this is the agenda that we have for today. All right, so team, let's get started. Team, consider this is your pod. Okay, this is your pod. And inside your pod, you have some containers. Okay, you have container one. <clears throat> you might have two containers as well. Okay, that is completely up to you. But the thing is, consider your application got hung. Okay, you have one pod and you have one container inside. And because of some reason, your container got hung. In that scenario, you have to restart your pod you have to restart your container all right you have to delete your pod and you have to recreate it because it is hung it is not responding you cannot troubleshoot it you have no options in that case you have to restart your pod but in that case you will get a new pod you will get a new container and your logs will be lost as well so you cannot troubleshoot it after you get the restart Alright, so that is a problem with us. We cannot figure that what is wrong with our container, what is wrong with our application. Is there something wrong with the application code? Is there something wrong with the container? You get no logs once it is restarted. Right? So that is a problem. Okay, to deal with such problems we have volumes in our environments okay any environment that have containers does have the concept of volumes whether it is your docker whether it is your kubernetes everywhere okay you get a concept of volumes in kubernetes as well we do have that okay so it is used for the same purpose like Consider that you have a container and you want to write your logs at some location. You use volumes. If you want to share some data, you use volumes so that even if your container dies out, your pod is restarted, your content has to be remained there. It is not lost. Okay. For the same reason, we have different type of volumes in Kubernetes like empty directory, post path, PV, PVC and storage classes are different topic. Cloud disk. These are the storage options. These are the volume options we do have in Kubernetes, and we are going to study about them one by one. First is your empty directory. So, what is an empty directory? Consider you have a pod, okay, and this is a multi-container pod. You have two containers inside a pod. Okay, we have already understood about the concept of sidecar container, ambassador containers, right? So what happens here? One container is going to do some operation and second container is going to have your application front end, right? So team, that is the case here. We have two containers inside a pod and 
consider one of your container is going to have something from github repository it is going to cook your war file and then it is going to pass your war file to your second container okay consider this container is of your nginx which is going to have your web page and this is some your centos container in centos container you are going to cook something you are going to clone your git repository you are going to create your war file you are going to build your artifact that all work is going to be done in your first container and then your first container should pass on that war file to your second container right but how is uh, how is this going to happen how they are going to share the data directly they cannot at that place your volumes come into picture okay consider this is being your volume all right so what will happen your centos container is going to share its content its war file or any other file to the volume and that volume will be accessible to your nginx container as well okay if i take a layman example consider you work in your organization right you work in a team so if you want to share something within the team uh, whether it is your outing parties pictures videos all right you want to share some presentation within the team what do you have in your organizations for that so team what do you have in your organization what do you have in your team if you want to share some outing pictures some party videos or some kind of presentation on anything if you want to share something within your team how do you do that yes girish and you recall guest gorov anel yes rishab satish akhil yes right we deal with a share point we have a share drive where we upload our items so that everyone can see it yes jyoti exactly okay so consider this volume as a share point okay any container can share any content with this share point and it will be visible to any other container inside that particular pod and this is called your empty directory okay it provides sharing the content with the containers of a single pod important point is inside a single pod you cannot share anything with empty directory cross uh, cross pods okay all the containers on the same pod can share the data with the help of empty directory no other container from different pod can access it okay so team let's take an example for this one it will be more clear to you all right so you have to go to the repository again here you have something called storages all right here is an example of empty directory okay we have to example you can choose any one now let's try to understand this what is here i'm simply going to create a pod okay i'm going to create a multi container pod this is the type pod and this is the name of my pod under this specification i'm going to give the definition of containers you can see i am going to create one container that is of centos all right the name of my container is my volume container 1 it is going to do some eco operation and then it is going to sleep for some time you can see there is a volume mount it means i am going to mount a volume inside a container as slash demo okay so team whenever you read the keyword volume mounts you have to be sure that it is a part of inside container volume mounts it means you are doing it inside the container so inside the container you are mounting some volume and then th that mount path is going to be slash demo so if you log into your container 
this volume will be visible to you as slash demo. And which volume you're mounting? Demo volume. Similarly, in the second container, that is of your Ubuntu flavor. Okay, it is also going to do some e-cooperation in sleep. But the volume which will be visible inside this container will be visible as the slash demo 2. But you can see we are using the same volume. Okay, demo volume here and demo volume here as well. We are using same volume but in first container it will be visible as demo 1 in second container it will be visible as demo 2 third container is again your alpine okay we are doing the same operation but it will be visible as demo 3 but it is the same volume demo volume but where this demo volume exactly lives for that we have to define the volume as well okay this is a different component now. I am defining a volume. The name of the volume is going to be demo volume. And what type of volume it is? It is empty directory. So whenever you create an empty directory volume, this is the way you are going to define it. Okay, empty directory colon close brackets. Close curly braces. That's all. Okay, so team, I am going to take the raw format of this one. And before I start, let's see if our cluster is ready or not. Okay, you can see your cluster is ready. You can click on your cluster. All right, you get all the details about your cluster. All right. We can come back. You get three dots, you can click on connect. Okay, it is asking you that you want to use it in the cloud shell. So yes, I want to use it in the cloud shell. We can copy the command it has provided. So team in GKE managed cluster, okay, in GKE managed cluster, you don't get the access to the master, okay. In GK cluster, you don't get the access to your master. You just get the output of a cloud shell. It provides you a browser where you can run all the commands that you want to run on the master, but it doesn't allow you to manage your master. Okay, you have just a master terminal. All right, as of now, I'm working as different user. I want to work as a super user. That is root and then I'm going to paste what I got earlier. Okay, that is the content I have pasted. Now I'm connected to my master. So team, this terminal is not very big. It is not good visible. So here you can click open it in a new browser. Okay, so I have maximized it. kubectl get nodes. So team, you can see you have two worker nodes ready with you. Okay, you can see role as none. It means it is your worker nodes. So you don't get the output of master node as well because master hasn't created as a node. It is being managed by Google and the backend. So if you do kubectl get nodes, you get the details only about your worker nodes, not about your master in the managed cluster. Okay, so this is done. Now we are going to create some of our components. I am going to create a pod with empty directory. kubectl create hyphen f. Okay, your pod is created kubectl get pods hyphen o wide okay currently it is creating your containers so team this is your node name okay when we created the node name was a little better k node 1 k node 2 we can name it but when google creates your nodes it gives such names lambda one so we cannot do anything with this Okay, so team, you can see that your my volume pod is created. Three containers are running inside it and all are in the running state. 
so everything looks good here all right now what we are going to do we are going to connect to our containers inside our pod all right so same way kubectl exec hyphen it all right your pod name hyphen c and your container name let's connect with our first container first my volume container 1 hyphen hyphen bash okay so team now i am inside my container if you want to see about your volumes ef hyphen h you can do okay you can see a demo mount point is there right a demo mount point is there as of now it has no content okay so what i'm going to do i'm going to create a file here okay this is my send to us so send to us file.txt okay so at the demo location i have created a send to us file let me come out of this container control pq let's connect with our second container now i am connected to my second container of the same pod here my volume was named as demo2 you can see it let me go to this location so team now you can see the send to us file that i created for the first from the first container is also accessible to your second container your second container was of ubuntu flavor right now let's create a file here as well touch ubuntu file dot txt okay now you can see there are two files send to us file and ubuntu file let's come out from this container as well now i am going to log into my third container okay it didn't log in okay so team third container is your alpine alpine is the lightest image you can have and why it is lightest because it doesn't have all the libraries itself so if you want to log into your alpine you cannot log in using bash you have to use a shell prompt okay so whenever you use alpine image always use shell not bash it doesn't allow you with the bash see i am logged in df hyphen h we have demo 3 let's go to demo 3 okay so team now you can see send to us file and one to file both are present here as you have used the empty directory okay i can come out from this so team this is the concept of your empty directory okay it is used for sharing the data across your pods in the same across your container within the same pod all right but the challenge is still a little bit there okay now you can do the sharing but once your pod goes down once your pod is restarted your volume is again gone okay it is going to overwrite it it is going to clean it up okay so if your pod gets restarted all the content is gone it is just used for the sharing purpose within the pods but it can not store the logs because once your pod is gone your volume is also gone because it is inside your pod okay so if anything happens to the pod same thing happens to the volume as well it is only providing you the sharing capabilities that's all now next part still we have the problem we cannot share the logs okay we cannot store the logs because if something happens your logs are also gone so that also we need to address to address the same concern we have the next concept called host path if we want to have our volume that doesn't live inside the pod it lives outside your pod okay it lives outside your pod so that if you store the logs and if you have to restart your pod your volume is going to remain there 
okay there is not going to be any impact volume will survive your logs will survive only your containers and your pod will get deleted and get restarted your logs are going to remain there so if you want to store your logs outside your pod you use host path host path simply means any location on your worker nodes where your containers are running okay for example that you have defined a host path of temp slash data okay so what is going to happen all the container logs will be stored at a location called temp data of your worker node where your container is getting created so if your pod goes down or if you delete your pod as well your host path is going to remain there and your logs are going to remain there no impact of deletion of pod you have the logs okay so that is what you have in host path let's see how it practically happens okay we have the last example here volume host path pod all right team so what i am doing i am just defining the pod this is the name of my pod this is the name of my container i am using the tomcat image so team if you have used a tomcat container you know that this is the logs location okay where the tomcat stores its log is a location called user local tomcat log okay so i am mounting some volume and i told you volume mounts means that your container will have the volume mount this is the location inside your container ashok don't worry i'll explain you again let me show you an example it will be more clear to you okay so earlier what i did i mounted a volume okay this is the name of the volume and this is the mount path so this mount path will be inside your container okay this path is inside your container and what is the volume that i am mounting i am mounting the volume name host path volume all right so this is the definition of your pod now i have mounted a volume name as host path volume i have to create a volume as well so now this is my volume definition okay under volume definition i have given the name of my volume that is host path so what exactly host path is in the previous example you saw that this is a empty directory in the previous example but now this is host path it means this path will be a location at your worker node and what is going to be path temp logs okay a location on your worker node as temp log has to be there where the volume will be mounted to this location okay so team inside your container you have a location user local tomcat logs and you are mounting this location as volume and the volume you have defined as a host path okay type is right it is an optional field you want to give you can give if you don't want you cannot you can skip it okay let's take the raw format of this one i'll copy it cube ctl create hyphen f okay so team you can see that your pod is getting created cube ctl get pods hyphen o wide so team you can see it is in container creating state it is not created yet and let me tell you it won't get created okay let me tell you it won't get created it is going to remain in the same state container creating okay so team it is not getting created right 
how do i say issue how can i know what is the issue some of you wanted to do the troubleshooting let me know how to troubleshoot this one why it is not getting created rishab editor guest shiju you are asking for cube ctl log cube ctl logs provide you the logs from the container your container is not getting created itself how you can check the logs kushagra yes good one kushagra you gave the right answer abhishek you also <coughs> gorav yes to some extent you are right mosami you too jagannath correct you are absolutely correct aditya correct chandrashekar absolutely correct satish yes you are too ankur absolutely correct okay so team this is the part where you do the troubleshooting okay <clears throat> you see that your container is creating but it is not getting created what is the issue for that purpose you have to describe your pod okay describe will tell you what is the issue cube ctl describe pod pod name okay here you get there it was scheduled successfully after that cubelet was working cubelet was not able to attach or mount the volume okay so team i have given in the description that from your host path the location should be temp logs so did we create temp logs on any worker node did we create the temp logs in any of the worker node no right we didn't create that so we have to create that as well okay first we are going to see on which worker node it is getting created it is r9gb okay just remember this let's go to your vms okay r9 gb this is the machine i am going to connect to this machine now stream i have go to uh, go to temp location okay under temp location you cannot see anything related to your logs okay so what i have to do i have to create a logs location mkdir hyphen logs sorry no hyphen okay you have created the logs location let's go inside the logs location as of now you don't have anything here right the location is completely empty you ctl get pods so it will keep checking for the volume now it will find that volume is there now it is going to create your container soon so team it is from gke gke is a little slow if you compare with the cluster that you create manually and if you compare it with the gke cluster gke cluster is a little slower with the nitro so that's not from our issue it should 
catch it automatically. Okay, Chandrasekhar, let's watch it. CTL get bots. No, Siddharth, we don't have to create it on the both nodes. Okay, only on the node where your bot is scheduled. Yes, team now you can see this container is running okay it was looking for the volume and once the volume was available on that particular node you get the running status it means your pod is created okay also if you go to your worker node team can you see the content here on your worker node okay you can see these are the logs of your tomcat container Earlier you had nothing here, okay. Earlier you had nothing here, but once you mounted the volume inside your container at the logs location, all the logs of your container are placed on your host path as well, okay. And your container is also running. CubeCTL get bots, okay. Your both the containers, both the pods are running and your host path volume is also running. So team, if I delete my pods, will I still be able to see these logs? I have deleted my pod. Will I still have these logs with me? Anyone? Yes, Chandrasekhar, yes, you're right. Dear guest, Aditya, uh, Ashok, Ankur, Satish, Rishabh, Masumi. Okay, all of you gave the right answers. Okay, so what I'm doing, I'm deleting my pod. Okay, it will be done in a while. So, team, it is the problem with GK, it is a little slow. We have to wait a lot for many things <clears throat> okay your pods are deleted now if i'll do ls here you can see your logs are still there okay your pod is gone your container is gone but the logs are with you okay so team this is the option that you have with volumes of host path okay you can create your host path so that you don't lose the logs of your application. Okay. Team, any question with empty directory and host path, do let me know. We'll discuss that. Any doubt, anything which is not clear to you from empty directory and host path? If it is clear to you, then we'll move to PV and PVC. Empty directory and host path clear to all of you. <clears throat> uh, Shiju, have you created the folder within the specific node? <clears throat> yes, Shiju, I created I created a uh, location on the specific node one in host path if the uh, Jagannath good question okay Jagannath I'll come back to your question a little bit later okay Ashok I, I will repeat it okay so Ashok you understand the empty directory right in empty directory the purpose is to share the content with the containers inside a pod okay but you understand that once the pod is gone your empty data is also gone 
okay so you cannot store your logs in that empty directory because it is purposeless your container is gone your volume your empty directory is also gone so the first issue i discussed today that you want to retain the logs even if you delete your container even if you delete your pod your logs should be retained okay that was our agenda that is what we wanted to have so the same thing we can achieve with the host path in host path what you do you mount a volume inside your container that corresponds to a location on your server where your container is running okay host path correspond to a location on your physical server that will be mounted inside your container okay consider that i am working uh, my container is getting created on node 1 okay at node 1 there is a location on node 1 there is a location inside my inside my server node 1 as u01 data data files okay and i have placed some data files at this location and i want these data files to be inside my container as well so i am going to mount this location as a volume as a host path inside my container so that i can see these data files inside my container as well also if anything happens inside the container if container wants to modify some data files or write some new data file it will be available on my local worker node as well okay so this is the address of my host where my container is getting created okay on this node i am going to create a container and then i am going to mount this location inside my container as well so that i can see it ashok is it clear to you now ashok temp uh, log we created on the worker node if you can see this okay this is my worker node you can see the address okay the address is r9gb okay if i go to my cloud shell kubectl get nodes i went to my node directly and there i created the temp log location i want to uh, yes joydeep good question okay i am coming to this question now okay so the question is pending uh, from joydeep i have to answer the joydeep answers and jagannath answer any other question from all of you okay so team uh, two very good question arrived okay so the question is almost similar from both of them the thing is consider you created a pod okay and you don't know on which node your pod is going to get scheduled right as of now in my cluster we have only two nodes right but there are chances that you might dealing you might be dealing with 15 to 20 worker nodes right there are chances so what you can do first you are going to create your pod okay it is going to stay in the container creating state for a while you will see with describe command on which node it is scheduled and you will go on that node and create your host path right that is a lengthy process you don't want to do it you don't want to take that much pain you are creating pod your volume should also get created automatically okay it is a pain that i have to check on which node it is scheduled and then i have to go to that particular node and then i have to create the path or what else i can do i can create the host path on all 20 nodes i have to log in on all 20 nodes and create the location so i won't face this waiting time my container will be created on the go so i have to create the path on all 20 nodes that is also an overhead i don't want to do that as well okay i have to log in on 20 nodes that is also a big task okay so still you can see there are some challenges with this 
this is the first challenge second challenge consider because of some reason your container got hung and again your pod got restarted okay your pod was restarted and you know once your pod is restarted it can go on any node okay there is no surety that your previous pod was created on node 9th okay if your pod was created on pod uh, con sorry your pod was created on node 9th if it is getting restarted there is no surety that it will go on the same node again your pod can also get scheduled on the 14th node or 18th node okay so again your location is going to vary again you have to create a host path on that particular node so team there are still so many challenges with host path okay it is not one of the most feasible options you have in kubernetes to deal with the volumes okay it is only feasible if you are using one master one node machine okay only then it is going to be useful because you are going to have only one worker node your pod is always going to get scheduled on node 1 okay there is no option of getting schedule it on any other node so your host path is only usable when you have one master one node cluster and we never use that so host path doesn't fulfill all your needs again and to deal with this challenge we have pb and pvc as our next topic okay persistent volume and persistent volume claim that is our next topic for today it addresses all the issues that we have discussed so far okay so team uh, to make you understand about pv and pvc let's have a small story time okay we are going to know about our story and then we'll see how your pv and pvc work a layman example a layman story okay team consider this is me okay your trainer so i'm a trainer i visit many locations all right for uh, to visit many location i do the hotel room booking as well okay so what is the story that i might have to stay in hotels okay in hotels we have multiple rooms okay in hotels we have multiple rooms all right so team if i travel to some location and i want to have some room booking what do i need to do can i directly go to the hotel and enter in my room of my own cho uh, choice no it doesn't work like that you have to make some reservation right and you have a variety type of rooms inside a hotel okay consider this is your uh, one bedroom okay one bedroom in the second one you have two bedrooms okay it is a double bedroom some rooms are ac some rooms are non ac okay so there is a variety of rooms in any hotel okay so i have to choose accordingly all right and i have to make some kind of reservation okay without reservation i cannot go to any hotel and enter in any room okay so for that purpose what i need to do i need to do the reservation or simply i have to go to any application your make my trip or any or airbus any kind of app i have to log in right and in that app i have to set filters i have to set filters that what kind of room i do want okay depending on my configuration that i need a single bedroom and it should have ac as well okay it should be a ac room i have to set my filters that what exactly i need so according to that filter i can book a room okay consider i am booking uh, booking a room based on my configurations now what is the situation there is a hotel there are some rooms and i have booked a room with a reservation okay now i do have the reservation can i simply go to the hotel and have that room with me i do have the reservation i have went to the hotel 
and can I simply enter in my room without dealing with anyone? No. There is going to be a first point of contact. There is going to be a receptionist, right? There is going to be a receptionist. Uh, there is going to be a manager or someone. Okay, so I have to show him my reservation. Okay, so I made the reservation. I am going to show that reservation to the receptionist or the manager, whosoever is there. I am going to show my uh, reservation to the receptionist, and after that. As per your reservation, that manager or receptionist is going to guide you to your room. Okay, sir, this is your room. This is your room number. Go to this one, or this is your room number. Go to this one. Okay, so he or she is going to guide you that exactly where your room is, exactly what is your room number. Okay, so team, this is the complete process. How you deal with any reservation? Simple enough, easy to understand. Okay, this is the hotel example that I wanted to give you. previously so team whenever you make the reservation whenever you make the reservation are the rooms already created or they get created in the real time when i do the reservation are the rooms pre built or they are built when i do the reservation pre built right absolutely okay so the rooms are already there rooms are already there i have to choose that which room i want to do so i am going to make the reservation accordingly okay and sometime it also happens that i ask for a single bedroom okay i ask for a single bedroom but because of some reason in that hotel your single bedrooms are not available they are full okay at the time of reservation it was there but when you enter the hotel it was already occupied it was not available so sometimes you get the upgrade also a free upgrade right so what the manager or uh, reception is going to do they say sir I, we don't have one bedroom so we have upgraded your room to a two bedroom they have given you a promotion okay so based on your requirement you get your upgrades as well Okay, so team, this is the basic example of the hotel I wanted to give you before we start with PV and PVC. All right, now I am going to correspond everything with this. So you already understand that rooms are already created. Now I am going to talk in the term of Kubernetes. Okay, so in this scenario, this is not me. This is a pod. Okay, a pod wants to have some volumes. Okay, in this situation, you will have these volumes to be created automatically. You will have a variety of volumes already created: five GB volume, ten GB volume, twenty GB volume. As per your requirements or as per your expectation, you will get your volumes created beforehand. Okay, even before the pod comes with a request, you will get your volumes created, and these are called. persistent volumes okay or simply say pbs okay your persistent volumes are already created with different different type of variety say 1 gb your second volume is 2 gb third is 5 gb last one is 10 gb okay you already have a variety of different volumes created beforehand and these are called persistent volumes okay and now you have some reservation okay now pod comes with the request that i need a volume of at least 7 gb okay take an example of 7 gb or uh, take an example of 4 gb okay let's take an example of 4 gb So a pod arrived and it asked that I need at least four GB of data. I need four GB of storage which I can use for my storage. Okay, so this is called the reservation, the request that you are making. 
it is called persistent volume claim okay this reservation that you are making is called persistent volume claim or you can simply call them pvc all right so you came with a request that i need 4 gb of storage your volumes were already created beforehand now you come to the receptionist and that receptionist is called here storage class okay the part of the manager is being handled by the storage class the storage class is going to check all the pvs in your cluster okay it will check all the pvs inside inside your cluster and it will check which pv should get assigned to this pvc okay the pvc is asking for 4 gb okay so you, you can see that it cannot assign the 1 gb pv right it is not going to be fulfilled it cannot assign the 2 gb right it asks for 4 gb but it this volume has only 2 gb so it cannot assign this one if there is some volume if there is any persistent volume with 4 gb available it will assign that but as of now you can see it is not available so it is going to assign a 5 gb volume okay it is going to assign a pv of 5 gb because the ask was minimum 4 gb this is the minimum part all right so that is one part now next part okay so this is one thing now consider the hotel example again okay so sometimes you went to a hotel regularly all right so you know that room number 105 is perfect for you okay sometime what happens you visit a hotel regularly and you know that room number 105 is perfect for you it has a single room it is a single bedroom it is ac it has a good view from the balcony okay you know everything so what you understand that you like the room 105 so what you do you simply go to the hotel and you'll ask for room 0 room number 105 okay so these persistent volume also have some names okay you can say this is your volume 1 this is your volume 2 here also we are going to give names right this is your volume 3 okay you can give the specification in your reservation or you can simply ask for the room number in your specification okay you can simply go to the hotel and you ask that i need room 105 or simply go to the hotel and you ask that i need volume 103 so it is simply going to assign your volume number vol3 okay so team is it clear to you persistent volume persistent volume claim and storage class theoretically is it clear to you we'll see this practically as well so team i tried to explain you with the easiest way possible okay the hotel example i gave in all my classes because i find it very connecting with this example karo we'll see that <coughs> okay persistent volumes are cre uh, created in the real time yes it is i'll show you this practically so if the pod wants 7 gb will it give two volumes and you take a guess no it cannot give two volumes okay one pvc one pv there is one to one mapping okay so if the ask is for 7 gb it cannot go to the 5 gb as well it will go to the 10 gb directly okay it cannot club pvs there is always one to one mapping one pv one pvc okay so team let's see this practically then you will understand in a better way okay so as you already understand that persistent volumes are already created first it means your hotel rooms are already created before you go to the hotel or you make any reservation your hotel rooms are already created so the first thing that you need to create is a persistent volume so first you create a persistent volume 
then you make the reservation and then you go to the hotel all right so first thing you are going to create is persistent volume then you are going to create a persistent volume claim and then you are going to create your pod this is going to be your flow okay jagannath i'll show you okay let's see this practically team your questions are more practical related related okay all the question you are asking all practically related so let's create a pv pvc and pot so that you will understand it better storage is so as i told you first you need to create your room okay you need to build your hotel okay so first i am going to create a pv so this is the definition of your pv okay kind is persistent volume the name of my pv is going to be my pv storage class i am going to use standard okay so the hotel manager or the receptionist i want the standard one i don't want any other type so storage class is a, a same one this i'll come back later okay capacity storage i am giving 1 gb okay 1000 mbs so i need 1 gb of persistent volume so what i'm going to create right now i am creating this volume okay access mode is read write once uh, you can have multiple i'll tell you that also okay host path i am mentioning okay host path i am mentioning temp pv data okay so now team another example from the same hotel one okay so what i happen i booked room first one okay i need 1 gb so i have booked this volume i went to the hotel i need one bedroom single bedroom okay so now the thing is once i leave the hotel okay once i leave the hotel what will happen to the volume or what will happen to the room okay i stayed there for one day in the hotel room and then i left so what will happen they will recycle the room okay they will um, uh, refresh the room they will uh, remove whatever the trash i have put or something okay they are going to clean the room and they are going to assign the room to someone else right that is the first scenario that what can they do they can clean the room they can recycle the room and assign it to someone else that is first scenario now consider second scenario what happened that i asked the hotel that today i am going but tomorrow i am going to come back so keep the room under my name only don't assign this room to anybody else okay so it means i am retaining the room i have asked the hotel people that tomorrow i am going to come back today i am leaving but tomorrow i am going to come back so do not assign this room to anybody else i am going to retain this room okay that is a two scenario first is recycle assign it to someone else after cleaning or second one is retaining tomorrow i am going to come back retain this room for my name only okay don't assign to anybody else so these are the two scenario now the third scenario consider once i book this room once i enter this room i got infected with covid okay for example now the thing is they cannot assign this room directly to someone else okay they have to sanitize it they have to make it completely uh, different okay they might have to remove the bed they have to replace the bed or bed sheets or whatsoever okay they have to sanitize the room okay if it is a pre built room consider if you are dealing with tents they are going to burn out the tent okay they will remove the tent also ever all together okay so these are the three scenarios same scenarios you have here as well okay either you can recycle the volume it means if your pod is getting created it will assign this persistent volume to that pod and once your pod is deleted it is going to recycle it will delete the data of that volume and it will make that volume available for any other container or pod to use okay that is recycle you can do the retain also it means even if your pod is deleted it is going to be there your volume data is going to sustain okay it is going to be there third is deleted it means once your pod is deleted your persistent volume should also get deleted okay you have these three options next is your access mode you have three access mode read write once read only many and read write by many okay it is on the node level consider that your volume was created on node 1 okay 
your worker node one get four. So what will happen? Only the containers or pod that are residing on that node one will have the access to that volume. They can read and do the write operation as well. Or read only many. It means only the node where your pod is getting created. That node will have the access of read write. But if any other pod which is running on another node will have only the read access. They cannot modify the data of that volume on a different or read write many. It doesn't matter where your volume is getting created. All the pods across your cluster will have the read write access. They can read the data and they can modify the data. Okay, so these three definition you can provide in the access mode. All right. So team, first I am going to create this persistent volume. Okay, connection is lost. Let's reconnect. to set uh, the cloud config again okay so let's reconnect it from here first so team it has given the timeout so i have to go and connect again from the kubernetes engine i need to have this let me save it on the wordpad so that I can have it again and again wherever required. So yeah, now I'm connected. I'm going to create the PV. kubectl. Get nodes. kubectl. Create hyphen F. Persistent volume. Persistent volume is created. kubectl get pv. pv is a short form for persistent volumes. Okay, team. Now you can see a persistent volume is created of thousand MB's capacity. Read write only, and the reclaim policy is recycle. Okay, so even if the pod is deleted, it is going to delete the content and make this pod available uh, volume available for another pod to use. Okay, the status is available. Okay, so in the hotel, the room is still available. It is not booked. It is not assigned to anyone. So you can see the status is available. Uh, storage class is standard. All right. Now next is I am going to make the reservation. Now I have to make the reservation. I have to create a persistent volume claim. Okay. So there is an example of PVC as well. Okay. This is a smaller one. I am creating a persistent volume claim PVC. The name of my PVC is going to be my PVC. Storage class I am using standard one. Access mode I need read write once. Okay. Resource request storage 500 MI. Okay. So team, what is happening? That I need only 500 MB. I don't need thousand, but I need 500 MB. So it is going to search out for only the volume of 500 MB. If it doesn't found. It is going to upgrade my plan. Okay, it is going to upgrade my plan. So let's create your PVC. kubectl create hyphen F. Now I have created the PVC. Now I have made the reservation. 
team is my voice clear to all of you are you facing any challenge with my voice uh kushagra people are responding that my voice is clear maybe some issue from your end okay thank you okay so team now you can see your pvc is also created let's get your pvc cube ctl get pvc okay team you can see that my pvc is created and the status is bound okay status is bound and it is bound to which volume my pv whose capacity is 1000 mi okay but what you ask for you ask for only 500 mi but 500 mi was not available okay you went to the hotel and you asked for a single bedroom but they didn't have that and available so they have created your plan they provided you a double bedroom similarly you can see it assigned you 1000 mi capacity okay storage class is standard okay if i do cube ctl get pv now okay now you can see the change okay now you can see the change earlier this room was available it was not booked but now the room has been booked by a reservation okay who has claimed that room the room has been claimed by my pvc all right so now your pv and pvc are bound together okay the reservation has been made your room is booked now any one who will come with that reservation okay so the reservation has been made now if with that reservation i go to the hotel or somebody else go to that hotel he can enter the room right i have made the reservation if i go myself to the hotel with that reservation i will occupy that room or if i go if i give that reservation to my brother okay if i give that reservation to my brother or system to any other of my family member or my friend he can go to that hotel and he can occupy that room right same thing is going to happen i am going to create a pod and i am going to give that pod my pvc okay your pod will be using that pvc to use a persistent volume pvc host pod pod okay let's understand this i am going to create a pod the name of the pod is pvc pod it is using a uh, tomcat image and this is the name of my container okay now i am doing volume mount which volume i'm mounting i'm mounting pv volume okay and this volume will be visible inside my container at this location user local tomcat logs i'm mounting the volume which volume i'm mounting i'm volume pv and it will be visible inside my container at user local tomcat logs now next thing is volumes i have given the volume on name i have to define it also now i am defining the volume the name of the volume is pv and earlier you used to see what here you used to see your empty directory your host path okay now you are using persistent volume claim i am handing over this reservation to the spot okay what is the persistent Persistent volume claim name is my PVC. Okay, the name is my PVC. So now I am going to create this pod. Before creating this pod, what was the location of your PV? Let's see that first. Okay, the location was temp PV data. Let's verify if that is available on any of the worker node or not. Okay, I'm already connected with one of my worker node. There is no directory as PV data, right? Under temp, let's connect to my second worker node now. Okay, I'm already connected with the nine uh, R nine GB. Let me connect to M thirty eight C. All right. 
here I am connected to my second worker node. If I go to the temp location, okay, on both the worker nodes, you can see that under temp location, there is no folder called PV data. Okay, now I am going to create my pod. I'll take the raw format. I'll copy it. CubeCTL create hyphen F your pod. So team your pod is now getting created. When we created your pod with host path, when we created your pod with host path, what happened? Your container was not getting created because the location was not found. QCTL get pods. Okay, as of now it is also creating state. Right? Same one. Same thing happened with a host path. Same thing is happening with your this one also. But you see it was resolved automatically. Okay. You can see this time it was resolved automatically. How? QCTL get pods hyphen O wide. With host path it was stuck. With persistent volume it didn't. It went to M38C. Okay, at that node also the path was not available, right? You can see M38C temp PV data was not created. Now you can see it is created. Okay, with host path you have to create it manually, but with PV and PVC you don't have to. Okay, it is created automatically. Why? Because in host path you provide a path. Okay, that path is manual. But here all the things that you are defining are your Kubernetes its own object. Okay, you have created a PV that is a Kubernetes object. You have created a PVC that is also a Kubernetes object. You deal with storage class that is also a Kubernetes object. You created a pod again Kubernetes object. All the objects that you have defined all the objects that you have defined are of your Kubernetes own. Okay, pod, PVC, storage class, persistent volume. Everything is your Kubernetes own object, so you don't have to deal with anything manually. Everything will be done automatically. Okay, so wherever the pod is scheduled, whether in node 1, node 2, node 3, node 5, node 10, node 20, doesn't matter your Kubernetes is going to create that host path on that location automatically. You don't have to worry about it. Okay, so even if you go on that worker node. Okay, if I go to my PV data. You can see logs are already updated off your Tomcat container. Okay, so team, this is the concept of PV and PVC. Any question, any doubts? It was a complex topic, I know. I tried my best to explain you with the best examples. Whatever PV of 500 is available, but with different access mode. Okay, Gaurav, you are asking if there is a PV of 500 MI is available with different access mode. It will not assign that 500 MI. Okay, it has to match all the conditions. All the conditions should be fulfilled. Storage with the minimum level with access mode. It should match Should the access mode be read write many if I have to deploy with many ports across the nodes Okay, Jagannath another good question. So team the question is uh, from Jagannath should the access mode be read write many if I have to deploy uh, Deployment with many ports across nodes. Okay, so team as of now I have created only one port but in the real time scenario, you don't do that. You create a deployment and in deployment, what happens? Your pods are distributed across the node. So what will happen? A PV is going to get created on all the nodes where your deployment is placing the pods. No, that is not possible because you already understood that it is one to one mapping. One PV equals to one PVC. So if you are dealing with a deployment where the pods can spread across the nodes, okay? So in that scenario, your PV in PVC is also going to create a problem. 
okay so for that what you can do you can have the reader in many access that is one way another way is you can use some shared drive again okay if you have 20 nodes you can have a shared mount point or you can have a nfs okay you can have, have a nfs it will be get getting in sync with all the 20 nodes all right so doesn't matter wherever your pod is getting created a shared location will be there across all 20 nodes so it doesn't have to create the path again and again that shared volume will be available for all the volumes okay so if you want to do this with a nfs uh, nfs okay i hope all of you know what is an nfs it is a shared volume okay it will be attached to all the instances and it will stay in sync with all the machines okay so team i have kept an example with nfs as well if you want to practice at your own it doesn't needs it doesn't comes in your examination okay in ck exam they never ask about the nfs okay because nfs is not a feature of kubernetes it is a feature of your cloud provider so if you want to practice at your own here is an example i have kept for you you can work with local also you can work with gke as well okay how to create your nfs pb how you to create nfs pvc okay all the examples are here if you want to practice at your own you can practice okay it takes somewhere around 30 to 40 minutes okay that is why i am not including this in a session okay it will take a big toll on the time but if you want to practice you can practice all the concepts are same with your pb and pvc just you are going to have a shared mount point across all the nodes Kushagra, you are asking how read write many works. So Kushagra, I have just given an example. Consider you are creating a deployment. Okay, you are creating a deployment with two replicas. One replica is getting created on node one. Second replica is getting created on node two. But both are going to use the same volume, right? And the volume will be created only on node one or either on node two. It won't get created on both the nodes. It will be created only on node one or node two. So what will happen, consider that your persistent volume is created on node 1. But you have one part also living on node 2. It also have to access some data on node 1 volume. Okay. So there you are going to use read, write, many. So even the pod which is residing on node 2 will have the access on the volume which is created on node 1. Mosomi, you are asking how to restrict the PVC to be used for a specific pod. Mosomi, it is already restricted, right? You have one reservation, right? PVC is a reservation and pod is a person who is taking that reservation to a hotel. So if I have made a reservation in a hotel, it means I am going to have that reservation with me. It doesn't happen like that. I take the same reservation to the hotel. My brother also took the same reservation to the hotel. My friend also took the same reservation to the hotel. They cannot assign the single room to three people, right? So the reservation has to be one only. It is one to one mapping. So only one pod can have one PVC and one PVC can have only one PV. It is already restricted. But consider I have double, um, booked a double bedroom. Okay. So consider I have booked a double bedroom. So I am going to go to that room as a double occupancy. So I will go with my friend. I will go with my wife. I will go with my brother. That is up to me. So that is a deployment now. Okay, your deployment has two replicas. I am going to that hotel with the same reservation with a double occupancy. So you cannot, uh, if you are using with a deployment, you cannot have with the, for the specific pod. But if you are dealing with a single pod, you can specifically limit it to a single pvc and a single pvc to a single pv uh, standard storage class uses uh, from master storage sarat i don't understand about the master storage what do you mean by master storage Shagra, you are asking, can we use a different machine apart from the cluster node to create a PV by using a machine IP? Kushagra, that you can do using NFS. Okay, using NFS you can do, or if you want to do it with a cloud disk, you can do with the cloud disk as well. I'll show you over the cloud disk. Uh, 
कुशाग्र इज इट पॉसिबल टू मेक अ पीवी नेम स्पेस ओके सो कुशाग्र देन पीवी इज ऑलवेज अ क्लस्टर लेवल रिसोर्स ओके पीवी इज अ क्लस्टर लेवल रिसोर्स बट योर पीवीसी कैन बी नेम स्पेस बिकॉज योर पीवीसी इज गेटिंग मैप्ड विद अ पॉड और डिप्लॉयमेंट एंड यू नो दैट पॉड एंड डिप्लॉयमेंट कैन बी नेम स्पेस सो इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंट टू नोटिस दैट PV is a cluster level resource PVC is a namespace level resource Sarat no it doesn't take the storage from the cube master it will take the storage wherever your pod is assigned if your pod is assigned on node 1 it will take the storage of node 1 if your pod is uh, located on node 2 it will take the PV uh, storage from the node 2 it doesn't take anything from the master Masumi, you are asking. Please explain. Read, write once and read or uh, many again. Okay. Masumi, read this. Okay. If you have defined read, write once, the volume can be mounted as read, write by a single node. Okay. Wherever the volume is getting created, if your volume is created on node one, okay, and you have given read, write once, so only. node 1 will have the access to read and write consider if a pod is created on node 2 your node 2 pod will have no access on the volume which is created on node 1 it cannot read it it cannot write on it okay so that is read it once it will be accessible to only node 1 the volume can be mounted with read only by many nodes okay so what happens if your volume is created on node 1 all right so node 1 components can read and node 1 components can write as well but if you have read write many the node 2 node 3 node 4 component can read the data they cannot write the data but they can read and read it many all the nodes can write the data which is residing on node 1 okay kushagra i'll let you know about the uh, storage classes okay that we have in discuss in depth we'll study about the storage class also in the further session so team any question from pv pvc storage class uh, not storage class i'll discuss storage class later any doubts with pv pvc host path md directory Ashok, you have to pay attention. Okay, you can see that PV was created on node, another node, right? This is my worker node. I'm 38C. This is my worker node. Your persistent volume is created on this node. Okay. So Ashok, whenever you define PV and PVC, the volume is not created right away. Okay. A PV object, Kubernetes object PV is created. but it doesn't take storage of any node once you create the pod okay once you create the pod then your pv is created figuratively okay actually your location will be created once your pod is created otherwise your pv object your kubernetes object will be created it will not consume any data any storage it will consume the storage only when you create the room okay so if you have uh, in a hotel you have a room okay in a hotel you have a room if nobody has occupied the room the electricity will be cut off okay they will cut off the fuse the lights and everything fans will be turned off of a room which is available and not booked all right similarly a kubernetes object pv will be created but it will not consume any storage of any node now consider i have made the reservation i entered the hotel okay i entered in my room only then they are going to provide electricity to that room only then the power will be enabled for that room only then the lights or fans of that room will be on once i enter the room similarly whenever your pod is getting created whenever your pod is created only then your pv will consume the storage from the node where your pod is assigned 
okay so everything will be done on the worker node itself the scheduler give any preference to the node while creating the pod in regards to pv and pvc sadhat it depend uh, no that is not the case okay scheduler is going to put your pod on any worker node based on the scheduler that we have uh, studied in the previous class a persistent volume or persistent volume claim will be assigned to that node itself okay so pv pvc does not have impact on any scheduler choice scheduler will choose the worker node for the pod and then a persistent volume will be created it will consume the volume data or uh, storage of that particular node afterwards Premal, you are asking, can we update the PV side if we need the latest stage? Yes, definitely. You know the uh, how to edit the components in Kubernetes. Simply use kubectl edit PV and PV name, and then you can resize it as well. That is possible. Okay, it is again got disconnected. All right. So, team, the next concept is uh, we are going to cover is for config map. Okay. So, what is config map, and what is the need of the config map? Okay. So, team, as you are working in IT organization or getting started, okay. So, one thing you might be knowing that in any organization, you have multiple environments for any particular application, right? Like, first is your development environment, second is your testing environment, right? then you have a pre prod okay and finally you get a production environment right this is how you have your environments in any organization for your single application okay now i want to create some pods or i want to create some containers all right but what i want to do consider i am uh, having a nginx container okay i am having a nginx container so i am going to create a container for every environment okay what difference i want in any nginx you get welcome to nginx right you get a welcome to nginx page but i want to defer it as per the environments like if i deploy it on the development i want it to welcome to development environment when i deploy the same container on test it should get welcome to testing environment when i do it on the pre prod it should welcome me on the pre prod environment and when i do it on the production it should welcome me as a welcome to production environment okay that is my requirement okay i want the container to behave differently on different environments okay so team now one question to all of you should i create a single image or should i create multiple images for this should i create one image or multiple images for this now okay great all of you are giving right answers great team so whoever has answered all of you have answered correctly okay we are going to use a single image only all right because that is the purpose why we started using container because we wanted to have a singular environment okay we wanted to eliminate the challenge that we used to have that work, code is working on production code is not working on production but working on a testing environment okay that is why we uh, come to container environment so definitely we need a single image only but still we want that image to work differently okay it should behave differently so for that purpose what we have we have config map we are going to pass some kind of configuration to the container so that it can behave differently as per the environments okay we are going to pass on some configuration to this container which so that it can behave differently in dev environment we are going to pass on some configuration to this container so that it behaves differently in the testing environment okay so we can pass it using volumes or we can pass it using your <clears throat> environment variables okay we have multiple ways but the single name that we can do it with is config map okay it is simply a short form of configuration mapping okay config map means configuration mapping so we are going to use config map to achieve the same thing all right so before that let me connect to my cloud shell again and then i'll show you an example for this
Kubernetes engine. In the meantime, it is creating my connecting my machine. All right, so let's go to the storage again. And there's a config map example. Okay, there are multiple config map example. I'm going to take the first one first. Okay, so team. I am creating a config map here. Okay, first I am going to create a config map. What is the name of the config map? The config map name is Nginx HTML. And I am going to store some data. I am going to store some data in that config map. Okay, so this is a key index HTML and it should give me a message of hello config map. All right. And now I am going to create a pod. Creating a pod API version metadata is a name container. Okay. I'm using the Nginx image. All right. Now I'm going to pass that config map using a volume. Okay. So till here you have the clear definition of the pod. Now I am again using the volume mount. Okay. So whenever you see the volume mount, it means it is happening inside the container. This is the name of the volume mount. Okay. This is the volume I'm going to use and I'm going to mount it at a location of user share Nginx HTML. This is the location where you are welcome to Nginx HTML pages residing. All right. So here I'm going to place my volume. I'm giving the read only true. Okay. I don't want any other access. Now I'm going to define the volume. The name of the volume is going to be HTML from CM. The same I'm using as volume mount. Okay. Under this now I'm giving config map. Now I'm not giving a uh, persistent volume claim. I'm not giving your empty directory I'm not giving your host path I'm giving a config map which config map nginx html that I have just created above okay so we are going to take this example authorize CTL. Let me delete all first. Okay, so it has not deleted the PV and PVC. QCTL get PVC. CTL delete PVC PVC name QCTL get PV okay so now you can see the status is again available because now I have deleted the PVC QCTL delete PV my PV okay so I have deleted both the PV and PVC I have deleted the pod I have a clean environment now I'm going to create the config map. kubectl create hyphen f and config map. Okay, so you can see your config map is created. Let's see it. kubectl get cm. Cm is a short form. Okay, you can see that nginx html config map is created you can describe it kubectl describe cm okay so team here you can see that it is namespaced okay you can have your config map into particular namespace as well all right apart from that what is the data you have a key called index.html and what is the value hello config map okay so with this your uh, pod is also created all right 
So let's try to log in and see if it is placed or not. kubectl exec hyphen it hyphen hyphen bash. Okay, now I'm inside my pod. I have mounted that config map at this location. There has to be an HTML file. Okay, you can see HTML file is here. Okay, and you can see the content has been updated. It is giving you hello config map. Okay, otherwise it used to give welcome to Nginx page. Okay, so that we have achieved. Now, next part, I told you that we can give your config map by two ways. Okay, first way was by volumes. We have already seen that how we can pass your config map using volumes. But we can pass on your config map using environment variables as well. Okay, so let's take an example for that also. This is another config map I'm creating. Okay, earlier I passed only one value. Earlier I passed only one value that was html.index and the value was hello uh, from config map. Now I am giving two values. What I am defining, I am defining db as my mongodb and app as my app. Okay, I have defined two values this time in my config map. I am creating the pod name container. Okay, and I want to execute a command. Okay, I want to execute a command echo key value one and key value two. Okay, and I'm defining those environment variables here. What is the name? The key is equal to going to be key one. Okay, what should be the value of key one? It should take the value from config map key reference. Okay, it should take the value from config map key reference. Which config map? The name of the config map should be special config. You can see this is the name of your config map. And which value it should pick? It should pick the value of DB. Okay, it should pick the value of DB. So what will happen? The value of DB is my DB and my DB will be stored at key one. All right. So team, you have to understand the flow, right? Now, I'm defining second key. Okay, I'm defining second environment variable. Second environment variable is key two. From where it should pick the value, it should pick value from config map key reference. Which config map? The name of the config map is special config. And which value it should pick? It should pick the value of app. Okay, so the value of app is my app. So this my app value will be stored at key two. Okay, team, I understand it is a little boring. I do understand that, but I cannot do anything. This is how the subject is. Okay, so I'm going to create a config map using environment variables this time. I'll take the raw format. I'll copy it. kubectl create hyphen f this. Okay, your config map is created and your pod is also created. kubectl get sm, sorry cm. Okay, now you can see a special config has been created and it has two datas. Okay, earlier we have one data, now we have two data. We can describe it. kubectl describe pod. Sorry, it is config map. Okay, now you can see it has two data. App equals to my app and db equals to my mongodb okay and these values should get pasted in my container okay so team test pod was created and it has only one job right if you see this i just did a eco operation i didn't get any sleep okay i didn't ask is this container to stay alive so that is why it deleted it as a job it is completed okay so once your uh, pod is completed you can see the output as kubectl get logs kubectl logs and your pod name 
So team, can you see? You are getting the output as my MongoDB, my app, as it was said. Echo key one and key two, and you get key one value as my MongoDB, and key two value as my app. Okay. So team, this is the concept of config maps. You can use your config map using volumes, and you can use your config map using environment variables. So, team, is config map clear to all of you? Uh, Gaurav, the thing is, you had a key value pair of index dot html. Okay, and you use it with a volume. Whenever you use it as a volume and you don't give any proper file path, it create it as a file itself. Okay, whenever you use it as a volume and you don't store a value in a file, so it create it stores that value as a file itself. Uh, Rahul, you are saying uh, how to create a config file using a config map. You can store it with the uh, values like this. The first example that I showed you. Okay, let me show you the first example again, Rahul. Okay, so what happened? I created a HTML file here and I stored some values here. Right. So what you can do, you can give here as a config file, and you can store all the configuration here accordingly. Okay, it is just a single key value pair. You can use an array. You can use a dictionary. We already understand that how it works with a YAML. Okay, so it is simply a key value pair under data. If you want under data, you can have an dictionary and array so that you can store multiple things, multiple content inside a single file. So that is how you are going to use a config file. Ashok, you are asking what is the use of config map? Ashok, that is what. With I started, okay. I just started with the same thing. What is the use of config map? Okay, so you have different environments. You want your container to behave a slightly differently in every environment. You want to pass on some details to the container so that you can identify that this container belongs to a lower environment. All right. So what I said, I should get a create. I should create a container created in the development environment, and it should. Uh, greet me with welcome to development. Okay, so that I'm aware that this container is of development environment. <clears throat> this container should respond welcome to testing environment, so that I can know that this container belongs to the testing environment. So what happens? Depending on the environment, depending on your environment, you want to pass some details that is environment specific to your container in any organization. So for that, you use config maps. When you want to pass some configurations to your container, how can we pass binary data in config map? Kushagra, you cannot pass uh, binary data in a config map. Okay, we have something different for that. I'll tell you about that. Uh, Rahul, you said you tried four different files. Uh, it is giving four different configs. So Rahul, if you are giving it just like this, okay? If you are giving it data, and then you give the same indentation, it means it is going to have different entries. You have to give it as a dictionary or array, like this container, and then you have some dictionary. Then it has names, okay? Then environment also have some names. You have to give. That config file data is like that, not just like a key value pair. Okay, the concept of YAML formatting applies here. Gaurav, you are using, uh, asking why we use a pipe symbol uh, signal symbol uh, here in the example one. So Gaurav, that is for the alignment. That is for the next line. Okay, you can also ask that why we have given uh, this hidden sign slash h1. So that is for the heading. So that is how your HTML formatting works. 
okay so it belongs to your html formatting oh now let me see if any example have that that you are asking this is with database and database url okay rahul actually at this point of time i don't have an example like that okay these are the commands for the config map okay so as of now i don't have an example ready with me where i can pass multiple details into a single file okay okay but uh, you yeah, do remind me i'll uh, try to manage that example for you mosami you are asking how to pass certificates in a config map okay so mosami uh, certificate part we haven't discussed yet okay certificate is a part that we are going to discuss in the next class okay so i'll request you to keep your certificate related question in the next for the next class place of in file values can we have properties file and directly access it from the yaml uh joydeep i don't understand your question in place of in file values can we uh, can i have a property file and directly access from yaml uh, sorry uh, joydeep i don't understand your question Uh, Rahul, you want to pass on the TNS entry uh, for the config map for connecting to database. Okay, so Rahul, there are a lot of functionality. Okay, I am here to understand, make you understand the concept. How you utilize it, you can. And that is up to you. Okay, you can use the config map for a variety of job. Okay, so I have made you understand the concept. It is up to you how you are going to use it. So, if you want to pass a connection TNS string for that, you can do that. Okay. One more topic I want to tell you before you ask further question on this. Okay. Before you ask further question on this, I want to ask you one question now. Okay. So, team, uh, there was a question uh, from someone Rahul. Okay. He asked something related to Oracle database or something. Okay. So now I have to ask you one question. The question is. can you pass a database connection string or sometime you have to pass some password password as well okay you want to have some environment variables you want to have some configuration pass that enables you to connect to the database or where you need to have some password details also okay so can you pass on some password related details or some sensitive data using config map to the container okay some of you gave the right answers kushagra you are right on top shiju uh mausumi yes ankur absolutely correct okay so team we should not pass on any password related details or any sensitive data using config map and why is that because if you are going to describe it okay if you are going to describe any cm get cm if you get any details in the config map they are available to get read in plain text all right you can read all the details in the plain text so anybody can explain your config map and it will get the details and password and other sensitive data you don't want them to be exposed like that okay so for that purpose in kubernetes you have some concept called secrets okay secrets are exactly same as config map the only difference the details are not visible here like this and you can do the encryption as well 
okay in secrets you can do the con uh, encryption as well so it is same so i have some examples here all right for secrets but uh, let's take an example uh, for secrets from the official documentation okay some examples we can take from the official documentation as well so storage use secrets kushagd in the binary data uh, are you asking about this okay so if you want to pass on normal data you can pass if you want to pass some binary data as well you can pass with the uh, config map as well okay so this is about binary data as of now we have provided the normal data all right so team this is your official documentation from where we can take the example of secrets all right for the better understanding consider i want to pass on the username and the password all right i want to pass on the username and password into my container using a secret all right so this is uh, being done using base64 encryption all right so base64 encryption is usually available with all the linux environment whether it is your ubuntu shell uh, alpine or uh, centos red hat okay base64 encryption is available with all of them so for now what i am going to do i am going to have my my app username this is my username and i am going to have the base64 encryption for this okay so the encrypted value for my app is this string similarly for the password this is going to be my password and i am going to have base64 encryption for this also so now this is my username in the encrypted format and this is the password for my encrypted value all right now i am going to create a secret api version is v1 kind of secret name of secret is this you can see this is the username and this is the password as per the encryption all right you can verify now what i am going to do i am going to create this secret all right your secret is created kubectl get secret <coughs> test secret kubectl describe secret okay so team when you describe the secret you can see that the type is opaque and under data <coughs> you can see that no values is visible to you you know that password has been passed username has been passed it is giving you what is the string length it doesn't give you the actual value it doesn't give you the encrypted value as well okay so we have pass on the encrypted value but that is also not visible here it is just giving you the bytes all right so cube serial get secret we have seen that we have described that as well all right you can create a secret from the command line as well okay that is a format now i am going to create a pod that have access to the secret so this is the pod pod definition again i am using volume mount okay the name of the volume that i am going to use is secret volume and it should get mounted at etc secret volume inside my container what volume i am using the name of the volume is secret volume and i am using secret behind it the name of the secret is test secret that i have just created so let's create this pod as well okay you can use apply and you can use create both will create your pod qctl get pods okay your secret test pod is created and it is running all right so if you want to see the value you can see the value of that by logging into your container all right now you are inside your container 
at this location you have saved your details so team you can see etc secret volume you can see the password and username all right so that is also encrypted it is not visible to you directly and if you want to see the actual values you can see the username the username is my app and if you want to see the password you can see the password as well so team why you can see the username and password because now you are logged inside the container okay so the beauty of a secret is if you log into your container then only you can see the actual values otherwise as a kubernetes admin i cannot use any kubernetes or kubectl command to see the actual values of a secret if you want to see the value of a secret you have to log into that container all right yes kushagra it is a plain text inside a container the purpose of secret is it should get read inside a container right you should be able to read a secret inside a container but you should not allow anybody else who cannot log into the container that it should read the content so secret allow you to keep it a secret outside of container inside of container you can definitely see it all right so team this is the example how you are going to use a secret using a volume okay if you want to use using environment variable just like a config map okay we have seen example a config map where you can use it using a volume and using a environment variable same thing i am going to do with the secrets also okay this time i am going to create the secret using command line okay in a imperative way cube ctl create secret this is a keyword okay you have to create a secret generic is a keyword that you have to give backend user backend user is the name of the secret okay the secret will be named as backend user from literal literal means you have to pass on the value so team whenever you create a secret from the command line you don't give the encrypted format okay you give a plain text if you create a secret using command line pass on the values just like that without encryption so the key is backend user name and the value is backend admin all right so i am going to create the secret now secret is created all right now i am going to create the pod using environment variable for this okay this is your pod definition here i have provided environments the name of the environment is secret username i have to pick the value from key secret reference which secret i have to refer backend user and the value of back uh, backend username okay i am going to use this pod all right now if i want to see the value <coughs> i don't have to log into the container every time all right i can simply in place of bash i can simply give echo the secret username okay so the value was backend admin all right so team this is how you use your config map and secrets do let me know if you have any question with secrets and config map but we can uh, also easily decode base 64 encoded data so yes you cannot you can do that all right you can do that but when you inside a container see the purpose of a secret is to pass some value secretly to a container so it has to be not visible outside the container but once you are inside the container it should give you the actual values
Gaurav, you are asking uh, we encrypt the values at what level the decryption took place. Okay, uh, Gaurav, that is simply encrypted and decrypted. You passed the encrypted value. Okay, so it will get decrypted because you have used base 64. It is an automated process. It is from the Linux environment. Decryption took place automatically. Rishav, we have already seen even the encrypted value is not visible in a secret. You can describe a secret, you will get a blank area. Okay, when you describe a secret, you don't get the encrypted value, you don't get the decrypted value as well. Anyway, we can avoid doing base 64 encryption by ourselves. Kushagri, that is up to you. Whatever the encryption type you want to use, you can use. Okay. That is completely up to you. You don't want to use base 64. You want to use any other encryption. You can use that also. Sarath, uh, will secret volume is created as PV in a sing, uh, simple example? No, Sarath, PV is completely different. Okay, PV is completely different concept as a volume. I'm just mounting it as a volume inside when you define a volume. All right, let me show you. Whenever you define a volume below that you give what is it? You can give my PVC in the previous example. You have seen here persistent volume claim previous to that example. You have seen here host path previous to that example. You have seen empty directory. Okay, so it is a way of passing something using volumes under volumes. What you have defined that matters. So a config map is completely different from PV. We should not compare it like that. Joydeep, can we use a PV for secrets? Uh, Joydeep secrets are managed internally by Kubernetes. Again, as I said, PV is completely different concept from secrets. Shiju is not encryption and encoding. Uh, yes, Shiju, my bad. I use the wrong word. Okay. Encryption and encoding. It is encoding format. Base 64. Uncle, majorly it is used uh, base 64 only. Okay. But it is not a standard. You can choose anyone. All right. But majority of the use is of base 64 only. Bishop, it is a support from your operating system. Where can we change the encryption type? It is based on your operating system. What uh, encryption or encoding formatting you have installed? Okay, in uh, you can have your encoding installed on your operating system and you can encode the data using that. It will be decoded automatically. So you don't have to define it anywhere. You should have installed it in your system. That's all. Uh, it, I mean, uh, is it possible if a secret can itself encrypt our plain text to base 64? Kushagra, you, are, uh, you have given the base 64 encoded data and that is being converted into plain text. Okay, so you are asking how to uh, have your plain text to base 64 format and we have seen that how you can do that. There is a command already provided you. In this documentation, right? Okay, so team is secrets and config map clear to all of you. If so, we are going to move to the next topic. Okay, we still have three topics left for today. Sarat, that is a concept of security. Okay, that is what we are going to cover in the next session. Okay, our next session is dedicated to the security certificates context 
there we are going to see how we can secure our pod all right okay so team now we are going to discuss two topics that is completely dependent on your managed kubernetes cluster okay cloud disk and service load balancer are the two topics that you can only study with gke or any eks or managed cluster all right so team you have understood about the pv and pvc concept right pv and pvc is clear to all of you now one thing is consider i have used an fs shared mount point right because i wanted to have consistency so what i have done i have created an nfs and it is attached to all the worker nodes so don't you think it is a mm, it is not a cost efficient way of doing things okay because in any cloud environment whether it is your aws or gcp it is a model of pay as you go all right so if you have created a nfs dedicatedly whether it is being used or not you are going to pay for it so even if your nfs is not being used it is going to incur some charges and you have to pay for it to your cloud provider so that is not a very efficient way of doing it because you are paying for something that you are not using in that scenario your cloud disk comes into picture okay with cloud disk what you can do you can create the volume directly on the cloud when it needs to be used okay whenever a pod requires a volume then only it is going to create a cloud disk it is going to create a volume directly on the cloud not on any server also that cloud disk will be available to all the instances to the complete cluster okay and that can be done only with gke so that is why cloud disk is a concept it is not important for your examination they never ask about a cloud disk because it is a part of gke it is not a part of core kubernetes okay similarly service load balancer as well so let's see an example for the cloud disk okay this is the one chcp so team this is how you are going to create a storage all right this is a api version storage class okay i am going to create a storage class now all right earlier what we did we used a standard storage class journal one okay that journal one what it does it create the volumes on the instances all right that reception is only allow you to book hotel in that particular room but if you want to book a room at some other place you have to deal with another manager right so for that purpose i am going to create another storage class that will be capable of creating volume from gke cloud you can see the provisioner is gce google cloud engine so this storage class will allow you to create volumes directly on the gcp that is why i have taken this all right so what i'm going to do take the raw format of this this time i am going to create the storage class first cube ctl create hyphen f cube ctl get sc is a short form for storage class all right you can see a fast storage class is just created all right 7 seconds ago who is going to provision it google cloud engine this volume will be uh, so this storage class is going to instruct google cloud engine directly to create the volume okay volume bounder uh, binding mode is immediate whenever the requirement is arise it is going to immediately provision your volume all right and the declaim policies delete you can modify it you can have it as a recycle you can have it as retain okay that is up to you but as of now it is created by a delete one so now your storage class is created all right now you don't have to create a pv okay that is the part that we are skipping all right by creating a storage class we don't want persistence volume to be created beforehand okay that is a requirement right so now we don't have to create the persistent volume we have to create a pvc right away okay pv 
ABC, storage class fast. Persistent volume create, uh, claim I am going to create PVC. Which storage class I am going to use, which manager I am going to use is fast disk Okay. What is my requirement? I need 10 GB. So a 10 GB storage volume will be created on the Google Cloud directly. Let me take the raw format. kubectl create hyphen f and your persistent volume claim is created kubectl get pvc okay so team you can see that a persistent volume claim is created and it is already bound you never created a persistent volume in the first place but still the status you can see is bound it means a persistent volume is created in the real time what is your persistent volume this is your persistent volume 10 gb and this is your access mode and storage kubectl get pv all right you can see this is the name of your volume and where this volume is created it is created directly on your cloud So team, can you go to storage and you can see a persistent volume claim is already created. Okay, this is from the Google Cloud. GC, uh, GKE. Uh, let's see about the volumes. Cloud storage. Okay, not here. I'm forgetting the name. Okay, it has to be same way. I am forgetting the location exactly. Okay, disks. Okay. Thanks, Akur. <coughs> I forgot it. Thanks, Angkor. Okay, so team, here you can see the volume is created. Okay, how to verify? You can see the ending of the volume name, 4EA5. All right, 4EA5. This persistent volume is created right away on the cloud desk. All right, it is not created on any server. So even if the pod gets recreated on any other node, it is not going to impact anyway because this disk is at the cloud level. Okay, it is not assigned to any particular worker node. Okay, so that is the beauty of this. Any doubts, any question in this? Cloud disk. So let's create this pod as well. Okay, you can use apply and you can use create. Both will create your pod. QCTL, get pods. Okay, your secret test pod is created and it is running. All right. So if you want to see the value, you can see the value of that by logging into your container.
All right. Now you're inside your container. At this location, you have saved your details. So team, you can see etc secret volume. You can see the password and username. All right. So that is also encrypted. It is not visible to you directly. And if you want to see the actual values, you can see the username. The username is my app. And if you want to see the password, you can see the password as well. So team, why you can see the username and password? Because now you are logged inside the container. Okay. So the beauty of a secret is if you log into your container, then only you can see the actual values. Otherwise, as a Kubernetes admin, I cannot use any Kubernetes or kubectl command to see the actual values of a secret. If you want to see the value of a secret, you have to log into that container. All right. Yes, Kushagra, it is a plain text inside a container. The purpose of secret is it should get read inside a container, right? You should be able to read a secret inside a container, but you should not allow anybody else who cannot log into the container that it should read the content. So secret allow you to keep it a secret outside of container. Inside of container, you can definitely see it. All right. So team, this is the example how you are going to use a secret using a volume. Okay. If you want to use using environment variable, just like a config map. Okay. We have seen an example, a config map where you can use it using a volume and using an environment variable. Same thing I'm going to do with the secrets also. Okay. This time I'm going to create the secret using command line. Okay. In a imperative way. kubectl create secret. This is a keyword. Okay, you have to create a secret. Generic is a keyword that you have to give. Backend user. Backend user is the name of the secret. Okay, the secret will be named as backend user. From literal. Literals means you have to pass on the value. So team, whenever you create a secret from the command line, you don't give the encrypted format. Okay, you give a plain text. If you create a secret using command line, pass on the values just like that without encryption. So the key is backend user name and the value is backend admin. All right. So I'm going to create the secret now. Secret is created. All right. Now I'm going to create the pod using environment variable for this. Okay, this is your pod definition. Here I have provided environments. The name of the environment is secret username. I have to pick the value from key secret reference, which secret I have to refer backend user and the value of backend, uh, backend username. Okay, I'm going to use this pod. All right. Now, if I want to see the value, <coughs> I don't have to log into the container every time. All right. I can simply in place of bash, I can simply give echo the secret username. Okay. So the value was backend admin. All right. So team, this is how you use your config map and secrets. Do let me know if you have any question with secrets and config map. But we can uh, also easily decode base 64 encoded data. So yes, Jagannath, you can do that. All right, you can do that. But when you inside a container, see the purpose of a secret is to pass some value secretly to a container. So it has to be not visible outside the container, but once you are inside the container, it should give you the actual values.
Gaurav, you are asking, uh, we encrypt the values at what level the decryption took place. Okay, uh, Gaurav, that is simply encrypted and decrypted. You pass the encrypted value. Okay, so it will get decrypted. Because you have used base64, it is an automated process. It is from the Linux environment. Decryption took place automatically. Rishav, we have already seen even the encrypted value is not visible in a secret. You can describe a secret, you will get a blank area. Okay. When you describe a secret, you don't get the encrypted value, you don't get the decrypted value as well. Anyway, we can avoid doing base64 encryption by ourselves. Kushagri, that is up to you. Whatever the encryption type you want to use, you can use. Okay? That is completely up to you. You don't want to use base64. You want to use any other encryption, you can use that also. Sarath, uh, will secret volume is created as PV in a sing, uh, simple example? No, Sarath, PV is completely different. Okay, PV is completely different concept as a volume. I'm just mounting it as a volume. Inside, when you define a volume, all right, let me show you. Whenever you define a volume, below that, you give what is it. You can give my PVC in the previous example you have seen here persistent volume claim previous to that example you have seen here host path previous to that example you have seen empty directory okay so it is a way of passing something using volumes under volumes what you have defined that matters so a config map is completely different from PV we should not compare it like that Joydeep can we use a PV for secrets uh, Joydeep secrets are managed internally by Kubernetes. Again, as I said, PV is completely different concept from secrets. Shiju is not encryption and encoding. Uh, yes, Shiju, my bad. I used the wrong word. Okay. Encryption and encoding. It is encoding format. Base 64. Uncle, majorly it is used uh, base 64 only. Okay. But it is not a standard. You can choose anyone. All right. But majority of the use is of base 64 only. Rishabh, it is a support from your operating system. Where can we change the encryption type? It is based on your operating system. What uh, encryption or encoding formatting you have installed, okay? And uh, you can have your encoding installed on your operating system and you can encode the data using that it will be decoded automatically so you don't have to define it anywhere you should have installed it in your system that's all uh, it i mean uh, is it possible if a secret can itself encrypt our plain text to base 64 Kushagra, you, are, uh, you have given the base64 encoded data and that is being converted into plain text. Okay, so you are asking how to uh, have your plain text to base64 format and we have seen that how you can do that. There is a command already provided you in this documentation. Right? Okay, so team is secrets and config map clear to all of you? If so, we are going to move to the next topic. Okay, we still have three topics left for today. Sarat, that is a concept of security. Okay, that is what we are going to cover in the next session. Okay, our next session is dedicated to the security, certificates, context, 
there we are going to see how we can secure our pod all right okay so team now we are going to discuss two topics that is completely dependent on your managed kubernetes cluster okay cloud disk and service load balancer are the two topics that you can only study with gke or any eks or managed cluster all right so team you have understood about the pv and pvc concept right pv and pvc is clear to all of you now one thing is consider i have user nfs shared mount point right because i wanted to have consistency so what i have done i have created an nfs and it is attached to all the worker nodes so don't you think it is a it is not a cost efficient way of doing things okay because in any cloud environment whether it is your aws or gcp it is a model of pay as you go all right so if you have created a nfs dedicatedly whether it is being used or not you are going to pay for it so even if your nfs is not being used it is going to incur some charges and you have to pay for it to your cloud provider so that is not a very efficient way of doing it because you are paying for something that you are not using in that scenario your cloud disk comes into picture okay with cloud disk what you can do you can create the volume directly on the cloud when it needs to be used okay whenever a pod requires a volume then only it is going to create a cloud disk it is going to create a volume directly on the cloud not on any server also that cloud disk will be available to all the instances to the complete cluster okay and that can be done only with gke so that is why cloud disk is a concept it is not important for your examination they never ask about a cloud disk because it is a part of gke it is not a part of core kubernetes okay similarly service load balancer as well so let's see an example for the cloud disk okay this is the one cscp so team this is how you are going to create a storage all right this is a api version storage class okay i am going to create a storage class now all right earlier what we did we used a standard storage class journal one okay that journal one what it does it create the volumes on the instances all right that reception is only allow you to book hotel in that particular room but if you want to book a room at some other place you have to deal with another manager right so for that purpose i am going to create another storage class that will be capable of creating volume from gke cloud you can see the provisioner is gce google cloud engine so this storage class will allow you to create volumes directly on the gcp that is why i have taken this all right so what i am going to do take the raw format of this this time i am going to create the storage class first cube ctl create hyphen f kubectl get sc is a short form for storage class all right you can see a fast storage class is just created all right 7 seconds ago who is going to provision it google cloud engine this volume will be uh, so this storage class is going to instruct google cloud engine directly to create the volume okay volume bounder uh, binding mode is immediate whenever the requirement is arise it is going to immediately provision your volume all right and the reclaim policy is delete you can modify it you can have it as a recycle you can have it as retain okay that is up to you but as of now it is created by a delete one so now your storage class is created all right now you don't have to create a pv okay that is the part that we are skipping all right by creating a storage class we don't want persistent volume to be created beforehand okay that is a requirement right so now we don't have to create the persistent volume we have to create a pvc right away 
ओके पीवीसी स्टोरेज क्लास फास्ट परसिस्टेंट वॉल्यूम क्लेम आई एम गोइंग टू क्रिएट पीवीसी विच स्टोरेज क्लास आई एम गोइंग टू यूज विच मैनेजर आई एम गोइंग टू यूज इज फास्ट डिस ऑन ओके वॉट इज माई रिक्वायरमेंट आई नीड टेन जीबी सो अ टेन जीबी स्टोरेज वॉल्यूम विल बी क्रिएटेड ऑन द गूगल क्लाउड डायरेक्टली लेट मी टेक द रॉ फॉर्म एट क्यूब सी टी एल क्रिएट आई एन एफ एंड योर परसिस्टेंट वॉल्यूम क्लेम इज क्रिएटेड क्यूब सी टी एल गेट पी वी सी ओके सो टीम यू कैन सी दैट अ परसिस्टेंट वॉल्यूम क्लेम इज क्रिएटेड एंड इट इज ऑलरेडी बाउंड you never created a persistent volume in the first place but still the status you can see is bound it means a persistent volume is created in the real time what is your persistent volume this is your persistent volume 10 gb and this is your access mode and storage cube ctl get pv all right you can see this is the name of your volume and where this volume is created it is created directly on your cloud so team can you go to storage and you can see a persistent volume claim is already created okay this is from the google cloud gc uh, gke uh let's see about the volumes cloud storage okay not here i am forgetting the name Okay, it has to be somewhere. I am forgetting the location exactly. Okay, discs. Okay, thanks, Akur. <coughs> I forgot it. Thanks, Angkor. Okay, so team, here you can see the volume is created. Okay, how to verify? You can see the ending of the volume name, four E A five. All right, four E A five. This persistent volume is created right away on the cloud desk. All right, it is not created on any server. So even if the pod gets recreated on any other node, it is not going to impact anyway because this disk is at the cloud level. okay it is not assigned to any particular worker node okay so that is the beauty of this any doubts any question in this cloud disk so me from where you is asking wait for the first consumer storage class status Uh, where exactly provisional reclaim policy volume mining mode allow volume h okay 
okay this wait for the first consumer okay so for this uh, whenever you use this storage class okay first it is going to um, have a pod first okay and after that a pod will be created a volume should be assigned but once you start putting some data at that volume only then that volume will be created exactly okay so that volume will be assigned even when you create the pod it will wait until unless you write some data to that particular volume okay otherwise it is used internally for your kubernetes it is not available for you all right you are always suggested to use the standard one or you can create your own so this is wait for the first consumer it is used by the kubernetes internal processes they create the volume when and where required immediate basis like they will have a volume internally but it won't consume any space until let unless you write some data in that volume is there any similar service like cloud disk in aws yes ankur there is if you have used eks service okay in uh, in aws you have eks for kubernetes engine there you can use the volume as per your choice here we have ssd there we have different type of volumes i am not a big fan of aws so i don't know all the type of volume which are available there but you can use that okay for that you have to create the storage class where you have to give the provisioner of aws any open source solution for storage class to create dynamically in a non cloud environment okay sarat that is up to you if you want to create a non cloud environment you have to choose the provisioner accordingly okay so here you can see uh, for the storage classes if you see the definition this definition is for the cloud storage for gcp google cloud engine provisioner okay so if you want to have provisioner uh, depending on your environment you can have the have to google it from the kubernetes official documentation which provisioner for the uh, you have to use okay we have used for the gk if you want to use for aws you can simply search out for the provisioner of aws for storage class in kubernetes you can find it there Rishab, uh, but here the provisioner for standard is uh, GCEPD. Yes, it is GCEPD, but here you are defining the type as PD SSD. Okay, here you are defining the uh, type is PD SSD, so that it is going to create the volume directly on the Google Cloud. Okay, obviously provisioner is going to be GCE. If you are creating the volume also on the VM machine, the provisioner is going to be your Kubernetes itself. let me show you here all the volumes that are attached to your worker node 1 worker node 2 all the volumes that are attached on your master all the volumes are provisioned by gk itself all right even on the worker nodes it is provisioned by the gk right so you have to give the type also parameter Yeah, EBS can be used for AWS. Joy Deep. <coughs> okay. Any other question till now? Where can we define reclaim policy for the standard PV? so under specification you have to define it okay kushagra if you want to define the reclaim policy you can see a, a previous definition of any pv and pvc
so you can see all these type of definitions are given under specification your storage class your access mode all right if you see a pv definition as well you can see the access mode uh, and reclaim policy is under your specs so you have to give that under specification of your pvc as well Some of you are asking how read write once and read in many applicable for the cloud disk. Okay, so if you have multiple ports running on different different nodes, okay, so read write once here is going to be defined as a particular port and a particular deployment. Okay, so if you have created a deployment or if you have created a port, it will be accessible. This uh, volume will be accessible to that only. All right, one deployment. One PVC or one port, one PVC. That is how you are going to do the mapping. If you have given the read write once, that volume will be accessible to that only. But if you have give, uh, given read write many, so it can be used by different deployment and different port as well. All right. So team, I guess we won't be able to cover the stateful set and headless service today because of the time, because of the questioning. All right. But we have to go over the service load balancer because this is the part that we have to deal with GK itself. Okay, so team, how many type of services you remember that we have in Kubernetes? How many type of services are there in Kubernetes? Cluster IP node port, right? <coughs> okay, I did it again. Shiju, you have given the load balancer as well. Okay, did. Okay, team, consider you have a deployment, and under deployment, you have created three replicas. All right, and these three replicas will be exposed to the outer world using a service. Okay, and this service will expand across your cluster. Okay, consider these are your nodes, right? Node one, node two, node three. This is your master node. This is your worker node one. And this is your worker node two. So if you remember about the services, okay, if you remember about the services, you know that with service, you create a node port a port number with this you expose your ports to the outer world and how do you expose that you use IP address of your master IP uh, master world and you can have the node port okay so here you have the functionality that you can use IP of any of the worker node okay you can have IP2 with node port you can have IP3 with your node port, right? That is a uh, flexibility you get. You can use IP of any of the machine, whether it is your master machine or your worker node one or worker node two. Now the question arises that what you do, what IP you are going to give to your customer, okay? Or simply you create a DNS entry, okay? www.shub.com okay that is my application URL so behind that you have to do the DNS mapping you have to give an IP as well so whose IP are you going to give are you going to give the IP of your master or your worker node 1 or worker node 2 because IP of any of the machine is going to work all right in that scenario you need to do the load balancing okay you're going to have a third load balancer that is called load balancer service Also team, you have to remember that load balancer service is again available only with 
manage Kubernetes cluster, whether GKE or EKS, it is not available with a core Kubernetes. All right, it is only available with this. So what happens if you create a load balancer type of service? So you are going to have a single IP. Okay, you're going to have a single IP. You are going to use a node port. And then load balancing will take place across IP1, IP2, IP3 as well. Okay, a single IP traffic will be routed with master of one IP or worker node one IP or worker node two IP. All right, so you have a definite endpoint if you do a load balancer service. All right, so team, I'm going to create a load balancer service only. Okay, nothing much than that. You have to go to the repository. Here you have service network. And here you have a load balancer YAML. All right, I'm going to create a deployment. This is the name of the deployment. These are the specification. I want to have three replicas. All right. All this definition is all clear to you. Now I'm going to create a service. This service is has a type of load balancer. All right. And the port number is it is going to use is 3000. So let me take the raw format of this one. I'll copy it. kubectl create hyphen F. And that's all. So you can see your deployment is also created. Your load balancer service is also created. kubectl get SVC. All right, you can see a load balancer. This is the third type of your service is created. External IP is still pending. And this is a port number for you. 32556. All right, let's see where it does get created in the cloud. All right, let's search for the load balancer. All right, team, you can see our load balancer is created. One target pool, two instances. It means it will do the load balancing between worker node one and worker node two. All right, this is the load balancer that has been created. All right, this is the front end URL and this is the IP address and port number you are going to use on your browser. All right, you can see the output is going to come like this. All right, you can refresh it as my time. It will be load balance between your three ports. All right, the port number is being used 3000. And if you see here, all right, 3000 is a port number for your external and 32556 is your node port. All right. So in the diagram, you can see that you have a load balance service. It create a service node port also at the back end. Okay. A load balancer service also create a service node port at the back end by default. So IP address and node port, it will be used for the front load balancer. It will do the load balancing between these worker nodes and then it is going to use the service IP of node port and use a node port and distribute your traffic across your ports. All right. So team is the service load balancer clear to all of you. It is simply putting a load balancer in front of your cluster. All right, simply putting a load balancer in front of your cluster. Any question with service load balancer team? cluster you have to have a load balancer automatically uh, at your own you have to create a manual load balancer okay if you are using cloud you have to create your own load balancer manually on the cloud front all right if you are not using a non-cloud environment you have to use a HA proxy server Imagine you want to create a load balancer for 
bots using command line <laughs> himanshu if you are creating a deployment <clears throat> you are already doing the load balancing okay if you talk about a deployment it is itself doing the load balancing between your pods why do you want to do it differently when your deployment is doing the same job no kushagra it doesn't create the cluster ip because that is not required here right if you are doing the load balancing on the ip level of your cluster all right it means you wants to expose your application so if you are exposing your application you will need only node port you don't be need cluster ip jagannath i have repeated many times okay i have repeated many times that service load balancer and cloud disk are not a part of your examination because it is your managed kubernetes cluster okay cloud disk and service load balancer cannot come in your examination but is because it is not a part of your core kubernetes it is a part of your managed kubernetes cluster i just wanted to give you a better idea that is going to help you in the real environment something more than for your examination where does the node port to the port mapping define is it uh, default port number 80 Siddha, that you have to define in your YAML. Okay, so Siddha, you can see here when you give the container definition, you have to define at what port your application listens. Okay, this is my application, and I know my application, my container listens to port number three thousand. So you have to define it at the container port. Akhil, for your examination point of view, you have only two services in Kubernetes. That is node port and cluster IP. Okay, so for CK exam, you have to remember only two services: node port, cluster IP. If you want to go for an interview or you want to practice in the real-time enterprise level, you have three services. But load balancer is specific to manage Kubernetes cluster. Shagra, you have never created a cluster IP for other pods, right? Your all the pods can communicate to each other by the service that is created by Kubernetes itself. Okay, thus you have seen all the cube system pods. All right. Similarly, Kubernetes has a system level service as well. This is your Kubernetes cluster IP service. This helps with all the internal communication. Whenever you create a deployment, all the pods can talk to each other, right? But we never created a cluster IP service. Then how they are communicating to each other with this service? This is always created by default. Even if I delete everything, this service will get created automatically. Kubectl delete all hyphen hyphen all. Okay. So whenever delete everything. You might have seen that a service is also deleted. Okay, I don't know if you have paid attention to that or not, but this Kubernetes service is also created, deleted. Can you see Kubernetes service is also deleted? But it is a system level resource. It will get created automatically. CTL get SVC. Okay, it was not deleted. So you can see cluster IP is always coming back. It is just like a system level resource that helps in with the internal communication. Abhishek, you have to understand this. Does job support service and endpoint? Why do you want a job to support service and endpoint? Job is something the bot will do some task and it will die. So where you want to expose that? A job is completed. 
once it is completed your poet is going to die out then where you are going to expose that died container nowhere so why do you want job to support services and endpoints no point in of having that uh kushagra so uh, if we are defining a separate cluster ip it means we are isolating those uh, set of pod from the rest of the cluster pod so kushagra that is you are creating a subset of your clusters okay you have a cluster ip it is allowing you for your complete cluster to talk to each other all the pods inside your cluster to talk to each other okay so you are creating a subset inside your major set so that a prop a some a set of pods some database pod should be able to talk to some application pod all right you can have this disabled at that time so that is a part of security how you can allow your specific pods to talk to each other only okay you can also stop them by talking to each other on across the nodes across the cluster across the cluster definitely it is not possible if you want to stop communication between a pod to a different pod on a different node or you don't want some deployment pods to talk to other deployment pods you can also restrict that and that can be done using security that we have in the next session okay so cluster ip is used for the internal communication uh, by default cluster ip is already provided you can also create your own cluster ip and you can provide a restriction as well that we haven't seen yet that is the agenda that we have for the next class okay in the next class you can see we have networks security context and config files so team any other question for today all right team so welcome to the last week of your kubernetes training all right and second last class team one question uh, for all of you actually i missed that uh, i don't remember it exactly did we cover stateful set and headless services in the last class you are talking about there's nothing like templates in kubernetes as such grish last week we worked on a uh, ga cluster right so with there you got a terminal and then that was the only master node you have and the thing is in managed cluster you don't have access to your master node you just get a terminal all right similarly same case is this uh, it's with aws eks all right not much difference setting up is a difference that is all otherwise all the commands you are going to execute or and all the commands all the objects will keep working on eks everything will be same only setting it up is going to be different rahul to uh, uh, you want to make yamls files automate we have already covered that if you remember i have told you with the dry run right If you remember, I have told you what are the dry runs, how you can create a dry run uh, hyphen o yaml file. Dry run equals to client and hyphen o yaml. You get a template. You get a output. How you can create a yaml file? Okay, it is just like that. So if you are asking about that template, we already covered that.
गौरव यू सिंह ऑन जी सी बी मास्टर एंड स्लेव नोट कॉन्फ्रिकेशन आई एक्सपोज एंड इंजीनियर्स डिप्लॉयमेंट यूजिंग नोटबुड सर्विस बट इट वॉज नॉट एक्सेबल यूजिंग मास्टर आई पी नोट आई पी विथ नोट बोर्ड ओके गौरव वॉट वॉज एर यू वो गेटिंग और द पेज वॉज नॉट लोडिंग और यू गॉट सम एर और समथिंग Okay, so for that purpose, what I'll suggest you to do, you have the note port, kubectl get uh, services, all right? There you get the details about the services you have created. Describe the service note port service, describe it, and also do the curl operation on the cluster IP of the IP of your service. Okay, if you get uh, kubectl get services. you will get the name of your notebook service and you will get an ip also for your notebook service try to curl it from the command line all right if that is the case if the curl is happening it means your service is created properly and it must be accessible on the browser what difference can be there then when you created the servers all right when you created the servers chances are there that you didn't allow http and http access at that time all right that is one possibility uh and i suspect that is the only uh, reason because of which you are not getting it on the web page all right because if curl operation is working on the cluster ip of your service it means everything is set up properly if you are not able to access from the browser it means your servers don't have the access to the open internet Okay, the curl operation on the cluster IP was working, and I have allowed HTTP and HTTP access. Uh, so, uh, Gaurav, did you try it again after cleaning up the setup and doing it again? Okay, do that also. Apart from that, I'll suggest you to <coughs> do one thing more. All right. you have all your master ips uh, all the servers all the nodes either your master or worker nodes component do have docker installed all right simply create a nginx docker container with docker command okay with docker command create a container of nginx on any of the machine all right what will happen that will create a container on the same node you will have the local host there so what will happen you will expose a node you yeah, you will expose a port number to that also all right so if you have seen my first class you will get all the details how to create a single docker container then when you create a nginx docker container with docker you will expose a port number as well so use that port number and use its own machine ip address and try to access it from the browser all right so a simple docker container if it is working from the browser it means something is missing from your kubernetes setup if that also is not working it means your uh, servers don't have access to the open internet also when i use this load balancer service the ip allotment was to remain in pending state for more than 15 minutes seems something not good with my gcp got up 15 minutes is a long time it was not supposed to take that much time all right if it take that much time you have to describe the bot and in the event section you will find out what was not going well okay from there you can do the troubleshooting All right. So, uh, team, as you all have confirmed that your stateful sets and headless services were not covered yet, uh, in the last class. Okay. Sometimes when I take multiple patches, I do forget few things that what was covered and what was not covered. That's why I double check with you people. So that was not covered. So first, what we are going to do, we are going to cover your stateful sets and headless service that was uh, that was supposed to be done in the last session. 
but it was not done so first we'll going to cover that after that we are going to move to your networking concepts all right it means we are going to talk about your security not network exactly but securities all right and securities will discuss about your authentication and authorization we'll talk about your certificates roles and role binding cluster role cluster role binding your config context uh, and then we'll discuss about security account and security context as well so it's service account and security context all right so team uh, this is the objects we are going to cover today all right so we'll try to cover it all today itself so that we don't have to stretch on the last day and we can have a good session on troubleshooting and important question discussion and tips discussion on examination all right so we'll try not to leave anything all right so this is what we are supposed to do today uh, when sorry got of you say what we should do when our nodes doesn't have access to internet so uh, got of in that case you uh, i think i have told you earlier as well first is your http and http access should be there you should have access to all cloud apis that i have also shown you in the earlier classes all right these are the two section which are important apart from that you should have a firewall rule that should have access uh, to 0000/0 ip all right that is i am just telling you for the practice purpose not for the enterprise level definitely they have their own set of rules but for your practice purpose you should have a firewall rule in place that allow access from open internet and that should applicable that should be applicable to all the nodes that you have created and two things that i told you http and https access and access to all cloud apis all right team so shall we start with today okay yes gorov that is a possibility okay in one of my session i have also shown you to create the firewall rule as well that is as far as i remember if i'm not remembering correctly do let me know if you don't know how to deal with the firewall i'll show you that also okay tomorrow you can let me know i'll show you how to create a firewall rule also okay so team shall we start with today with the topics that we have today any question you can ask before we get started okay team so let's get started first thing first you do have a cluster as you always had all right in that cluster consider you want to create a deployment all right if you are dealing with a normal application if you are just dealing with an application so what happens that you create a deployment with multiple replicas right so what is happening here if you have asked to create five replicas if you have asked to create five replicas so what happens all the five replicas are created on the single go okay i'm not telling you anything new i'm just telling you what we have already seen and discussed if you have asked for five replicas all the five replicas will be created simultaneously and they will be available at the same time that is a general nature of your deployment right now consider you have some database pod this time in the first scenario which i told you that is an application pod so application pods are stateless in nature what is stateless in nature they have a war file and it will remain in that way so you will have a application it will be a web based application or any kind of application it is going to remain constant its state is not going to get changed state is not going to get changed it means it is stateless in nature it means even if one pod goes down and new pod will be take uh, will be taking its place all right so there is nothing like there will be some updates in the previous pod and the new pod should carry that updates also 
because in application ports you have a jar and war file we don't update it like that if we do update we directly upgrade your deployment right now second scenario consider you have some database ports all right now what i am doing i am having some database port all right i do have the replicas all right so i am having five replicas in database pod what is the basic nature that in a database you will have some data all right or with data you are going to play around you are going to delete some rows you are going to insert some rows you might update some rows all right so updates are always going to happen consider if i'm creating a database pod with deployment if i want to have five replicas all right so what will happen all the five pods will be coming online at the first time all right and one thing also we have seen earlier that if a user is trying to access its application i have shown you that maybe first time <clears throat> the user will connect with pod 1 all right so what it did with database pods the user connected with pod 1 and it did some updates all right it updated some rows now the user refresh the browser all right once the browser was refreshed he got connected with pod 4 okay fourth pod uh, pod was now serving the request now does the fourth pod have the updates from the first pod does the fourth pod has the updates that he made on pod 1 if i'm talking about the deployments no of course right <clears throat> so deployment is a big failure if i talk about your database pods right deployment is a big failure if i talk about your database pods again same case if consider this pod goes down all right one thing i can do that with uh, volumes i can have all the uh, pods in sync but still there might be a chance that once a pod is deleted another pod will take its place it might not be at the same state that earlier pod was supposed to because deployment creates a pod with the definition it doesn't take all the values from the previous pod right so team these were the challenges that i wanted to ad get addressed if i talk about database pods i don't have anything in kubernetes that helps me with this all right then comes the concept of stateful sets all right stateful set is almost similar to your deployment all right in stateful set you also define the number of replicas in deployment you also mention the number of replicas now i am going to tell you the basic difference between these two if you create a deployment if you create a deployment all the pods comes online at the same time in deployment you ask five replicas all the five replicas will be coming online at the same time but if i talk about a deployment uh, sorry stateful set that is not the case in stateful set what happens first your first pod comes online once it is running then your second pod will be coming online after that third pod after that fourth pod after that fifth pod one pod at a time comes online okay so stateful set whenever you create a stateful set one pod will come at a time next thing the naming convention difference the naming convention in deployment it is always alpha numeric string some gibberish string at the end right but if we talk about stateful set the naming convention is defined properly all right the first pod will be addressed as pod 0 second pod will be addressed as pod 1 third will be pod 2 pod 4 and pod 5 this is the naming convention is going to be there if you create a stateful set okay that is not present in the deployment it is always some alpha numeric gibberish string okay 
two difference discussed one more difference all right consider in a deployment if one pod goes down another pod will take its place all right again no updates are going to be there and there is no specific order as well all right in a uh, deployment we have seen all the pods are equally capable of serving the request and it can go round robin the user can connect to any pod in deployment but in database uh, stateful sets in stateful set if one pod goes down consider pod 03 was brought down all right so it is not like it will take another place or something like that all right all the pods will remain in the same order if pod 03 went down pod 03 only will take its place okay naming convention is also going to retained all right and it will take its own place as well all right so this is the difference another one is whenever the user connects there can be two operations right in a database pod you can either write or you can either read all right these two operation can be done if you talk about writing in a stateful set the user always connect with pod 0 okay whenever you want to do the write operation the user always connect to pod 0 that is defined that is the rule all right but if the user do the read operation it can connect to any pod if the read operation is taking place it can connect to any pod that is okay if any write operation is there it will always connect to pod 0 now why is that happening because in a stateful set in a stateful set what happens let me tell you all right so looking at this image you can now understand the pods are connected in a particular order all right consider you did some write operation on pod 0 once the pod 0 have those changes it will make those changes in pod 1 all right once the changes are made in pod 1 the same will be reflected in pod 2 and then it will pass on the changes to pod 4 3 and pod 4 okay now the pods will take the responsibility to make all the pods in a stateful set in sync okay this is how it goes in a stateful set okay now let's see an practical example after that you will be more clear about it all right so team also one important thing to note that it never comes in your examination okay i have really seen the questions with this all right but still i just want to tell you for your own practice really comes it is not like it doesn't come anyways it might come but haven't seen these questions very uh, regularly all right so here you have to go to the controllers All right. Here is a folder called Stateful Sets. All right. If you want to have some uh, description, you have here. Let me take in a simple example of this one. Okay. So first, what I'll do, I'll take the raw format and I'll create both things. I'll create a Stateful Set and I'll create a service also. I will tell you what kind of service it is. Let me connect to the machine first.
this was a cluster kubectl get all let's see if we have anything or not okay just sign it what we have all right that is okay all right so team what i'm going to do i'm going to create a stateful set kubectl create hyphen f okay that is not what i wanted to copy control c kubectl create hyphen f yaml team pay attention kubectl get pods team can you see it is getting created in order db0 db1 db2 db3 db4 and db5 okay first pod was created in this second ago now db6 db7 creating containers all right so team all the pods were created one at a time all right let me show you the definition also i missed that part all right so simply api version kind is always there metadata you have name okay the name of the pods are going to be db under specification i have given eight replicas i have created a service also with this select a match labels redis okay i'm having redis containers here is a template and here is a specification of the container all right so team you can see with the time duration also okay see the age all right you will understand that db0 was created first and db second uh, seven was created last and we have also seen that they are created one at a time kubectl get pods all right 88 seconds ago then 80 seconds ago 73 70 68 66 62 and 60 one pod was created at a time now what will happen if i make any changes if i want to update any thing in my database pod the change will be made to database 0 first okay just like it was created in the same way the way it was created in the same way it will pass on first the changes will be written to db0 then db1 will catch those changes then db2 then db3 and in the same order okay one pod will be updated at a time and in the same order now as i told you if i'm going to delete one pod another pod will be created at the same place it will not take any other place all right so it's not like if db04 was deleted or terminated so what will happen the order will change and another pod will take the last place no that is not the case it will take its own place always kubectl delete pod and db-4 for say if i'm deleting all right i deleted that kubectl get pods all right you can see that db04 was again created 3 seconds ago all right so it always take the same place it never mess up with the order okay because in stateful set order is very important that is only what matters actually all right so team if i want to access my database pods in a stateful uh, stateful set all right can i use a normal service like your node port and uh, cluster ip no that is not the case all right why because what i told you here you can have either a write operation and you can either have a read operation all right in read operation what will happen you can connect to any pod but with write operation you will connect always with the main pod okay db0 you will always get connected to db0 <laughs> all right so team with a normal service you can say if i'm using node port we have seen the nature of node port what happens whenever you hit the browser all right sometime it goes to port 5 sometime it goes to port 10 sometime it goes to port 2 there is no order whatsoever all right so we need some different service that will help us achieve the right operation because it always has to be done on db0 all right 
for that purpose we create a service that we call headless service okay that is why stateful sets and headless services are always called together okay they are always called together now let, let's see the definition of this okay so as for your understanding headless service is no different but it just solves the purpose of writing always to the db0 all right because you know write operation is still the same you can read from any of the pod but write operation will be done on only pod 0 that can be achieved with headless service and this is not the third type or fourth type i'll tell you the difference what you can do with the service that will it will make as a headless service all right you can see api version is v1 we have service called a uh, kind as service you have the metadata all right <clears throat> this is the name of the service under specification you give the port number where to expose all right then you mention that cluster ip all right you mentioned that cluster ip should be none okay you should get cluster ip equals to none whenever you define this it means that you are defining a headless service okay headless service you can consider as it doesn't have the head all right it means it doesn't have the ip so whenever you create a headless service this is the one that is going to identify that it is a headless service or it is a normal service let me show you here as well kubectl get svc <laughs> okay so team if you do remember from my previous classes if you create the cluster ip you always get an ip right whenever you create a node port service you again get the cluster ip all right if you remember from the last class when either you create cluster ip or either you create node port always ip is always assigned okay ip is always assigned but how to create a stateful uh, stateless service uh, sorry headless service in headless service you have to mention cluster ip equals to none then kubernetes is going to understand okay he wants to create a headless service all right so team this is the concept of stateful set and your stateful set and headless service is it clear to all of you any doubts any question with this in stateful set consider a four cluster application not a db okay four cluster application all three are running while and while scaling down how will i ensure that the pod which goes down is not processing any request rishab that is i think we have discussed in previous classes okay i think not in this class sorry my bad all right so uh, rishab you are asking if you are uh, talking about some application pod and you have down scaled so what is going to happen all right in that case see kubernetes has a basic nature it waits for 30 second to gracefully bring down a pod okay whenever you delete a pod kubernetes try to gracefully shut it down for after waiting of 30 seconds if it was not able to gracefully shut down after 30 seconds it forcefully shut it down so what happened during that 30 seconds during that 30 seconds no new connections are made that is one thing consider if a previous connection is already made for more than 30 seconds it will be terminated abruptly all right so what will happen for a, a second of time you will see that your application is not available so what you usually do in that case you hit the refresh button and once you hit the refresh button your application is always visible all right so whenever you hit the refresh button your request will go to some available pod all right that is what happened when you create the application deployment that is the case Gauri, you are asking how we uh, how we can we access the database when we don't have the IP. Gaurav, we never use the IP exactly. All right. If you remember, then uh, if we are using node port, all right, we use a node port number. We have never used the IP address. IP address is used for the internal communication. If you use cluster IP, then it is for the internal communication. Again, you never define the IP anywhere. 
all right so ips are never used if you use a service we never use it all right so that is for internal purpose so you don't have to give no cluster ip so that community understand it is headless so it has to solve the purpose of writing to the main pod and then it will write to the different pod so if you are going to describe it let me describe it also cube ctl describe svc redis all right you can see you still have the endpoints it is not like that you don't have the endpoints all right it means this server will divert the traffic to your pods all right it will divert the traffic it does have the endpoint it doesn't have its own ip that is the only thing and that is how it is defined as a headless service otherwise it will fulfill the purpose with which it is created ashok you are asking what is the use of headless service okay that is what i started with all right this is the most basic definition i gave earlier <clears throat> so ashok the thing is if you want to achieve this it is something different all right you want if you do the right operation it should always get connected to db0 all right and if you want to do the right operation it should connect to any pod just like what happens in deployment all right but you want to achieve this that if you are doing the right operation it should be done only on db0 all right that can be achieved with a service called headless service okay that is how kubernetes has defined it that it is called a headless service headless service will allow you to do the right operation on db0 only and do the read operation from any other pod all right and how to identify if a service is headless or not you will assign cluster ip equals to none okay whenever you define cluster ip equals to none it means you will have a headless service it will not contain its own ip address and it will solve the purpose of your headless service it means writing only on pod 0 and not writing on any other pod but if it is read it can do from any pod all right so that is the use of headless service okay sure kushagru i can do that cube ctl get pods hyphen o wide all right here it is you want to verify the uh, port num uh, ip addresses you can see that okay 10.36.04, 10.36.04, 10.36.05, All right, and you can see plus five more. It means you have all of them. All right, endpoints are not uh, listed in order, but you don't have to worry about it. It will always go to DB zero itself. Okay, so many questions. All right, Arjun, can you please repeat why headless service is created here? Is it just to? Uh, it is just so that first pod has right capability. Arjun, absolutely. Okay, because when you connect to some pod, service plays an important role. Sarat, I just gave you an example of volume just to make you understand. All right, otherwise it has no relation with volumes or something. All right, that is what I just wanted to explain you. Otherwise, it is not related to volumes in any way. Uh, sort of, you are asking if there is chance of database down. So, can we take the backup? Sort of, we are having multiple replicas here. Okay, so what happens if you create a database? you have a data card set up also okay so that you have real time replication and that is your backup strategy if your primary goes down you will connect to the secondary one all right same thing we are having here we are having seven replicas all right we are having seven replicas one may get down two may get down not all the seven all right so this is itself a backup strategy okay we don't want to have any other backup strategy we always have seven replicas right here 
so we will always have some backup got of uh, maybe a basic question but suppose we have an application that wants to connect to the redis db using connection string we need to mention uh, in the connection string in the server address got of for that purpose what you can do it depends on what kind of database you are using all right you can, might be using mysql or redis or oracle oracle is not available in the pods but yes mysql and uh, redis is also the one so if you talk about mysql i don't have much experience with redis so you have mysql connection string mysql hyphen h host name hyphen u username hyphen p password all right so that is a connection string so what you can do you can pass on that string all right you can pass on that string to your application pods with the help of config map and secrets okay so that is how you are going to pass your connection string to the application pods in host you can mention the pod ip right or you can use the uh, ip of where your database is running if you are running your database on rds in aws on if you are using your database so it is not important that you always use database pod you might be having your database at the back end with rds services or a stand alone database server all right so that is also the chances so you can pass on those details using config map of secrets to your application pods Pimple, how fast a uh, pod will be in sync for ready uh, reading values? Post any write operation happens, and what about the read and write operation at the same time? All right. So Pimple, you have already seen that pods are very fast. All right. If you do the reboot, it doesn't take even a second, just a fraction of second. Mostly dependent on how heavy your application is, it takes fraction of second. so the write operation is so fast when i created these pods okay when you when i created these pods you can see that out of seven pods out of seven pods eight pods seven pods were created within a minute okay first pod was created 12 minutes ago otherwise if i take minute wise seven uh, six pods eight pods were created in the same minute so it is so fast if you have given multiple replicas they are created in the same minute so same happens even the lesser time it takes to do the write operation it gets in sync just like that much more faster than the creation itself how is it able to identify the record level updates and sync pods in all nodes if uh, or is it deleting and recreating every time when the write operation happens okay anil that is a internal process completely all right so it is like how you are asking that you have a database all right you have a ms sql database you have a rds database any uh, oracle database you are uh, running a command update row row number and like that so now you are asking how the update is happening at the back end all right so this question is just like that so how the replicas is taking the place whatever you executed on db0 once it is done it will be executed on db1 once it is done it will update the db2 all right so it is not going to terminate or recreate it again and again updates will be made in all the pods in order one at a time all right and how it is done it is completely internal process all right any other question any other doubt with stateful set and services siddharth you mentioned uh, that in case of mysql you can give uh, pod zero host name as a connection string so assuming it is retaining the ip along with the name okay so that that is the example i gave on the higher level as i told you that you might be having your database at the back end you might be using your mysql database as your 
RDS services or a standalone database. Okay, that is how I gave you. <clears throat> All right. So yes, if you want to give that also, you can give. If you can use the service also, you can use service also in the connection string. You can pass on the service name. All right. So service name will be used. All right, and it will divert. It will first write it down on DB zero, then it will write it down on DB one, and in the same order. Anil, you are asking, does it have any limitation of numbers of concurrent operation? Anil, practically no. All right. it always get dependent on the configuration that you have for your node and your pods all right it all comes back to your cpu utilization and ram utilization if they are struggling then your write operation or concurrent operation will struggle as well if your ram and cpu cores are not struggling you won't have any struggle with the number of concurrent processes okay so it always bring down to the cpu and ram utilization All right, so team, this was supposed to be a small topic. <laughs> All right, and we have already given eighty-five minutes to this. Is it possible to show a little demo to connect ports using headless service? One write and one read, maybe. Okay, so that uh, so that is going to take time. All right, so we have seen that how it works. All right, so all the read write operation. are done by the database admins if you have your application your application will be accessed by the third party users is if you are talking about the kubernetes administration all right you just have to create the services and pass it on to the application team all right you don't actually do the read and write operations so as a kubernetes administrator you don't have to worry about that also in the examination purpose as we are here for ck certified kubernetes administrator it doesn't ask you to do the update like this all right so uh, also sidhat we have to cover a lot of content as well now in two days all right so i hope you understand that can you please let us know we will be able uh, to see the recordings of today's and tomorrow's class yes fenny all the things will remain the same okay the 9th class and 10th class will behave in the same manner how it worked in the last eight classes you will get all the recordings you will get all the details just like that no difference all right so team uh, let's quickly move to the next topic all right now we are going to come to the security concept how your security works and how you can secure your kubernetes cluster all right first thing first we have authentication and authorization so team how many of you know the difference between authentication and authorization tell me what is the difference between authentication and authorization how they are differ with each other no one Okay, Siddharth, uh, uh, got it. Masumi, okay. Arjun, all right. Girish, okay. Siddharth. So, got up. What you have defined? What? Okay, you have given two uh, words. So, which is authentication and what is authorization? a 
अर्जुन सुमित ओके जॉयदीप राहुल वसोमी और ब्रिज प्रसाद राहुल अंकुर सुमित ओके सो मेनी ऑफ यू ओके सो टीम ऑल ऑफ यू हैव गिवन द राइट आंसर ऑलमोस्ट टू सम एक्सटेंट और इट so team as you have already said i am going to write it down the same all right what is authentication authentication asks you who are you okay who are you so it means it is going to check that if you are supposed to be here or not all right or simply it asks for your username and it asks for your passwords all right it authenticates you okay it allows you it checks you who are you you are supposed to be here or not or what is your username and password that comes under authentication all right for example if i take a layman example let's take an example of this webinar all only okay you are here on this webinar i am also here in this webinar all right because we are the authentic user we have been authenticated all right you went to your lms portal from the lms portal you logged in with username and password then you were authenticated and then you were allowed to be in this session that is why no other person is there in this session right only we are here anybody cannot be here in this room all right so that is authentic authentication you can authenticate it all right you can allow and not allow it so first is your authentication now what is your authorization authorization defines what you can do okay what you can do all right so classic example is a role based access control okay i hope most of you know about what is a role based access control we define what user can do what all right we'll discuss about our back also in details in today's class all right but i'm just giving a one word right now role based access control we define that this user should be allowed to do this all right so taking the same example that we have here all right <clears throat> i am also in this webinar you are also in this webinar it means we all are authentic user okay we have done the authentication that is done now let's talk about the authorization so the thing is i am the trainer all right uh, so i do have some different privileges than you have all right i have the power to mute you and unmute you you can also unmute yourself but you cannot unmute me or mute me all right so i have some greater authorizations i can mute you people i can unmute you people all right i can see all of your message you cannot see all other messages right i can see name of all the candidates you cannot see the name of other candidates all right so that comes under authorization i have higher authority and then you people all right so authorization gives you that what you can do exactly okay i am here sitting doing more, more things with this webinar tool then you can do so it is all comes down to authorization all right so team this is your authentication and authorization i hope you understand that okay so how you can do the authentication how many ways are there to do the authentication all right we are going to understand about that a very basic one you have already seen okay you can have username and password all right that is one way another way uh, say you want to do it with username and token okay you can generate token and you can use that token all right next uh, you can use certificates as well certificates all right you can do the authentication using certificates as well okay and last is you can use service accounts okay with all this what you can do you can do the authentication of a particular user all right so understanding about all of them okay understanding about all of them <clears throat> if we talk about the kubernetes in kubernetes we
डोंट यूज द यूजर नेम एंड पासवर्ड एंड यूजर नेम एंड टोकन फॉर ऑथराइजेशन ऑथेंटिकेशन और राइट इन क्यूबिनिटीज वी डोंट यूज दीज टू मैनर we can use that but it is not never suggested and it is never comes in your examination also because humanities understand that we always use other ways we use server certificates and we use service accounts kubernetes it itself doesn't suggest you to use username password and tokens but it has given the functionality but they always stand by your certificates and service account all right so we are going to understand how your certificates works and how your service account works all right so certificates are uh, consider if we understand about certificates certificates are nothing it is a two way communication with which you get some public key and private key and you are get authenticated user all right so uh, i will try to explain you certificates in depth so that you can understand it and never forget about it all right so this is the important part i'll let you know in detail from the scratch all right i know security concepts are little boring and mundane i'll try to make it as fun as possible and make you understand the core concepts all right consider team if uh, i go some uh, to banking uh websites all right consider i visit this website all right this is a icic bank website all right but how do you know that this is a authentic website okay you simply come here and you do your login details and you just log into your bank account all right but do you realize that this is a official website this is the authentic website all right how do you know about that all right for that purpose we need certification author authentication all right so if you see that whenever you open some official website okay some authentic website you always get this lock button all right what does it give you connection is secure your information for example is private when you are in this website all right and you can see that certificate is valid cookies are ready in use you don't have to worry about it you can see that certificate is valid all right so for the authentic website you will see this message that certificate is valid all right considered you have lms portal all right in lms portal also you can see that certificate it is valid all right and you can see the certificate is issued by godaddy all right you can see it right here similarly you can see in the uh, icic bank website as well valid certificate it has been issued by dg cert all right so team these are the certificates that allows you the secure connection and how it is run at the back end i am going to explain you that all right so team pay attention all right i'll get you all the details from scratch consider this is my web browser all right this is my web browser and this is where your icic bank application is running this is your icic bank application server all right so what you do you connect to this web server via internet right that is what happens you type www.icicbank.com all right your request went to this server okay and you get the response this is your browser and this is your server all right so team now what happens if you use http website okay if you use http website so what happens that all the details that you pass to this server are in plain text all right so if i am going to log into this website all right i will pass my username i will pass my password also okay but if this website is not secure if it is http is following http protocol all right my username and password will be transferred to the server in plain text all right so that is risky for me why because if some intruder or some hacker wants to hack when i am transferring the details 
it can hack in and it can get the my username and password details so he can also go to the website and use my account okay he can get all the details about my account so that is why we never use http okay i have already written http as whenever you use http website that is following http protocol it means all the details that you are transferring to the server will be given in the plain text and that is not what we want okay so that is why we always follow http protocol and http protocol always follow your two way handshake all right and it provide ssl certificate authentication as well all right how http connections are actually established let's try to understand about that so team uh, whenever you give some request to the website okay whenever you give uh, the server some request okay that i want to log in all right you give some details you try to access this server when i did www.icic.com okay a request went to that server when that server saw that a request is coming from a browser okay it will transfer its certificate to this browser certificate to this browser okay the certificate to this browser will be transferred that is why i can see all the details here all right i can see all the certificate details how i am seeing this because the server has responded to my request server has responded to my browser with the certificate all right along with the certificate along with the certificate it has also transferred its public key okay it has also transferred it a public key okay what is the purpose of public key public key allows you to transfer encrypted data to the server certificate is used for the authentication that my browser now trust this website okay that we have seen but now i am going to give my username and password details here right i want to give my username and password details they should also not get transferred in the plain text because android can hack it for that purpose your server shares a public key to the browser all right now the browser is going to send the data encrypted with public key all right now the data will be transferred using public key encryption okay now server has to decrypt it how the server is going to decrypt it server is going to have a private key that will be associated with the public key okay encryption is done by the public key that was provided by the server now server got the encrypted data all right now server has its own private key okay and that private key only decrypt the data consider that you are transferring your data using public key your data is encrypted your intruder has hacked and it has taken those details okay that what username and password you are transferring either in even in the encrypted way it will try to hack it but how he is going to decrypt it how it is going to find it out what exactly the string is he should have the private key if the user doesn't have the private key he will not be able to decrypt the data all right so once the connection is established now i am going to log in i will pass on my details those details will be transferred to the server with the encryption of public key that i have received along with the details of the certificate and at the server level it is going to decrypt it and then they are going to authenticate me and provide the authorization to access my own account all right now what is your public key and private key what is your public key and private key okay it is always confusing all right it is always confusing so i'll try to make you understand about this what is a public key and what is a private key okay so team consider that public key is not a key public key is a public lock okay uh. i'm just giving you a basic examples for your understanding consider that your public key is not a public key it is a public lock all right and you can open that public lock using private key 
all right so consider team uh, again a uh, basic layman example consider i am going somewhere all right i live in my house alone and i am going somewhere so what i am going to do i am going to lock all right i am going to put a lock uh, at my door all right so once i have left i am going to put a lock at my gate so team that is a public lock <coughs> how it is a public lock anyone who will cross my house will be able to see that lock all right anybody crosses my house he or she will be able to see the lock because that is a public lock anybody can see it anybody who is uh, crossing my house he will see that this a uh, gate is locked and he can see the lock similarly the public key that has been transferred to the browser it will be available to the intruder as well intruder can also have that public key all right you can also see that it is encrypted data it is encrypted using a public key all right so public lock is visible to all of them but can anybody open that lock nobody can unlock it because they don't have the key to open it okay i lock the door so i have the key so nobody can open the house okay? nobody can open the public lock nobody can decrypt the data of public key until and unless they have the private key then okay so if i have put a lock on my gate if i uh, give the private key to one of my friend then he might able to come and open the lock only when i have provided the private key as well otherwise private key is with me nobody can open the lock no nobody can open the public lock only i can okay so team till here it is clear to all of you okay this is the very basics of your certificates certificate connection secure connection ssl connection this is the very core basic of it okay i wanted to explain you it has nothing related to your kubernetes as of now all right because we are going to use certificate i wanted to have a basic understanding how your certificate security work okay that is why i am giving so much time on this all right team please confirm if it is clear to all of you how certificates are transferred how your public key and private key works any question any doubt till now let me know i'll repeat again it is an important part okay so if you are clear next point next point so team your browser is authenticating the server based on the certificate right your browser has very uh, verifying the server with the certificate all right then the server is authenticating the browser using public key and private key right but consider that intruder is sitting right here okay what he did he created a fake certificate and it provided that fake certificate to me that can be a possibility intruder can sit right here in between and it will uh, give me the fake certificate how i am going to verify that this certificate is authentic or not okay because i am doing it with the certification only if the certificate is not valid how i am going to justify it right in the same way if i take a layman example if i am going to uh, some organization for the interviews all right they are going to ask me for my degrees all right they are going to ask me my graduation and post graduation degree all right so what i can do i can print my own degree also right i can print my own a degree of graduation and post graduation i can give it to uh, do the uh, hiring to people all right but how they are going to verify that this certificate is valid the degree i am showing them how they are going to make that it is authentic so team how we are going to do that i went to a organization i showed them my degree how they are going to verify if this is a authentic website uh, uh, this is a authentic certificate or degree or not arjun um, to some extent you can say rishab yes kind of
नो अर्जुन नॉट डी एन एस मौसमी एब्सोल्युटली करेक्ट यू गॉट इट अनिल एब्सोल्युटली करेक्ट ओके सो टीम इफ आई हैव प्रिंटेड माय ओन सर्टिफिकेट और आई हैव प्रिंटेड माय ओन डिग्री if i have had degree if i have some certificate it must it must be from some universities or something all right i have done my graduation it must be from some university right so the university has issued me that degree if i have actually gone gone to that repository so there is a authority okay the university is the authority that validates that my certificate is authentic okay so it is the responsibility of the university they give the authenticity that yes this degree is authentic you can trust this all right similarly here also we have something called ca okay we do have something called ca ca is certificate authority certificate authority validates that the certificate that you are receiving is authentic uh, one or not all right ca authorities lies with the browser ca lies with browser all right so so browser have all the little details that if a certificate is coming from this location can i uh, authorize the certificate or not if it is valid or not so all the browsers have their own ca embed certificate authority who can validate that this browser sorry this website with this certificate is authentic one okay it can be trusted so we have ca authority with all the browsers in it all right so team conceptually we have understood about the basics of security with certificates all right as of now we have understood about the basics of security if it is clear to all of you then only we can proceed further Akhil, you ask me what basis CA certificates are issued. CA is a certification authority. It validates it. CA doesn't create its own certificate. It validates the certificates. Okay, so you can consider it as a repository. Okay, in the repository you have details about all the general certificates, <clears throat> and it cross checks from there, and then it is going to verify that yes, this certificate is validated. You can trust this certificate. All right, Akhil. all right so team if you have the understanding of kubernetes cluster uh saurav uh, you are asking certificate authorities approve that this site is verified is that correct saurav uh, i will make a little correction you said certificate authority approves that this site is verified no little correction required certificate authority approves the certificate that comes with the site okay so if i say that uh, this is a certificate with adureka lms portal go daddy okay so what happens ca authority has a ca authority for go daddy secure certificate authority as well we have go daddy certificate authority all right so this website is giving you details that go daddy is a issuer all right so you can it goes at the back end to the go daddy and it verifies is this a genuine website do you have this certificate for this website and then go daddy is going to confirm that yes this is authentic website you can trust this if this website has a certificate from my side i take the responsibility that yes that it is authentic website okay so certificate authority approves a certificate that comes along the website see cross check the uh, namespace provider akhil we are not talking about the namespace right now okay name space has no relation to ca right now
All right, team. So if you have understood, shall I move forward? So I have just uh, written here public lock just for your understanding for the example. Otherwise, it is a public key and it is a private key. All right. How you can identify that if it is a public key or private key? How you can identify that? All right. With the naming convention, you can understand that. All right. So uh, for public key, if I talk about the usual extension of a public key, uh, ends with dot cert. All right. Dot cert you get, or otherwise you get pem. Okay, pem is another extension that you can see behind a public key. All right. And similarly with private key, if I talk about the extension, uh, the extensions are usually dot key, dot key. All right. Or it is like hyphen key dot pem. Okay, if you want to identify by the naming convention, you can understand like this. Usually, the public keys come with the extension dot crt and dot pem, and private key comes with the extension dot key and hyphen key dot pem. All right, that is for the identification purpose. Now, team, let's understand about something called your Kubernetes. All right, now you are towards the end of the session, so I expect you answer this one. All right, let's see how much you prepare for examination. If I connect with my cluster, which components are the uh, which component I get connected to directly? Okay, to which component I got connected directly? Whenever I do kubectl. All of Kushagra, correct. Mosomi, Arjun, Anil, I'm asking to which component it gets connected. Okay, I'm not asking about which node. You run a QCT command on master only. So it always gets connected with master if you're executing that in a master. Rishabh, no, not right. Ankur, correct. Siddharth, correct. Chandra Shekhar, you have not written it properly. Akhil, no, wrong. Edirika Guest, I cannot see your name. Imanshu, correct. All right, so team, most of you have given the right answer. Some of you who haven't, you have to prepare well for exams. Ankita, correct. Okay, so team, if you remember your master node component, you have API server. API server is someone that connects with all the components. Okay, you have etcd. All right, you have scheduler. With scheduler, you have a controller manager. All right, these are your master node components. All right, whenever you execute some command with kubectl, it comes to your API server directly. All right, it always comes to your API server. Okay, that is clear now. All right, so team, I told you all the component inside talk to each other via API server itself. If ETCD wants to talk, it talks to API server. Scheduler wants to talk, it talks to API server. Controller manager wants to talk, it talks to API server. All right, so again, communication is happening inside your cluster also, and we need security there as well. All right, we need security there as well. So they all have their own public key and private key and certificates. Okay. All the components come with your certificates. If you talk about API server, API server has its own public key and private key. Scheduler has its own public key and private key. Same with etcd, same with controller. All the components have their own public key and private key. All right. And when they communicate with each other, they share those keys and have the authentic connection just like that. Okay. Just like this. Consider this is your API server and this is your etcd. Okay, so if they're talking to each other, they will share their public key and they will decrypt the data using private key. So inside your cluster also, whatever the communication is happening, it is also secured by certificate. All right, 
and certificates provide you the highest level of security. Let me show you that right in the cluster. Okay, so this is the Kubernetes cluster on which we are working. All right, you remember the manifest location, etcd Kubernetes. All right, manifest. All right, all your master node components are here only. Right, all your master node components are here only. So consider if I talk about uh, your API server. Let's see the API server definition here. All right, so team, these are the basic details that what is the API version, what is the kind, all right? You have some metadata, all right? You have some labels. You have defined it in the proper namespace, all right? After that, you can see a lot of commands here. All right, you can see a lot of command. API server has the most number of commands. Why? Because it communicates with everyone. All right. So API server always ha also has some IP at the back end. All right. Authorization, you can see it can uh, do the authorization using RBAC. All right. You have client CA file. This is your certificate file, certification authority file. All right. After that, you can see etcd certificate file. It has the certificate file for your etcd. All right, and this is the, uh, sorry, this is the client key for ATCD. Okay, a public key and private key. Same, if it wants to communicate with the Kubelet on worker nodes, it has the keys for that also. All right, proxy is also running as a pod. So if it communicates, again, your keys are in place. All right, so all the components definition you can see. You can see the definition of all the commands. You will see the certificates. Always certificates are used to communicate. And where those certificates are there, go one directory back. There is PKI, okay? Public key repository. Go to this folder. You will see all the keys, all right? You can see that API server has its own public key and private key, right? Kubelet communication with uh, Kubelet uh, component connection with API server, key and certificates are there. All right, for proxy, it also has certificate and keys. Same with proxy and same for ATCD. All right, and ATCD has its own complete repository of your certificates as well. All right, so team, all the certificates are here, right? All the certificates are here. And I told you there is a certification authority as well that validates all the certificates. Okay, so API server is coming with its own, CA, its own certificate all right kubelet is coming with its own certificate all right they have own set of public key and private key they have certificate as well now who is validating those uh, uh, certificates here who is validating the certificates here here what we had we had certification authority similarly in kubernetes cluster also you have certificate authority okay you have the certificate authority that validates that all the certificates with which we are dealing are authentic. We can verify that as well. Okay, CA authority. CA is the one that authorizes all the certificate that they are validated. Okay, Kubernetes has its own inbuilt CA. All right, so team, all the components you can see how they are communicating with each other. How AP server is talking to uh, scheduler, how controller manager is talking to scheduler, how ATCD is talking to scheduler. All right, but how your kubelet is working uh, with API server? All right, so team, this is a question for you. All right, how your kubelet is working, uh, talking to API server? The answers come from the bootstrapping of cluster. When we bootstrap our cluster, if you remember how we did it, you can answer it how kubelet talks to API server. You can simply answer it now. If you remember how we bootstrapped it. Anyone? Siddharth, no. Mosumi, no. Ankur, no. Nobody has answered me correctly. No, Arjun. That is a network. Okay, I'm talking how they are authenticated. Abhinav, absolutely correct. 
Okay, one right answer so far. Okay, Gaurav, so did we ever set up public key and private key for cube serial? Only one right answer team. No Imanshu. Aditya, no. No, not that case. I'm asking what we did in the bootstrapping class. Okay, when we initialized our customer, what we did that time. So that your API server was talking to cube, uh, understanding cube, uh, cube CTL commands. No, Anil. Team, if you remember when we bootstrapped the cluster, we executed some commands, we created some directory and we moved the config file, right? Siddharth, correct. Kushagra, correct. Now you are right. All right. So I told you, remember what we did in the bootstrapping cluster, right? Yes, Imanshu. We moved the config file. Okay, we created the config file. So you remember when we were able to give the commands with kubectl get pods without making the directories and moving the config file. We were getting error. If you remember, connection refused was the error what we were receiving because your API server was not listening to kubectl because kubectl was not authenticated at that time. That is why your API server was not addressing all the requests that was coming from that kubectl. Then what we did, we moved your kube config file. Okay, in the home location, we created your kube config file. dot cube all right we have a config file here let's see what is there in this config file okay so team here you can see there is a api version there are cluster as well all right and see here you can see that certificate authority data okay so this is base 64 encoded value of your certificate all right this is simply your base 64 encoded value of your certificates with the help of this only, he is able to communicate with the API server. All right. This is the IP of your master node. And this is the default port number of your API server. Okay, my bad again and again. All right. So this is the default port number to which your API server listens. And this is your master node IP address. All right. And this is the name of your cluster that is given by default. Uh, by the Kubernetes, okay? Kubernetes, whenever you create a cluster, it gives the default name, all right? Under here, you can see something else as well. All right, here you have the cluster name and here you have the username as well, okay? So the username was never created. We never created that, okay? But whenever you bootstrap the cluster, a default namespace is always created and similarly a default user is also created okay kubernetes admin is the default username is the default user with which you are executing all the commands okay all the commands that we are giving kubectl get nodes kubectl get pods kubectl create kubectl run all the commands that we are executing those commands are getting executed by kubernetes admin user all right so you can create your own users as well okay you can rename your cluster that is all we are going to see today all right but with this he is able to connect with the api server this is the ca authorization details and if you come back a little bit you can see the client certificate data all right with all these certificate details okay this is the certificate data of the user kubernetes admin user whose data is this one Okay, so this certificate of the user called Cube, uh, Kubernetes admin is validated by this certification authority. Okay, and that is why once we had our config file, we were able to communicate with API server. So all the components talk to each other via certificates and the kubectl talks to API server also via certificate. We have some user and we have the certificates for that. Okay, so next thing how we are going to set it up at our own okay what are the steps are going to be to have our own user and have all the certificate generated 
All right. So consider if I want to have a user who wants to talk to API server, like what we have already seen. All right. So first of all, you are going to create a user. All right. How you are going to create a user? For that, first you have to generate the keys. Okay. First you have to generate the public key and private key. Right. If you talk about the server. All right. Whenever the server was provisioned, a public key and private key was generated. Right. So same thing. What I am going to do? I am going to generate the keys for my user. All right. After that, I am going to raise a CSR. All right. What is a CSR? CSR is the certificate signing request. CSR is certificate signing request. Whenever you create a request, whenever you create a request of CSR, then only CA authenticate your certificate. You have your certificate. You have to get it validated from the university where you were studying. All right. The university issued you a degree. All right. But you saw that there is no stamp, there is no validation. Then you will go back to the university. You will say that you have to authorize it. All right. You have to raise the certificate signing request. Then only the university is going to stamp the cert degree so that now it's validated. Similarly, whenever you generate the keys, all right. Whenever you generate the keys, you get it authenticated by CA user. CA. All right. For that purpose, you have to raise the CSR. All right. So once the certificate signing request is there. You have to sign the request also. Who oh, CA has to sign the request as well. Okay, once you do all this, once you do all this, then you will have a user created for yourself. Okay, once you do all these things, then you have your user created, and then your authentication part is done. Okay, then your authentication work is done. Authorization work is still not done. You have a user, and now that user is authentic. Once you generate the keys for the user, you raise the certificate signing request. The CA authority of Kubernetes will validate and sign that request. Then you will have a user to connect to the cluster. But what he can do with the cluster, we'll talk about that in authorization. All right, in role-based access control. All right, but if we set up a uh, Kubernetes on remote machine. It would uh, require some certificate, right? Yes, Kushagra, you will require the certificate as well. All right. So, team, in the first class, I also told you that if you want to uh, bootstrap your cluster, you have two ways. All right. You have two ways. One way is your hard way, and second is your cube ADM way. All right. So, cube ADM is the one that take care, who takes the responsibility of all the certificates. All right. So if I go to etcd and Kubernetes and PKI, all right, you can see so many certificates are there. So many public and private keys are there. Kubeadm takes care of all of this. If you do the hard way, you have to create all the certificates. You have always, you have to create your certificates. You have to get them signed. You have to have some CS authority. All right, you have to do all of this in the hard way. But with Kubeadm, it has done been uh, it has been done automatically. Okay, so team, yes, I know it was a lot of theoretical part. I try to make it as as easy as possible to make you understand. I hope you understand whatever we have covered so far. Anybody has any doubt? Clear to all of you? Yes, no, maybe anything. Okay, few responses. Yes, or no. okay, all right. All right, so team, now I'm going to talk about the authorization first, okay? Then we'll start with the practical lab. Okay. Team, very few responses. Only 
we got five to six responses. We have 40 candidate strength today. Okay, team, so let's get started. All right. One more small concept I want to explain you here and then we'll see everything practically. All right, everything will be done practically afterwards. All right, so team, by all these three steps, okay, by all these three steps, you will get a user created for you, okay? With all these three steps, your user is created now. All right. Out of these, uh, out of these three steps, you have two more steps. All right. You have done the authentication. Now you have to do the authorization. All right. Now you have to do the authorization. And for authorization in Kubernetes, you have something called roles and cluster roles. Okay. You have roles, or you have cluster roles all right and you have roles binding and cluster role binding Alright team, so once you have your user created, now you have to do the authorization and an authorization in Kubernetes can be done using these two ways. You can create a role or you can create a cluster role, alright, and then you bind that role to a user or you bind that cluster role to a user. Alright, so first I'm going to show you a little bit what is a role and cluster role, what is a binding, a core role binding and cluster role binding, alright. So if I go to my node and if you do kubectl API resources, okay, so this is the basic command we have used many times. Resources, all right. And consider now they have, uh, there are two types of resources, right? One which can be namespaced. Namespaced equals to true. All right. So team, the, uh, these are the list which can be placed inside a namespace, all right? If you talk about pods, if you talk about PVC, okay? These are namespace label resources. Demon set, deployment, replica set, stateful set, okay? These all can reside inside a namespace, all right? And there are some resources that cannot reside a names inside a namespace, all right? And those are called cluster label resource, okay? All the false components, are cluster level resource okay so if you talk about namespace itself it is a cluster level resource all right if you talk about nodes this is a cluster level resource if you talk about persistent volumes pvs pvs are namespace pvc are namespace but pv is cluster level resource all right because it can get created on any node all right so team uh, this is the difference between your namespace component and non namespace component cluster level resources and namespace level resources so consider you want to create a role that has privileges that requires privileges that is on namespace level all right consider i want to have some access i want to have some access only on ports i want to see how many ports are there okay i want to see what are the number of deployments are there all right i want to fetch details related to ports and deployment i want to create name uh, pods and deployment i don't want to create any namespace all right in that case in that case we are going to create our role okay because role is always namespace level all right consider if i'm talking about roles so i am talking about namespace level objects all right and if i'm talking about cluster role all right, I'm talking about cluster label resource. All 
all right so let's see the difference what is the difference between these two all right consider i want access uh, on your pods all right or i want access on your as i said deployment all right i want to have access on rc rs all right if i want to have access on these type of objects and these can be namespace so i am going to create a role for it okay i'll have a create i will create a role that will have access on pods deployment rc and rs all right but consider i am a, a kubernetes administrator okay so these access you are going to give to some developers all right just for example you have some developers in your team all right who wants to create some pod and deployments so you will create a role for them all right you will create a role because they should have access only on namespace objects pods deployment services like this all right but cluster uh, level resources consider inside your team you have another kubernetes admin you are also a kubernetes admin and you have another person who is kubernetes admin and you want to give him cluster level resources all right maybe limited than you all right consider you have experience and there is a fresher so you don't want to give complete access on cluster but you want to give some access that is on cluster level all right for example if you want uh, the namespace permission all right that the user should be able to create some namespaces all right or the user should be able to create or see some uh, persistent volumes all right so in that case you are going to create a cluster uh, role okay this is called cluster role all right so a uh, team consider uh, with all these definition okay i have uh, these roles i have pods uh, management deployment management rc and rs uh, management i have created a role here which is named as developer this is the name of my uh, role all right this is the name of my role similarly i have created a role for namespace and persistent volume also and that is a cluster level role so i see uh, say that this is our admin role all right i have created two roles the developer roles have some access on pods deployment rc and rs and we have a admin role admin role has access on namespaces and persistent volume all right now consider uh, a person named ravi all right a person named ravi is in a developer team okay a person named ravi is from a developer team he wants to have access on the roles all right no problem what we can do we can give him access okay the arrow is not coming properly never mind all right so i created a role and i assigned that role to ravi all right so what is happening here this is called role binding this is called a uh, called role binding it means assigning a role assigning a role to a username assigning a role to a username is called role binding similarly consider that i am a kubernetes admin all right i am a kubernetes admin here and i want also some access on the cluster role and i want admin role so i am going to assign a admin role to myself all right and this will be called cluster role binding all right and this is called cluster role binding whenever you create a cluster role and assign it to some username it is called cluster role binding whenever you create some role and you assign that role to some user that is called role binding all right so these three parts are your authentication and these two parts are your authorization all right so team if this is clear to all of you conceptually we are going to see this practically now everything from the scratch we'll start from generating the keys we'll first create a user we'll authenticate that user and then we'll create your cluster role cluster role binding roles role binding and then assign that to the particular user who is authenticated now will provide authorization everything will be seen practically conceptually every question any question any doubt till now okay 
okay great so as i always says there are only two scenarios if you don't have any question you understood everything or you don't understood any, anything so i hope first one was the case that you understand everything all right so team now we are going to do lab on this one all right we'll go to security all right under security you have our back okay so team all the things that you need to do that how to get a normal user are back okay you have a md file for uh, for that here all right how to create a certificate signing request you have here all right so all the things are here in edutica security are back all right and i have made this a little more easier for you all right here is a history file okay all the commands are provided here to create everything from the scratch all right you can simply copy paste the commands and you can understand what is happening all right so i have created all this so that you can simply copy paste the command because the commands are very uh, different here that is why i have everything here all right so first as we have already discussed all right first we are going to have a user and generate the keys for it all right then we'll raise csr and then we'll sign the request first we are going to do this things all right for that purpose first simply i'm going to create a directory here all right i'll just create a simple directory okay under home i have created a prod user all right this is going to be my username all right team so this is going to be my username now onwards and i have placed a certificate folder inside it all right after that i'll go to this folder home prod user search all right as of now there is no content here completely blank all right now you can see that i am generating the keys okay i am generating the certificate with open ssl all right you want to use any other utility you can use it all right but open ssl is also fine all right so what i did i used open ssl to generate my certificate all right to generate my key okay and this is going to be the name of my key and i'm using 2048 bits all right so with this you can create your keys all right let me have it here all right then you list you can see the prod user key is there all right you can cat it also okay so you can see that this is the begin of your private key all right if you see the diagram that i shown you all right first for the authorization i have generated my private key ashok no that is not the port number okay this is not the port number this is your uh, bit encoding all right because you generate your keys they are encoded all right so we have done 2048 bit encoding this is not a port number we are generating the keys right now all right so team first thing is done if we can see generate the keys we have generate the keys now the next part is raise our csr okay certificate signing request all right so team this is the command again with the open ssl so team this is again up to you if you have used a open ssl certificate you have to raise a request with it only if you have used any other ssl certification tool you have to raise accordingly all right so we are using open ssl here so you can see the keywords open ssl request i am just requesting a new with key which key prod user key you will have an input as key prod key and what you will get out you will get a csr okay you will get a certificate signing request all right and this is just a subject okay it contains the details it is optional if you want to give you can give if you don't you can skip it all right it is just providing you the details all right which organization you are from which username you are what is your username to which organization you belong all right so prod user is a username devops is your organization all right so whenever you raise a certificate request all right you ask the authority you give the details okay i am this person i am from so and so university 
all right so you studied from a college and if you went to the university directly that i have my degree you want to sign it so you give details also right that this is my name i'm coming from this college you provide all that details so this is that only so now i am going to open a ssl with this command all right you get a warning that is okay no problem with that that is all right you can see a prod user csr is request raised all right a certificate signing request has been created all right if you want to read the content okay you can have the content in the base encoded format okay so i'll have the base encoded format of this prod user csr okay you can see this is your base encoded string i am going to copy it somewhere all right i'll let you know why i am copying this but let me copy this thing all right so this is my key sorry this is my certificate signing request in base encoded format all right so team now you have to raise a csr as a kubernetes object okay i have just created a file okay i have just created a file as of now certificate signing request has been raised as a file but you have a ca authority of kubernetes itself so you have to create the csr in a uh, kubernetes object kubernetes has a object called csr so you have to raise a csr as an object there not as a file all right so you have to come back and then you'll go to our back directory there is a yaml called certificate signing request all right you can see the kind the kind is certificate signing request so this is a official object of kubernetes this is a api version metadata this is the name of my user all right specs group system authenticated and request this is your base encoded uh, base 64 encoded csr value okay so i have to update this only i'll copy this and i will have it in the notepad all right now i am going to paste it so team you have to copy paste it very carefully okay even a single space can mess it up okay so be very careful be very careful before doing it all right so i have raised uh pasted this base encoded csr file value into csr object of kubernetes let me have this file with me now vi csr dot yaml vi this i'll save this one kubectl create hyphen f csr okay so you can see that certificate signing request of prod user is created all right if i do kubectl get csr okay you can see that prod user has requested a certificate signing request who is a requester a requester kubernetes admin all right so you have to create the user and as a administrator you have to request the certificate signing request it is not the one if uh, consider a developer came to you that he wants to get a user created and he wants to have the user with proper authorization all right so on the behalf of that user as a kubernetes admin you have to raise the csr all right and that's it is why you can see the status is pending as of now all right the status is pending so ca is going to authorize this now sorry authenticated so let's go back to the history file all right so team this is the command with which you approve the csr cube ctl certificate approve prod csr okay sorry you have to change the name this is not the prod you have to use the name itself prod user 
this is the name of your CSR. Okay, now you can see certificate signing request is approved. All right, now it is approved. See, the status has changed for prod user. It is approved and it is issued. It is approved and it is issued. So what we have done so far, we have generated the keys, we have raised the CSR and the certificate signing request has also signed by Kubernetes itself. All right, so your user has been created. Now you are authentic to give any commands from this user. All right, we are going to use context for that later on. Okay, we'll see that later on. But just if you want to try some command with this user, okay, if you want to try some command with this user, from here only you can say kubectl get notes. All right, kubectl get notes uh, with as user. All right. Hyphen hyphen as prod user. Mm, right, right. Okay. So team, you see that you get an error. Okay, error from the server. Notes is forbidden for user, prod user. Prod user cannot list the resource node in API group as a cluster scope. All right. So team, what have you seen? Your user is created. Okay, your user is created. It means authorization is done, but sorry, authentication is done, but you haven't set the authorization. All right. You have created the user, but you have not defined what this user can do. Okay. You haven't given that also. So now once the user is created, we are going to see how we can provide your access accordingly. All right. So team, I have created the CSR using a YAML file. Okay, I have created the CSR using a uh, YAML file. If you want to create, you can uh, sign the request like this only. This generate a cert file. All right, so time, uh, team, now I'm going to create a role. Okay, kubectl create a role and this is your role name. Okay, this is your role name. So if you're talking about roles, you have to remember that you are taking talking about namespace level resources all right so what you can give you can give verbs that i can get i can list it i can watch it and i can create it all right i get access to get list watch and create what resources i can create pods i can watch pods i can list pod i can get pods similar with services as well i can list the uh, services i can list uh, watch the services and get the service and get the services okay you give that in resources for which namespace you're talking about now we are talking about namespace level resource so definitely we have to specify the namespace as well so as of now what i'm doing i'm just doing it for the default namespace all right so by taking this i'm going to create a role okay you can see a role is created kubectl get roles all right a role is created you can define describe it kubectl describe a role all right so you can see what are the resources and what are the <clears throat> features you have to do okay you have access to what resources you have access to services requests service all right what you can do you can get a list and watch and create all right, so this is about the details. Your role is created. Consider now you want to have uh, the YAML. All right, I created it from the command line, but consider I want to have it from the YAML. Okay, so I think Rahul, you asked about the template generation. So again, I'm showing you that also. Okay, dry run equals to blind. All right, and then hyphen O YAML. All right, so team, you can see how you are going to define it. This is your API so API version. Then you have kind metadata. You can see the name and the namespace you have to give. What are the rules? In rules, you can see resources. You have the access to resources called ports and services. And what you can do, you can get list, watch, and all this. All right, so team, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to create a deployment. All right, let's try that. 
kubectl create deployment dev test all right hyphen hyphen image image nginx <clears throat> all right so your deployment is created if i do kubectl get pods and kubectl get nodes sorry not nodes uh deploy okay so as a normal user as a kubernetes admin user you can definitely see all this but consider i want to see this using prod user kubectl get deploy hyphen hyphen as prod hyphen user okay so team as a prod user you are forbidden okay you are forbidden you cannot see the details of a deployment if i do same as prod user but in place of deployment i am listing the pods okay why it is not authenticated it should be done team right it should be done anybody can tell me why it is not happening absolutely mosami kushagra joydeep gorav absolutely correct no anil no that's not the case all right team i haven't given the role to the user as of now all right i have created the role i haven't created the role binding okay first i have to do the role binding i have to give this role to this user then only this user will have this role all right so you have done the role you have to do the role binding as well okay now i am creating a role binding cube ctl create role binding this is the name of the role binding whom to whom you are binding this role you are uh, binding this role to prod user which role prod admin all right you have to execute this as well all right now your role binding is created okay now your role binding is created so now let's try those commands again cube ctl get deploy again you are forbidden cube ctl get pods so team now you have the role binded to the user called prod user now you can get the rest earlier you were not able to right because creation a role a creation of role is not enough you have to do the role binding as well all right so team this is how you have created the role and role binding right this is how you have created the role and role binding all right so for now what i am going to do i am going to delete it all right also if you want to see other namespace objects you can see all right you can get the pods from default namespace but if you want to try to get the cube system okay cube ctl hyphen n cube system get pods as prod user forbidden why because you had access given only on default namespace if you list the pod of cube system you won't be able to see that all right so team we understood about the role and role binding now i want to show you the cluster role and cluster role binding if you don't want to get confused for that purpose i am deleting the role and role binding i have just created all right because i am going to assign the assign the cluster role to the same user that is why i have deleted your role and role binding all right so team whenever we talk about cluster role some of the cluster roles are already created all right when i did cube ctl get roles i had only one role which i created but if i do with cube ctl get cluster roles okay you can see so many cluster roles are already provided by kubernetes all right so team just hold on for few more minutes okay once we are done with the cluster role and uh, cluster role binding then i'll take your question all right so some of the default cluster roles are already created some is your view operation 
all right so that you can see all the cluster level resources you cannot modify it but you can view it all right so i am going to use this one only i'm not going to create a row cluster role like i created the role i'm just going to use a normal one all right if you want to describe a role you can do also all right we have already seen how to describe a role now i am creating a role binding cube ctl create cluster role binding okay the name of the cluster role binding will be abcd all right to which user i want to assign prod user which cluster role i am just assigning the view permission all right he can see the cluster level resources but he cannot create or modify anything cube ctl create cluster cluster role binding abcd to which user prod user and the cluster role okay your cluster role is created all right now if you want to get the details you can get the details of all the name spaces all right you can see this prometheus grafana matrix server default name space cube system name space monitoring name space prod name space all right you get the details from all the name spaces about all the objects why it is permitting you because you have the cluster role to view anything all right you can view any name space content but can i create anything in any name space all right so let me try that i want to create a nginx pod 1 in cube system forbidden prod user cannot create resource pods in api group in the name space of cube system cube system i cannot create any object all right let me try to create in the default one as prod user again forbidden because i have just a cluster role that allows me to view the resources i have no permission to create any object even in the default name space so if i execute all these command with the prod user the role binded to that user matters a lot all right so team we have seen all of this all right we have seen all of this all right any doubts till this point of time all right we have understood how to generate keys how to raise a csr and how to sign it all right then we have also seen how to create a role cluster role is also going to get created in the same manner how we are going to bind the roles and cluster roles all right so we are at this point if anybody has any question to whatever i have told you let me know i'll explain again can we bind a system user like instead of using as prod user we just name a system user assign a role got a yes absolutely okay the username is just a keyword for identification all right you can see the prod user i haven't created the user on the os level or anywhere all right you can give abcd you can give your name you can give gorav you can give shiv that is no problem it is just a string username is just a string you can have it the way you want how to restrict someone to use a particular user only kushagra i didn't get it you want to restrict a user for a particular user itself how it does that work i'm not sure if you want uh, if you're trying to say that i have used as hyphen prod user i can create another user and i can give hyphen hyphen another user all right if you're talking about that i'm going to uh, come on that part right now all right once you have understood all this how to use these users actually okay that is the next part i am coming to that is the next part i am coming to how these users are getting used actually that is the next part i am coming to how these users are getting used actually Ashok, you are saying uh, how can I check uh, what are the users are binding to specific role? Okay, uh, so Ashok, you have cluster role and roles. We have already listed that. All right. Similarly, roles binding and cluster role binding are also an object of Kubernetes. You can describe them also. Okay, Kube Ctl. 
get or uh, let me have the object name from here role binding I have just deleted it so I might not have that let me have the cluster role binding cube CTL get cluster role binding okay you can see this many of cluster role binding are there already in place all right but this is the one which I created right so you can see that ABCD cluster role binding is there all right and this was created four minutes ago if you are going to describe it you can describe it so this is the cluster role binding and what are the role you have it is mentioned here and you can describe this also cube CTL describe in just a minute describe cluster role binding a B C D all right this is the cluster uh, role binding all right and to which URL it is assigned this is how you can check it out all right so team any other question till now any other doubt to the whatever we have covered team quick yes from all of you if you do understand if not do let me know I will repeat if I give access to someone to the master node and they can use an executive command what is the purpose of having the functionality done Kushagra yes that is the case okay so you never give access to the master node to any user okay why we are creating users because I want to access it from some third place I don't want to give access to my master node that is what I'm going to show you later Himanshu how to see which user has deployed which pod instead cluster if they have many users with the same role all right Himanshu for that purpose you have to uh, manage some other kind of monitoring all right but if you are going to describe that you can describe uh, the Bots, all right so let me show you that kubectl get bots or let me get the deploy first I hope its definition is going to the shortest one kubectl describe deploy dev test Names letter uh, rolling update. Okay, that is a part of security context. Okay, so I will tell you that later on. Okay, so I will answer your this question also. Okay, how to find out which user created what? Okay, for that purpose, you have to understand the security context. Sorry, not security context, uh, service account. All right, we'll see how token also work. Tokens are also there in Kubernetes. All right, so I can answer that question a little bit later. So Himanshu, I guess that is okay with you. Kushagra, I'll tell you now, okay? Have some patience, okay? I'm asking you the questions from the content I have covered, okay? I'm coming to that part, how to execute the commands from another node. Arjun, uh, okay, you want a high level reputation, all right. How we can target user of specific nodes and pods? Anil, as I just requested all of you, please ask the question from the content that I have covered so far. Okay, because I am going to show you everything. Once it is clear, okay, you are asking advanced questions that, yes, you have understood whatever I have taught. Now, but how I am going to use it? These are your questions. So I will show you that. But whatever I explain, if that is clear to you, then only I'm going to move forward. All right. Okay, so Arjun, a quick repeat for uh, you. All right. We have already seen that we uh, need to have a user and we need to have some RBAC. 
all right our purpose was to have authentication and authorization both so to have the authentication to have a authentication you have to have a user all right you have to generate the keys for that user once the certificate is generated all right your certificate needs to be get uh, get signed by someone also that is your certificate authority all right and certificate authority we are using here is of the official kubernetes itself one okay so we can raise a csr all right we will have a csr file then we are going to have base encoded format of that csr file and we are going to place that in an object called csr of kubernetes itself okay kubernetes has its own object called uh, certificate signing request so you have to create a yaml for that and there you are going to have base encoded csr file value all right after that you have created sr csr your uh, certificate signing request is raised now your kubernetes has to sign that request once these all tasks are done once all this task is done it means your user is created your authentication is done now you have to give the authorization in kubernetes you have two ways of giving the authentic authorization you can create roles if you want to give permission to a specific namespace but if you want to give access on the cluster level resource you have to use cluster roles if to a particular role uh, namespace you use roles all right so if roles are there you have to do role binding if you have cluster role you have to do the cluster role binding it's not like you have created a cluster role and you are doing role binding that is not possible all right so team if this is clear to all of you we are going to move forward a little bit okay if it is clear to all of you we are going to move a little forward now all right so team this is part is done now as i told you you have your kubernetes admin as a main user all right we have already seen that in the kube config file all right we have another way to see that also kube ctl config view okay this is also there in the repository so you don't have to worry about it all right kube ctl config all right as of now what i have done kube ctl config view that is what i am doing all right so team here you get all the details in a yaml format all right so team what is the name of your cluster it is kubernetes all right which user you are using kubernetes admin all right and then with the name of the cluster and with the name of the user collectively they are called as context <coughs> okay collectively they are called as context username at the rate cluster name collectively they are called context so what is a context context just allow you to connect to a particular node <coughs> okay so if anybody have uh, anybody of you have connected to some databases okay so i have worked on uh, oracle databases and mysql databases so just to make you understand about that i can tell you in uh, oracle database if somebody of you has work so how is your connection string is sql plus then you give the username at the rate uh, sorry slash password at the rate database name all right in mysql you have hyphen h host name then you give a uh, hyphen u username and hyphen p for password all right in kubernetes you give the username and at the rate cluster name because we don't use password so you can don't need to give the slash you are using certificates that is why username at the rate cluster level cluster name all right so context defines context wow. defines that which user is connecting to which cluster all right and you get the details that this is the current one you can have multiple contexts also all right so kubernetes admin at the rate kubernetes is connecting to this one all right so team now the next part is consider due to security reason like we are already discussing about the securities in kubernetes i don't want anybody to access my 
work on uh, master node all right kapil uh, i showed you the command for that also all right let me show you again all right when you do the uh, cube ctl get uh, uh, csr all right you get the status if it is approved if it is issued if it is expired you get all the details all right so team please hold on for your question okay i'll ask you uh, to ask question then uh, post your question all right so because of flow breaks all right so team now you want you don't want anybody to access your master node directly all right you don't want anybody to access your master node directly so what you want to do you want to have a jump server all right so i am creating a jump server okay a complete blank vanilla machine all right so what you want you don't want anybody to access your master node you want to have a jump server from where the user will connect to the master node all right you don't want access given to anybody for your master node so this is what i'm going to do now i am creating a clearly blank machine all right a small one will also work change this one to ubuntu 18 select allow full access to all cloud apis allow http access okay nothing new you have already seen that in the first class all right so team if you understand all the concept till now you understand that your cube uh, ctl utility is required to use your cluster all right all right and cube ctl has some config file with that config file i can access my kubernetes uh, cluster all right so it is all dependent on your config file because config file uh, config file has all the details about your cluster it has the certificates it has everything all right so what i just need i need a config file so that i can connect from another node as well okay i can connect from another node as well let's see how we can do that okay so you see that this machine i just created right in front of you so it doesn't have anything all right what i am going to do i am going to place the cube config file here also all right at the home location again i am going to create a directory mkdir dot cube cd dot cube just like I have on the master node. Cat config. Okay, this is my complete file. Again, you have to be very careful by copy pasting it. All right, just to understand, you have. api version all right you have mentioned the cluster you have the cluster certificate all right here you have the name of the cluster all right this is the ip address of your master and this is the api server node uh, port number you have the cluster name all right you have the username you have the context you have the current context okay all the details are here the username certificates are also so you do have everything with you okay you do have everything with you i am going to create same file here vi config so team question for you i have created this config file if i do cube ctl get pods will i able to get the outputs from here cube admin is a user created it has the admin <coughs> level privileges I have placed its own config file in this machine. Will I get the output here? If yes, why? If no, why? Got a user is already created. Okay, in this config file, I have placed the detail about the user, about his own certificate. So we have the authentication, we have the authorization. Kushagra certificates are present in the config file. You have base encoded value of certificates. Okay, so certificates are also present. Siddharth, 
you got it okay siddharth got the right answer anybody else arjun said yes okay prempal again right answer gorov i don't need cubelet mausami absolutely correct okay so team let's try it's not working it is saying that snap cube ctl first okay so definitely if you are running some cube ctl command you should have that client also okay so let's download that also i am not going to install anything i am not even going to install docker or something i am simply going to install your cube ctl install all right i'm just going to update the repository and i'm going to install only your uh cube ctl okay first let me have the dependencies first just updating it all right i'm just installing cube ctl no other component at all all right team now tell me i do have cube ctl installed will it work now cube ctl get nodes will it work now mausami prempal right enter mapping values uh, line 2 there is some error in the line 2 let's check it out one minute cube ctl get nodes yeah some error is at line 2 vi config okay i didn't get the complete output let me have the cube config file once again all right yeah it is a issue with the browser uh, when you get the terminal from the google cloud you cannot copy everything just like that okay so till here i have copied let me paste everything here from kind to this last this part all right so this is done now let's see if it is working fine or not all right done team it is working cube ctl get notes all right so team now you can connect to your master cluster from a testing machine okay you can connect to a cluster from a testing machine you don't have to give the access to your master node cube ctl get nodes all right cube ctl get pods all right you can get all the details from your testing node all right so team now you can see that i have created a context i have created a config file all right consider from this testing machine only okay i want to connect to my production cluster i want to connect to my uh, testing cluster and production cluster and qa cluster and pre prod cluster okay can i put multiple config file at this location so that i can connect with all the clusters 
Is it possible? Can I create multiple config files here? Premal, no, wrong answer. Also, me, yes, you are right. Arjun, okay, you think so? Kushagra, absolutely correct. Anil, you are also right. Absolutely correct. So, team, if you are going to create multiple config files. Okay, if you are create, going to create multiple config files, how you are going to define uh, which config file you want to use? All right, whenever you give QCTL command, how it is going to identify that which config file they have to follow? Okay, so we don't create multiple config files. Okay, we always use only one config file. What we can do is we can create multiple context. Okay, I just told you about the context, how context works. All right under context you can see it is a list okay it is a list you can have multiple contexts you can give multiple cluster name you can give multiple username as well all right so if i'll go here i can create multiple username and multiple cluster all right consider let me show you this uh, diagrammatically all right Consider team, this is your master, uh, this is your production cluster, this is your testing cluster, this is your development cluster. You have three Kubernetes cluster. This is your prod, this is your dev, and this is your test. You have three cluster. Now, you have multiple users as well. Uh, just a minute, please. Yeah, sorry. Consider you have multiple users as well. All right. You have Shub, all right. You have uh, Ravi, all right. You have Naresh, okay. You have multiple users as well. All users have their own level of roles and role binding, cluster role and cluster role binding, all right. Now you want to connect. Consider Shub want to connect with dev server, dev cluster. Ravi wants to connect with prod server, prod cluster. Naresh wants to connect with test cluster. So you can manage that with the help of context. Okay, you can create the context according, accordingly. That should, should always connect with dev server, uh, dev cluster only. Ravi should always connect to test cluster only. Naresh should always connect to prod uh, cluster only. You can do that using context. All right. So let me show you that here. All right. Consider I'm creating some dummy values here. Okay, just a minute. Okay, I'm going to have some dummy values. Cluster saying I'm giving a prod cluster name. All right, username is I'm giving as uh, Shub. All right, and the name I'm defining for this context is Shub at the rate prod. All right, and I have to define it as a list also. Hyphen context. Okay, so context is a list. This is your one context, and this is your another context that I have created. All right, and you can see that your current context is Kubernetes admin. You have to set your current context. I'll save it here. All right, so team, I have created your context. Let me list them kubectl config get context. Okay, I think I messed it up again. There's something at line number 30. 
All right, let's go to line number 30. Okay, it is about the new entry only. Okay, I haven't put the columns at the end. My bad. <clears throat> it is done. Team, can you see now you have two contexts? Okay, now you have two contexts. Kubernetes admin at the rate Kubernetes. That is your first context. Second context I have created as shub prod. Cluster is prod and name is shub. And you can see the current one also. Okay, the current one is marked with start. So if you want to change the context, all right, if you want to change the context, you can do kubectl use context. Okay, kubectl use context. Which one? I want to use this one. Okay, I have to give config also. kubectl config. Okay, switch to the current context. All right, now you can see that my current context is this one. So team, if I do kubectl get pods, will I get the output now? Right, it's a dummy one, so it is not going to give you output. All right, because your Kubernetes is uh, your API server will not identify it. No keys are identified, no certificates are generated, no certificates are signed. All right, so nothing is here. So your API server will refuse the connection. Your API server will refuse to answer to this command. Okay, because it is not a value, even though. All right, so if you want to switch the context again, you can switch it. All right, again, I'm going to use the default one. All right, so team, you can create users. All right, and after that, you can give those user details in the cube config file and you can choose your context accordingly. So team, I hope now you are able to have the complete picture how we use it. All right, we create a jump server. All right, we create a jump server. Consider a developer came to me that he said he wants to have a namespace with the privileges to create pods. All right, that is a requirement with which a developer came to me. All right, so I'll say, okay, all right, I can do that. What I'll do, I'll create a jump server. I will not give him the access of master node. I will create a jump server, all right. Where my master is running, I'm going to create a user for him. I'll generate the keys of that user. I'll generate a CSR. I will sign that CSR, all right. After that, the developer asked me that he wants to have the access on pods. Accordingly, I'm going to create a role. I'm going to bind that role to that user. All right. After that, I'll place the cube config file in this location on the jump server. But in the place of default user, I'm going to put the details of the user that I have created. Okay. So the user, the developer will access this jump server, will come here, will do the cube serial commands and he will have the access only whatever I have defined on the master node. All right, team. Understood to all of you. With all this, we have covered stateful sets and we have discussed all the content or concepts of security, authentication, authorization, certificates, role cluster, role binding, cube configs, context, this is covered by us. Okay. All of this is covered by us. We are remaining with two topics now. Siddharth, you're saying let's assume that your dummy prod cluster is actually present, but I guess still you won't be able to do that because same uh, CSR role binding needs to be created. Is that understanding correct? Yes, Siddharth, absolutely correct. Okay. By mistake, you might have given the context details accordingly right there are chances that there is a cluster of prod there is a user called chub but it doesn't have the role and role binding so definitely you won't get the output
Gaurav, I have already showed you. All right. I have to put the content of the prod user. I have just given the dummy values right now. But if you want to give the details about the prod user, then you have to give the details of uh, what I'm saying about the certificates also. Okay. So when we created the user, you had the CSR. All right. If I'll go to my master node. And which command I used to have that? Just a minute. Here we are, and uh, security history file. All right, at this location, you have your certificates on master node. This is my master node. All right, you have your private key. All right, you have your CSR. You have to put these details. You have to put these details in this YAML as well. All right, you have to give the context and you have to give the certificate values also. Okay, I haven't just put the certificate details, otherwise everything is already done. Then can you please show us how to, uh, how do you configure multiple context with multiple certificates in Jump server? Uh, okay, Siddharth, uh, let me tell you that. All right. So Siddharth uh, and Gaurav, I think this was a question from both of you. Okay, so as you can see that context is a list. All right, you see that context is a list. Under context, you can define multiple contexts as I have defined. This is one context. This is another context, which is the current context I have given here. All right. Now, if you want to have multiple cluster as well, you can see that clusters is also a list. Okay, clusters is also a list. So under cluster, you have to give your cluster CA certificate details. Okay, I showed you where your CA resides. Your CA resides at ETC Kubernetes PKI. Okay, from there you are going to have the CA authority data. All right, base encoded format. You are going to have that in this cluster. Another next detail. All right, and you are going to have your API server, your master node IP address, and the API server port number that is going to be default 6443. But the IP is going to get changed. All right, so similarly. You are going to have, if you want to connect to two cluster, you are going to have two entries here like this. One will be your cluster and second will be your server. All right. So you can set multiple cluster details here. All right. Now talking about the user details. All right. You can see that users is also a list. All right. User is also a list. So you have to give the name of the user. All right. And you have to give the certificate details of that user also. Okay, and we have already seen how to have a base encoded format. The command is already provided you in the bit uh, Git repository. Primpal, is there any way to connect to cluster without copying config file on the jump server? Primpal, how can you connect to any server without cert authentication and authorization? If you're not going to move the config file, how you can connect to a cluster authentication and authorization is the main thing yes that absolutely you got it yes got the way i created another entry you can remove a previous entry also if you want to remove this entry you can just comment it out and remove it uh, totally from the cube config file Uh, Kushagra, uh, you want to know about external name service. All right. Uh, so Kushagra, if it is okay, can we discuss about that tomorrow? Okay, because we already have some topics remaining from today's class. Yes, there is an external service name. It is never used, honestly speaking. In my complete experience, I have not used it any enterprise level and in the examination also, they don't give the question with this. 
can we create service account and add users to it so that we can create certificate for any service account instead anil that is what i wanted to show you with the remaining topics all right the service account we are supposed to discuss okay so team will take some time all right we are going to extend a little security context we can do tomorrow but i want you to understand about the service account today itself okay because it is all related to your security the flow breaks because that is the reason i kept the all security content on a single day all right so team what is the service account certificates you understood that certificates allows you one component to talk to each other all right now but if you want to have and also important thing i'll show you the dashboard also okay so if you do a little overtime i'll show you the dashboard also today all right so team consider uh, where your service accounts are used with all the communication you can see that i have used certificates but consider that if you are using bots all right consider as i went to the icic bank website it has a small prompt at the corner with the chat option all right uh, for example if i show you hdfc there is something called eva right so this is an artificial intelligence it is a bot all right it you will get some details it will fetch that details from its own cluster all right consider i want to know about credit card services all right so what this bot is going to do it is going to check inside the cluster and give me the details all right so certificates are used to authenticate the user and service accounts are used to authenticate some automation all right or you can say artificial intelligence so if you want to uh, give some details across artificial intelligent objects you use service accounts to communicate between application without prompting username and password absolutely correct name pal all right so team with this i am going to show you something with the dashboard also all right so team uh, what is our kubernetes dashboard kubernetes dashboard allows you to do all the operation from the dashboard on the ui all right not on the command line everything you can do from the uh, dashboard also so what is happening dashboard is also a ui all right it you are going to uh, give some uh, permission you are going to uh, create something from the dashboard it will be created on the node you do cube ctl get nodes on the dashboard all right so it will get authenticated via a service account and connect to your command line cluster and get the details from there so if you talk about that there your service accounts come into picture all right so team service account again i am telling you it is not important for the examination point of view all right i am just giving you for your own good all right i want to show you the dashboard as well that is why i am covering this otherwise it is not important for exam they never give you dashboard or service account in examination all right so team i'll come to the dashboard under dashboard you can see i have insecure dashboard also and secure dashboard also insecure dashboard you want to use you can use it all right so it will not use any uh, authentication it will simply give you the details on the dashboard but i want to use a secure one because i want you to understand about the uh, service accounts all right so you can see this is a yaml i am going to create a namespace i am going to create a service account so team what is a service account actually under kubernetes cube ctl get sa all right you can see a default sa is already created all right let's describe it cube ctl describe sa default all right so team with a service account a token is already connected okay you can see this token is with every place all right this token is in a place of everything if i do cube ctl get pods and i describe a pod cube ctl describe pod pod name all right so team i described uh, the pod and i had this token this is the default service account it has a token of pm8 gk all right in this definition you can see that somewhere 
where is it where is it here it is okay you can see the amounts you can see it is having a cube api access pk m7 p okay so whatever the resource you are creating it is using the secret it is using the service account all right it always uses that so along with this you can see this is the token okay you can see this is the token but you can see that mountable secret also so with the same name a secret is also there all right cube ctl get secret secret name all right you can say a secret is also created along with it all right let's describe the secret now cube ctl describe secret and secret name all right so team this is the end token this is the end token of your service account that actually uses okay so you can see understand the hierarchy you have a service account with service account you have a secret created and under secret you have a token this is a complete hierarchy of your service account all right let me go back to a uh, normal location all right and you can see all the objects are going to get created i am creating a service account here all right i am going to expose the service because i want to have it as a dashboard then i am creating a secret also okay so you can see everything that i have shown you are going to get created i am creating secrets here also multiple secret for multiple components multiple secret i have used config file uh, cube config sorry config map i am creating a role also okay because secrets also need uh, roles right by that only they are going to get the details from the cluster you have a cluster role we have a role binding cluster role binding all right now we are creating a deployment all the objects are there that provides you uh, the complete dashboard and there is no component left in this yaml that you don't know about all the components in this uh, yaml you have understanding about all of them cube ctl create hyphen f and done okay so you can see your name space service account services secrets are created config maps roles role binding deployment services and this all right cube ctl get all hyphen hyphen all Okay, I find I find all was there. Oh, uh, let me get the services only. SVC, I find I find all. Anything wrong? I'm doing. No. Oh, uh, just give me a minute. Okay. Thanks, Arjun. That slipped my mind. Thank you. All right, so team, this is your stateful set. This is your replica set. I am looking for a service. All right, you have a service for Kubernetes dashboard. All right, so I am going to use a node port of this one. On the this one, uh, let me see what I am looking for. I am looking for my master node IP. I'll place it here, and I'll get the port number. Three zero five double two. Okay, so it is, it follows HTTPS HTTPS because we are talking about the secure connection. Advance. So team, this is a secure connection that is understood, but the certificates are not CA authorized. That is why it is asking you: Do you want to continue or not? 
all right so team it is asking you to have the token all right it is asking for you to have the token let's see where i can find a token all right kubectl get sa all right you can say uh, kubernetes dashboard all right i am going to describe it kubectl describe sa and the sa name kubernetes dashboard it has a secret let me describe the secret kubectl describe secret and secret name all right so team this is a token that you have to provide there okay this is the token that you have to provide here then only you are going to get the sign up all right so team welcome to the kubernetes dashboard all right you can see this is about the default namespace you want to see of any other namespace you can see kubernetes dashboard namespace you can check it out here all right all the objects you can see what are created all right cpu utilization memory utilization workload how many pods are there how many deployments are there how many replica sets are there all right you can see about the replica set details all right this is your replica set for say all right this is your maximum search maximum details all the details when the it was created you get all the details from here okay all the details you get it from here consider i want to scale my deployment okay this one it has as of now one oblique one pod click on the three dots scale okay consider i want three replicas now okay i want to have three replicas i'll scale it okay so on the command line if you want to see kubectl get deploy can you see dev test has been scaled to 3 all the things that you can do from the command line you can do it from the dashboard also okay these are your number of pods all right how much your pod is consuming actually this is your ram utilization this is your memory utilization and how it is fetching all these details because your metric server is installed okay so you can see all the details here you can edit anything you can create anything all right this is about your services if you want to uh, make some changes edit your service delete your service everything you can do that all right so team this is all about your dashboard so today you have seen your dashboard as well okay so team any doubts related to your service account Premal, uh, you asked that how to uh, prepare a project and submit in Eureka LMS. Uh, I'll request you to confirm that with the support team. Okay. As for my understanding, you have the project. You do the use cases on your uh, cluster. All right. Have a screenshot of that. Paste it in Notepad or somewhere, and then submit that document. That is my understanding. But I'll request you to double check with the support team. Mosomi, you are asking what is a mountable secret? Mountable secret is nothing but a normal secret. Okay, mountable is a keyword written because it is used by all the components inside the cluster, and that secret is mounted on a service account. That is why it is showing you mountable. Otherwise, it is just like a normal secret. uh how to control uh, read write access of volumes using roles and service account okay mosomi i i think i have already told you for example if you want the access limitation on a persistent volume persistent volume is a cluster level resource so if you give any user a cluster level resource you can define it that he should not have the access on persistent volume or he should get the access only of getting the persistent volume not creating not deleting all right and if you want to deal with namespace you have persistent volume claims all right you can create a role in uh, 
for persistent volume claim that if anybody wants to list it or delete it or create it so you create a role and create a role binding corresponding to that user so that's how you are going to do that mosami so can i create a pod from the dashboard rahul absolutely you can do that okay here is a plus sign all right on plus sign you create if you want to give a yaml format you can give a yaml file here okay if you want to upload a file you can upload a file also all right from here if you want to create right from the command all right i give a name okay testing app container image i am using nginx all right number of pods i want one only service i don't want to create any service as of now deploy okay so with this you can create any object all right you can provide the yaml text here you can uh, have a file uploaded or you can create it from the command line itself all right so if i show you on the dash uh, command line cube ctl get pods 20 seconds ago a testing pod was created okay you can see it was created as a deployment all right it is created as a deployment but that doesn't uh, create any problem all right because it was providing you to provide the number of replicas as well so if you want to create a single pod you can create it as a deployment also no problem with that ankur that is the question i was not expecting honestly okay you are saying that this dashboard didn't ask for the username and password i told you what are the ways of authentication there are four ways of authentication okay username and password username and token and uh, you have your uh, certificates and you have service account these are four ways of authentication all right and i told you in kubernetes we always follow certificates and service account so we logged into this dashboard using a service account all right i can log out and you can see i am providing a token with that token i was able to log into this dashboard if you don't have this token how you uh, log in that is a alpha numeric long string it does provide you a security if you uh, miss any one character you won't be able to log in all right let me give you any gibberish here okay i am just typing gibberish let me sign in okay it says invalid credential so i have to make sure that i am providing exactly correct details here all right this is uh, where is it this this is a token okay and this is a token of your service account you give that detail then only you will be able to log into your cluster otherwise you won't be okay so if you want to use cube config file you have to give the cube config file also you can do that also okay the config file you can browse it from the uh, local machine all right consider i have a cube config file of kubernetes admin all right so token is used by service account if you want to use service account you use token if you use certificate you use cube config all right in cube config you have the config file you place it on your local machine download it on your local machine then browse it select that file and then you can log in to the dashboard using cube config certificates okay so that is how you are going to do that sir if i have to create a de uh, development uh, for dev and a testing at the same time will it be possible for the dashboard so i have to change the labels in yaml Oh uh, Rahul I didn't get it so if I have to create a deployment okay you have to create a deployment for dev and testing at the same time will it be possible from the dashboard or I have to change the labels okay so Rahul what you want you want to create a deployment all right so you can have a yaml file here all right 
you know in a yaml you can create multiple resource at a same time right if you see this yaml file okay if you see this yaml file i am creating multiple objects service account and see i am creating multiple secrets one secret two secret three secrets all right all the three secrets are getting created in a single go if i copy and paste it here if i copy it and paste it here and upload it means it will create three secrets in parallel okay i hope this was your question in place of secret you can give your deployment definition okay what's wrong with him all right so in this in order to restrict uh, dashboard access in terms of kubernetes object i guess i need to restrict the role of the particular service account during the cluster role uh, role binding no siddharth if you are talking about the cluster role and cluster role binding what i have created in this yaml are used to fetch all the details about your cluster and see it on the dashboard okay the cluster role i have created with this yaml i have given the permission to create the resources from the dashboard all right but if you want to restrict uh, the access of dashboard you have to keep the yaml file with you properly all right or consider you can have the multiple uh, dashboard you can have a multiple dashboards of the same cluster in some you give all the roles and responsibility with your uh, cluster role and role binding all right in some dashboard you can limit the access and you can vary you can change the dashboard access using the port number because you will see that always a new service is also created with a new dashboard okay so yes by that way you can also restrict the access all right team any other question till now everything is clear to all of you any doubts any question so team with this i will try uh, i will be concluding today's session here all right i'll be concluding today's session here security context is a small topic i can cover it tomorrow as well all right today we are already uh, 25 minutes late all right so team i am getting all your feedbacks and i really appreciate all of it all right so keep doing that we are done with today's topic if you have any questions you can stay otherwise uh, you can leave today's session and mark your feedback and tomorrow we are going to meet for the last time where we are going to discuss about everything troubleshooting and your examination tips everything we'll cover tomorrow okay Yes, Anil. I'll provide you all the content about your mock papers and CK questions. What kind of questions comes? We are going to have a good discussion on examination point of view. Okay, we'll do that. Arjun, uh, you won't get the mock exams actually. All right, you won't get exactly that. But I will try to give you as much as content I can give. Today we are going to wrap it up. All right. after today you will be ready to take the examination of ck so team please confirm if you can see my screen and if i'm audible to all of you um mm, yes ashok ask a big question if you have Ashok, for interview, you don't have to remember the commands. All right, yes, but basic commands idea you do, you should have, do have. All right, like how you can list the pods, QCTL get pods. Okay, basic commands you should have. How to create a service from command line, QCTL expose is the command. 
all right and if you are going to write the yaml what are the mandate fields it is api version kind metadata and specs and if you want to uh, scale a service so kubectl scale deployment deployment name hyphen hyphen replicas equals to five so all the basic commands you should be knowing all right so that comes with practice only if you're going to an interview and you are showing your experience that you do have in uh, you do have experience in kubernetes so definitely somebody will expect that you should know basic commands and you uh, wants to ask anything before we start with today's class agenda is right in front of you I'm audible to all of you, right? I got only one response today. Okay, great. So team, nobody has any question, right? let's discuss that by the end of the session all right because to discuss on the interview if you can start if you want to start a discussion on interview we can have a complete session for that and even that won't be enough right still if you want to prepare for the interview and if you want me to give a one-liner you should have your core concepts very strong all right today we are going to see the troubleshooting all right so from there you can get an idea that your course should be strong your concept should be clear your basic should be clear how the kubernetes is architectured and if you want to troubleshoot how you can troubleshoot it all comes down to the basic architecture how much clarity you do have at that area all right so uh, we'll discuss that thing by the end of the session as per the time permits all right team so i think we can start for today right first thing is that uh, we left on which yesterday all right security context was left from yesterday's class all right so first we are going to go over that and after that we are move, uh, going to move to the networking part all right so uh, to be very honest security context is hardly five minute topic all right it doesn't have much time for that so team uh, what is security context security context is nothing uh, like for example if you give uh, if i give you a basic idea i'm using my laptop right i'm using my laptop a windows laptop i do have all right so what happens whenever i am working on it whenever i am working on it what i do i do uh, all the things with the administrator account all right whenever you are using your laptop you always use administrator account all right but consider you want to hand it over to somebody else for a few hours all right if you want to hand it over to someone for a few hours what you do you'll lock your administrator account and what you'll do you'll open a guest account right 
so that if somebody wants to use the, your laptop, he will be using guest account. So team, don't we do that? Isn't it that the case? Yes, no, maybe. Isn't it? So team, come on. Are you sleeping or what? I'm not getting responses enough today. Didn't had your coffee? So team, today is the last class, all right? So definitely uh, topics are going to get a little complex. If you won't respond, I won't be able to help you. The session has to be interactive. Okay. So team, a uh, few of you said yes, right? So whenever you're using your laptop and if you want to give it to someone for some uh, few hours, so what you do, you always have a guest account so that he can use it and he won't have the complete permission of your laptop, right? That is what we do. Similarly, in your servers and containers, all right, consider your system administrator of your organization. So you are responsible to take care of all the servers, all right? Again, in that server also, you have a Linux server, all right? So what you'll do as a Linux administrator, you will have the super privileges. All right, and the person who are from other team, for example, a person from database administrator team came to you that I want access on this server. So what you will do, you will create a user and you will provide that user access to that particular database administrator so that he will log into that machine with that username and he won't have the complete access. All right, he won't be having super privileges. Okay, so team, these are the two use cases that you have seen on daily basis. Same thing we want to have it for our containers as well. All right, same thing we want to have for our containers as well. So team, what happened by default, whenever you create a container, okay, kubectl run pod1, Hyphen hyphen image nginx. All right, your pod is created. kubectl exec hyphen it pod one hyphen hyphen bash. Okay, so team, by default, whenever you create a container and you log into that container, you are entered as a root user. All right, you can see I logged into the container. All right, by default, the user I get is a root user. And I don't want anybody to have the root access inside my container. That is my requirement because he can go inside the container and he can mess it up. So what are my expectation? I don't want to give a root access to anyone inside my container, even if I'm the dad person. All right, if any other Kubernetes administrator is there, I don't want to give that much access. All right, so how we are going to avoid it? To avoid that, a security context is something that comes into picture. Okay, security con uh, context helps you with that. So let me show you an example for that one real, real quick. All right, it comes under the security. And then we have security context. All right, consider it is my uh, pod where I don't want to give root user access. All right, so here is an example run as non root prod. All right, so team, you can see the definition. It is API version one and kind is pod. This is the name of my pod. It's under specification, I'm going to mention security context. Okay, under specification, you mentioned the security context. In the security context, you can say that run as not root. 
is true all right so i am asking it not to run as a root user run it as a 405 user all right let's have a raw format i'll copy it uctl create hyphen f okay my pod is created uctl get pods okay so many things are running all right kubectl exec hyphen it and the name of my pod hyphen hyphen bash so team you can identify all right whenever you have the root access you get a hash all right whenever you don't have the root access you get something like that dollar sign or what or if i do id as well okay you can see what is my user id my user id is 405 group id is root that is okay i just ask for the user all right so i don't have the root user access at this point of time all right similarly i have multiple examples here all right the type of variety you can have for the users inside your container all right like if you want to have a pod which has read only access so you cannot make any changes in the pod configuration you have that also okay you have uh, set the volumes and you will have only the root uh, read only access in the root file system all right in the root file system root slash you won't be able to do any changes okay it will have only read only access similarly multiple cases are here all right multiple cases are here we have multiple examples all right whatever you want to have you can do with your pods and container all right so team security context is nothing just managing the access you give to the container all right that's all about your security context this is this much only all right we don't have much in the security context that is all about it ashok sir i have just given a name of the user all right 405 is just a name of a user you can give xyz abcd rahul shok ashok whatever you want to give you can give it is just a username all right uid means username if you saw earlier it was root okay earlier it was uid equals to root it is just a unique id all right zero is a unique id for root all right and 405 is a unique id for guest account okay so team clear to all of you i told you this was a smallest topic in fact all right so team now we are going to start with today's agenda all right your last class agenda all right and we are going to start with the basics of networking all right we are going to start with the basics of networking so don't worry i am not going to start right away from the kubernetes networking i'll show you a basic idea of basic networking and then we'll jump into kubernetes and this is uh, mostly a theoretical part okay so kindly try to bear with me there will be theoretical part much on the networking side first okay so team consider i have multiple laptops okay or multiple systems we have c1 c2 c3 c4 all right and consider your this laptop wants to talk to this laptop all right they want to communicate with each other computer 1 and computer 2 basically main uh, language all right 
two systems wants to talk to each other in very basic example layman example how do they communicate with each other what is a technical term in networking with which they can talk to each other <coughs> Yes, I got your answers. Okay. Okay, Rishabh. Yes, that is true. But how? Premal. Yes, you too. But what do we need for that? Okay. So team, the thing is called switch. Okay, you need to have a switch if your two computer wants to talk to each other. All right. Same thing happens with C3 and C4. If they want to talk to each other, they are also going to have a switch with them. All right. Again, switches here. But consider if they want to talk to the other one in a crossway. All right. Consider your uh, computer three wants to talk to computer two. All right. Or your computer one wants to talk to computer four. All right. That could be the case. How they're going to communicate crossly? In that case, we need something called router. All right. Then we need router. All right, so team, this is very basic networking. If we talk about, all right, very basic networking, no rocket science. All right, now let's come to containers. All right, let's come to container. In a container, all right, in a container, we have something called CNM. Okay, container network model, right, with which uh, they can communicate. With each other, I'm talking about the containers right now. All right, I'm just talking about the container. Container means we are talking about Docker containers. All right, consider in on the same machine, on the same machine I have two containers. All right, on the same machine, if I talk about I have two containers, being on the same host, they can definitely talk to each other. All right, both the containers are running on the same host, definitely they can talk to each other. But how they can talk to each other? What is the networking terminology that allows them to communicate with each other on the same host, being on same host? All right. So that is called Docker Zero Network. If I have installed Docker on a machine, I am creating Docker machines. So all the containers on the same host. Will have a Docker Zero network with which they will be able to communicate with each other. All right. Similarly, if I talk about Docker Swamp, <coughs> okay. If I talk about Docker Swamp, now you understood that your pods, uh, sorry, containers can happily talk to each other. Inside the same host, all right. In the same host, that is possible. But consider, but consider now if you have Docker Swarm, okay. On Docker Swarm again, you have a cluster of machines, all right. And again, you want your pods to talk to each other across nodes, okay. Now you need this communication as well, okay? This container should able uh, should be able to talk to container which is residing on a different node. All right. For that purpose, if I talk about Docker and Docker Swarm, you have something called overlay network. Okay. Overlay networks are there that helps with the communication of inter-node communication in Docker and Docker Swarm. All right. So, team, this is the basic of networking on in your Docker Swamp. 
all right because docker has its own cnm but consider i don't have my own cnm right do we have cnm in kubernetes do we have cnm in kubernetes correct no right our uh, team just allow me a minute please one minute All right, yes, team. Okay, so in Kubernetes, if I talk about I am creating a cluster in Kubernetes, definitely I won't be having this overlay network, at least. All right, other things I might be having, because definitely on all the nodes there is a Docker Docker Zero network because Docker is created there. All right, so if I talk about Kubernetes, I am not having CNM, I am having CNI. All right, and that was completely up to me, which. Container networking interface. I am picking. All right, Flannel, Calico, Weavenet, and plenty of uh, are there. So it is again up to me. So team, in the examination as well, it is completely up to you. Whichever you want to use. All right. So uh, as we have used Weavenet, you have seen how we can use it. All right. So it is the easiest one. So that is why I suggest you to have a Weavenet with you during the examination. All right. So team, now I'm going to show you practically how many networks we do have in Kubernetes. If we talk about uh, your CNI, all right, like Docker Zero network, overlay network, how many networks we have with Kubernetes? This is my master node, all right. Simply give IP hyphen A, IP space A, all right. Now let me show you how many networks you do have, all right. First network is your loopback address. All right. First one is your loopback address. What is a loopback address? Loopback address is the same address with which your host comes back to itself. Okay. This is a default IP which is given on every node. All right. So if you want to uh, do like localhost.com, all right, on laptop, if you do that, so it comes back to its own address. So that is called loopback address. I completely understand that you all must be knowing about this one. Very basic thing. Not even a, a networking concept properly. All right. After that, you can see a third one, which is called Docker Zero. Okay. So this is Docker Zero network because a Docker has been installed on this machine. All right. Apart from that, you can see a Webnet network also. So what all these networking are doing? They are simply providing the IP addresses to your objects. All right. If I talk about Docker Zero, Docker Zero helps with providing the IP addresses to your containers. All right. And this is your CIDR block. If I create a Docker container, it will be have the IP in this range only. All right. This is a CIDR block. Similarly for Beef. Okay. You can see the Beefnet. This is what we had as a CNI. It has this own <coughs> CIDR block. So all the pods which I will be created using Weavenet in this cluster on this particular machine will have the CIDR block. Okay, it will vary from this node to worker node one to worker node two. Okay, it will keep on varying because our Weavenet pod is there on every machine. If you remember, right? And if you talk about the other one, okay, like this one and this one. So these are related to the pods that are currently running. Okay, whenever you create a deployment or whenever you create some object in Kubernetes, all right, they create their own network as well. Because as you already know, you have a deployment, all right. In deployment, you are asking for five replicas, so those five replicas should be able to talking to each other. So definitely, they also need some kind of uh, network within the deployment, 
all right so you can see these network as that all right so team is it clear to all of you clear to all of you service network all right basics all right so time uh, so team this is some of the theory that you already understand all right some of the theory on basics of networking all right since a kubernetes cluster consists of various nodes and pods understand how to communicate them is essential all right networking model support different type of open source implementation all right so we already know that it allows a variety of cnis these are all open source implementation all right a kubernetes networking model on the other hand natively support multi multi host networking in which pods are able to communicate with each other by default okay so you know that on whichever node the pod is getting created they will be able to talk to each other so that is already provided us through by default kubernetes follows an ip per pod okay we also know that if a pod contain multiple containers as well if it is a multi container pod then only we support only ip per pod there is only one ip per pod no matter what uh, no matter what how many pods are running inside your container how many containers are running inside your pod all right there is always one ip per pod and ip address is all the containers in, in a single pod shares the same uh, network namespace and ip address all right containers in the same pod can therefore reach each other ports via local host and port number all right so the number of pod if consider if i have two pods inside my consider i have two containers inside my pod all right so simply they both the pods can reach to each other using local host all right they can simply say uh, 127.0.0 and uh, dot one all right and the port number like this they communicate inside a pod it is not recommended to communicate directly with a pod via its ip due to pod volatility all right so now if you want to communicate with the container we never suggest you to have the ip of the container all right instead use a kubernetes services which represent sorry uh, i was trying to say that whenever you use uh, whenever you want to access your pod all right we never suggest you to use the ip all right we always create what a service to communicate with our pods because we know all the ips that are present are internal all right services gets their own ip addresses all right we have seen whenever we create a service ip address will be assigned to that also all right so team all the description that is mentioned here you have seen all of it all right nothing new is it a small part that you don't know is your dns for services and pods all right so what is dns for services and pods so team the thing is whenever you type www.google.com okay whenever you type www.google.com what is this isn't it a dns entry of any web server all right consider you entered www.google.com so what actually happened this is our dns name all right at the back end there has to be a ip all right so www.google.com is simply a dns name all right at the back end dns resolution take place dns resolution consists that your name the dns entity the human readable characters you have provided at the back end it should have some ip address okay and that ip address is used to reach out to the server because your servers are identified with the ip address okay they have a address in ip ranges so these are your dns name all right in kubernetes in kubernetes 
if we talk about services and if i talk about pods they also own some dns name all right for the internal purpose like if i want to access www.google.com that is for me okay so google has created it like this so that it will be easy to remember for the users simply type www.google.com and you will have the website they don't want their customers to remember the ip addresses okay because numerical string is hard to remember as compared with the name all right similarly in kubernetes also not for the cluster not for sorry not for the customers all right dns names are created for services and pods so that kubernetes can help them communicate inside the cluster all right if one object wants to talk to another object all right for that purpose we get dns name assigned to pods and services so that they can communicate with each other easily all right so if you remember if you remember i can show you that again kubectl get pods hyphen n cube hyphen system okay there are still two pods that we haven't discussed on okay we haven't had a long discussion or much discussion on these two pods core dns these are also your master level resources all right you can see two core dns pods are they are always running okay so what is the purpose of these pods they provide naming convention for your pods and services all right a dns name will be assigned to your pods and services now let me show you another thing all right kubernetes provides its own dns uh, services to resolve domain name inside the cluster all right in order to for pods to communicate with each other this is implemented by deploying a regular kubernetes service which does not which does name resolution inside the cluster all right and configuring individual containers to contact the dns service to resolve dns name all right so these are the internal dns names all right let me explain you practically so team now i am taking a little example okay don't consider them as a node now all right they are not the nodes they are name spaces all right consider this is my ns1 all right and this is my ns2 all right i have two name spaces i can have it all right so you can say that uh, i have a pod running inside this name space all right and i have a service created along with it similarly on your second name space i have a pod and similarly i have another service two different name space two different pods in different name spaces and two different services on two different name spaces all right that is what we have understood so far and accordingly consider you have another pods running outside your name spaces that is your dns pods all right you saw core dns they are running in the third name space cube system all right system level is also core dns so what we have we have dns here now consider team that uh, you have some file on your laptop all right you have some files on your laptop okay so this is your complete laptop so consider your resume is run uh, residing on your d drive or it is maybe deciding on c drive all right so if you to have to reach the path all right you have some naming idea of about it how to reach to a particular path you go to c drive stash abc cd all right stash program file stash something okay so you have a complete path for it all right you have a complete path in kubernetes also all right in kubernetes also we follow some naming convention all right so first the naming convention start with your cluster local all right 
cluster local is simply like your my computer all right on your laptop you have my computer now you have my computer after that you have some name spaces all right so like if you want to go to program files first you'll have c drive and then slash program files in kubernetes you have the cluster name all right this is your cluster local and consider if i want to talk to namespace one so the naming convention will go like ns1 ns1 dot cluster dot local similarly if i talk about ns2 it will be ns2 dot cluster dot local right team making sense and now consider if i want to have the address of these ports and services all right so it will again have something it will again have something like for say if it will have some service name all right it will have some service name all right and then it will have ns2 and then it will have cluster dot local okay so team this is how you do the naming convention right now let's see the practical example for this also okay let's try to do this practically okay where is an example uh, dns test md all right so team the same example i have given you i am going to create it all right i am going to create a nginx pod and nginx service in test ns namespace all right so first i am going to create a test ns namespace all right my test ns namespace is created now i am creating a test ns in the test uh, test ns namespace i am creating a pod all right i am creating a pod and this is my image all right in the same command i am exposing it also okay i am exposing it also at port number 80 all right i am creating a service and i am creating a pod in a single shot okay done all right my nginx pod and nginx service is created so if i want to list kubectl hyphen n test ns get all all right you can see one pod is running with nginx name and one service is running with nginx name all right good now consider i want to create another my nginx pod and my nginx service in default namespace all right so in default namespace if you want to give hyphen n default you can otherwise you can skip that also all right again i am creating it in the same way i am creating a service and i am creating a pod in a single shot command that is also done all right so now i am going to validate both of it kubectl hyphen n test ns get all hyphen o wide it is kubectl all right so this is about your test ns namespace and kubectl get all hyphen o wide okay i am having a lot of things let me delete everything first let me come uh, clean up the system all right it will have a lot more things otherwise So my system is clear. Clear. Cube CTL. Hyphen N. Get NS. 
sorry ns is not to uh, test ns get all all right so i deleted everything but my pods in test ns are still there all right that's good let me create the default one also i have no white All right, team. So you can see, Nginx pod and Nginx service is running in test ns namespace and in default namespace. My Nginx name pod and my Nginx named IP uh, service is created. All right, that's all. So if I have show you what I am doing, this this is is your test ns. All right, and this is your default one. All right. So, team, any doubts still here? Okay. As of now, we haven't done much. We are just trying to understand the basic networking concepts. All right. Very basic, basic things. All right. So team, now I want to know about the naming convention of this. All right. Now I want to find out what are the complete DNS name of these objects, whatever I have created so far. All right. For that purpose, you have some DNS pods just to resolve the namings. All right. Just to resolve the namings. All right. So team, during exam, they might ask you the complete full DNS name. All right. Complete name resolution they want. All right. So in exam, they do ask you that. They provide you a image also to find out the name. All right. They provide you the image also to find it out. All right. But if you want to use my image, you can use this image also. Okay. This image also provide you NS lookup. All right. And they will also give you the image to use. You can use any one. All right. You can use any one. So to do the NS lookup, I am creating a pod with this image. Learn DevOps. Netshoot. All right, so I'm going to create it and I'm going to log into this container right away. All right, so team, you can see my prompt has changed. All right, it is a bash form. Now I am inside this container. Okay, DNS test. So what is the purpose of this pod? I can test the service names. I'll do cat uh, etc resolve.conf. Okay, how the naming convention are resolved. So team, can you see how it goes? First cluster local, as I told you. All right. Now, if I want to talk about the service, service comes with service dot cluster dot local. All right. Or you can search like. Test NS. If you talk about the test NS namespace, test NS namespace, then services, then cluster IP, cluster local. Okay. So team, this is how you do the naming resolution. Okay. This is how it is going to resolve the name. All right. Let's see about that. So if you want to have the complete name of a service that is running inside your test NS namespace. All right. If you want to see the full name, NS lookup, all right, and then you have what? This is your service name, all right. And then you have namespace name, and then you have the object type, all right. So team, this is how you are going to give the names, all right. Again, I am repeating it. First, your object name, then your object namespace, then your object type. All right. So I have a Nginx named service in test namespace, and what is its object type? Is service Nginx dot test ns. Then the type SVC. So you can see the complete name of it. Okay. At the last, you have the cluster local. All right. Then the type of object. Then namespace name, and then the object name. 
all right and you can see the ip address also of this one all right if i can uh, let you check this nginx service all right what is your ip 100 246 and 201 100 246 201 all right consider now i want to check the full name resolution for my another service all right i want to check for this one it is running in the default namespace so what i am going to give ns lookup all right the name is my nginx all right my nginx namespace is default namespace and what kind of object it is again service full name resolution object name object namespace object type and then cluster local all right my computer ip address you can verify 102 triple two one zero two triple two all right so team i guess you understand about this now all right if you talk about services how it goes object name all right namespace then object type all right object type and finally your cluster local so team now i want you to tell me okay <clears throat> now i want you to tell me if i want to do the name resolution for your pod how i can do that okay you have seen how i can do with services how can i do it with the pod you guys tell me so this is we are using a dns for service which is inside kubernetes cluster but what we have uh, we are connecting to service outside the cluster with dns name rahul as of now we are just trying to understand how your networking happens inside the cluster okay if you are talking about from outside the cluster you know that all right you have a notebook service it will be exposed all right you can use it from the any ip machines and you will have the notebook cluster ip is definitely not accessed from outside the cluster we are just checking how the dns name resolution happens from outside the inside the cluster okay so team i want you to give me the complete string all right like if i doing the ns lookup for your service so what i did i did nginx dot namespace and svc if i want to ns lookup for pods what i am going to give here okay what i am going to give you type it out okay great answer ankur anybody else Okay, Rishabh, Anil, Himanshu, Arjun. Arjun, uh, you never mentioned the object type. You never mentioned the object type. Okay, so team, most of you answered correctly. Okay, let's try it if it works or not all right as per our current understanding i assume that all right ns lookup all right consider i am looking for the test ns pod okay what is the name of my test ns pod test ns the name is nginx dot namespace test ns object type pod all right that's all no, it cannot find it. Server can't find it. Okay, let me try for the another namespace. Okay, on another namespace, how it is going to be? NS lookup. The name was my nginx. Default dot pod. Still not working. Okay, so team, what is the thing? If you deal with services, the naming convention follows name, namespace, and 
object type okay it is followed for services only but if you talk about pods top uh, pods has different kind of naming convention okay they uses ip okay they uses ip now if i want to do the test i want to test the pod dns all right there is a rule that has defined by the kubernetes all right to form the pod dns get the pod ip first all right and replace dots with hyphen and then add namespace name and then pod as simple as that all right so whenever you want to do it with the pods you have to give the ips all right you have to give the ips that is how it is arranged all right so let me do that ns lookup all right first i'm going to give the pod name that is going to be my ip let's have it all right so about the test ns pod ip is this okay and it is asked to replace the dots with hyphen let me do that and then namespace name test ns and then you give the type that is pod see now it is doing the naming resolution okay you get the address and you get the name also okay pod dot cluster dot local similarly we can do with the another one also all right what is the ip of my nginx pod okay my nginx pod ip is did we do about this only okay so let me do with the let me verify it all right 106 test ns 106 okay i mismatched all right i mismatched hyphen then default then pod okay so team this is how your naming convention are resolved all right in examination you might get question from this part all right they will say that this uh, pod is running in so and so namespace all right this pod is running this service is getting created in so and so namespace have the full name resolution all right in that case you have to create a pod with the learn devops net shoot image all right or they might also provide you an image you can use that image and have your complete naming resolution to uh, taken in place all right so team any question any doubt in uh, pods naming resolution services name resolution any doubts here all right we have covered security context basics of networking and dns test any doubts any question here anil uh, the pod which i created was from the netshoot image okay the purpose for which that image was created to have the naming resolution you will get another image in examination kubernetes does provide their own image to do the naming resolution if you want to use my image netshoot learn devops slash netshoot you can use that also okay it is just for the naming resolution okay team if it is clear to all of you give me a quick yes so that we can move to the troubleshooting part anil everything in the uh, git repository all right you have to go to your uh, git repository service network dns test.md all right where it is where it is this one so anil it is here ओके 
Okay, so team, now we are going to move the troubleshooting. All right. Now we are going to move to the troubleshooting part. How we can do the troubleshooting inside our cluster? All right. So we'll start from the very basic one. All right. I'll ask you questions. You answer me. All right. So team, this troubleshooting session has to be interactive. Okay. I need answers from all of you. Then only it is going to help you in the examination. All right. You have to think over it. How to solve a particular situation? Control P Q, Q C T L. Get bots. All right. So team, see that your engineering spot is running. All right. Your one of your engineering spot is running. I find a white. All right. So if I do N S lookup, not N S lookup. Sorry, my bad. Uh, curl operation. Okay. I'll curl the I P. Okay, you are getting the uh, output with "Welcome to Nginx." All right, it runs on default port number 80. I'll give port number 80, and I suspect there is a page also. Sure. Okay, let's try that. So it is not found. All right. So team, starting with a very basic troubleshooting, I want to check the logs of my container. Okay, I want to check the logs of my container. Maybe a dumb question. Uh, in cloud uh, VM, we add DNS while deploying uh, VM nodes. Is that not so? Then why uh, deploy DNS pod? Okay, Arjun. Uh, in VMs, we are not dealing with VMs right now. We are dealing with Kubernetes. All right. In Kubernetes, so uh, Arjun, what is the difference? Whenever you create a virtual machine, okay. Whenever you create a virtual machine, you can use its external IP. And then you can access it from the outside world. All right. You can see I created a virtual machine. It had one internal IP and one external IP. So VMs are configured in a way that they will have two IPs, one external and one internal, for outside world also. But if we talk about pods, pods have internal IPs only. Pods doesn't have the external name. All right. For that purpose, we create services. So it is a collective efforts of pods and services to expose your application. And that takes help of DNS. All right. So VMs are different with the ports and services that we are discussing. All right. So team for troubleshooting, I got only two answers: Anil and Adhirika guest. Risha, Bankur, Premal, <coughs> great, great. All right. So team, now I am getting good answers. All right. So if you want to troubleshooting. Your first troubleshooting starts with kubectl log command. Kubectl logs my nginx. All right. Yes, you were absolutely correct. Okay, I'm getting the outputs from where I access. All right. So team, during exam, what type of question can come from this part? All right. So they will have you a pod given. All right. They will have you a pod given, and they'll say a pod is running there. All right, and find. Uh, logs uh, find the error when there was 404 error. All right, and save the output in a file. Save the output in a file. All right, you can do that. Kubectl logs. All right, I will grab 404 error. All right, and I will direct the output it to faucet temp slash error file. Okay, so in exam they might ask you that you have a pod, grab the 404 errors and place the output in a file. You can do that. If I'll cat temp and error file, see all the errors that you had with 404 will be saved to a file. Okay, very basic one. Okay, so team from here it starts that you can grab the error. All right, and you can save the output in a file. Okay, so team, for the further troubleshooting, what I'm going to do, I'm going to pause my screen. Okay, I'm going to pause my screen. Let me do something, and then I'll ask you what I did and how it is going to help. Okay, let me go here and here.
All right, so team, I think now you can see my screen. Just a minute, please. Okay, so team, what I'm doing, kubectl run. I'm creating a pod, pod one, hyphen hyphen image. Nginx. Okay, so team, what I have did? I created a pod. Qctl get pods. So team, the status of your pod is coming like this. All right, the status of your pod is coming as pending. Pod is created. Container is not getting created. All right. So team, now you tell me. Okay, how do I start my troubleshooting? All of you. Great, great answers. All right, describe. Describe is going to be your first approach. If something is not happening, try to describe it. Describe pod, pod one. All right, so team, I did the describe as per your suggestions. Okay, but in the describe, you can see there are no events. Okay, there are no events itself. Now what? Think about it. At your guess, uh, the pod is in pending state. Container is not created. What I'm going to do exec with? Exec will take you to nowhere because your container is not created at all team think about it okay Abhinav you CTL get notes okay good Prempal you can do the logs only when container is created all right logs are fetched from the container your container is not created at all how you can do the logs how you can do the exec Check YAML storage class is not ready. Okay. All right, team. So first approach, I'll tell you what you can follow. Qctl get pods. All right. It is still in pending state. So whenever your uh, pod is not getting created, it is in pending state. First thing, what you did, you check the describe. All right. What is the first step in the events? Okay. You know the architecture, you have seen the events log multiple times. What is the first thing that comes in events? What is the first action that happens inside the cluster whenever you request a pod? Yes, Arjun, absolutely correct. No, Rahul, you're wrong. Ganapati, yes, to some extent. Uh, no, Gaurav, no. Mosomi, yes, but by whom? Okay, you are reaching there, Masumi. Okay, so team, the first event that happens is your team. Let me show you of this one. Okay, you don't remember. Some of you do remember now. All right, but not all of you. You see, till uh, describe pod by Nginx. Team, what is the first event that happens? So many of you are telling the uh, image pool, image pool, image pool. No, first thing that is done is scheduling. Okay, team, you have to pay attention. What is uh, the basic architecture of Kubernetes? Right? The basic architecture tells you first the schedule, scheduling will take place. After that, will Kubelet uh, will uh, pull the image on the worker node. First the scheduler. All right, so next thing, if you cannot see any events, all right, you go with the architecture, okay? So team, for troubleshooting, stick with the architecture. What happens at what time? So let me get the output of kubectl get pods hyphen n cube hyphen system. Okay, let's see what is happening here. So team, what is happening to your schedule? 
schedule is filling with crash loop back okay so what i did i intentionally corrupted your scheduler okay i intentionally corrupted your scheduler all right so where your scheduler yaml is scheduler runs as a static pod you all know that so i'll go to the static pod location manifest all right ls vi cube scheduler so team anything is wrong there right so what i did i intentionally corrupted my scheduler yaml okay i intentionally corrupted it so let me make it right all right so i fix the error all right now you can see that scheduler is working scheduler is working cube ctl get pods okay it is currently still in pending state but it will get scheduled okay you can see that it is scheduled then only you are getting the creating container all right now it is in running state okay now it is in running state cube ctl describe pod pod 1 okay so team first step that happens if you do not do not see any logs you have to check for the scheduler or all your master components all right all right so team i am going to pause my screen again okay i am going to give you another use case so team if we talk about troubleshooting there are endless scenarios okay we do have endless scenarios but i am trying to show you a few all right so that you understand how you do the troubleshooting how it goes okay what approach you take that is what i am trying to show you all right so team in the meantime you can tell me that if i want to create a static pod how do i do that okay the next troubleshooting scenario is coming from static pod so in the meantime you can tell me how to create a static pod so team i have resumed my screen now you can see my screen okay so team uh, most of you have answered me correctly all right couple in main frame we can create static pod i don't understand this so team this is my worker node one okay i am going coming on worker node one so cube ctl <coughs> run oh uh, let me have this command from here okay cube ctl run pod one hyphen hyphen image nginx all right hyphen hyphen uh, i am just having the output for this okay die run equals to client and hyphen o yaml all what i am giving okay all right so
so team this is uh, a yaml okay this is i want to get created on node 1 as a static pod cd etc as all of you have told me kubernetes and manifest okay vi pod dot yaml okay i'm saving it all right so team now i am how i am going to verify it if my pod is created or not How do I verify if my pod is created or not? All right, kubectl get pods I'm going to do from the master node. All right, but if I want to verify it from the node one itself, Docker is installed there. I can do Docker ps, right? Docker ps grep pod one. Okay, it is created. Okay, uh, just a minute. So team, what is happening? I just restarted my kubelet once. All right, I just restarted uh, my kubelet once, and I place a YAML file here. All right, a YAML file is here. So team, your pod is not getting created. Okay, your static pod is not visible here. Docker ps. The earlier one all right so ignore this one you cannot see the pod one keynote one now okay your yaml is there your yaml is there at edc kubernetes manifest location but but at this location you cannot see your pod why your static pod is not coming you tell me now arjun you are well prepared for the exam honestly speaking okay great answer So are you Gaurav? Correct answer. Team answers. Okay, my static pod is not coming online. I have placed the YAML at ETC Kubernetes manifest location. Why it is not coming up? Help me with the troubleshooting. Okay, Ankur, you are saying check the kubelet status first on the worker node. All right. Good one. Service kubelet status good approach okay so Ankur you give the right approach you know that static pods are always managed by the kubelet all right so this is how your troubleshooting should go you place a yaml file your kubelet is working or not that is you have to check your kubelet is checking working now now what Ankur Team answers, you will get these kind of troubleshooting scenarios in exam as well. Okay, so you cannot say quite. Where is Can't read con file. Ankur, which 
service you are talking okay docker service docker ps command gave the output so docker is working also kubelet agent enabled present on okay this okay got it actually your question panel was placed at this area so that is why i was not able to see unable to read all right so yes right rishab team did i ever tell you that etc kubernetes manifest is a default location for your static pod is it always remain the same or it picks it from somewhere is etc etc kubernetes manifest location is a default location or this value is picked from somewhere team answers no sort of i never told you this is the default location no no couple i never told you that this is the default location yes this is our default location in a way but this value is getting picked from somewhere i showed you that also okay when we studied about the config files sorry when we studied about the static pod i clearly told you from where this value is getting picked yes eka absolutely correct prempal right no mosmi from the yaml you cannot help it okay so i told you team i told you that kubelet has all its uh, libraries kubelet has all its library uh, libraries at var library and kubelet location okay here are your all libraries and here is a config file as well all right here is a config file as well all right i told you you have to come down and there is a static pod path okay you have to come down to this config file and there is a static pod path you can see that is that says that okay it is not the right value that is why your static pod is not created okay your static pod path is not given properly all right so this is not the default location all right this is not the default location you can change it so team consider in exam they might ask you create a static pod all right they ask you create a static pod you will go blindly to etc etc kubernetes manifest location and paste the yaml there all right but your pod will not come up then you are going to troubleshoot it this way all right you will check that even if your etc kubernetes manifest location is still the default one or somebody has modified it okay so i'll save it all right i'll restart my services service kubelet restart all right team your static pod is coming online now okay see your static pod is now online your static pod is online now all right uh got you showing a phase one scenario where kubernetes is using c group as system d but docker is using uh, is that serious uh, scenarios kubelet is not working fine what is the best approach uh got it uh, during the installation process okay during the installation process i told you uh, to have one step okay uh, sorry that was not with this batch my bad all right so uh, gorov and team what happened uh, recently version 22 all right kubernetes etc uh, kubernetes version 22 has arrived all right so let me show you here kubectl get nodes all right when we started uh, when we started all right then the version was v1 21 okay now with the latest version has arrived 22 so if you are going to have the installation step let me show you that this is your install all right some steps are modified you can see this file has been updated 9 days ago okay this file has updated 9 days ago readme.md 
all right so now during the installation process you are making that your docker should also run with c driver group at system d all right now you after you install the docker you have to create a daemon json file place this output in the that file and restart the docker after that you have to install your kubelet otherwise it is not going to work properly okay this is something coming with version 22 of kubernetes all right and the version 22 has been launched uh, i say two or three weeks back all right so team let me pause my screen again i'm going to pause my screen again okay i'm going to show you one more scenario okay all right just a minute <clears throat> So team, my screen is visible to all of you now. All right, I have resumed the stream. Consider I did kubectl get pods, kubectl get nodes. So team, I am not getting the output now. Uh, Sarath, I do have in the Git repository how to upgrade your cluster. All right, I already have that in my uh, Git repository. Uh, you will see that somewhere, all right? Otherwise, I'll let you know by the end of the class, all right? Okay, Mosumi, you say uh, that I check the kubelet services, all right? But it doesn't have anything to do with kubelet, all right? Your kubectl should be working, that is a client. But still, if you want, I can show you. So team, uh, till now, whatever I have told you, any doubts in that? Gaurav, I'll tell you about egress and in egress. Okay, I'll tell you about it. Can uh, ALB in AWS be placed, can be used in place of ingress controller for path-based routing? Joydeep, no, that you cannot do. Okay, ALBs are used to do the load balancing when you have your application on servers. All right, here we are talking about Kubernetes. If you have your application deployed right away on the servers, on the EC2 instances, on your AWS machines, then you can use ALB for path-based routing, but not here. Okay, so Gaurav, you were asking what is egress and what is ingress, okay? So team, uh, there are network policies as well, okay? There are some network policies as well. What is the purpose? With network policies, you can limit the communication inside your cluster, okay? With egress and ingress, it is a small topic, so I can touch base on this one, all right? So what happens, consider you have an application deployment and you have a database deployment. You can have the communication between them with the help of cluster IP, we have already established that fact. But now consider you want to limit the communication between these two only, all right? You don't want your uh, uh, database. You have to give the specific pathing also, all right? Consider, let me show you with uh, a diagram. It will make you understand better, okay? All right, so team, you can see that this is your application deployment and this is your database deployment. Application deployment, DB deployment, all right? So you want the communication to happen in this direction only, okay? You want the communication to be happening in this direction only, all right? Your app should be able to reach to DB, all right? And your app should only give the traffic to DB. 
your app should not be able to give traffic to any other deployment and about your database deployment you want the traffic coming inside your database deployment it should not send the traffic outside anywhere it should not receive the traffic from any other deployment it should receive the traffic only for from app deployment and app deployment should be sending outward traffic only to db all right these kind of rules you can set with egress policy all right you can set it with your network policies this one okay let me show you some of the yamls so that you can understand it is for allowing all egress and all ingress it won't allow understand you egress net policy yaml okay so team this is the network policy i am setting up the egress rule okay what is the egress rule under specification you can see uh, i am defining for web application okay web deployment all the ports with labels app equals to web egress all right it means it should out send the traffic egress is for out sending traffic ingress for incoming traffic or right? egress is for outgoing traffic i am defining a egress setup that web should only send the traffic to the ports where label is equals to app equals to db okay all the ports with app equals to web label should traff send the traffic only to app equals to db ports no other way all right so this is about your egress okay this is about your egress let's see what is ingress all right here i am defining the opposite rule all the ports with app equals to db should have incoming traffic from the ports who has a label app equals to web all right so team this is about your egress and ingress rule egress defines how your traffic outgoes and ingress defines how your incoming traffic should be okay that is all about it sir uh, gorav so this is about it Oh uh, yes, Joydeep. If you are using EKS, if you are using EKS, then you can use uh, ALB. All right. You saw that all the example I am showing you right now, all the example that I am showing you right now, we are everything doing on your manage uh, manually created cluster. If you are using EKS on AWS, then you can use ALB. Then you can do right. all right so team with this i am going to conclude the ingress topic as well okay i am going to conclude the ingress topic as well now i am going to show you something on your what is remaining helm okay hp is done ingress is done now helm okay so what is a helm so team another use case first all right so team how many of you have worked on ansible Okay, let me frame my question in a different way. How many of you don't know about Ansible? How many of you have not used Ansible? Okay, basic knowledge, not use Ansible. All right. Okay, so I was about to give you an example on Ansible. Let me think of any other example. How to explain you about Helm? all right uh let me make you understand about this in this way all right consider team that uh, we have seen the installation of kubernetes right we have seen the installation of kubernetes so with kubernetes installation i told you there are two ways one is a hard way all right one is a hard way second is the kubeatm way right that is what we have seen now if you understand that hard way was a actual hard way you have to install all the components manually one by one all right you have to get all the components one by one but with kubeatm what happened with kubeatm all the components were created automatically all the certificates all the deployments all the ports all the daemon set all the components were created automatically okay similarly in helm similarly for helm okay what happens in helm help is a marketplace all right consider that on kubernetes i want to deploy an application 
okay and the, this is a general application for example if i want to have jenkins okay jenkins is a ci cd tool all right i want to deploy the service of jenkins on helm okay i can also deploy the application of wordpress all right so if you want to create a wordpress or if you want to create a jenkins application on the kubernetes on kubernetes on microservice architecture so what you have to do you have to create your namespaces all right you have to create your uh, and uh, namespaces you have to create your deployment you have to create your role, role binding you have to create your services all right all the objects you have to create manually okay all the objects you have to create manually but with helm it is called a marketplace all right you can simply have all the definition all right and you can create your service on a go all right so this is your official website from where you can see all the definitions all right this is the marketplace from where you can package all right artifact.hub search your package whatever you want to okay i want to have jenkins okay so there is a jenkins so team you can correspond this to a uh, docker hub as well okay with the look and feel i just uh, understood about the another example all right consider that you want to have a nginx pod so you can use the nginx image directly otherwise if you go with a normal way so you have to have a nginx uh, sorry centos container image or a one to container image you are going to download that container image you are going to create your container all right once your container is created you are going to install nginx over that and then you come out to the container and then your container will be a nginx container now all right so that is one way but docker hub is a marketplace there are already images that have nginx installed in it so why do i have to take that much when that first i create the uh, image of ubuntu then i create the container then i install the uh, nginx i don't want to take that when there is a marketplace i can have simply an nginx container from there all right why take that much when simply with all your application in kubernetes there are some general level application that can be used on a general level so one of it is your jenkins all right consider if i want to install jenkins in kubernetes cluster first you can see all the commands will execute from helm all right so first you need to install helm all right so this is the commands to install your jenkins but command start with helm first you need to install your helm on your machine so helm is not a part of kubernetes all right it is not officially from kubernetes you have to install another thing for your helm all right get there is a folder called helm all right there are some details about your helm and this is for the installation all right i have to execute these commands to install your helm all right and let me change the mode to 777 all right let give the complete permission to this file triple seven okay now execute it all right so you can see that your helm is installed okay your helm is installed all right so there are multiple operation will helm as well okay so team helm is also a big topic i am just giving you a basic idea all right so don't think that now you have become the expert of helm it is just giving you a basic ideas all right helm itself is a big tool all right you can have multiple commands like kubectl commands you can have all the commands with helm also helm history helm list all right helm repo all the things you can see with helm okay i'm just giving you a basic idea and then you have a uh, helm jenkins all right so these are the commands that you need to execute all right for this purpose i asked you to have the gke okay i executed all the commands on my normal machine oh uh, let me connect with my kubernetes cluster manage one connect i'll copy this one run in cloud shell
so team why i am using gke because when you are using helm all right many objects are getting created all right you have your pv pvc cloud is many objects are getting created all right so that is why i am using this i don't want to create all the objects manually i want to get it created automatically authorize all right it is done cube ctl get notes all right you have to note cluster now let me install helm here as well i need to install helm Okay, already Hem is already installed in this one. Okay, my bad, my bad again, team. I had to execute it here. Ch mode triple seven. Get Helm. doesn't give you the permission or uh, try to do sh okay so with this you can see your helm is installed all right now i am going to uh, have your chart ready okay in helm it is called helm charts for jenkins first i need to get the repo from the helm hub all right i am just adding the repo then i'll install the repo then you can do helm list <clears throat> all right so team you can see uh, that your jenkins is dashboard is created all right the username is going to be user and a password has been created as a secret all right so if you want to get the output of this password you can do this it gives you command as well to find out the password all right so let me have this password with me on the notepad all right so let's see if uh, all the things are created or not cube ctl get all hyphen hyphen all okay team uh, i'm really sorry i'm doing the same mistake again and again i have to execute all the commands on your cloud shell extremely sorry the thing is i am very much used to do the, to do the alt tab install jenkins you can see the helm list one list is already there I'm going to echo the password from the cloud shell this time. No mistakes. Echo dollar this. All right. Uh, so this is going to be a password. Let me have it to here. Not bad. Cube CTL get all. I have an F and all. okay these are your replica sets services demon sets all right so team here is your services all right 
a load balancer service is created i want to modify it i don't want to have a load balancer service i want to have a node port service all right so let me modify this one kubectl edit svc and svc name all right i want to change the type of the service here it is load balancer i am changing it to node port node port okay jenkins job is edited kubectl get svc and this one okay so team now you do have a node port okay this is your port number let me have the ip of uh, the machine all right you have to go to the vm instances take any of your worker node ip copy it paste it in the browser colon and then your port number team you are getting the jenkins dashboard user all right and this is your password as simple as that so you saw that we just dealt with the helm all right all right you understand that whenever you create some microservice or your application you create a lot of components you create deployment replica sets pods services you pon uh, config maps secrets a lot of things are created all right you have to take care of all of them but some of the applications are general purpose so you can use the helm chart and have it on your kubernetes cluster all right so team this is how you use your helm all right whatever application you want to do you can use all right you can search it on the marketplace all right i have some example on the git repo as well if you want to practice all right there is awx helm also ghost image wordpress all right so many examples are here so you can practice at your own all right so team now if you have any question with helm or any other question you can ask no one else license is not required for jenkins all right because everything is already in the helm okay license is already there secrets are also also already there okay everything is managed by it rahul in helm i am stung how to create a template with multiple deployments is to be created can you be able to give idea on this i have pod 1 and pod 2 using two different images and how can i use template and charts all right so uh, rahul if you want to have the idea on chart there is a folder called charts all right and you can have the complete chart of grafana prometheus and from here you can take the example okay from the helm marketplace you can simply download it but if you want to create a chart manually so rahul this is an example prometheus you can see the template this is how you are going to create your chart file okay in helm most important part that you create a chart.yaml and values.yaml under that you have the templates all right so you can see that for example if i open a service okay server service so team can you see how the yaml is written okay you have the aps version you have the kind but under metadata you have given condition very differently okay your values are getting picked from the values file all right annotation labels also you can see that app from where the value is getting picked prometheus dot name okay it is coming from the charts okay some values comes from the chart dot yaml and some values come from the values dot yaml okay otherwise you can see the uh, structure is same api version kind metadata labels all right specification cluster ip all right all the things are same all the things are same but the way of passing them is different under templates you place all the yamls all right in chart.ms you define the values all right what is the api version app version is this what is the version what is will be the name of the chart prometheus all right so this is how you can create the chart so rahul if you want to have an idea you can go through these charts it will give you the complete picture ये 
Yes, Himanshu, definitely you can. Uh, Prempal, what is intermediate container? I don't understand exactly what kind of container you're talking about. Yes, Rahul, in this example, only one pod is getting created. All right, you can have multiple pod definition under templates. You can uh, have a deployment file. All right, let me see if a deployment file is there or not. It has to be there. All right, this is a deployment file. Okay, here, if you want to give multiple replicas, you can give them multiple replicas. All right, and this is one definition of your deployment. Have multiple definition. Once your definition ends here, put three hyphens and give a different deployment definition. Uh, Arjun, you're asking installing uh, using kubeadm for exam. Do we have to install Docker? Uh, no, Arjun, uh, Docker is by default installed in the examination machine. All right. So in exam, you don't have to install Docker. Docker is always going to be there. Okay, team, just a minute, please. Okay, uh, Primpal, uh, intermediate uh, containers, if you're asking in the Docker context, okay, so it is about uh, the Docker files. All right, you have a Docker file. It is a config as code, you can say, or infrastructure as a code, you can say. All right, you write the Docker file. In Docker file, you give the definition that what image you are going to use, what operations you are going to perform in this container. All right, you add multiple layers on your containers. All right, so if you understand about Docker file, you are asking a question from Docker. So that is why I am asking, uh, giving the answer in a Docker context. So consider that you are creating a Docker file. In Docker file, you have uh, mentioned multiple steps. First, that download a CentOS container, all right? Then create a container, then install Nginx in that container. Then you have to install a new index.html file, all right? So you have uh, mentioned four to five steps in a Docker file. All right. So in a Docker file, you have step, uh, given multiple files. Now you are going to create a Docker image from that Docker file. You are creating a Docker image from that Docker file. So you have given five steps. So all the five steps will be created on intermediate containers. All right. Like you first say that from image sent to us. So sent to us image will be downloaded and our container will be created. All right. Then you wanted to install Nginx. So that uh, you are going to install Nginx on that container. All right, you're going to install that Nginx on that container and then our image will be formed and that container will be deleted. All right, then if you have given next step that create a new index.html file, then new container will be created with the latest image and HTML uh, dot index.html file will be updated. Again, that container will be terminated and image will be created from that. All right, so for all the steps, intermediate containers are created. All right, all the containers which are getting created and deleted to give you a end image. Those are called intermediate containers. So Prempal, I hope that answers your question. Uh, Rahul, you are asking how to pass on different values for different deployment. Okay, uh, there is you having problem. So Rahul, do you have the complete understanding about the chart? That is the first question. All right. So if you want to provide different values, you can see that if else condition can be worked here. All right. I think that is mentioned in charts or values or YAML. Somewhere I know it is here. 
just a minute. I guess it is in templates. Uh, see, Raul, now this is your answer. All right. See under specification. All right. Here you can give if else condition. All right. You give the replica value. All right. Pick this number of replicas if value of server strategy is this. Okay. Depending on the strategy you have defined, you are defining the number of replicas. All right. So based on your application name, you can choose different image. All right. Give two definition of deployment exactly in the same manner. All right. And then you can uh, give the if condition. If you have given the string like this, this image will be picked and this deployment will be created for application one. And if you have given the naming convention differently, all right, pick the different name. If the name is different, then choose different number, uh, different type of image and create a different deployment. All right. So Rahul, this is how it is going to be. Otherwise, if you want to have a very specific answer, all right, I cannot give you that specific answer on the fly. All right, you have created a charts. You have good understanding about this. That is really good. But until unless I take a look on those charts myself, I cannot give you the specific answer. Eka, you are asking, can we still have access to the current Git repo? Yes, Eka, this repository is always, uh, always going to be there. All right, you don't have to worry about it. This repo will remain always. One year, two year lifetime, this repo is always there. Yes, Arjun, steps are given there. All right, I'll give you some idea on the steps as well. Not steps, but about your exam. That is what we have given. Okay, great, Rahul. Good to see that. Okay, so team, uh, today don't leave the webinar until unless I asked you to. All right, today is the last class. All right, I'm going to give you some important tips as well. All right, so do not leave the webinar until I asked you. I'll just take a few minutes more. All right, hardly two to five minutes. All right, so team, all the topics that we have covered so far. Helm is also completed. Now let's talk about about your exam. All right, let's have some discussion on your exam. All right, so team, first thing first, your exam is going to be proctored. All right, the most important point, your exam is going to be proctored. Whenever you register for your exam and you start giving your exam, there is going to be a person on the other side. All right, he will ask you to keep your webcam on. All right, and you have to sit in a empty room. Okay, there should not be interference during your examination. Earlier the examination was of three hours. Now your examination is of two hours. All right, number of questions has also reduced. All right, but the exam is proctored. You have to have your room clean. You have to sit in an empty room for two hours. There should not be interference at all. All right, you can have your water bottle or basic things without any labels or sticker over it. All right, and your proctor may ask you to show the complete room. All right. With the webcam, your examiner, your proctor could ask you to show the room overall. All right. In the beginning of the class as well and during the end of your class or also in the middle of the class, the proctor can ask you anytime to show you the room. All right. So you have to make sure that the, your room is clean and empty. All right. You should not have any gadgets around you. All right. Another laptop, if it is there, another desktop is there, so it should be powered off. All right. You should not have your mobile phones allowed. You can have your water bottle with you. So basic things. All right. During the exam, you can go for a washroom break or do break. All right. That is allowed. During the exam, you can go, but the timer will not stop. All right. So if you are away from the screen, if you are not in the room for some time, that is all okay. You can leave the room. You can go to the washroom, but the timer will continue to go. All right that thing in exam you cannot open the normal notepad okay if you want to uh, do write something if you want to write some yamls or copy paste something you are not allowed to use any notepad of your own okay during exam they provide you their own notepad you have to uh, copy paste anything if you want there only do not use your own notepad also no other application should be open on your laptop during the exam Okay, they will ask you to close all the application, all the uh, tools and anything. All the things will be closed during your exam. In the exam, you will have a window where you will be 
performing your exam you will have a cluster from where you are going to connect and very important point in the examination always use the context all right because you get a jump server they don't give you the complete access on the work master node all right you are getting the access on a jump server so they can ask you different different question from different different clusters all right so based on your output they will judge that you have give use the context or not all right and don't worry about the context format they will always give you the complete command use this context and do this all right they always do that so complete command will be there so you have to make sure that you are choosing the right context otherwise you will get the different output and your answer will be false all right make sure you use context thoroughly and as i told you in the beginning as well you are not allowed to open any extra trap tab all right you cannot open google you cannot any open anything it is really important that you have your bookmarks ready with you all right so that with opening an extra tab only one extra tab is allowed to you all right from there you can choose the page where you want to go for your exam all right there is a cheat sheet also i have placed in the yaml uh sorry um mm, your bookmarks all right so there are so many commands that can help you for your examination as well all right so so many commands are there which way you can use in exam so only one extra tab can be allowed and only official kubernetes website you can open there all right and about your exam i have already shared with you that cncf is the one who is conducting the examination now all right this is your examination page uh, certification ck all right here you can register for your exam all right you can have some training also for your exam you have the cost of 375 dollars all right and you get two attempts in this all right so maybe because of xyz reason if you didn't make through in the first attempt you can attempt again all right and validity for this course is one year after you have paid this price you can have two attempts within a year not after the year all right and all the details about your examination seven all right cluster architecture installation weights 25% all right workload scheduling takes 15% service networking takes 20% storage 10% troubleshooting is not 30% with the maximum weightage all right so it is important that you give your focus on troubleshooting thoroughly all right and for your examination preparation as well i have a lot of content in the git repository all right for example you have examples all right in examples it is for your application you can deploy a complete application consider you that you have want to have spring boot mongo app all right all the components are here you can create persistent volume then persistent volume claim all right all the objects that can create it to have your spring boot application is here so this for your practice again for exam preparation okay i have multiple use cases in these three uh, these five ck5 all right for example if you will see any what kind of question comes in the examination all right you have some tips and tricks also how to take your etcd backup i have already discussed about this all right no need to memorize the command how you can deal with it i have told you that also all right so this is for your tip and uh, tips and tricks these five documentation are for that you can go through them all right pod scenarios how many pods issues can be there and how you are going to resolve it okay there is a text file so these are the use cases what problems can happen with pods problem with pod yaml okay find out what is wrong with this definition all right so team these are all for your own practice okay for troubleshooting also there is a folder all right no issues network issues i have already shown you this one okay and somebody asked me how to update the cluster all right so uh, team i don't remember who asked me how to update the cluster there is a folder called update cluster all right here you can see how you are going to update your cluster update.txt all the steps are mentioned here to update your cluster all right all the steps are here nothing new everything is known to you how to use your cube ctl version how to take the backup of etcd all right how to take the backup of all this everything is here follow these steps thoroughly and you can update your cluster as well Arjun yes you can use your chrome you can use your opera that is okay 
okay choose your browser at your own but there should not any other browser open all right there should not be any other tab open only one tab is allowed for official kubernetes website can we use additional monitoring uh, during exam Eka, what kind of additional monitoring you want metric server is going to be there okay metric server will already be installed okay so in examination you will get the monitoring question related to top commands only all right that give the top uh, commands for these pods find out which pod is consuming maximum uh, ram okay find out which uh, pod is consuming maximum cpu these type of questions you get and you can find it out with a top command easily Anil, suppose we have gone through all the exam for your repo and what is the percentage cover? Anil, if you have covered this complete Git repo, you can clear your exam in the first attempt very easily. Okay, honestly speaking, if you have gone through all the examples in this Git repo, you are well prepared for exam. Can we take a notebook in our uh, KDS notes next to your laptop during exam? No, Kushagra, you are not allowed to have a notebook with yourself. All right, only official Kubernetes website and a blank notepad that uh, they are going to provide you in a browser tab. They are going to provide you a notepad for copy pasting, but no notebook and everything you can continue uh, have with you. Arjun, I'll honestly say that this Git repo is enough for your examination preparation, all right? But still, uh, I cannot give you any other idea right now, all right? If any website uh, lets you practice, you can simply Google it, how to practice for your CK exam, all right? There will be multiple links, but I haven't used any of them anytime. Uh, Gaurav, you are asking how many questions are there. Uh, I guess now they have reduced the number of questions and it is from uh, 20 to 24 questions now they give as per my understanding right now. Okay, I must have seen that somewhere. Exam prepared. Okay, number of questions were earlier, 20 to 24 questions. Now they have 18 to 19 questions, all right? Two hour duration is this, and now you get 18 to 20 questions. Passing percentage is also reduced. Earlier it was 74%, now it is 66%, all right? And the results are out in almost around 36 hours, all right? They need at least 36 hours to evaluate your answers, and they uh, then they publish your results. Anil, uh, total how many questions uh, will be there, multi-answers or single answer based lab? <clears throat> Anil, as I told you, it is not a MCQ type of question, okay? You don't have to take something, you have to practice it, okay? They are going to give you a scenario and you have to perform some operation. They are going to ask you to save the output in some fa files, all right? So after that, they are going to evaluate what you have saved in the files. So it is not a step marking or something. Either your answer is correct or it isn't. Eka, as I told you, uh, on the machine where you are giving the exam, you are not allowed to have any other laptop or desktop powered on, okay? So even if you have a laptop or desktop in your room, it has to be in powered off state. Uh, Gaurav, as I said, I don't have any mock tests available with me because I saw, as I told you, it has a subjective exam all right you have the use cases you have the scenarios that you have to create a pod you have to name a pod you have to rename all right you have to get the output of top command so these are commands that you have to execute and the same use cases i have already provided you in my get repo all right so the way questions are framed they are there how to answer those questions you already know now you have understand everything about the kubernetes so I don't have any mock tests available with me, but all the preparation content is already here.
Eka, I will recommend you to have only one monitor. Okay. Keep the other, uh, other one in the powered off state during the exam. There is no need to have two monitors and it is also not recommended. For examination point of view, you just have one one. Arjun, uh, the Kubernetes exam is CK exam is being taken care by CNCF only. Eka, how do we measure how we are ready for the exam? Eka, I have given the use cases. I am repeating multiple time. All right, I am repeating multiple time. In the exam preparation, you have multiple files here. They have all the questions. So consider if you are capable enough to answer all the questions, you can consider you are well prepared. No, Gaurav, during the two hours of exam, you are not allowed to have your mobile as well. Okay, keep your mobile powered off state or keep it in another room. Okay, nobody should enter uh, in your room also during the examination. Okay, so team during exam also you can skip a question for some time and you can come back to the question later on. Okay, so don't get stuck on a single question if you are struggling with it. All right, skip that question for that duration, move to the next question. All right, so there might, may be chances that the later questions carry uh, more weightage and you are more confident with that. So you can skip the question for the particular duration and after that, once you are done with all the questions, you can come back to the questions where you have the issues. Uh, no, uh, sort of no negative marking. 